The thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. This country's war supplies cannot wait. Everything else must be sidetracked. For this reason, it's wise to lay in a full supply of coal right now. Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer and tell him you want your bin filled clear to the top. Better be safe than sorry. Today, coal transportation facilities are adequate to take care of all requirements. But who knows what sudden change tomorrow might bring. Your reliable blue coal dealer is ready to serve you quickly. Serve you with all you want of this tested, superior home fuel. So please order without delay. Be prepared. The Shadow, a mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death Imported. The time, 11.30 at night. The place, the warden's office of the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Come in. Warden 7809 wants to talk to you. I'll bring him in. Yes, sir. Go in, Piran. Thank you. Now, what is it, Piran? I want to talk to you alone, Warden. All right. Leave us alone, guard. Yes, sir. Now, what do you want, Piran? I want to get out of here. Guards told me you were having one of your spells. Now, you know that's impossible. Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. Where did you get that knife? Never mind where I got it. I got it, and I know how to use it. Now, listen to me, Piran. Don't reach for that alarm if you want to live. What are you going to do? I'm going to get out of this place. And you're going to help me. I'm going to give you no help, Piran. Yes, you are, Warden, or you die. There's a supply truck coming into the grounds in exactly seven minutes. I'm leaving on that truck, and you're helping me. You'll have to kill me before I give you any help. You'll feel the cold blade of my knife on your throat, Warden. It would be so easy just You'll never to... get away with this, Piran. Oh, yes, Warden. When a man has something to do, he does it. And I have several bits of unfinished business. <laughs> Come on. Let's go. Extra paper, read all about it. Daring escape from state prison, warden murdered. Extra paper, warden murdered. Now look, Cranston, Miss Lane, it's getting late. Why don't you two go on home? I've got my reports to check. I tell you, Judge Emery is perfectly safe. Perhaps he is perfectly safe, Commissioner. But with George Perrin still loose and the police unable to find him... I tell you, you're making a mountain out of a... a... Molehill. Thanks, out of a molehill. Well, Perrin escaped three weeks ago and there's been no trace of him. Just call Judge Emery, Commissioner. And if he's all right, we won't bother you anymore. Cranston, Judge Emery asked us to keep his whereabouts secret. Then he is worried. Well, of course he is with that that nut running around loose saying that he's going to murder him. Hardly a molehill, Commissioner. Now listen, Cranston, this is not a problem for amateur sleuths. Okay, Margot, let's go. You better double lock your door tonight, Commissioner. Yeah, thanks, I will. I don't get it. So long. Goodbye, uh, Commissioner. Wait a minute, come back here. Yes, Commissioner? What did you mean by that double lock your door crack? Well, after all, you were the man who finally caught Piran, and he said he was going to get all the people responsible for his being sent to prison. And if I remember correctly, you were to be victim number two on his murder parade. He did? I mean, I am? Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> maybe I had better phone Judge Emery just to, uh, just to... Uh... to see if he's all right. Yeah. Uh, hello? Hello? Number, please. Uh, get me... <clears throat> it's that cold of mine. I mean, uh, get me Valley 7904. Valley 7904. Oh, yeah, that's right. 
One moment, please. Of course, this is all very silly, calling him up like this. Piranha's just a bluffer. He can't get away with a thing like this. Here's your party. And uh, Yes, thanks. Uh, hello? This is Judge Emery's residence. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Weston calling. I want to speak to the judge, please. I'm sorry, but Judge Emery is indisposed. He can't come to the phone. Oh, well, tell him that I called. It's nothing important. I'll do that, sir. Everything's all right out there. Oh, yes. Perfect. Uh-huh. Uh, who's this speaking? The butler? No, Commissioner Weston. This is George Perrin. <laughs> Can't he get more speed out of this car? We're doing 65 now, Crash. How far does Judge Emery live from here? About 10 more miles. He's at his country home. And we've got to make that 10 miles in a hurry, Commissioner, or Judge Emery hasn't got a chance. Okay, Cardona, give us all she's got. Right, Commissioner. <laughs> oh, now to get rid of these bundles. Oh, Father. Father, I'm home. Where are you? Father. Father. That's funny. The lights are all on. He said he'd wait up for me. Oh, Dad, are you upstairs? Perhaps he's going to bed. Dad, I was just... Strange, he's not in his room. Dad. Dad. Oh, don't frighten me. Tell me where you are. I guess I'd better look on the third floor, but there's no reason for him to be on the... What's that? Dad, are you playing games with me? <laughs> oh, you're in that room, aren't you? Now, Dad, wasn't it rather... Su oh, no. Come. I take you to your father. Take me to... What have you done with him? You'll see. Stay away from me. Don't come any closer. Master say bring judge's daughter too, he Stay say. away from me. Stay away. I got you. Is judge Emery's estate much farther, Commissioner? About another mile or so. Turn left, Cardona, when you come to the old mill. Right, Commissioner. Well, Lamont, what do you think Peran is likely to do to Judge Emery? Better not think about that, Mark. What I'm worried about is the judge's daughter, Jane. She's living there at the Emery estate, too. Yes, Peran is not the kind of man to spare even... Look. The... Huh? What's Look. that? What is it, Marco? Well, I thought I saw something running through the trees there. Stop the car, Cardona. Yes. Now, where did you see it? Back there. Just a flash of white for a minute. Well, I don't see anything. Well, I'm sure I saw something. It may have been some animal, Marco. It's pretty wild around here. <laughs> There, do you hear that? That was no animal. That was a woman's scream. Come on, Cardona, let's go. I'm coming too, Commissioner. Well, I'm not staying here in the car alone. Okay, come along. Stay close behind us. Remember, this isn't going to be a picnic, Margot. Peran is a very dangerous killer. Uh, I'm certain this is where I saw something, Lamont. Uh, well, there's nothing here now. Oh, by the way, Commissioner... How big a man would you say Peran was? Oh, I don't know. Five foot six or seven. Not very big. Then he could hardly have made this footprint here in the soft earth. What footprint? Holy jo What a foot! Why, it must be a size 17 or 18. This footprint was made by a giant. Now, wait a minute. Here's something else. It's a woman's locket. Looks like some kind of inscription on it. Can you read it, Cranston? Yeah, hold your flashlight up here. There you are. There. It says... To Jane from Dad on her 18th birthday. Commissioner, you said Judge Emery had a daughter named Jane. Uh-huh. Well, do you suppose it was she who screamed? Uh, what do you make of it, Cranston? I don't know, Commissioner. But I don't think we're going to find anything out here in the darkness. Let's get to Judge Emery's home and see exactly what's happened. Commissioner, Commissioner, Judge Emery's house is just around the next bend of the road. Every light in the house is on. All right, let's go. Something tells me, Commissioner, that we may have gotten here just a little too late. Yeah, this is Judge Emery's home, all right. Didn't you say that all the lights were on, Cardona? They were, Mr. Cranston, just a few minutes ago. That's strange. Well, let's go on in. Now, Cardona, you go around to the back of the house, and we'll go in the front. Right, Commissioner. 
Now, don't take any chances, Cranston. Just watch this. It's the body of a huge watchdog. Judge Emery's dog. His head has been bashed in. Oh, Lamont. Mm, It's a nasty wound, poor fellow. He probably died trying to protect his master. Come on, Mogo. Up the stairs. You better knock. The door's open, Commissioner. Yeah, so it is. Wait a minute. This may be a trap. Flash your light in there. I don't see anything. Here's the light switch. Nothing's wrong in here. Everything seems to be in place. Yeah. Let's take a look around. I'll take the upstairs. Uh, you search here. I'm going to call headquarters and get a few more men down here. If we're going to make a thorough search of the grounds, we'll need more than just we four. Okay. Come on, Marco. We'll see what's upstairs. All right, Lamont. I'm afraid I'm not going to like anything we find. No, Miss Lane, I don't think you are going to like what we find. But I don't think you'll find it upstairs. I think whatever it is, it's right down here. Now, here's the phone. Hello? 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 Number, please. What's the matter, operator? Did I disturb your nap? Sorry, sir. What number do you want? Get me police headquarters. Police? Yes, sir. All right. How did they ever let that guy Piran escape in the first place? Is that you, Cardona? I'm in this room here, telephoning. Come in, I want to talk to you. I'm sorry they don't answer. They don't answer. They've got to answer. It's police headquarters. I'll try them again, sir. That will be awfully kind of you. Oh, Cardona, did you find anything around? Say, who are you? I come to get you. Now, wait a minute. You better come. If you make noise, maybe I kill you right away. If you kill me, you won't get very far before the police get you. I get you! No, you don't! You want to fight with Brewer! You think you are strong like Brolo. Maybe I kill you now before I take you to Master. No, no. He's got better way for you to die. In a moment, our play will continue. Here's news. Over 180,000 mystic shadow rings have been requested by our listeners, some of which are still being sent out. If you send for it right away, you can still get this unique ring which has made such a sensational hit. Of course, it's no wonder the mystic ring has made such a hit, because it's so extraordinary, so exotic, such a rare kind of ring. The mystic shadow ring, you know, is no ordinary gold or silver ring. It's a white ring, and there's a peculiar and exotic magic in its whiteness. When you slip this ring on your finger, hold it near a light, and then go into a dark room. You discover to your amazement that your finger is encircled with a weird and ghostly ring of light. Yes, the mystic shadow ring is a light eater. It's hungry for light. It holds the light and glows in the dark like the unsleeping eyes of a jungle cat. Who knows what weird creatures of the night may be summoned by this ghostly torch? Send in today for your mystic shadow ring. Simply send ten cents, one dime, with your name and address, to The Shadow, Madison Square Station, Post Office Box 5, New York City. Here's the address again. The Shadow... Madison Square Station, Post Office Box 5, New York City, New York. This offer is limited to the United States only. Send for your mystic shadow ring right away. Now, back to our story. Cardona. Cardona. You want some more water, Lamar? Yes. Here, Cardona, drink this. What happened to you? Ah. I don't know. I was around in the back of the house, according to orders. Then I thought I saw someone lurking in the bushes. That was the last thing I remember. You're lucky you can remember anything, Lieutenant. Yes, I get... Where's Commissioner Weston? We don't know, Cardona. When we came downstairs, the phone was off the hook. And Commissioner Weston was gone. Gone? I'm going up. No. Oh. Stay right oh. where you are, Cardona. You're still groggy from that blow on the head. I'm going after Commissioner Weston. Margot... You stay here with Cardona. But Lamont... Margot, there's only one place near here where Peran may be hiding. That's the old mill about a mile from here. I'm going there and take a look around. Dad, I'm trying... 
trying to get these ropes off my hands and my feet. Then I'll be able to help you. It's useless to try, Jane. How would we get out of this old mill into the stream without Piran or that halfwit giant of his seeing us? Well, I'm going to try anyway. Oh, someone's coming, Dad. <laughs> well, well, I see that you both regain consciousness. That's good. Piran. You've got to let us go. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do now, Judge Emery. For three long years, they made me do things I didn't want to, but now I give the orders. Mr. Perran, why don't you be reasonable? When my father sent you to prison, it was his duty. Yes, and I made a promise then to make him pay. I don't break my promises. That's my duty, Miss Emery. What are you talking about? Don't be impatient. You'll soon see. First, I open this trap door. <laughs> My beauties are asleep down below there. Oh. An amazing thing about crocodiles, Judge Emery, they sleep most of the time. Right. Except when they eat. Have you ever seen them eat, Miss Emery? Oh. Well, you're soon going to have the chance. <laughs> what are you going to do? Need you ask? I'm going to feed my little pets, Miss Emery. They haven't eaten now for several days. Their former owner was the last one to feed them. You mean Grogan, the man who lives here in this old mill? Lived here, Judge Emery. I fed his body to his own crocodile several days ago. You... you madman! <laughs> no need for melodrama, Miss Emery. You see, he had just what I needed, so I took it. Just what I needed to even accounts with you, Judge Emery. Oh, no! You can't do this to my father, Perrin. Oh, yes, Miss Emery. No. It's going to be a most interesting spectacle, I assure you. Spectacle? Yes. But first, I must wake up my sleeping beauties. This rock ought to do it. Wake up, my pretties! Oh, <laughs> no, Perrin. <laughs> Listen to them. They're hungry. Oh, it's going to be over much too fast, Miss Emery. I don't care what you do with me, Perrin, but don't harm her. Her time will come later. Oh, Dad! Dad! Come, Judge. I'm going down into that pit. No, no. Please, Saran. If you have an ounce of human decency left, and you can't do this. Can I? Down he goes. No. No. <laughs> See, master, I do what you say. I bring him here. Good work, Prolo. Put Commissioner Weston down. Yes, master. You didn't kill him, did you, Prolo? No, master. He tried to fight, but he is not strong like Prolo. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, still unconscious, Commissioner Weston? Don't worry. You will know who to thank for your murder. Somebody knocking. You want Brolo No, to... wait. Carry Weston into that room there and lock him up. I'll handle our visitor myself. But, Master... Do as I say. Yes, Master. I take him. I do what you say. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes? I beg your pardon, Mr. Grogan. Grogan? How did you know my name was Grogan? I saw it on the letter box outside. I... I was under the impression that this mill was deserted. Well, now you know that it isn't. What do you want? I was talking to Judge Emery about... Judge the... Emery? Well, yes. Do you know him? He has that uh, big house about a mile or so from here. He was saying... When did the... you see him? See him? Why, Judge Emery's an old friend of mine. Uh, may I come in? Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, come in. Thank you. You were saying something about talking to Judge Emery? Yes. Uh, he told me that this old mill was deserted and I was thinking of renting it and fixing it up for a summer home. I see. When did you last see and speak with Judge Emery? Uh, I don't believe I caught your name. Cranston. Lamont Cranston. Cranston, eh? Name sounds very familiar to me. Does it? But as I was saying, Judge Emery must have been mistaken about the availability of this place of yours. Yes. Well, I think I'll run right over and tell him so. Uh, wouldn't you think it strange, Mr. Cranston, if someone came to your door at two o'clock in the morning and asked you whether you wanted to rent your home? Good heavens, is it that late? Yes. Well, I, I guess I'd better be running along, and I'm <laughs> so sorry to have disturbed you. Don't mention it, Mr. Cranston. 
Perhaps we shall meet again. Perhaps. Good night, Mr. Grogan. Perhaps we shall meet again. Sooner than you think. Rolo. Yes, master. There was a man just here. He can't have gotten very far. Go out and get him. Yes, master. I go. Yes. We shall meet again, Mr. Cranston. And my little pets will have another meal. Very soon. <laughs> Oh, dear. Jane Emery. What? Who called my name? The Shadow, Miss Emery. There's so little light in here, I can't see you. The light wouldn't help you to see the Shadow, Miss Emery. No one has ever seen me. What do you want of me? I want to help you escape from here. Oh, no, Shadow. Let him kill me, too. There's nothing left for me now. Now that my father's dead. I just want to die now. Duran killed him? Yes, he, he threw into those beasts to be eaten alive. He made me watch. Beasts? Crocodiles. They're in a pit under this room. Oh, yes. There seems to be a trap door here. Oh, please. Please close it again. Close it. Close it. How did Duran obtain these crocodiles? The man who lived here in this old mill raised... All types of tropical animals to sell to zoos. I see. And Baran used them to accomplish his revenge on your father. Yes, he did. Well, the shadow will see that he pays for his crimes. Oh, please. Please don't do that to me. Quiet, Miss Blaine. Jane Emery, I'll be back for you in a few minutes. Right now, there is someone who needs my help more urgently than you do. What have you done with them? I know they're here. Suppose I were to say that they were here, miss, what would you do? I'd go to the police. Yes, I see. But I'm afraid you won't be able to go to the police, miss. Because you won't leave this place. A giant. Rollo, didn't you find him? No. I no find him. He get away. You fool. Now he'll have the police swarming over this place like ants. Come, miss. I have a little surprise for you. Take your hands off me. Oh, <laughs> so you won't come, hmm? Rolo, carry her into the other room. Yes, master. No, stay away from me. No, stay away! No. What? Fainted, miss? I'd expected to take a little more time with my revenge, but now they'll all have to die together. Jane Emery, Weston, and this girl. <laughs> no, Piran. I will stop you. Who said that? The shadow, George Perrin. Order your giant to put Miss Lane down. I can't see you, but if you're so powerful, shadow, you order him. <laughs> Rolo, put her down. Huh. What? Where? Where voice coming from? Rolo, do as I say. You must obey me. I am your master, Rolo. I order you to take her into the room with the trap door. We'll feed our beauties well tonight. <laughs> yes. Master, I do what you say. Rollo, listen to me. He is not your master. The things he has made you do are evil. He has made you do them. Don't listen to him. I am your master, Rollo. You must obey me. Here. Go down here. Stop, Rollo. Stop. I must obey you, master. I must obey. <laughs> yes. Yes. See who's strong in our shadow. Rollo. You must not do this. I will protect you from him. He has twisted your mind. He makes you kill. <laughs> You've lost, Shadow. Into the pit with a brawler. Brawler, no. Put her down. Safely. Yes. Yes. I put her down safe. No. Like voice say. No, brawler. I am your master. I order you to... No. You make me kill. No, Rolo. You make me do bad things. No, Rolo. No, you go into pit. No, Rolo, listen to me. Don't come any closer. Don't, I command you. Stop, Rolo. No, no. boys. He is I... bad. Now he no. is going to die. No! Go right into the commissioner's office, Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. The commissioner will be in in a minute. Well, thanks, Cardona. Oh, thanks. 
Now, what do you suppose Weston wants to see us about? I haven't the faintest idea, Margo. The Baran case is all settled. Oh, uh, incidentally, I talked to the DA the other day about Brolo, and he's going to take my recommendation and place him in an institution. Oh, good. He's just a poor, well, big, hello, misguided... Hello, Miss Lane. Cranston, sit down, sit oh, down. thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I... Well, why did you send for us, Commissioner? Yes, I, um... <clears throat> well, it's, um... Well, I have my report to make out on the Paran case, and, uh... Well, I need your help. What? You need my help? Why, Commissioner, this is remarkable. Remarkable? This is history-making. Yes, well, uh, you see, it's this way. I, uh, <clears throat> when I got the crack over the head, I... I don't remember anything that happened till the next morning. Could have happened to anybody. Anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so at last, Commissioner Weston comes to Lamont Cranston for help. Yes, and I hate myself for doing it. <laughs> Immediately following John Barclay's message, we'll bring you a dramatic view of your part in the war effort. First... Here's Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, a gift you'll find most welcome this year is the practical kind. And I have a suggestion for you. This is for Dad or for Mother. I suggest that you get one of the new automatic Blue Coal heat regulators for your home. It's certainly a practical present, but it's even more than that. It's a present that will mean the whole family will enjoy more comfort and ease. Especially if you have children in the family, you need controlled temperature throughout the house. And that's just what the automatic blue coal heat regulator gives you. It automatically opens and closes the dampers on your furnace, so that when more heat is needed, you get more heat. No overheating, no underheating. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer and ask him about the automatic heat regulator. It'll pay you to find out about it. You may have a free demonstration in your own home. Thank you. The Shadow Story is copyrighted by Street and Smith. The characters' names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. In Hawaii and the Philippines, American soldiers are fighting and dying for you. How much are you doing for them? Give them a hand. Back them up. Do your bit. Buy United States Defense Savings Bonds and Stamps, and you can consider every dollar a bullet sent flying straight at the enemy. Go to your nearest bank or post office. Buy a bond. I want a United States Defense Savings Bond, please. Here's the money. Buy a bond, so that on the firing line, your soldiers can say this. Is the ammunition running low? No, sir. New supplies just arrived. Atta boy, now we'll make them sorry they ever started this war. Do your part. Every week, buy United States Defense Savings Bonds or Stamps. On sale at every bank or post office. Let's teach aggressor nations the truth of the warning... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen, and be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay.
Protect yourself against the quick weather changes that are so common this time of the year by heating your home with blue coal. You'll find this fine fuel gives you new and greater satisfaction because it's especially prepared for home heating. It's delivered to your home in just the right size for greatest efficiency. That means warmth even on the coldest days. It means money saved, too, on fuel costs. Remember, when you buy blue coal, you save money by buying the best. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow and have him fill your bin with the always clean and dependable blue coal. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama... Death gives an encore. <laughs> As the surgeon knows, the phenomenon called life is a delicate balance. To tamper with that balance is to upset it, and to upset it is to create a monster, neither living nor dead. A creature with no conscience, no mind of its own but obeying the will of its bloodthirsty master. This is the story of a scientist who walked a road no mortal man dared travel. And in conclusion, gentlemen of the Biologist Society, may I say that I have actually seen cases of this living surgery in the Orient. I have seen whole parts of bodies transplanted successfully. Vital organs removed from one person and grafted onto another. Well, I rather... Professor Gando, Professor Gando, may I say you leave so much to the imagination. Are you implying that I, I lie, Professor Wallace? I'm not implying. I say that you're a fraud and have no business here addressing a group of scientists. Right. I quite agree with that, yes. Well, Gando... Where is the proof of your statements on living surgery? For ten years, Wallace, you have attempted to ruin me. I have given you no reason, no cause for these unjustified attacks on me. Proof? Where's your proof? You have seen my collection of photographs of actual cases. Fakes, every one of them. You'll pay for this, Professor Wallace. I might add that you're a much better photographer than you are a man of science. <laughs> yes, you'll pay for this, Professor Wallace. You'll pay <laughs> Williams dies tonight in chair. Knife for Williams to be executed tonight. Read all about it. This is the end of the road for you, Williams. Have you any last words? Any last requests? Yeah, Warden. Free my hands and give me a knife. I see, Williams. Still unrepentant. May the Lord see fit to pardon your sins. All right. Sniper Williams is dead. Hello, Commissioner Weston speaking. Hello, Commissioner Weston. Yes. This is Warden Sloan of the state prison speaking. Yes, Warden, yes. Commissioner Knifer Williams' body was placed in the prison morgue and... Did you call me at four o'clock in the morning to tell me that? No, sir. What then? His hands, Commissioner... His hands have been amputated. Amputated? They're missing. Good Lord, missing. Why? I don't know, sir. It looks like the job of a skilled surgeon. In some way, someone got into the morgue and mutilated William's body. Mr. Bartolini's not in his dressing room, Mr. McManus. Hey. I went in to check on his costume. Not there? No, sir. What is Trapeze Act as the star act on the bill? Now, what can we tell the audience? Well, that's your business, Well, sir. you know they only come to see Bartolini's triple somersault in midair. Everything's gone from his dressing room, sir. Flew the coupe, eh? I don't know, sir. There's only a large wooden box there. Box? Well, let me see it. Come on. You know, Mr. McManus, I have a strange feeling about this. There's been a man... Oh, here it is, Mr. McManus. Hmm. 
sort of looks like a small coffin, don't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'm going to open that box. Oh, wait a minute. What's this? There's a note attached to the side. Uh? It says... Bartolini won't need these anymore. It's unsigned. Well, I don't get it. Open the box. All right. <gasps> oh! Just his arms. Bartolini's two arms in the box. Amputated at the shoulder. I don't suppose you remember me, Mr. Cranston. I met you several years ago in the Orient. Well, as a matter of fact, Professor Wallace, I remember you quite well. You were doing research work in tropical diseases at the time. Yes, that's quite right. And if I'm not mistaken, you are something of a student of criminology. Oh, why? Well, it's for that reason that I've asked you here tonight. Well, criminology is just a hobby, Professor Wallace, but I am very much interested in the subject. That's a masterpiece of understatement. <laughs> what was that? Oh, nothing. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Please go on. Oh, yes. Well, to come to the point... What would you say, Mr. Cranston, if I were to tell you that I have, for the last several years, been driving a man systematically insane? What are you saying? Now, wait, please, hear me out. First, hear my reasons before you condemn me. Please go on. I assure you my motives are above censure when judged in the light of medical science. Drive a man insane? Well, do you think that by doing that that you're helping mankind? Yes, I do, Miss Lane. See, this man's brain was warped before he ever crossed my path. I immediately recognized the danger in allowing this man to continue with his diabolical experiments. Experiments with living bodies. Oh, Lamar. I don't believe I quite understand, Professor Wallace. Experiments with living surgery, Mr. Cranston. The grafting of arms and legs and vital organs from one body to another. Oh. The man's name is Gondo, a brilliant biologist whose intense work in the field of biological research twisted his mind. Mm -hmm. There's no telling what horrible crime he might not commit in his effort to prove his theories. Oh, why wasn't some effort made to cure him? Cure is out of the question, Miss Lane. That horrible obsession is beyond medical aid. Oh, I see. So my sole purpose was to make Professor Gondo commit some act of violence toward me. Then I could have him sent away to some institution where he'd be safe. And at last, I think I have succeeded. Read this note I just received. Mm -hmm. What does it say, Lamont? My brain against yours, Professor. The body of a skilled gymnast, and in a murderer's hand, cold steel, thirsting for your blood. Tonight. Well, it's unsigned. It's undoubtedly from my friend, Gondo. Well, you don't seem very much upset by that threatening note, Professor Wallace. Well, Miss Lane, my apartment here is 22 floors off the street, and the halls are guarded by private detectives. Come on, look. Where? Look out the window over there. I saw someone on the window ledge of the building across the court. Why, that's impossible. There's not enough ledge on those windows for a cat to walk on. Well, I can't see anybody. It's... Too dark, eh? Well, I'm sure I saw someone for a moment. Probably your nerves, Margo. I can't say. I blame you after hearing that. <gasps> what was that? It came from my study. My assistant, Peterson, is going over some notes of mine in there. Come on. Yes. Yes, of course. Oh, oh no. Don't look, Margo. Peterson. He's dead, Christ. Stabbed through the throat with a knife. No, Alice. Not stabbed. The knife was thrown. What? And look. The window is slightly open at a level with his head. Thrown? Miss Lane was right about seeing someone across the way. Uh, careful, Wallace. The killer may still be there. Look out! What was that? Another knife. There's a note attached to it. Read it, Francis. Yes. Fear festers like an evil disease. The first knife was to plant the infection. The next to drain your life's blood. All right, card owner. Call me back here at Professor Wallace's apartment. Well, Commissioner? It seems Miss Lane was right about seeing somebody across this court. My men have found a good set of fingerprints on the ledge of that window across there. Uh Uh-huh. They're checking through the files now. We were sure of that before you found the prints, Commissioner. Of course, Valdemir Gondo's fingerprints. And how do you know this guy Gondo sent Professor Wallace the note? It wasn't signed. He threatened me before. Oh, wait, wait. Step by step, Professor. Step by step. Now, while you're all sitting in here, Miss Lane sees somebody across the court, 20-some stories off the street and hanging on the ledge. Hanging on a ledge, mind you, like a fool monkey. Why, it'd have to be another Bartolini to do that. Bartolini? Yes, that's the name I was trying to remember. Bartolini, the great trapeze performer. So you think it's Bartolini, huh? It could have been, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah, it could have been, Miss Lane. However, it seems that somebody bumped Mr. Bartolini off some three weeks ago. Yes, that's it. And sent his arms back in a box. That mutilation slaying, do you remember it, Professor Wallace? Yes, his arms were severed at the shoulder. The rest of his body hasn't been found. 
Cranston, do you think there's a possibility that Gondo succeeded in his experiment? Now, uh, wait. I, I'll answer. It's probably for me. Hello? Yes, yeah, speaking. Oh, yes, Cardona. You checked the prints. All right. Well, whose are they? Whose? Uh, check them again. You heard me check them again, and if you give me the same answer, you're fired. Ridiculous. Whose fingerprints were they, Commissioner? Dopes. In a... I'm going to clean out that whole fingerprint department. Whose prints were they? He said they were Knifer Williams' prints. And Knifer Williams died in the electric chair four weeks ago. Act two of Death Gives an Encore will continue in just a moment. Meanwhile, here's a reminder to get in touch with your blue coal dealer so you'll be prepared for anything the weatherman has in store for you. You can keep your home at just exactly the temperature you want with blue coal. Comfortably warm and yet not too hot because blue coal burns evenly and smoothly. In fact, this superior home fuel is especially prepared, sized, and carefully graded for home use. Yes, it fits the requirements of your furnace. It's tailor-made for your home. That's why you're sure of complete satisfaction when you heat with blue coal. You not only get comfortable, dependable warmth, but besides that, this tested superior home fuel is a money saver. It burns so efficiently that you enjoy real economy with blue coal. Get in touch with your neighborhood blue coal dealer tomorrow. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Now here's a special announcement about the Mystic Shadow Ring. This is an exotic white ring that holds light and afterward glows weirdly in the darkness. You can get this ring simply by sending 10 cents with your name and address to The Shadow, Post Office Box 5, Madison Square Station, New York City. Send in right away for your mystic shadow ring. Now, back to The Shadow. earth you make of this whole business? Margot, I don't think Bartolini is dead. Everything points to the fact that Gondo was successful in his experiments. Well, then the creature I saw on that window ledge... May have been the trained acrobat Bartolini with the grafted arms of the Knifer Williams. Oh, but how could Gondo control the brain of his monster? I don't know that, Margot. But the Shadow is going to interview Professor Gondo in his laboratory. Perhaps he will find the answer there. Soon. Proof you wanted, eh? Well, proof you shall have. <laughs> well, Professor Gondo. What? I heard something. There's nobody here. You're wrong, Professor Gondo. The shadow is also here. Where? Where? I don't see anyone. The shadow cannot be seen by your eyes. Why did you come here? I want to know about your experiments in living surgery. Living surgery? Why do you want to know? An attempt was made on the life of Professor Wallace tonight. You are under suspicion. Suspicion? Do you admit, Professor Gondo, I you... do not admit anything, Shadow. But I can tell you frankly, I would like to see him dead. I hate him. And you tried to kill him? No. <laughs> no, Shadow. If I were to kill Professor Wallace, mind you, I say if, it would be with these two hands. And not the hands of Knifer Williams grafted to the body of Bartolini, grafted by you as an instrument of your revenge? You speak in riddles, Shadow. I do not understand. Perhaps you find it convenient not to understand, Gondo. What's that? Someone is tapping on my window. Gondo, stay away from that window. I must see what it is. There is no one here. Come away from that window. <laughs> Gondo. Dead. Killed by a thrown knife. Professor Gondo, third victim of fiendish knife murderer. Police request anyone with possible clues to identity of murderer to come forward. Police request anyone with possible, with possible clues, clues to identity, to identity of, murderer of murderer to come forward. forward. Commissioner Weston stated this morning that, in his opinion, the killings have not reached an end. The murderer said he will attempt attempt to cover his tracks by killing anyone whom he believes can reveal it. Reveal him. Yes, yes, of course. Hello? Operator, get me police headquarters. Immediately. Oh, I hope it isn't too late. Hello? Police? 
I must speak to Commissioner Weston. Hurry, please. I think I can identify the knife murderer. Yes. Well, I'm the wardrobe mistress for Romero Brothers Circus, and I remember the man who was last seen with Mr. Bartolini. And if I'm in danger because of that... What? Oh, yes, I'd know him in a minute. He knew Mr. Bartolini and was always around. He seemed to take an unusual interest in Mr. Bartolini. Mr. Bartolini! You... You are going to die, Mrs. Donna. You are going to die. Mr. Bartolini, that knife. What are you going to do with that knife? I must kill you. No. You must be put out of the way. Oh, Mr. Bartolini, what have I ever done to you? Oh, please. No! No, don't throw that knife! Ah! I tell you, Cranston, I was talking to the woman on the phone when it happened. She was just going to give me a description of the murderer when she met her death. A knife in her throat. Now, what I can't understand is her calling out Bartolini's name. Bartolini? Well, Lamont, then you were right about his not being dead. Begins to look that way, Margot. Not dead. Bartolini's amputated arms were sent back in a box. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's dead. Now, don't try to tell me my business. I say that there have been four murders. Bartolini, Peterson, Gondo, and now Mrs. Dorner, the wardrobe mistress at the circus. You're leaving out something very important, Commissioner. Yeah, you fascinate me, my amateur sleuth. What is it? Not it, Commissioner. Knifer Williams. Knifer Williams was executed four weeks before Peterson was murdered. Fingerprints don't lie, Commissioner. Well, somebody is. Have you ever heard of living surgery, Commissioner? <laughs> Look, Cranston, Professor Wallace told me all about that business of grafting arms and legs from one person to another. He says it's the bunk. Still doesn't believe it, eh? Of course not. Tell me, Commissioner, since Gondo's death, has Professor Wallace asked you to have the police guard removed? Uh, yes, he just... Called about an hour ago and said he wouldn't need them anymore. And you called them off? Certainly. Why shouldn't I? Because, Commissioner, I have reason to believe that the murderer will strike again tonight. Well, Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane, you've searched my apartment and laboratory from one end to the other. You satisfied now there's no one lurking here? Satisfied isn't the word. I'm relieved. Well, surely, since Gondo's dead, Mr. Cranston, there's nothing for me to fear. Well, don't forget that Mrs. Dorner, the wardrobe mistress, was killed after Gondo. Mm. And by the same murderer. I, uh, I can't help admiring your bravery, Professor Wallace. But aren't you overlooking the facts? Yes, yes, that is quite true. On the mind of this monster, the hypnotic thought may still be implanted to murder you. Yes, that's very true, Mr. Cranston. Well, in that event, is there anything else here in my apartment you'd care to examine? Any place where the killer may be hiding? Mm, well, come to think of it, I did notice a fire escape off one of the back rooms. Do you mind if I look it over? No, no, please go right ahead. Now, wait here, Margot. I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, Lamont. Don't be gone too long. I won't... It's a very clever young man, Miss Lane. Very clever. Well, he has a way of tracking down a criminal, no matter how brilliant or how cunning. Yes, I suspected as much. You pardon me, Miss Lane, but I've been looking at your hands. You're a musician, aren't you? <laughs> well, I'd play the piano after a fashion. Just after a fashion? Well, that's too bad. With your hands, you should play magnificently. Uh, yes? Well, thank you. And don't thank me yet. What do you mean? I'm going to give you the name of a very fine piano teacher. See, I think I have his card right here on the desk. I'm sure I have it someplace. I... Oh, hello, look at this. Well, what a strange-looking bottle. It's carved jade, isn't it? Yes, I picked it up in my travels in the Orient. It contains a very rare and exotic perfume. I've forgotten all about it. It must have been in the drawer here. Here. It's yours. Oh, no, I couldn't accept it. Oh, please, I insist. I haven't any use for it. You may find it very interesting. Well, how nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Smell it. It has a very delicate, very wonderful scent. Mmm. Mmm, it's wonderful. I... Uh, it's wonderful. I neglected to tell you, my dear Miss Lane, that it is a powerful hypnotic drug as well. Now, Miss Lane, you're going to aid me. Yes, aid me to get rid of your friend Lamont Cranston. Now listen to me and obey. You must obey every command. Yes. Yes, I must obey. Good, the drug is working well. Now to release my killer... See, I press the button, and the panel slides open. Your clever friend Cranston overlooked that when he searched this apartment. Bartolini, come. I have another little job for you. I hear you, Master. Good. Now for the final ironical touch, the final sardonic gesture. Miss Lane, you will send this monster after Lamont Cranston. No. You will command him to destroy him. No. Command him. 
You will go to the fire escape. Yes. Yes. You will find a knife in your hand. Yes, the knife. Then you will... You will... Kill him. Uh, you will kill him. <laughs> good, good. You hear your orders, Bartolini? I hear. I hear. Then carry them out. Yes, master. <laughs> Do you think you can escape punishment for your crimes, Professor Wallace? What? Who said that? The shadow, Professor Wallace. You can't see me because I've cast a hypnotic mist over your mind. Shadow? It was a brilliant plan of yours, Wallace, to accuse Gondo of the murders. To make it appear that he was the creator of this monster with the body of Bartolini and the arms of Knifer Williams when it was you. <laughs> then to make it look as if you were the target of the attack rather than the attacker. And now you know, Shadow. I ordered my killer here to murder Gonzo and Peterson and then Mrs. Dollar. Yes, my tracks are well covered, too. Not well enough to deceive the Shadow. Don't you understand, Shadow? You are to be the last link in the chain, the last one to die. Professor Wallace, this is the end of your criminal career. Let's drop this pretense, Mr. Cranston. Cranston? Yes, I can see you quite well. You forget that I, too, know something of hypnosis. You're my prisoner. You're going to die along with your friend Miss Lane here. All except her hand, which I shall use again. So, it is to be a contest between the power of darkness and light, Professor Wallace. And the dark shall win, Mr. Cranston. I'll make the first move in our mental chess game... Bartolini, grab her. Hold her. Yes, master. Margo. There, master. I've got her. Margo. Make one move and she dies, Mr. Cranston. Up on the window ledge with her, Bartolini. Yes, master. Uh, you see how helpless you are, Shadow? One move from you and I'll order Bartolini to plunge from that window with her. Twenty-two stories to the street. Bartolini, come down from that ledge. There's a cloud over your mind. Oh. This man is evil. He has made you do evil things. Who speaks to me? I speak to you, your master. I command you to hear only my voice. Yes. Obey only my command. Yes. Bartolini, yes. listen to me. Uh. You are a man, not a slave. Uh. I speak to the man, Bartolini. Uh. Not to the monster created by Professor Wallace. Bartolini. Rebel. Rebel against him. Yes. Yes, I will try. No. Try. No, you cannot disobey me. I will help you, Bartolini. Come down from that ledge. Yes. Put Miss Lane yes. down safely. Yes. I must fight. No, Bartolini. Yes, I will put her down safely, Shadow. Bartolini! I have broken your power over his mind, Wallace. The power of good wind. Not yet, Shadow. You may control his mind, but the hands of Knifer Williams will act for me. Bartolini, the knife. Hmm. The knife in the hands of the knifer. Kill the Shadow. You can see him. Throw your knife. Yes, a knife in my hands. But these are not my hands. They feel strange to me. Kill him, Bartolini. As if they had a life of their own. Kill him. The shadow can be seen by you. I can't see anything but you. You. You taught me to use these hands to kill. Now I use them to kill you. No, no, no. Don't throw that knife. Stop, Bartolini. No. I've killed him. These hands have killed him. Bartolini, listen to me. No. I have no control over them. They don't belong to me. They're killer's hands. I must get away. I am Bartolini, the great trapeze. I can escape. Stay away from that escape. lake. Escape. Look out. Escape. You're 22 stories above the street. Escape. Bartolini. <laughs> the phenomenon called life is a delicate balance. To tamper with that balance is to upset it. And to upset it is to create a monster. This was the story of a scientist who walked a road no mortal man dare travel. In just a moment, we'll bring you a special feature of America at War. But first, we present John Barclay, Blue Coal's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you folks drive cars, I take it. But I'll wager that you wouldn't think of driving any car unless you were sure the accelerator and brakes were in good operating condition. That's common sense, because they control the speed of the car. Well, in heating your home, the dampers on your furnace should be operated correctly, for these dampers control the burning speed of your fire. So if you aren't sure how to set the dampers for best results, and if you're not getting your money's worth in real heating comfort... Call your neighborhood blue coal dealer. He'll be glad to send his John Barclay service man around to inspect your furnace. And remember, friends, this man has been trained in economical home heating. He'll look your furnace over and tell you frankly if adjustments are needed to improve its operation. 
What's more, he'll show you how to regulate your dampers properly. You see, he is genuinely interested in your getting satisfactory results and using the smallest possible amount of fuel. And folks, this is an exclusive blue coal service. If you have any heating problem, call your friendly neighborhood blue coal dealer. You'll find him courteous and anxious to cooperate. I thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Somewhere off the east coast of the United States, a ship is creeping forward in darkness. And with good reason. Like assassins in the night, enemy submarines stalk the merchant ships and close in for the kill. All the torpedo tubes ready. Stand by to fire on order. Ach, Himmel, what's this? Coast Guard approaching. Dive. Dive, you hear me? United States Coast Guard ship is almost over us. We're trapped. United States Coast Guard patrol reporting. Sighted submarine. Submarine sunk. The United States Coast Guard packs a deadly wallop, and the Axis knows it. Like to take a good crack at the Axis yourself? Then join the Coast Guard. You'll have plenty of action, plenty of thrills, and the sure knowledge that you're doing your bit for your country and the front lines of defense. If you are qualified as a machinist, carpenter, cook, or yeoman, you may get immediate petty officer rating. See your nearest Coast Guard recruiting station right away. Teach the Axis. That for nations, justice for men... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story was produced by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue... From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Who that? George Reed. Well, Merry Christmas, George. Is it? Well, what's the matter? You ever hear of Jediah Gillis? Uh, eccentric? Owns about half of Rhode Island? That's the boy. A couple of weeks ago, he wrote a special policy on an item he wanted insured. And it's up and disappeared, huh? How'd you know? Oh, just a while, guess. What did he lose? I hope you're sitting down, Johnny. Yeah? Why? Because the insured item is a mouse. House? Mouse. What? <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the missing mouse matter. Expense account item one, 85 cents, taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His Ivy League suit looked as though it had been slept in and he needed to shave. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I'm going to level with you. This thing has me going. Well, it serves you right. Anybody who'd insure a mouse deserves what he gets. Yeah, but it isn't an ordinary mouse, Johnny. No. Not according to Mr. Gillis's original application. Yeah, take a look. Uh, item to be insured. One unusually talented grayish-brown mouse. Unusually talented? Like how? I don't know. What? I tried to find out, but Gillis wouldn't tell me. And still you issued the policy. Well, you know our company, Johnny. We have a reputation for insuring almost anything, but we have to draw the line occasionally, and we would have here. 
except for one thing. What's that? And believe me, it better be good. It is. Gillis carries all of his insurance with us. Yeah, but even so. Just one of his several policies is a straight life for three hundred and fifty thousand. Well, we king size premiums, huh? Exactly. So when he called asking us to insure this fellow's mouse for a few weeks. Wait a minute. Gillis doesn't own it? No. Well, who does? It belongs to a friend of his, a man named Glazer. He's spending the holidays with Gillis. Gillis didn't want to be responsible if something happened to Glazer's mouse while he's there, so he asked us to write the policy. How much did you insure it for? All the company would allow, 5000 Oh, now, George, you think I want to get all worked up over a lousy five grand loss? What kind of a commission can I possibly make on Look, that? Look, give me a chance to finish, will you? All right, but only because it's Christmas. All right. Late last night, I received a call from Gillis. He wanted to know whom we considered the best investigator in this part of the country. When I told him, he told me about the mouse and insisted I send you up to help look for it. No, no, George, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pass. I've handled some screwy cases in my time, but this is... Please, wait till I finish, will you? I told Gillis you wouldn't be interested. That's when he started putting on the squeeze. Squeeze? What do you mean? He said if I didn't get you, he'd cancel his policies. Oh, come on. You don't believe that, do you? I don't know what to believe. Gillis is a screwball of the first water. We've known that for a long time, and frankly, I'd rather not take a chance. Well, you've got to. Maybe not. Hmm? I've received an okay from upstairs. On this one, you can write your own ticket. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? You didn't give me a chance. Look, there's a train for Providence at 3.30. Here's Gillis's address. He wants you to stay with him. That'll cost more, Georgie. It figures. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Same to you, Santa Claus. Expense account item 285 cents, cab fare, back to my apartment. I was intrigued by what George had told me and by what his company was going to add to my bank account, so I didn't really mind changing my plans for the holidays. Expense account item 3, $18.90, transportation, including a round-trip ticket, Hartford to Providence, and cab fare out to the Gillis residence. Palace would be a better word for it. It stood in the middle of a large wooded park. It must have been half a dozen acres, all of it surrounded by an old-fashioned iron fence. I dismissed the cab and had started toward the front door when it opened. And standing against the light, watching me, was a tall, beautiful girl. Careful the steps. Why? The steps. They're icy. Oh, oh. Thanks. We've been expecting you, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Well, hi. Mr. Glazer and Father are in the library. Would you like to meet them now or wait till after you're settled? No, I'm, I'm afraid I'd better see them right away, Miss Gillis. Marion. Johnny. Well, come along. You know, for the first time, I'm glad I came home for the holidays. Home from where? New York. Here we are. You'll have to come visit me, Johnny. Maybe I'll do something drastic, like losing a mouse to guarantee it. Marion, I told you to keep that door closed. Oh, Mr. Doll is here, Father. Oh, oh, well, have him come in. <laughs> yes, by all means, have him come in. <laughs> See you later, Johnny. Yeah. Well, Dollar, glad you finally got here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my friend and associate, Bert Glazer. Hi, Mr. Glazer. Uh, Bertie and his pals, Mr. Dollar. Beg pardon? Uh, my dog act. Uh, you investigators are supposed to have good memories. I hoped you might have caught us at some time or other. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, would you like to have a drink, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, thanks. Now, suppose I got get... anything you want to drink. I got an eggnog, hot buttered rum. Well, uh, maybe later. Right now, I'd like to hear the details of your loss. You mean that insurance agent didn't give you all the information? He didn't know it all, Mr. Gillis. All he did know was that a so-called talented mouse so has disappeared. So-called. And he hasn't disappeared either, not at all. He's been kidnapped, that's what. He kidnapped, yes, sir, and we know who did it, too. And why? We know why, too. And it's your job to get him back, Dollar. Oh, now, wait a minute. And I... I'm not going to pay one red cent for ransom. Not one cent. Not one cent. Okay, okay. But what makes you so sure the mouse was kidnapped? Well, I, I'm afraid I can't tell you that without Bert's permission. Well, Mr. Glazer? Well, if we tell you, we must have your solemn promise you won't repeat it to anybody uh, until Christmas Day. Well, I, I'm i not sure I can do that. If you can't, we don't open our mouths. Right. Well? Okay. Till Christmas Day. Good. Good. Uh, dollar. Suppose I told you Gulliver was worth at least $50,000. Gulliver? The missing mouse. Oh. You'd be surprised if I said it was worth that much? Depends. You claim he's talented. 
Does that have something to do with this uh, valuation you put on it? Something? something. Oh, it has everything to do with it. Yes, sir. Well, what does Gulliver do that other mice can't? Nothing. But it's how he does it that counts. How he does what? Sings. What? Can't you hear the man, Miss Della? Can't you hear him? Gulliver sings. He carries a tune. You know. With the clarity of a clarion, the fervor of a female opera star, and the tone of a tenor. Uh, that's how we plan to bill him. I, um, <clears throat> I see, um, well, uh... But he doesn't believe us. Ah. Oh, no, wait, I, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> There's no need to. We can tell by your face. Can't we, Bert? But a mouse. Mr. Dollar, it is a scientific fact that mice sing. Mice sing? Well-known magazines have published articles proving it. Unfortunately, most of them sing in a scale too high for human hearing. Ah, uh, but not Gulliver. Well, not Gulliver. Yeah, that's right. He's a basso. A basso. Uh, by mousy standards, that is. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Bert, he still doesn't believe us. Very well, Jediah, there is only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. You follow us, Dollar. We'll erase the doubt in your mind forever. I took a good look at Bert Glazer, then reluctantly followed the two of them out of the library and down a long hall. At the moment, this thing had all the earmarks of a good old-fashioned con game. Or better still, a benefit on behalf of Bert Glazer with Jodiah Gillis and Floyds of England as the sole cash contributors. We wandered for what seemed like blocks through the old mansion and finally reached a large playroom. On top of one of the billiard tables was a small brass cage. In it were two small grayish-brown mice. Glazer opened the cage and let them out. Mr. Dollar, allow me to present Hecuba and Esmeralda. Oh, how do you do? I mean, uh... I suppose they sing, too. Oh, they certainly do. But not nearly as well as Gulliver. Just don't have the instrument, you know. Instrument? The voice, the voice, down the voice, the vocal cords. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I, I see. But, uh, now, uh, where did you keep Gulliver? Uh, in here with the others. Bert didn't want to separate them. Uh, that's right. I originally started to make the three of them into a singing, uh, you know, trio, like the Andrews sisters. But Gulliver advanced so rapidly, I decided he should be a soloist. Oh, sure. You aren't afraid of mice, Mr. Danner? No. No, well, that's fine. Nice sensitive, you are, you know. It upsets them. It upsets them. If, all right, now, Hecuba, move over a bit. Give Esmeralda some room. That's it. Now, up on your haunches. Up, 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 Esmeralda. There we are. <laughs> now, what would you like to hear, Mr. Dollar? Oh, anything at all. <laughs> oh, Bert, how about my favorite, Danner? Over the way. Good, good, good. Da, 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 da. Hey, you got it, Esmeralda? Over the waves. That's it, Hecuba. All ready then? Mm. Good, that'll be fine. Ready now? One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, that's it. Oh, beautiful, Esmeralda. Beautiful. Yeah, da, 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 da. Well... I won't say I was convinced, but I won't say I wasn't. But I will say those mice were singing something, or giving a mighty good imitation of it. We returned to the library, and this time I sampled the eggnog liberally. <laughs> Is that all right, Dollar? Oh. <sighs> oh, fine, thanks. Well, Dollar, you know now why we believe Gulliver was kidnapped? Well, I'm not sure. To exploit him. What else? Exactly. Do you have any idea who did it? Harry McQueen, that's who. McQueen. Who is McQueen? Used to be my agent. Theatrical agent? Uh -huh. He's been snooping around here lately, Johnny. We figure he's gotten wind of our mice. Well, what do you mean by snooping around, Mr. Gillis? Oh, you know, he's been out here twice this week wanting to see me. Had to kick him out of here yesterday morning. How'd he get in? Well, my daughter answered the door. Uh, yes, I... She didn't know McQueen from Adam. So when he asked for me, she figured he belonged in here, rehearsing the show with the rest of us. Rehearsing what show, Mr. Gillis? What show? What? The show for the children's hospital. <laughs> Jodiah puts one on for the sick kids every Christmas Eve. Of course. You know, Dollar, Variety Act, Santa Claus. Uh, this year, though, we got a radio hookup. They go all over the state. And Gulliver, well, he was going to headline. And that's why I sent for you, Dollar. I figured you can get him back by tomorrow afternoon if anybody can. How long was McQueen in here before you noticed him? Long enough to lift Gulliver. This was our dress rehearsal, Dollar. We'd ask some of the kids from around the neighborhood in to watch, so it was pretty crowded. Where were the mice during the rehearsal? Well, that's where I made my mistake. What do you mean? We were keeping them a secret till the real show. 
Well, where were they? In their cage, over there on the mantel. Now, we were using this part of the room for the stage, so McQueen could have just reached in and taken Gulliver without us seeing him. Now, what makes you so sure McQueen did it? We told you. Besides, who else would want him? Uh, who else? And it was right after I kicked him out of here that I discovered Gulliver was missing. Why'd you do that? Well, I called off the rehearsal and started searching for him. McQueen? Dick Gulliver. And I put in a telephone call to the Providence House where McQueen was taken. Did you talk to him? Nope. They said he checked out. After questioning them for a while, I finally had a nightcap with Jediah, then went to the phone in the hall and made some calls, including one to George Reed. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It's not. That's why I'm calling. Look, they think a theatrical agent named Harry McQueen stole the mouse. He has offices in Boston and New York. I placed a person-to-person call to both offices, but with tomorrow Christmas Eve, he might not get the message. So what do you want me to do? Find out his home number. Ask him to call me here. Okay. Anything else? Hello? Johnny? Johnny, you there? Yeah. And so is a cat. What? A big yellow cat. What's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing. Except he's got a grayish brown mouse between his two front paws. Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You can't buy happiness by the pound or the yard, but you can have it by the hour with no strings attached every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime when the Robert Q. Lewis Show is on the air. Join him and his fun-loving gang five nights a week and Saturdays in the daytime on most of these same stations. Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Missing Mouse Matter. I was standing in the hall of Jediah Gillis's home looking at a big yellow cat that had a mouse between its two front paws. As far as I was concerned, a mouse is a mouse, and this one could be Gulliver. I cut short my phone conversation with George Reed, then started toward the cat. Here, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty. Nice, kitty. Pretty kitty. Mama, Here, kitty. Mama, where are you? Here, kitty, kitty. That's a good kitty. Now, kitty, let me have the little mouse. Mama, you naughty cat. Where... Oh. This cannibal belonged to you, Marion? Yes, I promised father I'd... What do you mean, cannibal? Take a look. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he's very, very dead. Oh, you don't think it's Gulliver, do you? Well, Mr. Glazer will have to identify him. And if he is, well, that's that. Oh, no, no, Johnny. What do you mean? Oh, Johnny, please, you don't have to tell him, do you? Well, sure. If it's Gulliver, this thing's cleared up. If it's not, your Rama gets a reward for being a good mouser. Oh, Johnny, please. Dad almost had a fit when I arrived here with Rama. He made me promise to keep him in my room. This the only time he's been out? Well, no. Oh, he was out for a little while yesterday while they were rehearsing. I didn't notice he was gone till after lunch. Then the corpse could be Gulliver's. Oh, Johnny, if it is, there's nothing we can do about it now. And if you tell my father besides making him angry, it'll break his heart. All right. I won't say anything until tomorrow night. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Night. Good night. <laughs> Christmas Eve morning came cold, crisp, and clear. The Gillis grounds were covered with new-fallen snow, and the trees were heavy with icicles, giving the whole place the look of a winter wonderland. I dressed and went down to join Gillis and Bert Glazer at breakfast. I was on my third strawberry when the phone started to ring. Yeah, you expecting a call, Dollar? Hmm. Well, yeah, matter of fact, I am. Yeah, and you'd better answer it. If it's somebody at the broadcast station for me, tell them I'll be at the children's hospital at noon. They can call me there. Right. Hello? Johnny Dollar? Speaking. Look, I don't know what's going on down there or why you're going to pester me about it. Well, who is this? Harry McQueen. Who did you think? Well, I wasn't sure. Well, your friend Reed got me out of bed this morning, Dollar. He told me you wanted to ask me some questions about a mouse that's missing from Jediah Gillis's place. Hey, that's right. What do you know about it? Well, I've done a lot of pilfering in my time. I've taken towels from hotels from Maine to Miami and Seattle to Bridgeport. But I never had to stoop so low as to steal a mouse from any hotel, garbage dump, trap, or field. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly. Except for one thing. Yeah? This particular mouse was a performer. Was a what? He was trained, did tricks. Still doesn't interest me. 
Well, then why were you trying to see Mr. Gillis? To get some of my people on his Christmas show. Anything wrong with that? No. That would be a lot of publicity about it. Would have done him a lot of good. And you're sure you weren't interested in the mouse? Look, Dollar, when I went into this business 18 years ago, I swore then I'd never handle kids, belly dances, or animal acts. But you handled Bert Glazer's dog act. His what? Dog act, Bertie and his pal. Oh, somebody's feeding you a line, Dollar. That act was Bill Bertie and his pal, and the pal is a dummy. Glazer's a top-notch ventriloquist. He's a master. You hear me, Dollar? Yeah, Harry. I hear you fine. <laughs> I had to do some thinking, so I put on my coat and went outside for a walk around that wooded park. What I had just learned about Glazer confirmed what my instinct, my common sense, had been telling me all along. Except for one thing. The performance given by Hecuba and Esmeralda the night before. If Glazer had been doing the singing for those two mice, he was a master ventriloquist. Which was exactly what Harry McQueen said he was. I'd started back toward the house, wondering if I should get Jediah aside now and tell him or wait until after the show when something soft and cold hit me on the back of the head. Hey! <laughs> Sorry, Johnny, I couldn't oh. resist such a serious target. Anything new? Uh, well, if you mean, have I found Gulliver, the singing mouse? No. Dad told me to tell you, if Gulliver does turn up before 1.15, rush him off the hospital. Yeah, sure. But I think that's extremely unlikely. You think Rama got him, don't you? If he did, he got a very ordinary mouse. He didn't get one that sings. I'm afraid I lost you. Doesn't matter. Oh, now, I wonder what he wants. Hmm. That boy on the porch. Oh, well, if this was Hartford, I'd say he was the paper boy coming around to collect. Well, it's not Hartford, and he's not a paper boy because Dad doesn't subscribe to anything but fortune. Oh, well, then he's selling something. Well, if he is, he's not going to give us a chance to buy any. Johnny, looks looks like we scared him off. Hmm, that's funny. Hey! Hey, come back! He sure tore out of here when he saw us. wonder what he wanted. Do you suppose he was one of the kids they invited in to see the dress rehearsal? Well, if he was, what would he be doing back here today? I don't know. Let's take a look around. We found it in the playroom, near where Gulliver's cage had been. It was a roundish metal clamp, the kind of boy wraps around his trouser leg when he's riding a bike. I was about to call the hospital and ask Judiah for a list of all the kids they'd invited to the rehearsal when the front doorbell rang. Johnny, it's that boy again. Better let me get in. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was over here to see the show the other day. Oh? Yeah. You see it? No, I uh, I wasn't here then. Oh. Jeez. Sure is calling. Yeah, sure is. Oh, why don't you come in and get warm? Oh, no, that's okay. No, come on, come on. Nobody's here. No? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, come on. I don't want to bother nobody, you know. I was just riding by and I thought I'd stop and tell old man Gillis what a swell show they put on. You really liked it, huh? Yeah. All except for that Santa Claus. Oh? What was wrong with him? Nothing. Just that... Well, who believes in all that smushy kid stuff? Hmm? Kids, I guess. How old are you, uh... Bobby. Uh, Bobby Neves. How old are you, Bobby? Almost 11. Well, being that old, I can understand why you weren't impressed with the Santa Claus. All that other stuff, too. You know, like giving presents and singing those hymns and junk like that. You gotta cut it out when you, when you start growing up. You sure do, boy. Yeah. You know, you and my mom, you, you get along just fine. Oh? Yeah. She feels about Christmas. She feels about Christmas just like you and me do. All right. Yeah. Boy, this, this log fire sure makes your eyes smart, don't it? Yeah, it sure does. Where do you live, Bobby? Uh, cross town, Scully Avenue. Well, how'd you happen to be over here the other day? Well, I, I was riding my bike when I, when I saw this dog. Well, gee, he was... Uh, anyhow, when I, when I tried to catch him, he ran from me. I followed the silly muck clear over here. Uh -huh. Did you ever catch him? No. Nah. I was about to when this man hollered and asked me if I wanted to see a free show. So I 
I came in. I see. Well, dear, you must like dogs a lot, huh? Sure. You got one? Used to have one. When my pop was with us, but we can't have no pets where we're living now. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. You know that poem? Which one? You know, about all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not, not even a mouse. Yeah? Well, that fits our place. Especially now. How do you mean? Well, I didn't think he'd miss it, you know. Man with a house as big as this one and all. So when I saw this cute little fella up in that cage, well, I, I didn't really mean to take him on hold and leave it. When he got under my sweater and was real quiet and like he liked me, well, you know what I mean. Yeah, Bobby, I know. But I got to thinking, decided to bring him back. So would you give me the old man to Mr. Gillis for me, please? No, I think you'd better do that yourself. Oh, no, no, please. He might be awful mad at me by now. No, Bobby. In fact, you're going to get a reward. Yeah? <laughs> Word of honor. Now, what do you say we go down where Mr. Gillis is putting on that Christmas show and see it? Okay? Oh, Sure. Bobby. Yeah? Did you notice anything unusual about this mouse? Yeah, I sure did. What was it? He got some white on his right hind foot. Expense account item four, one dollar and sixty cents. Cab fare from the Gillis residence to the children's hospital for Mary and Bobby and myself. Inside, we followed the sound of children laughing and reached the auditorium. Marion found a seat among the nurses, and I took Bobby backstage. When Jediah saw Gulliver, his face lit up like, well, like one of the trees he'd had delivered to the wall. Oh, ha! Gulliver! By golly, by golly. I knew if anybody could do it, you could, Dollar. I didn't do a thing, Mr. Gillis. All the credit goes to Bobby. Oh, to Bobby Whale. I'll speak to you after the show, young man. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bert, Bert, look, look, he's back. Oh, 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 Gulliver, oh, I do declare I have never been so glad to see a person before. Yeah, you better hurry, Bert. He's scheduled to go on in just a minute. Oh, he will, he will. Now, I'll go check on the microphone when everything be just so. <laughs> Don't go away, Dollar. No, he won't. Bobby, why don't you sit over there where you can see the stage? Yes, sir. Uh, Bert, you think Gulliver will sing today? I think. I know he will. Oh, get ready, Gulliver. But that boy had Gulliver all day and all night, and he didn't sing once. Ah, did the boy ask him to? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for the first time in the world, one of the wonders of the world, Gulliver the Singing Mouse. Hey, Mr. Dollar, can that mouse really sing? That is what we're going to find out, Bobby. Uh, exciting, isn't it, Dollar? Sure is, Mr. Gillis. I thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now, for Gulliver's first number, he'd like to sing with... Uh, what's that, Gulliver? <laughs> oh, I, I see. Uh -huh. uh, he's going to sing Jingle Bells, but he wants me to get off stage so everybody will know it's really him doing it and not me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> is he all right, Bert? Oh, fine, fine. Just feeling us out. Well, why doesn't he start? He's going to listen. Well, Dollar. Now I have seen everything. Me too. Gee. Bert Glazer had a logical answer for having lied about his old vaudeville act. He knew I wouldn't believe the mice could really sing if I'd known he was a ventriloquist. And you know, well, after all, yet sometimes. Ah. Expense account total, including cab fare, Hartford Station to my apartment, $38.20. As for my separate and additional fee, as agreed upon before I took this matter, well, there's a boy named Bobby Neves who lives on Scully Avenue over in Providence. See that he gets it, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Oh, 
Our star will tell you about next week's story in just a moment. Meantime... Yeah, I'll make a deal with you. Oh? Let me have the mic for a second, then you can tell them about next week's story. By all means, be my guest. All right. I just don't want to pass up a chance to do two things. First, well, Pam and Eric and Fran, Mr. and Mrs. Froelich, Helen, Will, Scotty, oh, all the rest of you nice people who have written in to tell us how much you like the program. Thanks. I really appreciate hearing from you, and believe me, I'll answer your letters just as quickly as I can. Second, well, I'm sure you know what this is, and I want you to know it comes from the heart. Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. Now, next week... Next week, the case of a prize fighter who could win only by losing, because his life depended on it. Right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Charles B. Smith and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Howard McNear, Parley Bear, G. Stanley Jones, Bill James, Lawrence Dobkin, and Richard Beals. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Kendrick, Johnny. Over at Eastern Allied Casualty, remember? Oh, sure, Paul. How are you? Seen any good fights lately? Prize fights, that is? Yeah, the championship bout at the stadium over in Mulville last week. Were you there? No, I had to miss it. But it didn't miss me. Huh? The minute Georgie hit the canvas in that fourth round, it cost me 50 bucks. Johnny... Do you remember Al Coronado? Are you kidding? I've watched that boy come up from the Golden Gloves. Well, he fought in one of the preliminary bouts. I know. I lost on him, too. Twenty bucks. Come on over, will you? And I'll tell you why the company may lose 50000 on him. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Allied Casualty Insurance Company, 422 Spidal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the squared circle matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten cents cab from my apartment to the offices of Eastern Allied. When I got upstairs into his personal cubicle, I found Paul Kendrick pacing the floor. Sit down, Johnny. Uh, have a drink if you want one. No, no thanks. Hey, looks like you're the one who could use a drink. What are you worried about? Don't tell me you've been hitting the company till for big money to bet on the fights. Johnny, I'm worried about murder. Listen. I'm all ears. How long since you've seen Al Coronado fight? Oh, six months, a year, maybe. But before that, when he was working all the local arenas, you and I were present every time he put on the gloves. So? We knew him when he had reflexes quick enough to... Well, do you remember how he'd show off by picking a fly or mosquito out of the air, grabbing it between his fingers without even hurting it? Yeah, sure. He was no metal giant, not by a long shot, but he had the fastest eyes and hands I ever saw in a man. Right. But something has happened to him, something very wrong. And I think I know what it is. 
Listen. I'm listening. A few years ago, his manager, Ricky Malone, took out a $50,000 policy on him. Annuity. So what? A lot of managers take out policies on their boys. And then get them killed? Look, Al is fighting again tomorrow night in a small town outside of Joplin. Joplin? Missouri? A little place just across the state line. Johnny, I want you to be there. You mean as a sort of bodyguard? I want you to see the fight, that's all. See Al Coronado fight. Yeah, but this murder crack... I'm having a copy of the policy made, and you can pick it up at the Joplin Post Office. General delivery. Now, Paul... I know, I know. I may be all wrong. This may only be a hunch without a single legitimate reason for suspicion. That's why I took a whole week to think it over before calling you. That's why I want somebody who knows Al as well as you and I do to... Look, will you go down there and see him? Well, I... We'll pay the freight. Pad your expense account, anything you like. Oh, now that's an attractive... But do it, Johnny. Will you? Item two, another dollar ten, back to my apartment to pack. Item three, one hundred twenty-four dollars even. Plane fare and incidentals to Joplin. By your leave, Paul, the incidentals included a new sports shirt, loud enough to startle the whole state of Arizona, an extra pack of razor blades, and a new toothbrush. Also, item four, three bucks, flowers for the stewardess, who managed to find me an extra bottle of champagne. I arrived at Joplin shortly before noon, and after checking into a hotel, found that by some miracle, a copy of Al's policy was waiting for me at the post office. A quick glance at it brings up item five, four dollars and a quarter, phone call. What do you mean, holding out on you? I thought you said Ricky Malone took out the policy. He did, and pays all the premiums. But the beneficiary named is Frankie Fortina. Now, who's he? I don't know yet. Well, his address is in New York City. You better look him up, will you? I've been trying to. But the last time Fortina was at the address on the policy, it was a racetrack bookie joint. Oh, so that's why you're worried. Uh, that's one reason. Well, if you learn anything about him, let me know, will you? I'm staying at the Beverly Arms. Okay, Johnny. Johnny. Yeah? Call me again, will you? After the fight tonight? Sure. I was tired, so I had a big lunch. That's item six. Went up to my room and slept. I overslept. It was nearly 9 o'clock when I woke up, so I grabbed a cab, that's item 7, and went out to the arena in the nearby town of Mount Elba. For five bucks, item 8, I managed to get a seat at ringside in time to catch the end of the last preliminary. The winner in one minute, ten The program told me Al was scheduled for the main event against some local boy named Rafe Cummings. I never heard of him, and I doubt if anybody outside of Tucson ever had. I understood why when he stepped into the ring. This kid looked like the rankest kind of amateur. Strong, sure, and in good condition, but clumsy. He almost tripped over his own size 15 feet. And it was no act to fool an opponent either. Al, when he came in, looked as good as ever. He gave me a quick glance of recognition, though I'm sure he knew nothing about me except possibly my name. At the opening bell, he came out fast. All the old speed and timing were there. Faint weave and flick out that light, but punishing left. Same old pattern, same old... Wait a minute. Those quick left jazz were only landing about one and four. As though he touched Cummings only when the clumsy ox happened to walk into him. But because of his speed, Al took nothing but a few light ones on the body. He kept his face well out of reach. Oh, yeah, his timing was perfect, but his aim was terrible. Every time he shot out his fist, he was three, four inches wide. Then a funny thing happened. At the end of the round, when Al went back to his corner, and remember, Rafe had only tapped him a few times on the body. When he went back to his corner and started to sit down, he almost missed the stool. Would have if one of the seconds hadn't named it under him. Funny. The second round got underway the same as the first. Al was all speed, dodging, weaving, keeping his face out of the way. But again, he wasn't hitting his mark. And then it happened. He missed Cummings wide, then practically ran into his glove, catching it hard in the cheek, and down he went. Why, there wasn't enough steam behind Cummings' glove to hurt it. But Al took the count. He'd been hurt by that tap on the face. Then another thing. The second he was counted out, his handlers practically hauled him out of the ring and back to his dressing room. And believe me, Al looked terrible. His eyes had a strange, almost faraway look. As though that little smack had knocked his brains loose. Had... My seat was on the far side of the ring, but I elbowed my way through the crowd and back to the row of dressing rooms in a hallway built on the one end of the building. Al! Al Coronado! I told you on the way up the aisle, Doc, huh? we don't need you. The boy's all right. Go on, Doc, beat it. You hear me, Doc? Listen, this is Johnny Dollar. Huh? Old fan of Al's from Hartford. I want to see him. Some other time. No, no, right away. Come on, open up. 
I said some other time. Don't you understand? We're pulling out of this, Berg, and we ain't got time to stand around and talk. Now, look, buddy. Malone's the name. I'm Mel's manager, see? And when I say get out, I mean vamoose. Al, the... are you okay, boy? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, brother, that's what you're wrong. Hey, Al. Al. Good Lord, Al, what's the matter with you? Oh, uh, uh, hello, hello, Johnny. Hey, Al, look at me. No, no, I mean straight at me. Here, Al. I'm, I'm all right, Johnny. You're in bad shape. You should never have fought tonight. Oh, that, that's all right. Where are your seconds, your trainer? Uh, Ricky, he don't, don't let nobody in after fight. Look, Al, can you get up off that table, stand up and walk? Oh, sure, sure, Johnny. Then come on, I'm taking you out of here. No, Johnny. Easy, Al. No, look, look behind Al, you, Ricky. Please, he's up, he's got it. You bet I am, Dollar. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Each Monday through Friday evening, most of these same stations bring you the Amos and Andy Music Hall, variety entertainment at its best, for top songs, informal visits with top stars, and for a never-ending supply of fun. Turn your home into the Amos and Andy Music Hall five nights a week. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Squared Circle Matter. <laughs> came to, the dressing room was dark and quiet. After carefully falling off the table where they'd left me, I groped my way to the light switch, stumbling incidentally over the remains of the chair Ricky Malone had used on me. It was well after midnight, so I left by the dressing room window. The second I reached my hotel room, I put through a long-distance call, hoping Paul Kendrick would be in home, in bed. He was. Yeah, hello. Johnny Dollar. And Paul, you're right. It'll be murder unless I can stop it. Hey, you awake. Oh, hey. you mean Al Coronado. What's happened, Johnny? Plenty. And listen, that boy is more than punch drunk. He's had a brain injury of some kind. I'll bet on it. That's what I was afraid of. The tap on the face that knocked him out tonight wasn't enough to hurt a kitten. But a good solid blow would probably kill him. That's why he kept protecting his face. But Ricky Malone is making him keep on? Who else? I just met the gentleman, by the way. Well, what'd he say? Did you question him? Before I could, he cracked me over the head with a chair. Where is he now? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to do? See if the police can track them down. Malone said something about leaving town right away. Keep after him. Did you read that policy carefully? You kidding? I haven't had time. It's an annuity. That much I saw. Beginning in three or four years, it'll pay Al a nice little income for the rest of his life, if he survives. But the beneficiary named... Yes, Frankie Fortina, who gets the full face value of the policy if Al dies. Johnny... Yeah? I got a rundown on Fortina. You said he was a bookie at one time. That was the least of his crimes. He has a record as long as your arm. As I see it, he owns Al Coronado. Then you're probably thinking what I am. But Al hasn't been doing so well lately. He's taken a big drop in class. Isn't making the purses he used to. You know that? Yes. The ANBA keeps a complete record. So with this injury to his brain, the only way Fortina can clean up on him is by seeing him dead. That's right. Well, what about medical examinations before these fights? Ricky Malone could bribe his own mother, especially in some of the towns where Al has been fighting lately. Yeah, that's possible, of course. Also, what you and I believe is wrong with Al is one of the hardest things in the world to detect. Yeah, yeah, I must admit he looked great when he entered the ring. Okay, Paul, one thing's in our favor. Neither Al nor Ricky Malone knows who I am, outside of being a fight fan. Just so Fortina doesn't learn different. Where is Fortina, by the way? I don't know. So, Johnny, whatever you do, be careful. <laughs> Expense account item 9370 for a couple of phone calls, some breakfast, then a taxi to police headquarters. I'll say this for the Joplin police. When they go into action, they really get things done. Within less than two hours, Sergeant Danny Ruskin dug up all the information I wanted. Well, that ties in with what Conroy found out at the airport. No, that does it, Herm. Thanks very much. Something? Well, I think it gives us the whole story, Johnny. Al and his manager, Ricky Malone, checked out of their hotel, the Rayberry, at one o'clock this morning. Just the two of them? Right. There was no third party by the name of 14 or anything else, just the two of them. Uh, they caught the 140 plane for Oklahoma City, oh. and there they bought tickets routing them to Monterey, Mexico. Mexico? How soon can I get a plane? You're going down there, huh? I told you, I gotta save that guy's life. All right, look, in Monterey, look up Sergeant Romelia Garcia, Main Homicide Division. You mention my name, he'll give you anything you want. Good. Now, what about that plane? <laughs> deal 
Avalon plane connections turned out to be bad. The best time I could make was by way of El Paso. That's item 10, $127, including incidentals. I finally pulled into Monterey shortly after 8 p.m. I parked my bag at the airport, taxied into town. Item 11, I went straight to main headquarters of the Policia. Sergeant Romilio Garcia was off duty. He'd gone to the fights. Item 12, $4 American for a fast taxi ride to the Plaza del Fisticuff, so whatever they call it. There for item 13, five bucks, I had the sergeant paged over the PA system. After two or three minutes, a short, stocky, important-looking figure in police uniform stood up to the door. Senor Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. How are you? You Americanos. Now, what is so important I must leave the excellent fights to talk with you, huh? The possible murder of an American fighter right here in your own ring. So what is that to be excited about? Something that happens all the time. It's because the Mexican fighter is more better than the Americano fighter. So if that is all that is bothering you... Incidentally, Sergeant Danny Ruskin of the Joplin Police... Sergeant Danny! Why do you not say so at the beginning? Well, you didn't give me much of a chance. (laughs) How is it, my good friend, Sergeant Danny? Boys, it's too long I have seen here. Yeah, well, look... Excellent man, Sergeant Danny. When I have trouble with one of our Mexican nationals who escape across the border and go all the way to Missouri, Joplin, it's Sergeant Danny who... But, But you have a problem, eh? Yeah. A fighter name of Al Coronado. Coronado. Oh, but of course, tomorrow night he is fighting here, and he will lose. Why do you say that? Come, look. Here on the, what do you call, uh, a billboard, a picture of the man he is to fight. So, El Toro Negro. That sounds more like the name of a bull than a... Holy... See, si. big man, is he not? Is this picture real? 240 pounds, senor. But Al Coronado only weighs in at 181. See, si. El Toro, big man. The Senor Dollar, he is a killer. Our best. Three men he's knocked out of the ring. But nobody hurts him, so no wonder you worried. Sergeant, unless you and I can stop it, that won't be a fight tomorrow night. It'll be a premeditated, cold-blooded killing. Oh? How so? I showed Garcia my credentials. Then told him what I knew and what I suspected. Until we have proof of this, senor, to start what you call an international situation, you are not now in your own country, you know. Still, he agreed to cooperate. First thing, of course, was to locate Al and his manager. In this city of nearly 200,000, that could be pretty rough. But he said he'd try. He drove me by the airport to pick up my bag, then to a hotel. And there, as the bellhop unlocked the door of my room, I got a real break. The next door down the hall opened. Hey, kid, uh, how'd you like to bring me up a glass of warm milk, huh? Al! Al Coronado! Huh? Oh, oh, hi! Here, boy, just put in my bags inside and leave the door open. Gracias, senor. Hey, Al, are you alone? For sure. Hey, Hey, you Johnny, ain't you? Yeah, that's right, Johnny, and I want to talk to you. I used to see you inside all the time up in Hartford, huh? You saw me in Joplin, too. Only you don't remember... Where's Ricky Malone, your manager? Oh, uh, he says he has to go meet somebody. He's always going out. Look, Al, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Oh, I got some insurance. Yeah. One more fight and somebody's going to collect it. Oh, uh, no, Johnny. That's my retiring money. The only one who'll retire on it is Frankie Fortina. Hey, Frankie, he's my owner. You know him? Hey. Who takes all the aspirin around here? Me. I get a lot of headaches all the time. But maybe that's why I ain't been hitting so good lately. Yeah. Here. Catch this bottle. Hey, now. Ah, uh, now look what you did. No, no, Al. You look what you did. You missed that bottle by three inches. Uh, For the same reason you haven't been hitting well. Why you have these headaches. Well, I'll give it to you straight. You've had a brain injury, Al. One good wallop on that head will kill you. And that's just what Ricky and Fortina want. Ah, uh, no. Uh, Ricky always says they uh, keep my head protected, uh, so you must be wrong. Am I? Well, Ricky's good to me. Why, you numbskull, he's trying to get you killed. I, uh, you, Johnny, you're all wrong. You know the man you're up against tomorrow night? Well, I know his name. Well, he's the one scheduled to finish you off. Johnny, I, I don't believe that. Now, Al, listen, you got to believe it. Now, where's the tell? Here. Uh, uh, who are you going to call? 
Hello, this is an emergency. Get me Sergeant Romilio Garcia at Central Police Headquarters. Uh, cops? That's right, Al. And a doctor. Uh, no, look, Ricky says to stay away from doctors. All they do All is they can they... do is stop you from ever fighting again. And that would make you worth just $50,000 less to Frankie for... Sergeant Johnny Dollar. I found Al. Hotel room right next to mine. Room 915. Bring a doctor, a brain specialist if you can. Even if you have to drag him out of bed. Oh, look, we'll fight the international situation when we come to it. You get a doctor up here, you hear me? You hang up or I'll blow your head off. Well, Mr. Fortina, I believe. First, Kim Ricky. Sure, boss. He's clean. Huh? I hate to shoot an unarmed man, Dollar, but if you make one phony move... So you know who I am, huh? Well, Ricky here may be stupid in some ways, but he had sense enough to call me from Joplin after you broke in on him there. Finding out what you're up to wasn't difficult. Finding out what you're up to wasn't very tough either, Fortina. But it's all over. Not for me, Dollar. That's where you're wrong. That phone call I made was to the police. I know. To central headquarters. That's over three miles from here. By the time your sergeant finds a doctor and gets here, you'll be dead. And I will be gone. Have you forgotten that you have a border to cross, you Fortina? You think I'm stupid? Frankie Fortina has never been here. He's never been even in Mexico. Because my tourist card reads Charles Edward Smith. And since the next plane leaves for the States in about 20 minutes... Ricky. Yeah, boss? I think Mr. Dollar had better have an accident. Fall out of the window, perhaps. Oh, now, wait a minute, what? boss. I mean, well... Listen to me, Malone. I had two reasons for coming down here. To see if you were right about Dollar and to make sure of that fight tomorrow. You've been stalling with Al. You've taken too long. The heat is on up north. I need the dough. I told you, boss, that El Toro will do it tomorrow. Shut up. And look, if you take care of Dollar, what about me? What? Maybe you can get back to the States, but me, with with Dollar laying dead here, and and if Al talks... Al won't talk. You won't either. Frankie. Dollar has given us a perfect setup. He came here to Al's room. You found him here. Hmm? You had a fight. Dollar ends up in the street below. But what happens to me? Haven't I always taken care of you in the past when you were working for me? You know what will happen if you ever try to cross. No, no. All right, all right, all right. I have contacts down here. I have plenty of them. I have lawyers, good ones. It's going to be self-defense, pure and simple. But what if Al talks? I told you before, Ricky. You've taken too long with him. Frankie, listen. While I hold this gun, you're going to take care of Al, too. The way you should have a long, long time ago in his Frankie, fights. I, I don't no, understand. No, listen to me, Frankie. You listen. I You've been in this whole thing just as deep as I have. And deeper. Because you're the one who's kept Al fighting. You've paid off all those phony medicos. You set him up for this El Toro tomorrow night. <laughs> You'll do it, Ricky. No. Then I'll use the gun on all three of you. Frankie. You're out of your mind, Fortina. Am I? It will still look like a fight between you and Ricky. Boss. Al just happened to get hit accidentally by the gun that will be found beside your body. Boss. Hmm? Boss, I'll do it. <laughs> you bet you will. I'll do anything you say if you just help me get out of it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Dollar is first. And brother, if you think it's going to be it's easy. It's either the window or this gun, Dollar. So far as you're concerned, I don't care which. Go on, Ricky. Okay, Just remember, boss. your own life depends on it. You bet I... Hey, boy, dirty, will you? The window, Ricky. The window, I said. Remember, it's your own life, Ricky. All right, Fortina. So you have got a gun. Al. <laughs> uh, yeah, Johnny, I, I, I hit him, but... Well, I'll be. See, Senor Dollar, with one very fine, clean left hook. While Fortino was watching you and the uh, unfortunate Ricky. Yeah. You got here a little late, Garcia. You see, but uh, tell me, senor. What makes you think this Al Coronado has lost his punch? Expense account item 13, $100. Legal expense, mainly a deposition for a lawyer to take to court. Just now, Garcia got me out of having to stay in Monterey for a hearing. I will never know, but he did. As for Al Coronado, I suggest the company make some adjustment in his policy that'll permit paying his annuities immediately. And why not? The company should have investigated more thoroughly before issuing this policy anyway. And if it doesn't show a little heart, well, I'm sure it will. 
Item 14, 224.50. Hotel and incidentals and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, 491.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fast trip to the West Coast to an impossible case involving an impossible man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Herb Ellis, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Les Tremaine, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News, to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Dan Coverly speaking. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, you all set for another visit with Valentine? You know George. He's the boy whose motto in life is let George do it. Nothing too small, nothing too big. Better still, nothing too dangerous. He runs an ad in the personal column, but some of his clients are sent by friends. That is, if you can call Lieutenant Riley a friend. Dear Mr. Valentine... I am without doubt the ugliest man in the world. Hey, wait a minute. Who is this? However, I need your help or the man standing beside me will go crazy. Because, Mr. Valentine, I... Riley, it's you, isn't it? Lieutenant Riley. Yes, yes, it's me, and I'm the one going crazy. All right, have it your own way. Only, what are you talking about? Valentine, I've got a client for you. A little ugly stumble bum wants your help. A slot machine repair man, no less... He needs help, or at least he won't help me unless somebody helps him. Only he won't trust the police. I don't blame him. You make so much sense. Uh, Okay, then. Let's say I need your help. Sure, this little guy isn't much, but the idea is... Riley, hold it, will you? You said this guy's dying? Yeah. Police hospital. The doctor gives him a day or two at the best. Can't operate, can't stop the infection. From what, Lieutenant? Oh, gunshot wounds, Miss Brooks. One gun, but all six shells. Happened in a dark alley. Whoever it was didn't want to miss him, I guess. That little man must be tough. Maybe. Or lucky or unlucky. He's one of those guys who's born to end up at the bottom of the pile, Valentine. Then why are you so interested in him? It's just possible that he can steer us all the way to the top of the pile. His name's Trailer. I told you he was the littlest shrimp in the slot machine racket. The repair man. 
Well, we've never found out who the big shrimp is, and... Uh, I see. I worm my way into the man's confidence, and then maybe he spills. Is that it? Blows the whole racket apart. No, no, no. You just help the little guy find his girl. Betty. Betty, that's her name. I was going to see her tonight. Betty who, Trevor? What's the rest of her name? She's beautiful. I'm not, but she is. I'm just her bill, she said. You don't believe it either, do you? Trailer, can you understand me? There's nobody in the world to believe. You gotta be careful. You can't trust people. You gotta test them and test them and test them. And then, then you can't trust them because they're all the same. What are you talking about, friend? The racket? I won't tell you anything. I won't. I should. All right, all right. Take it easy. I, who shot you? Ants. You can test people to see if they're ants, you know. Put honey in front of them. See if they choke themselves. Why did you ask me? Betty. Hey, Trailer. Fine, Betty. Hey, look, Trailer. Uh, 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 Nurse? Betty. Uh, Guess you can have him back for a while. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Riley, I'm willing to bet he doesn't know anything that'll ever help you pry open the big time. Is that so? Well, just let me show you. Look in here. Oh, you mean the tall, skinny man over there? Yeah, yeah, Wilson, the highest price legal beagle in the state. Waiting to see if anybody off stage needs defending, huh? Yeah, that's it, the watchdog, ever alert. Just in case the police have a squealer who might stop worrying about the girlfriend and climb out of his delirium long enough to sing. Sing? What's this? What's all this, Lieutenant? Somebody singing? That's right, Mr. Wilton. Trailer in there tells me you own all the slot machines in this state. <laughs> yes, of course. It's just a sideline, though, rather a bother, particularly when I don't live in this town. Here on business, Mr. Wilton? I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh. How do you do? Charmed. No, I've, uh, I've been retained by a client, Mr. Valentine. Oh, who's that? The Black Company. Mm. Riley here knows about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Out-of-town corporation. Manufactures will-o'-the-wisps. Well, I'm only a lawyer. I'm not familiar. Oh, the Black Company's quite an outfit, Valentine. Perfectly legal. Only nobody knows who runs it. But do they own the slot machines? Oh, of course not. No do more they than I know do. who they make bank deposits for? Does this bird trailer even know who he works for? Does anybody? The basis of all good organization, Lieutenant, is the pyramid. Like a spy system, huh? No one man knows enough to incriminate any of the others. Then why are you here, Mr. Welton? Why are you worried about this trailer person? <laughs> I haven't really said I even know the man, have I? <laughs> Or that the company I represent is interested in anything more than employees' indemnity, his uh, accident and so on? <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. Riley, maybe it is possible that the best of pyramids get a little wobbly once in a while. Huh? Maybe it is possible that the reason Trailer in there got shot was that he found out too much about the higher-ups. Yeah, hold it, hold, hold it. Wait. Yeah, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Oh, I, I... I wanted to speak to the nurse about Bill Trailer. Well... All right. Who's calling? Well, I... Uh, just the nurse, please. The nurse on duty there. Well, just a second. Valentine. Valentine, it's a girl. Now, take it, will you? You're the intern on duty, or anybody, anybody. What's this? Misrepresentation, Lieutenant? Here, let me have it. Hello? Nurse? Well, she'll be here in a second, honey. I'm the receptionist. Well, I just wanted to find out about a patient. I his name is Trailer. Uh, trailer? Well, uh, wait till I get my cards here. 
trailer. Hurry up, please. Somebody said he was there, but I, I want to know what happened to him. Well, we had an appendix case come in this morning. Oh, just tell me what happened to him. Just... What? You don't handle cases like that in the police ward. Well, I meant in the other ward. I... Hmm. She hung up. It's all right. We got the number. Call came from a phone in a bar at 1612 Commercial Lane. The old Durfee Hill section, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's quite a district. A 50-cent flop house or a $5,000 penthouse. It's what the harness boys call the Ant Hill, Valentine. The Ant Hill? Huh? Mm-hmm. Let's go, Brooksy. A million people a day use that phone, my friend. Every third one tries a slug. But, bartender, all we wanted to Besides, know was... Besides, if the... you whistle at a dame, where's it get you? Maybe your boyfriend's a prize fighter. Me, I'll take television any day. The girl used the phone only a few minutes ago. Who was she? Should I know? Should I watch the cash register and be a bulldog for the phone company at the same time? All right, all right. You don't know. Or maybe you don't want to know. I suppose you never heard of a guy named Trailer around here, either. Trailer? No, not until the fight last night. What fight? Uh, him and Louie. Who'd you think? Nice guy, that Trailer, I guess. But he'll never amount to much, mixing it up with a guy hey, like slow Louis. down, will you? Slow down. Who's Louie? And what was this fight about? About a dame, natural, classy blonde, lives up the street, named Betty. Fight ended quick. We threw them both out. Betty! Sure. See what I mean about whistling a dame? You mean this guy, Louie's tough? Go on. Go on. More about Louie. Not a price letter, no, but a real sharp boy. Just the same. Working his way up for a good outfit. Makes collections for the black company. That slot machine's to you. Oh. Fellow employee, huh? Only Louie's higher up in the pile. He makes collections from guys like you. For me? You, you're crazy. Sure. Sure. What's the rest of his name? Louie what? Ask me no questions. I'll tell you no lies. Good day, friend. Brooksy, this is where your job begins. I said I'm sorry, sister. Wrong place. No Betty here. Now beat it, will you? Hi, lady. Find your party? Well, no. This gentleman Look, said what I... is this? The Census Bureau? Box of flowers, Max. Sign here. What? Oh, look. All of you go someplace. I huh? haven't got all day. Sign here and don't keep the pants. All right, all right. Yeah, not clear off. A giant. Ah. Uh, people send you flowers? Come on in. I don't know where Betty is. What do you want? Well, just to see her. Betty sings down at the nightclub, I found out. She mentioned to me once about a job, and I thought maybe dancing or selling oh, cigarettes might... Oh, great unemployed, huh? Look, you gotta be a jerk not to get along in this world, sister. What's the matter? No angles? Oh, I'm just new in town. Gee, that's a pretty box, isn't it? You gonna open them? How do you like that? Dated yesterday. Now, there's a florist who's gonna fall right out of business. Betty gets them like that all the time, sister. She knows her way around. Nothing better than the best. Gee, I met Betty's boyfriend, too, once. Trailer or something. <laughs> that's what he told you? Boyfriend? <laughs> there's a laugh. <laughs> well, sure he wasn't dressed so good. Oh, he... hopeful, Harry. She can do better than him any day. I didn't know. You mean you're the one she... Say, roses. Look, I'm Betty's brother. My name is Louie. Oh. Now, where did you say you met Betty? <laughs> Gee, has a girl got to relieve all of her privacy? We was only in the beauty shop. I was seeing about a tent. Well, don't look at me that way. She spoke to me because I complimented her on a corsage she said a boyfriend gave her. Boyfriend? <laughs> Look at that, sister. Those aren't just roses. It's a wristwatch wrapped around them, you see? Holy smoke. From an admirer, see? Guy she hasn't even met. Told you she was good looking. You ought to hear what they say about her singing. We're going places, her and me. Well, you don't have to hate my wrist about it. Uh, <laughs> so go be unemployed. Beat it, will you? Dear Betty, I look forward to meeting uh, you. What's that? I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes when I say I'm not a masher, and won't you please, please telephone me at Durfee Hill. Hey, yeah, give me that. Hey, let go. It's just a card with the roses, that's all. Come on, get out of here. Gosh, I'm not going to try to beat Betty's time or anything. I'll say you're not. I never heard that name anyway, Mr. Black or... Black! Valentine, of course, of course she's all right. You talk to her yourself, did you? Sure, Brooksy read me the note she'd seen on the flowers, but we why... We had a man watching him. After Miss Brooks left that place, a slewy fella took off in the opposite direction like a flying duck. But my man lost him. 
Now, now, will you please clear up what you've been doing? That Durfee Hill number in the flower note. It's a new number, Riley. Private listing and installed only a couple of days ago from somebody from out of town who just rented this place. What place? The fanciest penthouse in the whole section. Hey, Riley, people really look like ants from up here. You mean... Sure, sure, I'm in the place. There was a loose hinge on the service door and nobody inside. You've got the loose hinge, my friend. Don't you realize it was a Mr. Black who sent those flowers? Oh, Riley, add two and two, will you? Nobody knows who owns the slot machines, who runs the Black Company. And yet a mysterious Mr. Black shows up in town, a man nobody's seen, not even the janitor downstairs. Trailer's girl, Betty, she must have seen him. Oh, remember, he just wanted to meet her. Probably had seen her at the nightclub or something. But that was Black's mistake if he wanted to stay incognito, giving a girl his telephone number. Because now here I am with $10,000 in my pocket. But what? What'd you say? Sure. Must be collection time in the three lemon business. About two seconds ago, a delivery boy hands me an envelope at the door. Inside was an accounting sheet for all the slot machines on the south side and proceeds for the past month. Well, I... Riley, I figured out who's the man at the top of the anthill. Don't ask me how long it'll last or why it works this way. But right now, Riley, that man seems to be me. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You go to help Lieutenant Riley. Because there's a man dying in the police hospital who might tell what he knows about the slot machine racket, provided somebody helps him find his girl, Betty. Well, so far you haven't found Betty, though you have discovered that there's someone else in her life. Someone a little more successful than Trailer, a man who calls himself Mr. Black, who owns the slot machines, whose identity is a secret even from his own employees. Only if your name is George Valentine, now it's you who occupy Mr. Black's apartment. It's a dangerous game, and no one realizes that better than Claire Brooks. Down at the police hospital now, she seems unable to help. I, I don't know anything. I tell you, Trailer, I don't know. if you could just remember why you and Louie had that fight last night in the bar, was it over Betty? Betty? Or is something wrong in the business? In the black company? Fine, Betty. Just fine, Betty. Of course not, Brooksy. We've gone way past trailer now. We're in the middle of the ants, the scramblers. The police have the apartment surrounded now, well, George. Well, tell them to keep out and lay low unless I whistle for help. But, George... Angel will never find out who fired those shots in the trailer or who runs this racket unless we ride right along with the gang. You'll ride yourself right into a funeral notice. Sooner or later, the person who rented that apartment will come back I and said then... don't worry, will you, Brooksy, as long as I can... What? Go on, George. What do you people wash those shirts in anyway? A huh? cement mixer? The, the collars come back with ground glass on the edge. George, what's the matter? Well, Who's just there? don't use so much starch, that's all. Hello. I didn't mean to interrupt. The door was open. All right, then shut it and come in. Now, what is it? What do you want? Uh, don't get slow, boss. Now, take it easy. Your name's Louie, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Sure it is. How'd you know? You fit the description. Look, look, look I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I should have just sent the stuff up by messenger the way we always do, wherever the point is each oh, month. Oh, so that's I... it, huh? You're a collector. Uh, Durfee Hill and East Side, sir. You brought some money. All right, let's have it. Here, here. The counting sheet's right on top. I had all those figures in my head. It's a trick. I taught myself. Right, boy. I, I know it's not healthy to come up here and find out who you are like this, relax, but I... Relax, relax, will you? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew you wouldn't mind when you saw that. It's almost double last month. 23,500 bucks. What did you do? Fix the machine so they pay in bubble gum instead of jackpots? Oh, 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 no, sir. No, I didn't touch them. But uh, I've been in there giving them the old boost, you know, talking it up with the bartender. A real climber in the business, aren't you, Louie? Uh, now, what's this really about, Buster? How did you make so much money this month? Well, well the truth of the What happened is... to Trailer, the repairman? I don't know what you mean, happened. Who shot him? 
The boss, listen, he was cheating you. Did you know that, did you? I can prove he was. He was what? Holding out. Jack up the setting on the machines and then split the rake off with bartenders. That's how he did it. You must have heard the same thing from other districts. He floated around all of them, didn't he? You know, it's getting too complicated for me. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait, listen, that's how I build up my total for the moment, by catching him at it and stopping it. Yeah, you earned the Silver Star, all right. Uh, look, who are you, you going to call? Listen to the rest of what I got. Buster, I'm going to see a man about pinning a medal on you. But I didn't do it. I didn't empty any gun into him. Well, everything happens at once. Uh, you want me to get it for you, Buster? No, no, I'll get it. Go mix yourself a drink or something. Uh, don't mind if I do. I-, I know who it is anyway. Huh? This is great. Oh. Hello. I guess you're the man, huh? <laughs> Are you the girl? Don't be funny. I mean, well, after all the notes you've been sending me with the flowers. Oh, sure. Come in, come in, Betty. Thanks. Say, you live all right, don't you? <laughs> I hope to. Uh, you know, you're not so easy to find, Betty. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now. Yeah, I got the idea. Do you always use that whirlwind stuff, flowers and presents on a girl, Mr. Whatever your name is, Black? Or... Hey, slow down. Take your coat off. Uh, sure. Huh? You wanted to meet me. You saw me in the nightclub and you heard my singing and you wanted to meet me. Well, now, who wouldn't? You're very beautiful. Do a girl good to be known she associates with you? <laughs> no comment. Any girl would break her neck to get up here. She'd give her eye teeth to walk up close to you like this. Hmm? Hey, what's the matter? You dirty... Hey, sis, cut it out. Cut it out, sis. You said you'd be nice. Now stop it. Will you cut it out? I I don't know what's the matter with the boss. Honest, I suppose you both be quiet. She said she was coming up here to see you. She promised... She promised you would, you know. I I, I told her what a great guy you are. I said shut up, killer. What? Now, 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 look, boss, this is my sister. Say, one of the greatest kids in the I know, world. I know, I know. A guy could go places if his sister associated with a big shot like what me. What was it you said? You called Louie. Freddie, you came up here to find out about Trailer, didn't you? To slap my face and ask the big shot which one of his hired hands was responsible for your boyfriend being down there in the hospital. Wasn't that it? He's not a boyfriend. She's ten times as good as him. He's only been hanging around a couple of months. Sure, he's not an eager beaver like you, Buster. He wouldn't try to use his own sister to get him ahead in the world. Oh, no, no, they just thought about it. In that bar the other night? Oh, yeah, but that was all. I told him to stay away, and he got me and took me one at a time, will you? Honestly. You live with the ants. Don't you know what they're like yet? Oh, is that what you saw in Trailer? That he was a little different from the Scramblers? It was a dope. He was stealing, holding out. You want to bet it was you who was holding out from collections, Louis, and he caught you at it? Boss, no. No, have a chance to get rid of two birds with one stone. Get in the boss's good graces and cover your own tracks by being the guy... You said you didn't see Trailer after that fight. Well, All I, I know, buddy, is that your brother said something to me a minute ago about a gun being emptied in the trailer. Huh? Well, it so happens he was shot six times. Only how could you know about that little specific thing, Louie, unless you Boss, were the guy? look, everything I've done is for you. It's for the good of the company. I'm looking ahead all the time. See, I, I want to... Plenty, it, if you like. Huh? What? Hey, who's that for? Got a gun. Shut up. Hello, Mr. Wilton. <laughs> party's over, huh? Yes. Yes, the party's over, I'm afraid. And besides, it's making too much noise. Next door? No, I've been in the back of a wardrobe you overlooked. Oh, sure. Well, I didn't think it could last. It never did make sense that such a careful setup as this apartment wouldn't have... Wouldn't have me. Yes, me. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So's Louis. So's Betty. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, who is this guy? Now, if the three of you will I'll just... I'll take care of him. Down that gun, Buster. Don't worry. He can't get away with anything. Stand Louis, stop it. You're making a mistake. <laughs> Ambitious to the end. Couldn't resist trying to make one last impression on you, could he, uh, Mr. Valentine? Mr. (laughs) What? Yes, Betty. I'm afraid I'm the Mr. Black who's been so anxious to meet you. It was too bad. Things couldn't have worked out better for us. But if you're Mr. Black... The great organizer. The best of pyramids totter once in a while. I was here to make my own collections this time. I thought it was about time for a visit to South America. (laughs) So if you'll just hand over my money... Why don't you come and get it? You've caused enough trouble already, Valentine. Sure, come on, come on. Shoot some more people. I'm warning you. No. It's the only way you're going to get out of here. Valentine, I... that gun. Well, thanks, Riley. Mr. Slot Machine King, see what the sound of those shots brought you? Three lemons.
We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And that was it, Trailer. A gun test proved that Louis shot you. Yeah. Why? Well, ambition, I guess. Mm-hmm. Cover his own mistakes, get in good with a big boss. Mm-hmm. Can you understand me, Trailer? Mm-hmm. Can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Ants. All scrambling around. That's all Louis was. Sure. That's all Wilton is, too. But the girl's different. I think she'd like to see you, Trailer. Yeah. Yeah, we found Betty. She's a nice girl. Uh, yes, I know. Since when? What? I said, since when did you know? I mean, that she was the kind of a girl who's a little different. Who might have really meant it when she said she liked an ugly little guy like you. Mr. Valent, I'm very tired. I'm very... Wilton isn't kidding anybody. I just want you to know that I know that, Trailer. Uh... Begun to guess it, I... His biggest mistake was trying to take over the slot machine empire tonight. Like the rest, he couldn't resist the opportunity. George! Think back, Angel. Wilton's tall and skinny. Would he have ever written a note to Betty, just an ordinary-sized girl, saying, I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes? No, of course he did. He's only a lawyer. A rat trying to grab what he can off a sinking ship. But Valentine, I had no idea... I'll say it for you, Trevor. Uh, Wilton didn't ever own the slot machines like he claimed he did at the last minute. And he wasn't the Mr. Black in the notes. No, they'd have to be a short man, probably. A little guy. Yeah. A little guy. Like maybe a man who'd made such a success out of not trusting anybody that he couldn't believe a girl liked him. He had to test her by making her think a big shot was after her. To see if she'd drop him and run for the honey. He was in town for the collections anyway... And the nose around the way he always did, inspecting the anthill he'd built while looking like a repairman. You mean, Trailer here is really Mr. Black? Yeah, Brooksy. What would you have done, Trailer, if Betty had dropped you and chased after you, Mr. Black, the way her brother wanted it to? I... I would have killed her. No. No, I... I wouldn't have. I know. I don't... I know, Buster. It's pretty ironic. You kept your identity so secret, you did so well, that what happened? You got shot by a guy whose only ambition was to get in good with the boss, make a big, fine impression on you. Now you still want to talk to Betty while you can, Mr. Black? No. No. She's... Leave her out of our anthill. You have just heard The Ant Hill, another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey stars as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 
He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting, like being a truck driver, with the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holiday? I went down to Star Times office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling ten-cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. Sell 5,000 packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, Kara Box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? <laughs> Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny. Tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? <laughs> you interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. <laughs> Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. What was on page five? Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. Police announced they had recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is... John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. 
just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Oh, uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Well, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old DA just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. I bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I'll I... let you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holliday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. This is attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but what could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, the stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while the detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with a hold of men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write the need of the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. I got to earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. Small boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny. There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. You know him? Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. 
He's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny. Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. Oh, I feel terrible about it, just the same. And now... Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, um, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps you'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Oh, thanks. I... Did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling holiday. Waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holiday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, she's long and skinny. No, no, she's short. Short and fat. Holiday. Holiday, get up on your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right? Anson? Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One... Big How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holiday? I, I, I can't, can't make it. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holliday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better. Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with that district attorney. I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? 
Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was the hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago. The victim of a hit-and-run driver. And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holiday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holiday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you wanted to do too much talking. So, just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holiday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny, did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, and then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, he hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? <laughs> Only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, well, yes. Yes, he was. Uh... Was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no. He never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room. But it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? Dub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Hardy. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Uh -huh. I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight, I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. You like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? You ain't not twins, are you? No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. 
Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into that apartment house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Go! Holiday! Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? Any reply, Miss Joe? What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We, we can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willie? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that, go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to her? Shut up, you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before? How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only one admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You had me set up this whole deal. Had me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Had me frame the business of picking up my watch. I timed it out perfect for you. What do you do? You got dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy end. But Johnny Moran's father is free. The district attorney has Grace Willard. Joe Coakley and the stolen jewelry and Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped too when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think he needed money that bad. Uh, yeah, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee... Gosh, I guess I'm rich. Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I, 
I don't know. I... M- Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the... Ho- oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susan. I just invited Mr. Holliday out to have a drink. He can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susan. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the winter moon dips low over Broadway and hides again behind the scudding mists, Broadway is numbed. The year's ending is too swift. There's too much nighttime in December, as if the dimness of the subway had moved one flight up, as if the lights were not quite lights, but yellow things that drain off into shadows. It's a time of the muffler, the hurry up, the time of the wind. The dreams are dying, and it's a long while before April comes again. The place where I was, also one flight up above the street of the tired apartment houses and hotels. The avenue leased to anybody on the premise that home is any place where the rent is cheap. Hotel Savannah. The man who walked beside me and explained it all to me. After all, Lieutenant. After After all. all, What? The do not disturb sign has been hanging on the front of the door all day. And here it is almost midnight. So? So, a place like this. Rent a room for $3.50. Pull out the old pills. Leave the world to its own sorrow. The Savannah's getting quite a reputation for... Oh, this is the room. Now, that's how I found her. Right there on the bed. I could tell right away she wasn't a suicide. That bullet hole, no gun. Who is she? Took the room yesterday. Registered as Mary Smith. Ah, I keep a straight face as long as the payment is made in advance. Even she didn't have luggage, so what? Quite a few of my friends have not a presentable suitcase to their names. What about her visitors? This is her home away from home. That's our philosophy here at the Savannah. Why shouldn't she have visitors? After did she have any? I don't know. People come and go. A regular little world in itself, this Savannah. I remark this to myself often as I stand at the desk. Like I was looking on into a regular little world. That's why I always don't say... Don't say it, Mr. Burgess. I'll take it from here. And consider the place where a girl lies dead. A room of transients, a cubicle, a lot it's sold to the passer through. The mark of their passing, the scars where cigarettes were ground into the desktop. The hotel stationery, the postcards with the scenes of gaiety tinted in, ink stained, finger smudged, blank. The sign, please turn out lights when departing, leave key at desk. The bed where passing sleep is sold at the current rate. And in it, Mary Smith, dead by violence. Phone it in. Check other hotel personnel. Be told for the day she'd been there, the girl was quiet, discreet, no trouble at all. Visitors? Maybe, maybe not. Policy not to notice things like that. And take it home with you. Try to sleep against the image, desolate, lonely. Not quite make it. And welcome the coming of day. Somewhere to go, someone to talk to. You have a bad night, Danny. You have the look of someone who has slept with rocks in his bed. Head to foot. That's your morning's greeting to me, Sergeant Tataglia? You see? Other mornings you refer to me as Gino. But this morning... Danny, why is this morning different from all other mornings? You got something for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Sure, I got something. 
We coded that girl's fingerprints, that Mary Smith, put them on the wire to the chums of the FBI during the night. Had an answer? Those chums of the FBI are veritable Johnnies on the spot, Danny. You had an answer? Huh? On the spot. According to the info lately come to hand and now contained in my breast pocket, Danny, this Mary Smith was not a Mary Smith. Oh, no, not at all. All right, Gino, who was she? A Peg Ramsey, formerly of the Women's Army Corps, which makes her a former wife, which makes it easy for our Washington co-workers to check such things as fingerprints flying through the night. Such things as... As what? As the occupation of the deceased prior to say. This Peg Ramsey, heretofore known as Mary Smith, was a member of the publishing firm, Taggart and Ramsey on Lower Madison. It brightens the morning for you, Danny, this info? You tried, Gino. You really did. Thanks. <laughs> I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Get around to believing it, Mr. Taggart. Miss Ramsey was murdered in a cheap hotel named the Savannah. We want you to help us. What was she doing there? Was she registered? Look, Mr. Taggart... I can't believe it. I, I just can't believe it. Let's try it this way. What did Miss Ramsey do here at your publishing house? At our publishing house, Mr. Clover, Peg is as much responsible for the success of Taggart and Ramsey as I am. Of course, I'm directly responsible for a book club's choosing four of our novels. Peg only had three, but then... Just tell me what she did. Huh? Had final say on what we would publish and what we wouldn't, along with me, of course. Also, the discovery of talent and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. Friends? Every unpublished author in the world... You must understand, Taggart and Ramsey enjoys an enviable reputation. We publish stuff that others wouldn't even touch. Of course, sometimes we take a loss publishing literature, but we make up for it. Put out a crossword puzzle book and... Yeah, but what all... about special friends, Mr. Taggart? Oh, working on the premise that special friends can be special enemies, huh? That happens in our latest mystery, Kill the Murderer Dead. It'll be released for publication in May. Mr. Taggart... Peg had a very special friend. Who? William Walter. Who is William Walter? A writer. Where do I find him? I don't know. I have no idea. Peg handled him. What made him so special? Well, according to Peg, he was special because he was talent. The once-in-a-lifetime talent. Personally, I've heard that phrase too many times. Last year, after such a talent, we had to publish jumbo crossword puzzle books five, six, and seven in a hurry. And that was the relationship between Miss Ramsey and this William Walter, publisher and writer. Oh, I think more. I think Peg had her times to be a publisher and times to be a woman. It's my belief from observing Peg that she mixed the two up for this boy. What else about this William Walter? He was brought here from North Carolina. Brought here? You mean your firm subsidized him? <laughs> a writer's dream, but no. He was brought here by a Mrs. Janice Kirk, a self-styled discoverer of talent. You, Peg, slightly brought him to her with a couple chapters of a novel. Peg believed in this boy and gave him uh, an advance. Where do I find this Mrs. Kirk? Oh, I can tell you that easily. At the Ruxton Hotel. I've had cocktails with her there. An attractive woman, the way those women from North Carolina can be. Now, uh, will you pardon me, Mr. Clover? And at the hotel, ask for Janice Kirk. Be told she's been seen entering the cocktail lounge. Go there. The head waiter raises his eyebrows with an effort, tilts a patrician head slightly to the left, and that way indicates the woman sitting alone, sipping the colorless drink, sipping the colorless music, weaving its frightened way through potted palms. And on her face, the smile of acceptance for the music, for the furtive cocktail time laughter, for the glances of men, attached, unattached. Hello there, Norlet. Mrs. Kirk? I saw Alec tilt his Roman coin head, and that brought you to me. Whatever the reason, I'm glad. It's been lonely. I'm from the police, Mrs. Kirk. You didn't have to tell me that. You could have let me believe you'd walked in here and seen a, well, an interesting face sitting alone with her lost thoughts, and you took pity in it. You could have let me believe that. I've just come from Alfred Tigard of Tigard and Ramsey. Alfred, he... you tell him I'm very disappointed in him. He hasn't asked me to cocktails in, well, it must be hours now. You tell him that. He said you knew Peg Ramsey. Miss Ramsey, I've taken notice of her. Talk to her, I remember. I wouldn't call that knowing a girl. Now, why did he go and tell you I knew her? She's dead, murdered. She gave her name as Mary Smith and was killed in a hotel room. Why? Didn't she have a home of her own? I didn't mean to say that. Truly, I didn't mean to be flippant over death. Not a death like that. 
What an empty way to die. Taggart told me something else. I'm sure he did. It was about the boy, wasn't it? He told me about a boy, a young writer, William Walter. William, sweet William, sweet, sweet William. Maybe you can tell me more about him than Taggart did, Mrs. Kirk. Why, well, no, I can. I know more about him than I know about myself. Wasn't it I that discovered the burning tree of talent in him? Wasn't it I that beat him, tortured him, soothed him till he put it all on paper? Figuratively, that is. I did that to him figuratively. Wasn't it I that brought him here so his poetry could cry out across your metropolitan sky? Where is he and... now? I don't know. And you said that I you... said I don't know. First William stayed here, right here in this hotel close to me. And he took to living in all kinds of places, dismal places, dirty little finished rooms and tenements, sordid hotels. <laughs> Let me just high and dry for months so as he could taste your city. Then you haven't seen him. There is a phone call for you, Mr. Clover. You can take it here. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. You want it, Danny, right away. Savannah Hotel. Why, Gino? A boy. Shot to death in one of the rooms. Savannah Hotel, Danny. The same one... I hate your telephones. They interrupt just... Something bad's happened, hasn't it? I know it from your face. Something real bad. And I'll tell you another thing, Mr. Clover. I should have kept my big mouth shut about the reputation of the Savannah. Right down here. Same floor, same hallway as the last time I was here. Not only that. Same room. There he is, Mr. Clover. You know who? Yeah. Registered about noon. Gave his name as William Walter. Said he was a writer. <laughs> First time we ever had a writer. And in the room of transience, yet another one sprawled there across the bed, a boy, like a tired puppet, discarded. And the bullet hole in his temple gave him another quality, an attitude suddenly and forever caught in an instant of time, and the gun held in his dangling fist, the end of him, the death of William Walter. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A titled Englishman whined and dined at a Swank Park Avenue address is then mysteriously murdered. It takes no less than Mr. Chameleon, master of disguises, to make a dent in the Hand of Fate murder case. Follow Mr. Chameleon on this engrossing police operation tomorrow. Yes, that's tomorrow on CBS Radio. Mr. Chameleon is now heard at a new time, Sundays, on most of these same CBS radio stations. On the eve of the merry holidays, Broadway treats itself to a ten-cent sprig of mistletoe, stands under it, watches the women walk by. They hug the warm fur close. Let the December wind riffle it against their mouths, their cheeks. Let the wind breathe them away from you. And for background, the music flowing out of the tinseled metallic throats of loudspeakers. And the kids, standing carefully away from the assorted street corner Santa Clauses, eyeing them, studying them, lifting great puzzled eyes to the grown-up who holds their hand. Good, huh, kid? Makes you glow, so find the coin, drop it in the pot, pay off for the year that never was. And in a room again, the place of the dead, be alone with it for a little while, be alone with the boy with a bullet wound in his temple. The boy who'd come to the great city with poetry to offer, and in return had been given this, the end of searching, the end of pain. Be alone with it until Detective Mugovan comes back. I had a little talk with Burgess, the manager, Danny, like you told me. Yeah? Says the boy made a big to-do when he registered. Did Burgess tell you why? Uh-huh. Seems this kid, William Walter, insisted on having exactly the same room where the girl was killed. Manager tried to talk him out of it, offered him other rooms. Kid wouldn't have it any other way. I think I know why. Sure. Boy was a writer. That gives him a right the emotions the rest of us aren't privileged with. That's why he has to die in a room You where... through, Muggerman? Yeah. I guess I've been in it too long, Danny. Here's why he wanted this room. Found it in his pocket. Marriage license. I looked at it, Danny. 
Thanks. Hmm. Issue to William Walder and Margaret Ramsey. That'd be Peg Ramsey, the murdered girl, huh, Danny? Yeah. A place like this is probably going to keep the marriage a secret. Uh huh. Hey, come over here, Michael. Found something else. Here on the desk. Oh, it's written so fine. Wait, I got to put on my glasses. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Peg, beloved Peg, all of it is done, finished. For you, now for me. For someone you breathed life into, then dying, took it from him. Done. Finished. He wrote this, Dan? We'll check it at headquarters. I think we'll find he wrote it. With a gun in his hand like that, this note, how he insisted on the same room. Suicide, huh? Call it in, Muggerman. <laughs> Danny? Oh, come on in, Muggerman. Been down to technical? Yeah, for an hour, more or less. Took me that long to get out of Gordon what he knew as soon as I walked in. Now, guys like Gordon give mothers a bad name. <laughs> gave you a rough time, huh? Yeah, had me looking through microscopes, gave me a short lecture on the theory of spectrochemical analysis. Then when I didn't applaud, he got angry. <laughs> Anyhow, the gun that William Walter allegedly killed himself with also fired the bullet that killed Peg Ramsey. Murder and suicide, huh, Muggerman? I guess so. What do you think? Take a look at this suicide note. Well, I saw it, Danny. Well, I know you saw it, but look at it again. It's a suicide note. Is it? Hmm? Show me where he says he's going to kill himself. Show me where it says that he... What is it, Gino? Lady outside to see you, Danny. What lady? Name's Janice Kirk. Show her in. This way to see Danny Clover. Thanks. That'll be all, Sergeant. Well, please sit down, Miss Kirk. This is uh, Detective Muggerman. How do you do? Mrs. Kirk. I'm going to leave town tomorrow, Mr. Clover. I see. Yes. This is a lonely city now. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it because so many things, mostly... William Walter? Yes. Oh, I want to say, Mrs. Kirk, how sorry we are. Thank you. Mrs. Kirk, one thing I'd like to ask you, just what interest... The way you said Mrs., the little glance that just happened between you, you and this other gentleman... The missus means I was once married. My husband is dead. I see. And just what interest I had in William. He was a great writer. I said I was lonely. Now that William's dead, the world's a little bit more lonely, too. Though it'll never know it. Just why did you come here? I want to ask something of you, may I? Of course. I brought William here. I want to take him home. I want to bury him. We've already sent notification to North Carolina to his uh, next of kin. But in this case, don't you see, it should be me who should take... Well, call it responsibility. Call it whatever. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kirk. Until we hear from the next of kin, we have no authority. I loved him. Is that what you wanted to hear me say? Go ahead, exchange glances again. Snick a little bit behind your hands. Mrs. Kirk, what the lieutenant said simply Very means... Well, you see, it really makes no difference at all. For a moment, consider her fury at being deprived of the dead boy and understand it. Understand it because of the sudden statement of love for him. Blurt it out, bitter, explosive, no longer to be contained. But let it also open a door onto new questions. The finding out of why a boy's life must be taken. A boy of talent. A boy who was about to be married. A boy who had apparently scrawled a note against the insistent calling of death. Murder. Suicide. Make sure which. Let it take you to a place you'd been before, to a man you'd talked to before. I can't tell you how glad I am you came back to me, Mr. Clover. I just can't tell you how glad. Why, Mr. Taggart? Well, uh, this is perhaps an uncalled-for thought after those dismal doings at the Savannah Hotel. Even tragic, you might say. Peg and that boy. Just tell me, Mr. Taggart. Well, I was wondering, uh, just a fleeting thought, mind you, did you happen to find the manuscript of the boy's novel... Did he perchance die with it there in the hotel room? No, no, we didn't find it. Why? Well, you must forgive me for this rather scavenger-like idea I've had, but not that we won't take care of the boy's estate, mind you, but it, it seems a provocative publishing stunt. You want to it. publish the work posthumously. A boy kills himself, leaves a novel. That'll make a splash in the literary world, huh? Yes, uh, I would have tried to put it more tastefully, but that's it, exactly. Sorry, I can't help you. 
Well, then I can't for the life of me imagine what else we have to talk about. The reason why I came. I'm not sure the boy killed himself. He was going to marry Peg Ramsey. Did you know that? Marry? No, I didn't. Imagine. You said you met the boy when he first came here, that you... Quickly. A quick introduction from Peg. As I said, his work impressed her, so I okayed an advance for him. That's why if you find the manuscript, I feel it rightfully belongs to me. That's all you knew of him? The advance? Peg Ramsey's interest in him? Sponsoring of That him. and the money I've already expended on him. For advanced publicity on Peg's newfound genius, I even hired Tonto Jones. Who? Tonto Jones. Ace Blurbist. The Guy de Maupassant of book jackets. Told him to stick with Walter and get to his marrow, find out everything about him, and write it in a hundred words to fit the back of a book jacket. I'd like to talk to a man who knew all about William Walter. You have his address? Greenwich Village, somewhere. The girl will give it to you on your way out, Mr. Clover. You were going, weren't you? So downtown now, to Greenwich Village. Turn off 11th Street on the bank, past the bargain basement bars where the floor shows chuckle at the customers, and the local color is prefabricated. And find an address, another basement, where the door is a painted mural of pink and satyrs with a motto in French over the brass knocker. When the door opens, the man puts a finger to his lips. Shh. It's the last side. Huh? Schoenberg bought the records today. Come on. Come on, everybody's inside. All right. Grab yourself a hunk of floor and sit. If you don't mind, I'll stand. What did you bring? What? I told Bobette to tell everybody to bring a record. Didn't she? I brought a badge. Hey, who are you? Aren't you one of Bobette's... Police, I'm looking for Tonto Jones. Why? Where is he? Me? What do you want me for? A few questions, Tonto. By the way, where'd you get that name? Well, I spent a summer in Mexico trying to write. The natives gave me the name affectionately. It stuck. All right. Now tell me what you can about William Walter. I was going to do his dust jacket for him. You mean that stuff on the cover of a book that tells how good it is? What do you mean, stuff? Just tell me about William Walter. <laughs> I could have done it, too. Have somebody to support me. I could have written a novel. Did William Walter finish his? About a week ago. Pretty good, too. Oh, not that I would have approached his subject matter that way. Then you read it. Parts of it. Other parts he read to us. To us? Mm-hmm. People who drop in from time to time. We had varied opinions as to the novel's significance. Of course, if you're the type who's satisfied with sheer entertainment value... Where well, is the novel? Manuscript? Uh-huh. Oh, he left it here for me to look over. A couple of days ago, Janice picked it up. Janice Kirk? She said Willie sent her for it. I gave it to her. Hey, Tonto! We're disturbing your guest, Tonto. Go back to him. I'm just leaving. Hello, Mr. Clover. May I come in, Mrs. Kirk? Well, you don't want to talk to me now. I've been crying. I look a mess. It'll only be a few minutes. You promise? Yes. Well, then, come in. You wait right here. I'll go in the next room and do my face. We can talk. Well, go on. Talk to me. I've just come from Greenwich Village, Mrs. Kirk. Mm, I hate it, don't you? I spoke to Mr. Jones. Tonto? That's right, Tonto Jones. You know what Tonto means? No, I don't. I didn't either till I looked it up. It means crazy. Fatuous, stupid. No one pays any attention to what Don does, do they? I do. How do I look better? Of course I look better. Can you tell I've been crying? No. Now we'll talk. Did you like the novel? Well, be more explicit, Mr. Clover. I'm always reading. What novel did you mean? William Walter's novel. You know something? I told you I loved the boy. And I did. Even after he was so cruel to me. What about the novel, Mrs. Kirk? Well, that's what I mean. He didn't even let me read it after all I did for him. Maybe you didn't understand me, Mrs. Kirk. I said I saw Mr. Jones down in Greenwich Village. Well, he's a liar. About what? About anything he told you. He said you picked up Walter's novel a couple of days ago. I don't think he lied. Nobody else has that manuscript. Then I suppose nobody will ever read it. I suppose not. Mrs. Kirk? Yes? Yeah. You told me how hard you worked to foster the boy's talent, how you brought him here to New York, how everything was wrapped up in that boy and his novel. 
Doesn't it bother you that the manuscript is missing? Well, I... Do you have it? No, no, I don't. Did you destroy it? Did you? Well, what difference does it make? I'm just curious to know what the novel is about, that's all. I burned it before I read it. As soon as I got it here, I tore it up and burned it. That was the first part of it, wasn't it? Huh? What? To destroy everything about the boy. Destroy somebody you loved? How can you say that? You loved him, all right. Only he was going to marry Peg Ramsey. Did he show you the marriage license? Oh, he was never going to marry that girl. He just wanted his novel published, that's all. I don't know. Marriage license usually means marriage. They were going to keep it secret, but they told you because you deserved to know. Deserve to know. Do you know why they told me to be cruel to me? To laugh at me? To slap me in the face with it? So you killed her. Do you know what she said to me? Do you know what that girl said to me? I'll pay you for the train fare you spent to bring him to New York. <laughs> Even if I had killed her, could you blame me? But the boy you said you loved him. Him. Sitting there when I came into the room. I was ready to forgive him everything. I walked over to him, put my hands around his back. He shrugged him off. Kept writing. Writing a note to a girl who was dead. Did you ever hear anything as crazy as that? A note to a dead girl. We thought it was a suicide note. Then he went over to the bed and he sprawled out and put his hands behind his head and then he stared at me. He stared hate at me. Because you killed Peg Ramsey? He knew it and he didn't go to the police. That made me think he still loved me. Why didn't he go to the police? Because he knew I'd crawl back to him. He wanted me there so he could tell me how much hate he had for me. How much he despised me. You didn't give him a chance. You destroyed him. Everything that he touched, you destroyed. And the final thing to ride on the train... And he'd be back there, with the baggage, the litter, and the animals. Let's go, Mrs. Kirk. No one's going to do that to me. What he did, not to me. Who did he think he was? Let's go. Night bursts open like a sudden flame on Broadway. The crowd swarm dances between the silhouettes of a thousand buildings. Dances its fury away against the time of morning until the night soaks up the sound and pain and color and turns it into dawn. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Betty Lou Gerson was heard as Janice Kirk. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Steve Roberts, and David Wolfe. sing the praises of running brooks, babbling brooks, and he who brooks no evil. But you'll sing the praises yourself of Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, Sunday nights on most of these same CBS radio stations. As Connie Brooks, Eve Arden is sometimes running after a man, often babbling about men. And she brooks no evil that interferes with her pursuit of a man. So maybe the poets should sing her praises, too. Our Miss Brooks is fun to hear Sunday nights on CBS Radio. Bill Anders speaking, and remember, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy open fire on your funny bone Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network.
Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. From somewhere beyond the threshold of neon, the happy holidays beckon to Broadway. And the wilderness of plastic and chrome dons its ribbons of tinsel. Garlands of evergreen are hung against the shriek of subways. And behind plate glass, puppets with shrewd mechanisms perform their frenetic dance. The metallic music flows out of the horns of loudspeakers. The women walk slow, sway gently to its holiday rhythms. And everywhere, the image of gaiety is reflected in spangles that whirl on winter's wind. So paint the grin across your mouth, kid. It's the merry time. And somewhere within it, a phone call, a drunken voice that pleads you into a desolate, wind-littered street, into a tenement scarred with shadows, into a room also desolate. A man sprawled on the floor in drunkenness, his arm flung toward the woman who lies away from him, his fingers reaching, trying to touch her dead face. And the other man who clings to your lapel has waited there only so he could tell you about it. That bruiser had nothing to do with it, doesn't it? I called it in. I waited here for you. Me, along with those two, just so as I could tell you about it. Who are you? Bob. Robert Coker. I got a wife and a good name. I don't want to get mixed up in this mister. The woman? That's Mrs. Baker, Charlie's wife. Boy, has that boy got a hangover waiting for him when he comes to. Imagine, you and Charlie, you're enjoying yourself. You get invited in for a little nightcap. You walk in, and there's Mrs. Baker lying on the floor, her head all twisted like that. She was strangled. Yeah, yeah, that's how I figured it, too. When we walked in, saw her, I said, look, Charlie, boy, look at your missus. And Charlie kind of yelped like a dog or something, tried to make it to her. But he passed out on the way. I never touched the mister. Honest, I didn't. You and Mr. I... Baker were out together, then you came home? Yeah, but not like you think. We were to the office party. Charlie and me, we got adjoining desks. Big deal, office party. Booze and paper cups. Dance a little with the steno you've been wanting to touch all year. Then you take Charlie boy home and... And look, mister. Okay, if I go home now. I done everything could be expected. Okay, Call your wife, but... Mr. Culker. Tell her you won't be home for a while. And wait, then. Watch the barrier of faces form at the doorway, the same faces that gather always when sudden death is done. Faces tempered only by the quality of shirts, neckties, and hairdos. Quality this time, tenement, frayed. And in a while, the medical examiner, the nod toward the dead, the black satchel opened, and the stethoscope that hears no heartbeat. The official pronouncement that a woman named Lucille Baker, age about 32, married, no children, had been strangled to death. And the other nod to the two men who had been found with her. Take them along. Get out. Go. And back to the office. Give orders to interview everyone at the party. Turn Mr. Baker over to the officer whose extracurricular duty includes the sobering of suspects. Question Mr. Coker again. His story sticks. Then a door opens and a very sober man walks in. I don't believe what they just told me. I don't believe... What are you doing here, Bob? I just told them what happened. I told them we came back to your place. You wait outside, Mr. Colgan. Sure. Sure, whatever you say. Just take it easy, Charlie boy. Sit down, Mr. Baker. Your wife is dead. Lucille. I want you to try to tell me just what happened tonight. Uh, the office party, I... I went there. I was having a fine time. Yes, I was. I was having a wonderful time. Look, it was the end of the day, and at first I wanted to go home, but they wouldn't let me. They said, look at all this free booze. Lap it up and forget it. And now... now, Go on. Well, I tried to call Lucille three or four times. I don't know how many times to tell her I was having a good time, not to wait up for me, but the line was always busy. What else do you remember? Bob said, come on, let's go home. When we got there, that last thing I remember, Lucy lying there. I was saying to myself, just like this, I am drunk. You, you think you see all sorts of things when you're drunk, and this is one of them. That's, that's not Lucy. I'm not even home now. I wake up and it. <laughs> And 
And the room shorn suddenly of everything but a man sobbing. And this is only one in the long array of grieving that has been displayed you over the last years. The grief for the love dead, sometimes with laughter of strange texture. With silence sometimes, anguish, bitter. And sometimes this, like this man's. And always the walking away from it. And release him and his friend, Bob Colker. Go home. Sleep. And next morning, back to the tenement where a woman had been strangled. Ask questions through inch-open doors. And the children of the tenement shrivel away from you as if you were a cold wind. The doors that are never opened to you. The furtive whispers and scurrying behind them. The giggles. And finally, at the mention of the dead Mrs. Baker's name, a woman who begins a weeping suitable for police callers invites you in. Oh, that poor, poor creature. Taken from us like that, choked like that, cast away. Please, won't you come in? I'm Ruthie Alexander. Let's just shut the door, shall we? My neighbor's curious, nosy, so pathetically nosy. May I get you something? Hot chocolate tea? Something with a bite to it? Uh, No, thank you. You knew Mrs. Baker? I knew Lucille. Better than... How awful to be a man and have to suffer weeping women. You were saying you knew Mrs. Baker well. Better than she knew herself. The promises life offered that girl. Although Lucille wasn't pretty, mind you. Not in the real sense of the word. But she had her qualities hidden, kind of. Sly. It intrigued you men. You're saying that she... Nothing of the sort. Why, Lucille, the poor unimaginative creature, and I say this of her, and I was her best friend, mind you, and have the right. Lucille backed away from men. I honestly think they frightened her. She was married to a husband who loved her. Of course he did. Of course he did. Why shouldn't he? She could have even had a man like Teddy Fletcher. Teddy was dying for her. Lucille told me all about it. Fletcher? A fellow who works at the Dorsey Company where Lucille's husband worked. I told her so many times, a man like that, Lucy, they don't grow on bushes. They... You know something? What? That Lucille. She was a deep one. Sly, like I said, I wonder... I just wonder if she and Teddy... (laughs) How awful of me. (laughs) But will you have a cigarette at least? I'll light it for you. Draw the first puff. And refuse the kind offer. King-sized, cork-tipped, gratis and all. Give her back her solitude. Leave her to her tearless weeping. Now she'd have something really to cry about. She'd wasted a cigarette. To the offices of the Dorsey Novelty Company, Incorporated Limited. Be greeted, be given a catalog concerning current novelties. Be frowned at because I didn't want it. Be listened to, be ushered past the office force and slogans about geniuses at work and courtesy and cleanliness and accuracy. And be shown to a cubicle. Yeah? Mr. Fletcher? Yeah, what is it? I'm Danny Clover from the police. I'm expecting somebody from down there. Sit down, please. Thanks, sir. I'm trying to get some information. I know, I know. All right, you know. Tell me what you know. Just one thing. You think I killed Lucille? Did you? I was in love with her. Did you kill her? I just told you I was in love with her for two years now. I built my plans around her, day-to-day plans. That adds up to being my life, doesn't it? You think I killed her? It'd be like killing myself, wouldn't it? All right, we'll go on the premise you didn't kill her, Mr. Fletcher. Tell me about last night. I was at the party. Everybody got loaded. Not me. You don't drink, huh? Now, when it's better to stay sober. Last night was such a time. Oh, why? Last night, Charlie Baker was here getting tanked. Last night, Lucille Baker was home being lonely. Then you left the party because her husband was here and went over to see her. Is that it? It's the way I planned it. It didn't work. You going to tell me why? Yeah. I called Lucille from here during the party a lot of times. She said... I'm a wife with a husband. Stay where you are. Admirable, huh? A wife, if it killed her, then it killed her. Then you gave up and went home. I needed solace. I found Isabel by the water cooler. Isabel? Isabel Mitchell, pal and buddy, sweater and skirt. We smiled at each other over paper cups, linked arms, and went to her place. Drank and did childish things like pin the tail of the donkey. 
Drank. 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 Your alibi, huh? I want to talk to her. I guess she's still at home getting rid of last night's head. She didn't show up today. Nice kid. Where does she live? Two rooms on West 37th, 905, apartment 2. Look, Mr. Clover, that Hamilton wall clock says noon, and it's never wrong. You're not going to join me for lunch, are you? Thanks a lot. And the ride now to West 37th, to the block of the brownstones and the low rent and the corner grocery store. And next to the tailor shop that advertised proudly how it had held the line since 1950, find the number, 905. Walk past the door to apartment one, and a few steps more to apartment two. Apartment of Isabel Mitchell. Knock and get no answer. And open a door, walk in. The living room decorated in row house decor. Dregs of last night's drinks, Coolidge modern and empty. And the kitchen. The lights still burning, the perpetual distant sound in the exposed water pipes. And strung from them, the girl. The girl twisting this way and back. Only slightly. The lifeless girl. The murdered girl. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Confidentially, Edgar Bergen has a split personality, and it's hard to say whether he's funnier as the harassed Bergen or as that saucy figment of his own imagination who does the harassing, Charlie McCarthy. We leave it to you to figure out, between the laughs, every Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations when you hear Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. In the days before Christmas, Broadway puts on its flashy clothes and the flashy smile. Everybody's on his way to con Santa Claus. The blonde who walks with you stops to adjust her nylons in front of the jewelry store. The brunette who tells you to pick her up for lunch in the lingerie department. The redhead who behaved all year long. And while the reindeer dash across the tundra of the spectaculars, the recruits from the Bowery shake their little bells and nod lovingly at tiny tots. Get out the Christmas list, kid. That's where your friends have been all year long. And at headquarters, consider other things. Official musings. The dying of Lucille Baker, a woman strangled. Consider what chain of circumstance led from her to the murder of another, Isabel Mitchell. Consider... And be interrupted by a police sergeant named Gino Tartaglia, who sometimes had things in his mind. I got a headache, Danny. I'm sorry to hear that. Why don't you take an aspirin? Such condolences are touching, Danny, and I thank you for them. However, my symptoms are psychosomatic. Psychosomatic. A word Mrs. Tartaglia read to me last night, from a book. It's the type headache which is prone to deep thinkers. So science explained to Mrs. T, and she to me. You've been thinking deeply, Gina? Indeedy. As concerns the current situation in the murder of Lucille Baker, and the subsequent same of Miss Isabel Mitchell. Oh? A theory to wit. Mr. Ted Fletcher is a killer. Murdered the woman whom he loved, Mrs. Baker. Then murdered the girl he flirted with, Isabel Mitchell. But Isabel was his alibi, Gina. Why should he murder her? I got my headache making it sound reasonable to me, Danny. But I think I know why he killed Miss Mitchell. Yeah, I can think of a reason, too. You mean, like that, so soon? Well, it'd figure, Gino. You tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. The way it stands now, Gino, Fletcher can't account for his actions of last night. Nobody remembers when he left the party. Let's just assume he left with Miss Mitchell. He took her home and left her... You've been peeking into my brain, Danny. He left her, went to see Mrs. Baker, killed her. Came back to Miss Mitchell and asked her to be his alibi. She refused. Indeed, Danny, indeed. So she was the only one who knew he was a killer. She refused to help him. He killed her. Our theories make a lot of sense, don't they? Maybe. Have Fletcher picked up, Gino. Uh, I'm going out. Okay, Danny. Uh, Where can I reach you if I need you? At that novelty office. Maybe I can find out why that happy party had so much murder in it. You're the guy who told the girl you're a detective? That's right. Show me, show me. 
Girls get impressed with guys who show them shiny badges. Don't bother to read the small print. All they care is that a muscle man with a favor to ask. You through with it? Yeah. Take back your badge. I produce novelties like that by the carload. Just had to be sure you weren't giving the girl a fast shuffle. Some questions I want to ask you, Mr. Dorsey. About time you got around to me, huh? It just so happens I'm the head man in this little enterprise. Maybe the personnel didn't get around to telling you. They didn't need to. I saw your publicity on the wrapping paper. Yeah. You had a little confab with Ted Fletcher, the girls tell me. Sorry, it didn't occur to me I need your permission. Oh, it's not that, kid. It's just that I got a happy enterprise here. You walk in, talk murder talk, it spreads gloom. Everybody gets unhappy until I think of something. The office party the other night, that was one of your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Happened to be my birthday. I let it be known in a loud voice. And before long, the personnel is pitching dimes into a kitty. A good time was had by all. What did you think of? Who? Ted Fletcher. Personally, I can't stand the guy. Good worker, but I can't stand him. What do you think of him? Just keep talking. Fletcher. Not much to look at, but oh, you kid, what he does to the emotions of the ever-loving opposite sex. You know what I mean? You gotta agree, because you got him tabbed for killing Mrs. Baker, I understand. I tell you, it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Charles Baker works for you, too. Give me your thoughts on him. Baker's a good boy, nose to the grindstone type. I got a lot of plans for him. Been to his home, made his impress the boss type of food. Met his wife, the former Mrs. Baker. Yeah, and do you have an opinion? Mm-hmm. Dull woman, plain, boring. You know Baker's better off without her, in my opinion. I tell you, because you asked. And Isabel Mitchell, who also worked for you, who was also at your birthday party, who was strangled, murdered. Hmm. Kind girl. Had a kind word for everybody, but everybody. Prove it to you. Fletcher meets her at the water cooler at my party. Isabel gives him the kind word. Fletcher takes her home. That was a busy, busy night for Fletcher, wasn't it, guy? Anything else, Mr. Dorsey? That cuts it as far as I'm concerned. You too, huh? I bet you got loads of things to do, just like me. So goodbye, huh, guy? Yes? Is it all right if I just walk in here into your office? Of course. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'm Lois Nolan. Yes? I work at the Dorsey Novelty Company in the office. I run an IBM machine, time study cards. I don't guess you noticed me, did you? Well, seems that I do. I guess you're wearing another dress. No, I was wearing this dress. You just didn't notice, that's all. Well, why have you come here, Miss Nolan? I wasn't at the party last night, so your men haven't questioned me. I see, and you want to be questioned, is that it? Well, I was a friend of Isabel's. You were? Though we had differences of opinion, as they say, about friends, boyfriends. Personally, I like fellows from whom I can better myself. And Isabel... Yeah. She was not the discriminate type. Life, she once said, was a laugh and a song. Look what it got her, some laugh. Yes, well, now if you'll pardon me, Miss Some Nolan. laugh. If you knew where I just came from, you wouldn't say some laugh. Where did you just come from, Miss Nolan? From her uncle's house. In buckets, that's the way he was crying. He didn't say a word. But if you could have seen his eyes, those tears. Then he said, Lois, I cannot cry anymore. Isabel was a good girl, and now she is gone. I didn't know she had a family. No one's claimed Because Isabel's. that man is a nervous wreck. After all, Isabel did for him. Where does her uncle live? In Brooklyn. 2020 Stockton Street. I hope I've been of some help, since Isabel was a dear friend of mine. I was, I was always broad-minded enough to forgive the things. You've been a great help, Miss Nolan. Thank you very much. And the house in Brooklyn. Like all the other houses in the long file, the peeling paint, the sagging porch, the parlor curtains drawn aside to reveal a Christmas wreath, then drawn further to permit a clearer view of the man who walks their quiet street. And having noted your passing, open their windows, crane to see at whose door you'll knock. Then in faraway voices, announce it to friends, relatives, and neighbors. The voices drain away. Then, for a moment, the stillness is almost complete, except for the wailing of vessels in the harbor, the cry of wind trapped against street lamps. Then, break it. And the man in the woolen sweater... Wonders at you with pale eyes, washed away eyes. Oh, you must be from the mission. I phoned. I have the magazines all tied and ready. There. I'm uh, from the police. About Isabel. Yes. Oh, come in. Come in. You'll take your death of cold. 
I haven't been to claim her body because I didn't know if it was right. I'm just her uncle, and Isabel moved away from me over a year ago. I thought maybe she'd got someone closer to her. That's than... not why I came. Oh, no? Then why? Well, I thought maybe you could help us. Maybe you could tell us things about her that'll help us find her murderer. Isabel came here to live with us when her mother died. Then my wife died and Isabel stayed on. It was nice when she was here. And then she went away. Well, tell me about it, Mr. Clayton. It was nice, gay, exciting. Young men called on her, brought her things, brought me cigars, sat and talked with me while they waited for her to dress. She was pretty, real pretty, worth waiting for. Do you remember the men who called on her? No, no, just boys, nice-looking fellows. And you haven't seen Isabel since she left? Oh, huh? yes, I didn't say that. I saw her many times, but only quickly. I'd call her and tell her to come pick up little things I had for her. Oh? Things, presents. They weren't really from me. They were from this nice fella. He must have liked Isabel a whole lot. You know how I know? Well, tell me. Well, he'd bring her these things and make me promise not to tell Isabel they were from him. He said he'd tell her when the time came when he was ready to. And, and I'd say, Charlie? Charlie. Yeah, Charlie Baker. Nice fella. You know, he made me tell Isabel I was giving her those things. Look at me. What would I have to give a girl like Isabel? This is the first time I've been in a place like this, Mr. Clover. I've passed the jail many times, but I've never been in. These are just the detention cells, Mr. Baker. Detention cells? You mean they're not permanent? You're not sure about Fletcher? Fletcher was picked up as a suspect, and that's still all he is. He's a killer. We'll find out. I still don't know why I'm here. I want to put your story together with his. Oh, then you'll know, huh? Then we'll know. Oh, Fletcher's sleeping. With a conscience like his. Look at him. All right, come on, Fletcher. Wake up. Wake up, killer. On your feet. I brought you a visitor, Fletcher. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. That what you got to say to me? You my friend killer. Break it up. I said, break it up. Yeah. What am I, crazy, dirty my hands on him? You know what they got for you, killer? A chair. And you're going to sit in it. Fletcher, I told Baker how it was between you and his wife, Lucille. I'm glad you did. We were going to tell him we didn't get a chance. Lover boy. Killer boy. I didn't kill her. Is that what he keeps telling you, Mr. Clover? Uh-huh. That's why you just keep him in the detention cell, huh? That's right. Look, Charlie. All right, I'm looking. You've got to understand, Charlie, about Lucille and me. I loved her. She loved me. If we could have worked it out, I would have married her. Loved her? Loved Lucille? You? She wasn't a beautiful woman, Charlie. You know that. She was a gentlewoman. Talking with her, you, you weren't afraid of the world anymore. Well, Fletcher, if that's what she did to you, that's what she did to you. Didn't she do that to you, Baker? You were pretty broken up when she died. Did you ever have a wife who was murdered, Mr. Clover? No? Then don't tell me how it should feel. You and my wife, huh, Fletch? I didn't kill her. I swear I didn't kill her, Charlie. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. What happened last night, Fletch? Lucille waved you goodbye and you let your emotions run away with you? It was all over and you couldn't remember a thing, so you say you didn't kill her? Is that what happened, Mr. Fletcher? I told you what happened. Get him out of here. Just a few more things. About a girl who worked at your office, also murdered Isabel Mitchell. You had your hands full last night, didn't you, killer? I ask you, get him out of here. No, I want him to hear something. There's another way this thing adds up. You could have killed your wife, Baker. What are you talking about? I was at the party. Everybody knows that. Everybody will vouch for me. I don't know. A party like that. People coming in and out. Nobody remembers much about anything. Are you building something, Mr. Clover? Maybe. You could have left the party long enough to kill your wife, then go back to it. No one would have known the difference. Then play drunk, have a friend take you home, find your wife dead. Have a seat, Charlie. 
You might as well. His cots take a little while to get used to. Now listen, Clover. You... Then early the next morning, cry on my shoulder, be released, go around to Isabel's place and whisper to her the happy news about your wife's being dead. You're crazy. Why would I go to her? Because you were crazy about her. Crazy about her? Isabel? <laughs> Isabel! <laughs> what are you laughing at? He's right, Fletcher. You shouldn't laugh. Mr. Baker was crazy about Isabel. Gave her presents. What are you talking about? But on the sly. Isabel didn't even know where they came from. After you've gotten rid of your wife, you could tell her, huh, Baker? But she wouldn't have any part of you. You killed her. <laughs> In love with Isabel. Her? A girl like that? Oh, Charlie, you stupid man. A girl like that when you had your own wife. Shut up! Shut up, shut up! Isabel was sweet and she was wonderful. You know how I know? She wouldn't look at me because I was married. That's the kind of a girl she was. She was good. I killed my wife for her and she took pity on me. She was good. But she still wouldn't look at you, so you killed her. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I had no more to live for. Why should she go on living? Why should somebody else have her? Who else would have done for her what I did for her? Nobody. Just me. And she didn't want me. And she had to die. It's an enchanted island, this Broadway, or a desert of dust. Look at it, and it's a magician's pitch with golden mirrors and fountains that plume with jewels. Then you blink, it all dissolves. It's a crumbling wall, corroded with pain. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calford as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Featured in tonight's cast were William Conrad, Harry Bartell, Peggy Weber, Lou Merrill, and Herb Butterfield. All the best fun-making from Arthur Godfrey's daytime shows on CBS Radio. That's what you hear every Sunday afternoon on most of these stations when King Arthur Godfrey and his round table hold court. Hear it tomorrow afternoon. And remember to enjoy King Arthur Godfrey and his round table every Sunday afternoon on CBS Radio. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, those lovable rascals Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. Jeff Regan, investigator, hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the man who lived by the sea. The next 
time you're out for a drive, pick up Olive Street along about the 700 block. You can't miss it. It's a big building made out of white granite. The Cosmopolitan Building. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, rents an office there. International Detective Bureau, Suite 308. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. The Lion has the only desk in the office and the typewriter that Remington dropped from their catalog back in 1915. I walked in about 11 o'clock last Tuesday morning. The room was loaded with taboo. She was a tall girl with a flock of black hair and a mink coat. The kind you see driving a Nash convertible down Sunset Boulevard on warm Sunday afternoons. No wonder the Lion's cigar was out. It was wet on both ends. He had one arm around her shoulders. He knew by this time that coat was the real article. There wasn't any music, but he didn't seem to mind. Come on in, Regan. Not much room to dance. We got business. She's your date. This is Mr. Regan, Miss Cara. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon tells me you're just the man I want. Well, he said the same thing to a mortician last week. Miss Cara is associated with the famous psychic consultant, Prince Nemo. I help the prince look into people's minds. Well, that ought to be fun if all your customers are under six. You don't believe in thought transference, Mr. Reek? Do you? Uh, Prince Nemo sent Miss Cara to retain an operator. Why didn't he come himself? Prince Nemo never appears in public. He misses some good ball games. He has television. Yeah. The prince prefers to spend his time in meditation and thought. I handle all of his outside contacts. Regan, I want you to drive out to Prince Nemo's home in Ocean Town with Miss Cara and speak to the prince. What kind of a retainer did he send you? We don't discuss finances in front of clients. Oh, this is another blind spot. You don't know what this guy wants? He said it's a very delicate matter and he wants to explain it to you himself. Oh, sure. She waltzed in here with a check and you'd sell your grandmother to a glue factory for two bucks. Is there any way I can reassure you, Mr. Regan? Buy me a battleship. You got a license and a contract with International. You want to tell me about it, lady? Prince Nemo was very excited this morning. He called me in and told me to make the arrangements. It's not enough script. He never tells me anything. I just work for him. Will you please? Yeah, all right. Here's a nickel. Call me and tell me what's up. Suppose I can't. Then you got something for your piggy bank. The lion stood there and watched us leave. He looked happy, like a hobo in a bubble bath. Well, we went downstairs. We climbed into her convertible. The guy in the parking lot had to take a walk around the block when she flashed him a smile. I asked her about lunch. She said no. I asked her about dinner. She said something that meant no. It's like that sometimes. The flag's up, the meter's ticking, and you get nowhere. But from a couple of things she told me, I got the idea that she was doing more than help the prince read minds. His place turned out to be a good hour from Los Angeles up 101. A couple of stories of glass and concrete leaning out over the ocean. Inside, a guy in a white turban and some pants that looked like oversized diapers put his hand on a big curved knife he had in his belt. He was wearing tennis shoes. Right this way, Mr. Regan. Uh, butcher? That's Gini, the prince's manservant. He's from India. I bet the Indians are glad to get rid of him. Gini's harmless, tongueless, and he doesn't hear. I like you, Mr. Regan. This is the prince's study. Come in. Oh, come in. This is Mr. Regan. Of course. Welcome, sir. Welcome. The lion's eye. I'm honored, sir. Please sit down. That'll be all, Lena? Of course. I'll be in my office. Charming girl, Lena. She handled all your outside contacts? Except for those matters I must attend to personally. Mr. Regan, I'm in trouble. It's paid for. I want you to save my life. We'll look healthy. I am healthy, let me assure you. But my life has been threatened. They got police department. I thought you understood. This is a delicate matter. We aren't here to discuss me. Who's the guy? It's a lady, Mr. Regan. A very beautiful and lovely creature. And she'd like nothing better than to see my carcass go out with the tide. How do you know? She's erratic, ill-tempered, and ruthless. Any more? Yeah, she called me this morning and told me what she intended to do. You got a chance to reach for your gun. To reach for you, Mr. Regan. Now, I feel the entire matter could be settled amicably if you were to call on her and inform her you are my personal bodyguard and that you are here to protect my life. What makes you figure she'd go for that? It's worth a try. And besides, I'm paying. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me how long you've been blackmailing her. Blackmail? 
What do you mean? Oh, your racket might last six months, a year, but not long enough to build a place like this. The answer's blackmail. My dear fellow, I... Okay, okay, so I should have told you. Give it to me. Well, I can slip them into a trance. They spill a family secret or two. What kind of secret? Any kind. They want their minds read. I read them 25 bucks a hit. Where does the shakedown come in? When I tell them what they told me. You've been putting a squeeze on her? She's an actress. She was in on a deal with the studios. And she won't shake. She said she'd blow my head off. Look, I'm in a spot, Rick, and she's the kind who'd do it and make love to the jury. Give me a name. Doris Patrick. Never heard of her? Where'd she live? Palisades. Here's her address. All right. You going over to talk to her now? Well, she isn't gunning for me. Oh, thanks a lot, Regan. You know, I've been sweating. It's real good for a cold. Yeah, I'll try and catch one. You guys yell real loud when they answer back. I'm just thinking of my future, Regan. I won't look good dead. I left him sitting there scratching his bald head under his turban. He looked unhappy like somebody fed him a Vaseline sandwich. Well, I climbed in my car and I followed the highway to the turnoff back to Sunset. A Malibu fog was coming in for the winter and by the time I got to the address Nemo had given me, I was looking around for my hands. Doris Patrick's place was too big for a marble game and too small for football. There was a wire fence all around it and a sign every 15 or 20 feet or so that said not to trespass. I parked in the boulevard and walked up the driveway. It was about then that a guy in a blue suit showed up. He was tall and heavy, and he thought a lot of his hat. He pulled down on the brim, blew smoke in my face, and kind of nudged me with his shoulder. Well, boy, Pilgrim, we don't want any. How do you know? We're waiting for the 49s. Scram, huh? You aren't even on the list. All right, we'll wait for the 50s. Blow. I came to see Doris Patrick. Yeah, what for? You, her? <laughs> sure. What do you want? Business. Shop closed. You always like this, or you miss lunch today? Look, I don't know who you are, Pilgrim, but you don't understand English. Well, I know you. There's something about a guy in a lineup. Yeah? He memorizes easy. Cop? Private. Private as city, you all smell the same to me. Hunting season's over. You always carry a 38, do you? Oh, that's showing? Well, maybe you got a broken rib. <laughs> well, I met all kinds of funny guys. I said I wanted to see her. Ain't in. Watchdog? Now you're getting smart. Well, you aren't. What kind of crack is that? Just this, I'm going in. Trick I learned a long time ago. You shoot a guy in the knee and he don't ever walk straight again. Ever done it, punk? Oh, sure. That's how I learned. Mm -hmm. That's when I learned, baby. He slumped against the side of the wall and he looked tired like he'd been running from Compton. Well, I left him there and I went up the driveway to the porch. Coming around a blind corner, I bumped into something that kind of relaxed and rolled into me. It was a blonde girl, about 25, in a white polo coat. Well, I was willing to try it again, but she began talking with a voice that was deep enough to go in the oil business. <coughs> oh, I thought you might be running interference, but you look like the whole team. Whose side are you on, lady? I keep score. Doris Patrick? You're on the right field. Where's the locker room? Maybe I like you. Where do you come from? Right here. Hmm. Didn't know we raised your kind anymore. Or did you go wild? Do I pass? What'd you say your name was? Regan. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Which highway? Straight ahead. To the den. It's a nice place you got. When's harvest time? I said welcome. That isn't what the tall boy said. Tall boy? A blue suit with a thirty-eight and a hat. <laughs> That'd be Jesse. I was married to him once. What about now? Oh, he hangs around like that sometimes. I never see much of him. Trouble? No, not much. You got a lot of size, mister. Must have been good. Do that kind of thing often? Only when I have to. Sit down. How do you like it? Hmm? Soda or uh, water? Your way. There now. Isn't that better? I don't know. This is my first drink. You'll get another. It's a cold day. Not in here. You're quick. Must have a good straight man. His name's Prince Nemo. Must we talk about him? He thinks you're dangerous stuff. What do you think? Right now or when I'm a couple of feet away? No. Hey, now look. Remember me? I just got here. Your name's Regan and we're going to get along. Yeah. It's in the car. You've got a fast deck. Go ahead. Deal. All right. Hmm. How much time between rounds? Yes. Who? 
Oh, just a minute. You know somebody named Lion? Yeah. He has quite a roar. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Who's the neighbor? Where's the phone? Nemo's friend. Sounds like he's a friend of yours. All right, you got something to say? It's all off. Check, bounce. It was certified. Nemo called ten minutes ago and canceled a contract. Well, what happens now? Finish, come back to the office. Who told you I was here? The prince. It was a quick change. We got paid. Well, I already started something. I don't care what you started. You finish it on your own time and expense sheet. Yeah. Bad news? Well, I'm through working for the day. Well, I was an old friend of the family when I left. She didn't want me to go, but I was thinking about Prince Nemo and uh, the way that nothing made sense. Oh, the whole thing looked phony, like an undertaker in a white derby. It didn't take 20-20 vision to see that somebody was getting anxious to make a play. Now, by the time I got home, I figured I was out of it. But my company had other ideas. It was Jesse, and he had friends. You should lock your door, Regan. Why? You'd crawl under. All right, fellas. Friends? Yeah, I just hired him. You got a parade permit? Stan, say hello to Regan. Hello, stupid. What about Skinny? Oh, you Grogan. Name's Regan. He's a detective. Isn't that right? <laughs> You're pretty good with your women, Regan. You know, you look lonesome, Jesse. You got something to say? Stay away from it. You're shaking. You want a drink? Already had one. Stan, Skinny, set him on a bed. Let me go. Oh, Regan, once more. Once more. Stay away from it. You said that before. I want to make sure you understand. Stan, Skinny, hold his arms. <laughs> I've said all the right words. Maybe my punctuation's bad, huh? Lay off. Period. Lay off. Period. Lay off. Period. <laughs> okay. Okay, leave him on the bed. Hey, he rolled off. Now, that's fine. Fine. <laughs> now he won't have to change his sheets. Oh, Jesse was good. When I got up, my face looked like a relief map of Pasadena. He was wearing a signet ring. He left out some of the boulevards, but the Rose Bowl was right out in front. I found a drink in the cabinet, and I started for the mirror to see what was left. It was about then I heard a knock on the door. It was a little guy in a cab driver's suit. It figured that he got the job because they ran out of big uniforms. They double-crossed him on that cab. If it wasn't for his ears, he'd have been wearing a snood. Hiya. Yeah? Football? What do you want? Your name, Regan. That's what it says in the mailbox. I'm not a friend of yours today. Get to the point, will you? A dame. Named Lee McCara. Yeah, Lee McCara. Some dish. All right, you're in the register. Wait, wait, that ain't all she wants to see you. What about? Didn't say. Just had to see if you was home. You home? Yeah. I got her down in my camp. We'll send her up. I don't think she can make it. What do you mean? She looks kind of funny. Maybe you better come down. She was sitting on the edge of the seat, staring out at nothing. Her back was as stiff as a filing cabinet, and there was a little ring of white around her lips. I paid off the cabbie, and I took her back up to my place without a word. When we closed the door, she was sitting on my sofa the same way. Only this time, she had a twenty-five automatic in her hand. Well... Well? Where'd you get the gun, lady? Gun? Oh, yes. I bought it for $30. Can I see it? Oh, yes, Mr. Egan. I brought it so I could show it to you. Mm-hmm. I paid $30 for it. I paid $30 for it. Yep. It's brand new, isn't it? Oh, yes, of course. Did you know Prince Nemo was my husband? Since when? Long time now. Not many people know that. Did you come here to tell me that? No. No, I came to tell you that you don't have to worry anymore. About what? About what my husband hired you for? Well, I've already been called off. Oh. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you meet Doris Patrick? Yeah. And it was about her. What do you want, lady? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Just that we, we, we don't have to worry anymore, do we? Tell me about the gun. Doris is very pretty, don't you think? I've seen her on the screen many times. And she's quite pretty. Could hardly blame the prince at all. 
the part. Why'd you bring the gun? I imagine the air would be cleaner there, don't you? What are you talking about? It's really very humane, they tell me. Come on, stop it. It's just like sitting down and never waking up. I read all about it. Just walk in and sit down. If you don't try to hold your breath... Stop it, sis, stop it. Now listen to me. What is it? What have you done? What are you trying to say? Don't try to hold your breath. You go right to sleep, don't you? You're trying to tell me that you killed him? They, they don't make such a great deal of noise, do they? I left him sitting there in his house by the sea. He looked very much alive. Only... 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 He isn't alive at all. <laughs> tell me, Mr. Reagan. Tell me. Do I make a good murder? Do I? Do I? Well, after she got through screaming, she settled down to a slow, even kind of giggle that started somewhere around her shoelaces and didn't get past her knees. It gave me a feeling like somebody was unwrapping an atomic bomb under a Christmas tree. Well... She wasn't going to do any more talking, so I went downstairs and brought back a doctor friend of mine named Sammy Wing. He had his little black bag with him, and he gave her a shot of something. She wilted like last night's orchid and went to sleep. Sammy wrote down a couple of things, and then he looked up at me. Some playmate. Wish I'd have been here for the party. How is she, Sam? You know her better than me. No, is she going to be all right? Mm, in four or five hours, she'll wake up and want some water. And then what? She might ask you what happened, or it might start all over again. By the way, what was it? I don't know. She came over to see me. I should have visitors like this. I've been working too hard. She said she killed a guy who was a client of mine. Maybe I'm lucky at that. Why the past tense? The lion called me off the case. Official, huh? Yeah. And you've got nobody to protect. Where's the corpse? At a house in Ocean Town. Here. Call the police. And you and me can go out and do our Christmas shopping. Oh, she said she used this gun. A twenty-five, it killed people. No, Sammy, there's a bullet jammed in the chamber. James, don't know how to reload. It hasn't been fired. Ballistics got better ways of telling. She's pretty and she's nice, and I'll bet she looks like a million bucks in a bathing suit. But if I'd have met her within the last three hours, I'd have run for help. Was that professional? Acute hysteria. The kind that pops off guns and people and does a lot of things they can't remember later on. Call Sanducci. Look, it doesn't figure she'd do it with this. Maybe she had another one. While you're at it, call the coroner. Tell him to go out there with some DOA forms. No, I'm going first. Corpse hunt? Just an idea. La Brucherie had an idea. Yeah. This dame's bipped somebody, and she's told you her story. Well, I don't like it. What do they do when a private eye messes up an open and shut murder case? Sammy, stay with her, will you? There's some bourbon out in the kitchen. <sighs> Maybe both of us will get our pictures in the papers. I left him sitting there. He looked sad, like a water buffalo caught in a drought. I pushed through the fog for about 40 minutes, and I pulled up in front of Nemo's place in Ocean Town about 9.30. It was dark enough to give a ghost to creeps. I used that ring of keys that I'd taken from her purse, and I went inside. It smelled dry and still, like somebody was waiting for the world to fall apart. I clicked on my flash, and I walked down the long hall to his office. Well, he was there, just like she said. And there were three holes in the front of his shirt, close range, but it wasn't the laundry's fault. He'd been dead maybe two hours. The desk drawer showed some canceled checks made out to Doris Patrick. While I was thinking that over, I spotted a 38 Smith & Wesson on the floor by his hand. Lena had been carrying a 25. I broke it, and three cartridges fell out. From the looks of the holes in his chest, the 38 was the gun for the job. Well, that made her story and the 25 a fairy tale. While I was kneeling there, a light went on behind me. A fat man wearing a sheriff's star was standing by the switch. A tall leather jacket with a flashlight in his hand was in front of me. I began to feel helpless, like a trombone player with a short arm. Scavenger hunt, son. He don't talk, Charlie. Ain't much for him to say, is there, Cap? Yes, not. Well, son. You're going to be calling me names. Who do you like best? Killer, murderer, slayer? Papers use slayer a lot. I don't like any of them. Kind of breezy for a hot boy, ain't you? Uh, you mind giving me a name? Regan. I'm with the International Detective Bureau. It's Regan, Cap. He's with the International Detective Bureau. Got a card or something, son? Yeah. Here. Uh, this guy here, a friend of yours? My client, Lawrence. What'd you do for him? 
Okay, tell me this. Why'd you plug him? There's another story. Any good? Better than the one you got. You'll have a hard time selling it. It's a fix. Oh, why you want to say a thing like that? How long you been on the force? Easy, Regan. Me and Cap's being nice. Phone call a little while ago. Funny kind of voice. Then we find a stiff here. We didn't say we'd find you. Yeah, you're extra. The dame who worked for him told me. You'd tell homicide? No. That was a mistake. Where's this girl now? Name? Charlie. Call a coroner. Ocean Town is just a small place. Only me and Charlie around. We borrow from the county when we get something like this. Well, I can find you a real answer in an hour. <sighs> you got ideas? Lots of them. You can tell me all about them later. We got a corpse, we got a suspect. You know that's good. Even a weapon. I'll have an alibi when you check the time of death. We'll worry about that later on. All right, sir. Let's go. Well, I had about as much chance as an elephant in the tea room if those two locked me and booked me. I leaned back into his gun, spun around, knocked his wrist down. He pulled the trigger. But I'd already hit the light switch, and he was making rockets in the dark. I left my car there and cut across the highway and doubled back up the hill. They spread out in the wrong direction. An hour later, I was standing in front of the lion's door. He was wrapped in a bathrobe big enough to keep all the silkworms working overtime. What do you want, Regan? Information. You've been drinking? I've been working. That Lena Karras here? You sent her. She called me and said she wanted to hire you for something else. After Nemo canceled the contract. Yeah, why? You gave her my address. I thought you ought to talk to her. What she want? She told me that she killed the prince. She can't do that. We got a contract. Well, it's already been done. We're in a spot. Yeah, I figured that'd get through to you. They'll be asking me all kinds of questions. Well, why didn't you think of that before you signed? What are we going to do? You're going to find out where this twenty-five came from and if anybody fired it. Huh? She was carrying it when she came to me. I don't want to get involved. Well, you're in it up to your ears. I went out there and found the prince. Only a thirty-eight might have done the job. Yeah. Well, that cleans her up. Not yet. The Ocean Town Sheriff and a guy named Charlie are looking for me. Before. They think I know something. Do you? Not yet. There was a tip-off. Somebody was supposed to be a patsy. Where's Kara now? In my place with Sammy Wing. I'm going to get a lawyer. It'll look good. All right, give me the keys to your car. Why? I got a date. Find out who fogged Nemo and we won the championship. Yeah. You'll have to give the cup back. You cheated. I drove back out to Doris Patrick's place in the Palisades and I rang the bell and waited. It took her a while, but she showed. She was wearing a filmy kind of a thing that made a spider's web look like canvas. I began to feel warm, like a sun lamp on a picture set. We had a date at nine o'clock. I broke my watch. Come in, I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great with a Swiss movement. Yeah, it shows. We were going to look at the stars together. How long you been here? Well, I gave you up at ten. Tell me, how do you like my new dress? The right color, but the wrong cut for a funeral. I haven't read the obituaries today. No, it'll be in tomorrow's paper. Have a drink and let's wait for tomorrow. Your friend Nemo was killed tonight. He was no friend of mine. I told you that. So did he. He fall off his house? Murder. We've been having fun up to now. You know, you'll be first guess. I don't think I like that. He tried to blackmail you. Hmm, the story's backwards. Well, that's the way it comes out. Mm, not quite. You got another way? He never tried to blackmail me. Mm-hmm. I blackmailed him. How? I went to him one day and put him in a trance. Only I used scotch. I found out what he was doing and how he was doing it, so I turned the tables. It was good, clean fun, but expensive for him. Well, now, if he was your meal ticket, then you have an alibi, huh? Could be cancel checks somewhere. Right where I could find him. I'm telling you the truth. Where does Jesse fit? Oh, I told you we were married once. He's jealous. Did he know about Nemo? Maybe. It was watchdog when I came out. I told you. Jesse. Hello, gorgeous. I still have a key. What do you want? You. Get out. <laughs> you still trapping with this trap? Just in time, Jesse. You know, you didn't list good. I told you to lay off. Where's your friend? Paid off. I'm handling this alone. We've been finished for a long time. Oh, we're starting up again, Angel. Or didn't you know Nemo was dead? I saw your 38 tonight, Jesse. Ah, you're wrong. It's her 38. It's got her prints in it. What do you mean? I put him there. And you're going to be tagged for his murder, ain't you? <laughs> you see, you're sort of in a spot. Break it. Easy, baby. This punk never did anything right. Oh? 
Tell me how wrong I've been. All right. That tip of the Ocean Town cops was wrong. Telling Nemo was wrong. Ah, oh, you're twisted, Pilgrim. The cops got a warrant out for you right now. Yeah, I had it on the car radio. Murder suspect. <laughs> Plugging you is something they'll thank me for. With her prints on the gun? Well, how was I to know? I just see you and plug you. Everybody will be sorry, but it'll be manslaughter and suspended. It's pretty right, isn't it? Well, what about me? A friend of mine shoving off at Pedro tonight, Angel. Going all over the world. We'd be together. Well, Angel, do I plug him and meet you somewhere in two weeks, huh? Uh, I... Move over, Regan. The lady's making up her mind. Now, where do you like it? Oh, it was a real photo finish. Just as Jesse set the gun up against my head, Doris pulled a gun from the desk drawer and threw a couple of fast ones into him. Jesse tried for her. I'd call it a dead heat, but she'd have to give Doris the edge. Her first slug cut him down like a blade of grass, but she didn't give up. Angel! Angel! He's all used up. I've never shot anyone before. You look like a professional. Give me the gun. I... He deserved to die. Didn't he? Didn't he? I don't know, lady. You knew him better. Well, it all unwound like red thread in a Levi factory. Nemo told me his phony story so he'd have a good self-defense angle when he finally got around to killing Doris Patrick some afternoon. Jesse worked for him to keep me out, but I bounced him and got inside. When Jesse phoned Nemo about it, Nemo called the lion and had me jerk before we could compare notes. I guess Jesse went kind of crazy when he saw how well we got along. He got an idea and killed Nemo and made Doris a patsy with those fingerprints. Lena Kara? Well, she went kind of crazy, too. She found Nemo dead and got the idea she did it. It took three doctors a couple of days to tell her what really happened. And the lion was mad when he found out there wasn't any money in it. But then when he saw Doris Patrick's picture in the paper, he got kind of curious. He asked just one question. What did I do all that afternoon I was out in her house? Well, I didn't even bother to answer him. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with her Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. The story of the man who lived by the sea returned tonight by special request and was written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. In tonight's cast, the role of Doris Patrick was played by Yvonne Fady. Also heard Sidney Miller, Peggy Weber, Paul Fries, Marvin Miller, and Barry Croker. Music for this program is by Milton Charles. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. A few years ago, a new slogan or slang expression was thrust on the vocabulary of the American public. You remember it. It came in very handy when the wife wanted you to clean out the attic, or your brother-in-law put the bite on you for a ten spot. It was, quote, drop dead, unquote. Of course, it never did you any good, but it was better than 23's could do or go jump in the lake. If you listen carefully, you may get some tips on how to use the expression with more effective results. It all started with a phone call to George Valentine's office by a little fellow who was just full of questions. Oh, well, let's see if George has any of the answers. Don't you want a story? Hold it, will you? Who is this? Jerry Yule, I said. I'm a writer and I have a story. Yeah, well, this is George Valentine and I'm not a publisher. Please listen to me. You've got to meet me right away. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. The old waterfront district. The captain's who's what? I live here. It's an old hotel. I'm collecting material. But this particular story, I'm afraid I don't know how it ends. And that's why I need you. Sounds to me like it goes around in a circle. I want to be there when it ends. Don't you understand? That's why I'm calling you instead of the police. Police? What kind of a story is it? Well, it can 
concerns a mysterious stranger and a seaman who chews tobacco. And mostly, of course, the parrot. The what? The parrot, a green and orange parrot. Ordinarily, I don't like parrots myself, such mangy, squawking creatures, but Captain Charlie, of course, will... He's... A green and orange parrot. Now, look, friend, then if meet you... Meet me in 15 minutes at the foot of Tide Street, please. You don't want anyone else to get their hands on this story, do you? <laughs> Well, I don't know, Mr. Yule. It all depends whether or not this story has a happy ending. And from where I sit, I'll bet you it hasn't. However, to keep things even, here's another kind of story that I know has a happy ending. Now, let's see. Uh, George and Brooksy were supposed to meet a Mr. Yule at the foot of Tide Street. Say, that's a pretty rough part of town. You better watch it, George. You might get in over your head. Is it always so foggy down here? Well, only in the summer. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. Quite an ornate old place, isn't it? Oh, the rooms are empty now, or most of them, and half of it is locked off, of course. It tips like a one-legged man. There were the pilings underneath the sinking. The commercial docks went away and left this district, you see, when they built the new piers yeah, farther down. Yeah, I know. Beer and sandwiches. Step into the kitchen and make your own. Rooms, 50 cents. Quite a come down from the kind of hotel it must have been once. Oh, but there's no transient trade, you understand, Miss Brooks. Just the ones Captain Charlie asked to stay permanently. Like writers who specialize in foggy stories. <laughs> now, just be patient, Mr. Valentine. I want you to understand this setting, that's all. It's mood, it's it's character. It's strange, Shut the door. Hell, Oh, hello. You want some coffee for your own? Oh, don't look at me, friend. Captain Charlie, I suppose. No, no, this is Mawson. Sure, I'm not crazy. I I just look that way. The business cards, menus, and wedding announcements. That's his line. What? Why, he used to do the menus on the Lusitania, no less. Mm, been sunk ever since. <laughs> he prints Charlie's stationery for him. Not that Charlie ever uses any, but that's how he took him in. Where is it coming from? Who opened the door? That's all right, Sadie. Go back to your knitting. Oh, there, that's Sadie. She used to own the place back in the gay days when it was Sadie's Neptune. Sure, place. sure, but Captain Charlie never had the heart to throw her out either. Who are your friends, you? Oh, never mind us. All we care about is a story. Not that we'll ever get it. Yeah, well, now, Morton here, he was in it. Oh, no, I'm not. Charlie, give me a check for the 25 bucks. Don't mix me up in your fiction. Parrots. Ha! Bird feathers. I said who's down there? You, Captain? Look, Buster, for the last time, will you tell us what this is all about? Come on, come on. Through here. No borrow. I'll give you all right. Well, 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 and who might your friends be, Mr. Yule? No matter, no matter, the welcome's always out. But you know what I've been here sitting and thinking, me and Limey here? Right, Skipper and me been thinking. Be quiet. Right, Skipper. The next thing this hotel needs is a rubber plant. I remember in Bombay once, I, I seen the most lovely rubber plant... Hey, wait a minute, I wanted to tell these people about last night. Oh, that. Well, now, I don't blame you. Last night, young lady, I bought the most lovely green parrot that any man ever saw. Do you know this morning he Captain, actually... would you mind sticking with last night? What is it? What happened last night? He told you, Governor, he bought a parrot. No, 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 no. But a story should begin at the beginning. And, Mr. Valentine, the very first thing was $25. That's what woke me up. What? Yeah, right. I woke you up to borrow it, see? Only he didn't have it. And neither did Sadie, so I had to break the lock on Morton's room and dig it out of his stuff. It, that's on account of the skipper there was a little short in the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> made Morton sore, too. Made all of you sore. Oh, not me, skipper. Nobody appreciates a good parrot, young lady, but I do, and I bought him. Had to scrape up a whole hundred dollars. That's the story. But I made it, and I bought him. Limey, run fetch the bird. Show the people. Uh, right, Skipper, whatever you say. Uh, I'll give you a hand in case he talks back. Uh, Yule, is that all there is to it? 
just that the captain bought a bird. Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, the, the, the stranger. Now, let me tell you about him. The man he bought the bird from. The mysterious stranger. Now, uh, don't look at me that way. He was. He was a foreigner of some sort. He was a Hindu or Sikh or something. One of those big fellows with a beard and a turban. Uh, but a sailor. And he and Charlie gibbered away at a great rate in some heathen tongue. Oh, now, look, friend. He wanted to get rid of that bird, the Sikh did. Acted as if he was afraid of him. That's why all the fuss about the money. He was so anxious to get paid and get out. And when he left, he left a running. Well? Hey, here. Now, wait. <laughs> here he is. Thank you, you ducky low. Careful there, Limey. Careful he don't slip off your shoulder. <laughs> He's taking quite a fancy to Limey here, you know that? So that's the parrot. <laughs> Isn't he the most lovely bird you ever saw? Well, I wouldn't exactly say... Oh, he... Limey's going to clean him up a bit. You know how it is. But here, here, let me show you. This is a piece of resistance. Now, come on, baby. Say it. Speak out for the people, oh, baby. Oh, fine bird. He talks you. That's a baby. That's a baby. Talk right up like you did to the heathen. Speak out, baby. Speak out. Ah, drop dead. Drop dead. Drop dead. Ah. Drop dead? Isn't he the most lovely thing you ever heard? Drop dead. That does it. Uh, Valentine, wait, 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 wait. Wouldn't it interest you if I told you that I took a walk this morning just before I called you and that I found the sick... That heathen sailor who was so afraid and so anxious to get rid of the bird. And that the poor man was just lying there in an alley, dead. Now, wait a minute. That man didn't drop dead. He was rolled. Look at his pocket. See for yourself. Slugged and rolled, that's all. Yeah, you're right, Lieutenant. Only whoever hit him tapped him a little too hard, Chuck. It's happened more than once down here. But don't you think it's interesting that... Uh... And never mind that Eye of the Idol mystery magazine stuff either, Mr. Yule. What I want to know is why you didn't report this to the police quicker. But here in the alley, I knew no one would find him. Besides which? A beard and a turban. You don't even know he's the same guy you saw last night. I think he is. Ah, there's a whole shipload of these birds in port. Can you tell them apart? Routine, that's a routine case, and you've got to clutter it up. Big mystery. <laughs> okay, boys, where's that wagon? Well, Mr. Yule... I wrote a story about one of these fellows... Hey, hey, wait a... what are you doing? Johnson will cut your gizzard out if you touch that body. You're in enough trouble as it is. Let go of me! Ah. The turban. Here, hold that flesh out. Ah. Oh, brother. There. You see? I told you it was the same man. Yeah, whoever rolled the sailor just wasn't so bright about where he'd carry his money, huh? No, 60, 70. Yeah, give me that. Yeah, it's the hundred bucks, all right. No, 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 I'll keep it. Only so what? This still doesn't mean the parrot had anything to do with it. Hey, Mr. Valentine, look at this. Did you ever see an Oriental who chewed tobacco? Mm, what? A plug. Okay, so there's been somebody around here lately who chews tobacco, but... Oh, yeah, I remember. You said on the phone something about a seaman who chews tobacco. Yes, 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 a big fellow, but an American seaman. Well, where did he creep in? Now, look, Buster, you'd better spill the rest of what you know fast. I've told you everything, honestly, I have. He was just a seaman, that's all. I didn't get much of a look at him, but this morning when I woke up, he was peering in my window. And when I shouted, he ran. I came out to look around. That's when I found the body. And then I ran. Hmm. Well, that's a good idea. Hey, Mr. Valentine. All right. You too, Doc. Miss Brooks on. is still back in the car. You will out of the other way. Tell Johnson I went to get her, will you? Or some other lie? Uh, what? But I... No, no. You stay there and hold hands with Johnson. Hey, Valentine. See you later. I'm going to write a story. George, remember... He said that man in the turban seemed so anxious to get rid of the Take birds. Easy, and... Hey, Captain. Captain Charlie. This is a crazy, strange place, isn't it? That captain gives me the jitters. Ah, never mind. I don't want to see him anyway. Limey's the one who'll talk for us. A weasel if I ever saw one. But why? What can he tell you? What is it you're trying to... Here we to... are. Through here. Just check the information we've already got, Brooksy. Yeah, I'd like to weed out some of Yule's weird notions. He's about stupid enough to think that bird is some sort of weird super... Rock that, rock that. George. Relax, Angel. Over the head of the stairs, that's all. Come on. Let's speak of the devil. 
Yeah. Something at the bottom of the stairs, too. Limey. It's Limey. He's dead. Up there. Up there. You know, I've always found it pretty tough to squeeze juice from a lime. Well, that can't be true with everyone, because here's a case where somebody squeezed a limey too hard. Couldn't have been the parrot, but he might have been the inspiration. Now, uh, if you're in need of inspiration, why don't you give this a listen? George Valentine, you don't believe in the kind of story that has a parrot in it. When the parrot says, drop dead, people drop dead. The only trouble is, they do. First, a foreign sailor who sold the bird, and now the next man that the bird took a liking to, Limey. Yes, Limey is just about as dead as the sailor was. Who's going to be murdered next, George? Oh, Brooksy, cut it out, But Limey didn't just fall down the stairs. It's a dark stairway. It could have happened. Only you doubt it. Yeah. I guess he was dead before he fell. But a guess isn't good enough, is it? It's all so unbelievable, all these crazy characters. There's another explanation of some kind. You want to bet it's nice and simple? No. (laughs) Okay, maybe not. But for instance, why is the parrot important? Why was that mangy captain so anxious to buy him in the first place? Why is Mr. Ewell so interested? I get the idea. So run out and get the police, will you? Well, what are you going to do? I want to see who's around, Angel. Mostly upstairs. Well, the bird is, for one. Yeah, I know. He hopped off down the hall. See you later. All right, George. You sure fell, all right, Buster. Well, so who pushed you? Or slugged you for a Get him off me! What the? It's Sadie! Sadie! Get him off! That awful thing! Oh, what? Get out that window! Go on, shoot! All right, all right. Just a parrot, that's all. Just a. Of all the ugly memes. All right, take speaking. it easy, take it easy. He's out the window now, huh? Ah, sitting there in the kitchen roof like he was real proud of himself. Only what happened? Hopped through here across my face. I was sound asleep. I told Captain Charlie I wouldn't stay here if he kept that bird. I never allowed parrots when it was my hotel. This was a respectable place. Sure, sure. Was... But look, Sadie, did you hear any noise out by the stairs a while ago? Maybe about half an hour ago? No. Why should I? Everybody's been out except that awful creature. I heard them go. Why? Skip it. Only tell me something, Sadie. How long have you lived here? Forty years now, I'd say, off and on. Barring a couple of marriages. But I always come back. Oh, my lands, I wouldn't know any other place to live. None of us would. All been here for years with Captain Charlie, huh? Well, of course. Except that Yule, naturally, he's recent. We're all sort of has-beens, but... The captain, he keeps us all under his wing. He's a wonderful man. He's a generous, honest... That was what you wanted to ask about, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Captain Charlie. Ask anybody in the district about Captain Charlie. Okay, okay. Nothing bad about anybody here, except for that bird. Yeah. Well, I'd better get him off that roof. Well, don't you bring him back in here. You won't have that thing screaming at me. Oh, be quiet, Sadie. Somebody else trying to get him off that roof, too. Huh? Very popular bird. No, no, stay there. I can make it around the ledge. Just stay in your room. Easy done, my boy. I'll be up there and get you in just a minute now. Don't keep the big crap shut, will you? Less noise now, that's the <laughs> stuff. Don't you know, a seaman. Now we got you, baby. Would have been easier to climb up with a ladder. What? Bird watching society. You always chew tobacco when you go parrot hunting? Beat it, will you, buddy? I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Not on a slippery roof. Stay out of it, Mac. Hey, don't reach for that bird. I want to talk to you. I ain't the type. Stay where you are, I said. Drop that, drop that, drop that. Hold still, you blast. Yeah, now look what you did. That's the kitchen flue he's climbing into. Now I can all have fun getting him out. Yeah, well, let him stay there. Forget him. You're the one I want. There's a little matter of people dropping oh, dead. Oh, no, you all... don't, Mac. I had enough. I don't want no trouble. This is where I came from. Oh, don't try that. Hey, you... So long, sucker. Look out. You, you'll slip. Ah! Ah! 
Drop dead, drop dead. Valentine, you're the oh, one. Oh, stop it, Johnson. Drink your coffee. Yeah. Easy for everybody here, folks. Help yourselves. The seaman isn't dead, Lieutenant. His skull wasn't fractured. So we got to wait for hospital reports before we can get him to talk. Johnson, for the tenth time, leave me alone, will you? Go solve your two murders. Have you checked all these people on when they last saw Limey? No, uh, we checked and double-checked and still haven't found anything. Okay, then leave me alone. I'll drink my coffee and think about it. Sure. First, you pocket a hundred bucks and run. Then you find something but won't say what it is. Then you... Johnson. What kind of an idea did that seaman give you? What you got up your sleeve? I'll break up this picnic and maybe you'll find out. No, but you... Were... No, no. All right, all right, everybody. Get out of here. There's a genius working on a story. That's all for now. Break it up, break it up. George. All right, they've gone now. So come here, brace me, Angel. Then you can beat it, brace too. Brace you? What the name? George, get off of that stool. Oh, it's a big one. Got a big ear, man. What? The flu. Hope he's all right. Yeah, now I can reach you. Oh, where are you, boy? Come on, come on. Oh, brother, suit, grease, and cobwebs. You mean he's been there all this time, the parrot? I hope he's in here. Hope I can reach him. <laughs> sure, here we go. Oh, look at the poor thing. Yeah. Well, I'll clean him up a little. He'll be all right. But George, what are you going to do with him? I wouldn't touch that bird if it laid golden eggs. All right, hold still, Abner. Now, Brooksy, listen. we got to find out once and for all if this bird really does have anything to do with all the crazy stuff going on here. You're sure hard to convince. Hey, hey, get off my coffee. If you're thirsty, boy, we'll get you a drink. Now, Brooksy, you go in the bar where Johnson is. Give me five minutes head start, then tell people I found the parrot and took off down the alley. Well, of all the reasons... Well, this is the only way to find out, isn't it? To see who comes after me. The bird itself can't have any value, but maybe somebody thinks it does, or... Drop that. Drop that. Oh, Brooksy, now look, just because everybody who's been around this long-nosed chicken has got into all trouble... All right, all right, I'll do it. But there must be easier ways to find the end of a story. Okay, bird. Let's get some of the grease off your feathers. Bird of El Omen, huh? Big mystery bird. Oh, you like that, huh? Well, get yourself all stretched, because in about five minutes we'll go outside and see if anybody meets us. We'll find out just how dangerous it is to hang on to you when you're... Drop you know... that, drop that, drop that. Hey, hey. <laughs> cut it out, cut it out, will you? Drop That's better. That. Drop that, huh? drop, drop. What? Hey, bird, snap out of it. What's the matter with you? Hey, Abner, come on, boy, come on. That... This, there's nothing wrong. Oh, brother. Drop that, huh? Coffee. The coffee. You took a drink of my coffee. Brooksy. Johnson. What? John. George, listen to me. Can't you hear me? Here. Here, slap him with the wet towel some more. I'll do it. I'll do it, Captain. That you... stuff can't hurt him any. Get you and your crazy joint. Get out of here. All right. All right. Oh. You you all drink that stuff, too? Oh, George, here now. Don't move. <sighs> you told me five minutes. It was five minutes before anybody even started oh. to look for you. Sure, sure, sure. Just me, huh? Just my coffee. We're not all dead, huh? Valentine, I regret never this say. Never mind, I know. I lost it up again. An old-fashioned knockout drop. They keep them behind the bar. Naturally, the wood in this kind of a place. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The bird. He's all right, George. And making a lot more sense than you are. Okay, Johnson, somebody dope my coffee. Everybody had a chance. Everybody knew I was going to be here alone. But at least it proves that somebody right here, doesn't it? Hmm. You nominate the seaman? Yes, but why did this happen, George? We found you and the bird hadn't been touched. Hey, did or... you move me? What? Here, I'll help you. No, get no, up. don't touch me. If it wasn't the bird they were after, it was me. Only why me? What have I got that they... That hundred bucks. Look in your pocket. See what was taken. Yeah. I thought I had it in this pocket. Oh, well, the wallet's okay. Everything else? 50, 70, 80, 90. No, it's all there. Well, nobody'd commit crimes just for that amount of money anyway. No, no, of course not. So get on your feet. We start all over at the beginning. Johnson, I think better on the floor. You know, all this business could be awfully simple. Sure, Hindus and parrots and sea captains This thing and... with me could be a mistake. Limey could just have fallen down the stairs. The first guy we already know is just slugged and rolled. I think you'd better stand up, George. Okay. Too far-fetched, huh? But a desperate man might hope that's the way it'd go down. Like what, man? Like why? 
What are you talking about? Captain Charlie's respectable, isn't he, Johnson? Honest and good with the police. That's right, for years. The same goes for the people he's kept under his wing. Morton, Limey, Sadie. Sure, sure, sure. Charlie keeps the place clean, all right. Only, what's that got to do with... now listen. A foreign sailor comes in with a parrot last night and all blazes breaks loose. Everybody's imagination dives off in seven directions. It isn't imagination that the bird was involved in every crime, though, is it? Here with you, with Limey who took care of him, with the sailor who brought him in? Sure, and you get so wound up you don't notice something else that was involved with everyone. What, George? The money that paid for the parrot. Huh? But you just said that dough in your pocket hadn't been touched. I thought I had it in the other pocket, that's all. But suppose while I was out, suppose the reason I was dope was to get at that money and do something with it. Now, look, if it's there, it's there. And that something was the last crime that needed to be done. From here on, the mysteries could stop. George, for heaven's sake, tell Okay, tell... Angel, okay, words of one syllable. Suppose in this place one person isn't so respectable, being fooling Charlie along with everybody else for years. And last night, Limey broke a door, a lock. Why would anybody lock a door around here, incidentally? But who are you... Because Charlie needed $25 more to make up the hundred the sailor wanted for his bird, remember? Well, Limey got it all right. He found it in Morton's room. Well? Well, Johnson, from there on, one, two, three. Morton was mad, remember? But the sailor had already gone. Then the sailor was slugged and rolled. But if it was Morton, he couldn't find the money he wanted to get back. George, Limey didn't have any money. Limey was a weasel. Suppose he got to asking Morton about that money he took. Suppose he caught on to what I'm catching on to. So Morton killed him, scared to death of discovery now, with one accidental murder already to his credit. All right, then came me. Do you want to bet I was dope so that 25 of that 100 could be replaced with a different 25? Holy smoke. Sure, that's right. Replaced with genuine money. George, Morton's a printer, isn't he? You got it. His press must be in the locked room. He printed menus, remember? Green ones with pictures of Lincoln and Washington and people like that on them. That's the idea. And it explains everything. A counterfeiter, trying to keep from being discovered. Well, come on, don't just stand there. Martin. Hey, Martin. He was here just a second ago. He ran upstairs when you came out of the kitchen. There he goes. Martin, stop! Sergeant, Sergeant, get him! Hold it, Angel. Let the police do the rest. Hey, what's going on, anyway? Look, ma'am, ain't this a lovely bird? You know, someday I'm going to get me a rubber plant, and then... Oh, but George, even if Morton did commit those crimes, it still doesn't explain everything. There's still that tobacco-chewing seaman who fell off the roof and the parrot... Hey, hey, you didn't start this story. You did. So stick around a minute, and I'll give him the rest of it. You're right, Brooksy. There are a lot of questions that still need answering. So, while George is getting his story straight, suppose we all give this story a listen. Yes, he was a counterfeiter, I understand. All he wanted was to get his $25 back. But the seaman, George, Oh, yes, yes, yes. The mysterious man chewing tobacco. Why well, use a little logic? The sick, the foreigner who was so anxious to sell the bird in a hurry didn't speak English. Yes, that made it all the so more... So where did his bird learn to say drop dead? Oh! Yeah, and every clue Yule gave me about him suggested the obvious. That the sick had stolen the bird and was trying to sell quickly before the guy he stole it from caught up with him. You telephoned the hospital, huh? Well, this might not be all clairvoyance, but sure. The seaman didn't want to get mixed up in any trouble, but he still wanted his bird back. Huh. His bird. And that's all there was to it? Oh, my beautiful, romantic story of the waterfront. With all those strange characters. Watch it, I... watch it. Don't get carried away again. Oh, dear. My beautiful story. Anyway, cheer up, Mr. Yule. Maybe you could sell it to one of those mystery shows on the radio. Sure. Call it Drop Dead. Just in case we lost you somewhere along the way, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Brooksy played by Virginia Gregg. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the tale and Eddie Dunstetter played the music. 
Now, this is yours truly inviting you to our next visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began in the darkness of the human mind and ended in raging flame. Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Ever look at people as you pass them on the street and wonder what their lives are like? Where they've been, where they're going, and what they'll do when they get there. Me, I'm a sucker for the guy who wears his heart on his sleeve with just the scars showing. Or a pair of eyes that look out of a soul eaten away by loneliness. The old lady eating her dinner alone in a booth for four. The lone drinker in a plushy bar who toasts his reflections in the mirror and wishes that he was too drunk to see it. Sometimes the busiest street in the city can be the lonesomest spot in the world. And tonight it had seemed like that as I drove through the dark city. I was well into the warehouse district when I saw a flash. It was like an explosion, only there was no noise, no sound, just this flash and then flames. It was a three-story warehouse, the old wooden type, and the flames worked fast. I started past to find a box to turn in the alarm when I saw a man, and he was running into the fire. I stopped the car and took off after him. The only light in the building was from the fire, and the man was nowhere in sight. Hey, you! Here I was making like a regular stout-hearted Frank Merriwell. First one to a fire and no one to save. And then I heard him. Chloe! Chloe! I followed the sound of his voice. He was standing at the foot of some wooden steps, yelling his head off. Chloe! Hey, Chloe! Hey, you! Hey, what are you doing? Come on, Pop. Huh? Let's watch it from outside. Let go of me. Now, come on, now, come on. Leave me alone. Let go of me. Hey, come back here, you fool. Go away. Leave me. Pop, are you hurt? My leg. I hit it when I fell. Well, let's see if you can walk. I can walk if you'll help me. I'll go with you, mister. Yes, I figured you would. I half carried, half dragged the old man. The smoke was so strong that my lungs ached. And I felt lightheaded. Outside, a crowd had gathered. A line of policemen were keeping them back out of the fireman's way. One cop came over to us. Hey, you guys, you work here? You came in after me. Who are you? I'm Strong Heart the second, only don't let it get around. Oh, are you, Randy? Oh, the old man's leg hurt? It isn't broken, it's just banged up a get bit. You guys stay put. I'll get the ambulance boys over here. Okay, we'll be here. I, I'm not saying. You stay where you are. I gotta get going. What's the rush, Bob? Any good reason why you shouldn't wait around? You mean, did I have anything to do with the fire? Well, did you? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, okay, nobody's accusing you. What's it all about? Why did you run in there after the fire started? That's my business. Well, you're going to have to answer questions. You might as well start with me. Oh, get me out of here, mister. Get me home, and maybe I will. I led him through the crowd into my car. I followed his directions through the dark streets. He seemed to be looking for something. He leaned forward, watching in the lights of the car, turned his head to peer at everyone we passed. And all the time, he was silent. Finally, I broke the ice. Uh, maybe I'd better know who you are, hmm? Hey, I'm Ben Graham. Mm -hmm. You said you were going to talk. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my son, Tony. Were you looking for him in the fire? Tony went there earlier when, 
When I saw the fire start, I thought he might still be in there. And you ran in to find him? Tony used to work there. He used to? Yeah, he was a night watchman there and several other warehouses. You see, he's not like other people. I, I was afraid they'd see him there. Oh, uh, like... Oh, oh, it's not what you think. He's not crazy. He's... Well, he stays inside himself, if you know what I mean. He, he don't like people. He sleeps in the daytime. He lives at night. What happens with the jobs? Does he quit? He was fired. Every time. Fired. Why? He thinks it's because of the cane. Well, he uses a cane? Yeah, ever since he was a boy, he's touchy about it. One, one reason he doesn't like people. Ben, why do you think he started the fire? Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say anything like that. No, you didn't have to. It shows. I don't know what to think. There have been several warehouse fires around here recently. Five. Less than a month. Yeah, yeah. Are they the ones where Tony worked? Some of them, but it's not only that. But well, what else, Ben? Why are you afraid Tony started those fires? Three out of five of them are. Man with a cane was seen coming out around the time of the fire, and it, I, I, I gotta find him. Have you asked him about the fires? Oh, I've tried to. We don't talk much. Oh, well, there's my place. Uh, it seems like we're strangers. When, when I mention fires, he slams out of the house. Well, I'll talk to him, Ben, when we find him. I mean, I talk to you, mister. He's, he's funny about that. I will see. Hmm? I'll go in, will you? No, no, don't. You, you wait here. Don't come up there. I'll, I'll bring him out to you. <laughs> Ben Graham staggered up the short walk to his little shed. What was he hiding? What was he afraid for me to see? I heard him open the door without a key. The light switched on. After a few seconds, switched off, but Graham didn't come out. I waited a few minutes and then made my way to the darkened house. There was no sound from the inside. I called as I felt for the door. Ben! There was no answer. I found the knob. Before I could turn it, the door was yanked open. Oh, you, I told you to wait. I told you to wait in the car. Well, I saw the light go out. When you didn't come back, I thought something was wrong. Come on, let's... There's nothing wrong. Get back into the car. Tony's not here. We gotta find him, Ben. I know, before the police do. But where? Well, we'll try some of the warehouses. That's, that's where he hangs out. Which ones? Are they near here? Yeah, yeah, around. Well, then why don't we leave the car here and walk? No. Get in. What are you hiding, Ben? What do you want to get me away from? You wanted to find out or not? All right, all right. Where to? Block down and block over. Young and Wilson's warehouse. You seem to know a lot about these warehouses yourself. Well, I've been working in them most of my life. That is, I, I used to. Uh -huh. This uh, Young and Wilson, is that where the next fire is supposed to take place? I hope not, mister. I hope not. That's it ahead. The building's dark. Yeah, the watchman's inside. Over here. You do know your way around. Here? Yeah. What do you want? Tony here? Who wants him? Oh, you. Get away from that door. Don't come around here, Graham. Have you seen Tony? No, he's not here. Now get moving. What is all this? You're a stranger around here, you'd know. I'd know what? About Ben. He's a bad luck woman. Anywhere he goes, trouble starts. Somebody gets hurt or a fire breaks out. Once a watchman was killed. There's always accidents. It's him. What kind of superstition is that? Maybe a superstition to you, but not to us. All the watchmen know. Ask any of them. Now move on. Well, what's that all about? It's true what he says. Oh, coincidence. Well, call it any M you like. It happens. It, it can't help it. It just happens. That's why you're not working now? Oh, nobody will hire me. They, they all know. Sometimes they think of excuses, but mostly they're like him. They, they run me off. Well, you could get some other kind of work. Oh, I've tried, but they ask me where I worked, and when they check, they find out they don't need me. I... Listen. Stand back. Yes, Ken. Tony? Soon see where he turns that corner. What are you doing with a gun? Keep out of the room. You're not going to... Don't talk. That's not a cane. That's a nightstick. Policeman. Hey, you! Over there! He won't find me here. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, hey, wait a minute! Now, what's the matter with old Screwball? With who? Ben Graham. Oh, you know him? Sure. Everyone around here knows him. I'd have a black cat cross my path and Ben. Why? Wherever there's trouble, you'll find him. 
See the fire tonight? Oh, uh, yes. Why? I'll bet he was there. Every time there's a fire, someone swears Ben was there. Hey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was it the watchman had said? Somebody gets hurt or a fire breaks out? What about the fires where a man with a cane was always seen and another man who nobody wanted around? But why did Ben run when he saw the police? Why was he carrying a gun? I decided I wanted to see the Graham Shack again. What was he hiding in that house? What was it he didn't want me to see? The little building was dark when I went up the walk. If either Tony or his father was there, he didn't want anyone to know about it. I knocked once before I turned the knob. I thought I heard a movement in the corner. Ben. Tony? Anybody here? I felt along the wall for a switch. It was a sound like the cry of a cat. What do you want? Please answer me. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I frightened you. I, I'm looking for Mr. Graham. My husband or my son? Uh, both of them. What is it? What's happened? Oh, nothing's happened. I just wanted to see them. There is something. I know there is. No, it's nothing, really. Now, why don't you lock the door when I leave so no more bad dreams can come in, huh? I can't lock the door. I can't move out of this bed. Oh, you're paralyzed. I didn't know. I, I'm... Sorry, I, I wouldn't have laughed. I... It's all right. I like to hear it. No one laughs here. Won't you sit down? No, I, I can't stay. I've got to find Ben or Tony. What have they done, Miss? Oh, they haven't done anything. You're just like them. They won't tell me anything either. I lie here alone in the dark. Can't move. No one will tell me anything. Well, I just want to do... Give them a message. No, you didn't. Don't try to fool me. Nobody wants them. Either of them. I'm sorry I disturbed you, Mrs. Graham. Is there anything that I can do for you? You can talk to me. Just talk to me. They don't talk, Ben and Tony. They're dark men, both of them. Why do you say no one wants them? Has there been uh, trouble? There's always been trouble. What are they into now? I don't know. I better go find them. Is it the fires? You know? I've guessed. It is. It is the fires. Now don't upset yourself. Ben and Tony are all right. They won't tell me. They won't talk about the fire. I ask them and they won't answer. But I know. I tell you, they're all right. I just talked to your husband, to Ben. I, I thought he came here. They don't come here. All these years I've laid here alone. They don't come here but to sleep and to eat. Well, Ben was here a little while ago. He turned off the light and waited in the dark. What did he want? What was he waiting for? We, uh, we were looking for Tony. What has he done? I've got a right to know. I'm his mother. Well, Ben thinks that Tony started the fires. Tony? <laughs> Tony started the fires. <laughs> he did. He did. Tony started the fire. Back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. Yes, it was adding up, but it wasn't making sense. First, I drag a man out of a fire, a man who's carrying a gun. And now a frightened, paralyzed woman who wanted someone to listen. I could feel that tingling on the back of my neck as Martha Graham talked. She was terrified at the mention of fire. I sat in one of the chairs beside her bed and tried to calm her fear. She wanted to talk, and I couldn't stop her. Tony started the fire. It burned our house. That's that's how I got like this. That's why Tony uses a cane. He was a little boy then. Tony loved matches. He liked to watch them burn. Well, don't think about it now. I think about it all the time. Sometimes I dream about it. Everything burning all around me. My clothes on fire. And, and Tony in, in the corner screaming. I can see it over and over. Isn't it better if you don't talk about it, Mrs. Graham? Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. That's all I hear. 
I want to talk. It's better than lying here alone, not able to move. Now, don't excite yourself. Why don't you get some sleep? All right. If you'll stay, I'll talk about something else. Do you have any idea where Tony is? In one of the warehouses. That's where he always is. Well, I'd like to see him. Do you know which one? What time is it? Well, let me see. It's, uh, it's a little after two. Why? Then he's at the Holland Warehouse, about three blocks from here. It's where he goes at two. I don't understand. You mean he goes to different warehouses at certain times? Yeah, Tony makes a few dollars. The watchmen help him out. But he never talks to me. Well, it's hard for all of us to talk sometimes. You say Tony will be at the Holland Warehouse at two? Yeah. Tony tells me where he'll be. I don't worry if I know. And Ben, will he be there too? If he's looking for Tony, he will. Oh, thank you, thank you. I must be going. Will you do something for me, mister, before you go? Well, sure. What is it? Laugh for me. I just want to hear you laugh. Yeah. Laugh, she says. She hits me between the eyes and tells me to laugh. I stayed with Martha Graham a little longer, promised her I'd come back, and I set out to find the Holland Warehouse. It was larger than the other buildings around it and stronger. It was made of cement and steel and it towered above its wooden neighbors by several stories. I tried the front door, no luck. I rang the bell, I waited. No one came. I tried beating on the door. That didn't do any good either. I started to turn away and then... Yeah, what do you want? Who are you? I'm the watchman here. I thought the watchman stayed inside. I just stepped around the corner for two o'clock coffee. Oh? Uh, don't worry. The place is guarded. There's a fellow inside. Who? Oh, Tony Graham? Yeah. You know him? Well, in a way. Is his father with him? Uh, that jinx. I wouldn't let him near the place. Oh, you too. Oh, well, let's go in. I want to talk to Tony. About what? I'll tell him. Uh, come on. Where's your light? Got a flash here. Tony! 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 That's funny. Well, it's a big building. He's probably on one of the other floors. It shouldn't be. We punch a time clock here. This is the time we're supposed to check in on this floor. Now, where is the clock? Over by the stairs. Lights are there, too. It's not like Tony not to be here. You mean you've left him here before? Sure, he... He helps a lot of the guards, kind of relieves them like. We all pay him a little. And that way he can have a job and his old man don't know it. Better with these lights. Well, there's your light and there's your clock, but no Tony. Can't understand it. Let's try upstairs. We'll take this freight elevator. Are you in all the aisles here at least once during the night? Uh, it'd be pretty hard to do with all those rows of boxes and crates. Hey, uh, you, uh, you don't think uh, something's happened to him, do you? I hope not. I don't think he's up here. I don't know where he is. Listen. Tony and Ben behind those boxes, they're coming. I tell you, I didn't have anything to do with these fires. Well, you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. But I didn't. Why would I start these fires? Because you're a firebug, that's why. I'm not. You've told me that all my life, but I'm not. Ben. Who's that? What are you doing with that gun? Stone, are you following me? What are you doing up here, Tony? I came up here to punch the clock. He, he followed me up. Huh? He's going to kill me. This is the only way. Uh, there's always trouble where he is. I told you. Shut up. It's not my fault. Everything that happens. It's not my fault about my family either. Look at us. Me. Nobody give me a job and Martha. I know, Ben. I saw her. I know all about us, don't you? Oh, but Tony. Well, there he is. A firebug. What's hey, that? Hey, fire! Hey, the building's on fire! You brought it, Ben Graham. I told you not to come here. I'm getting out. Another fire, Tony. I didn't start it. I've been up here with you. I know you started it just like the others. I didn't start them. Oh, listen to me, Paul. I didn't do it. You have no proof he started them. How many times did I stop you when you were a kid? You always like to play with the fire and watch things burn. All kids do. That doesn't prove I... In our house, you sat there on fire, too. Everything we had went up. We've never had anything since. Haven't I been punished for that fire? 
Look at me, haven't I? Yeah, but not for the others. You'll never do it again, never. Put that gun down, Ben. You can't do that. That's murder. He's got to be stopped. It's got to be. But not that way. What if he didn't do it? What if you're wrong? I can't be wrong. I know him. You don't know him at all. You don't even know what he's been doing at night. Oh, yes, I do. He goes from one warehouse to another. I've been following him. He's been in every one of those buildings just before they burned. Every one of them? You see, even you were beginning to believe. The fire bell has stopped. That means the watchman's turned in the alarm. It's automatic. The fire truck should be here soon. The sooner the better. Look at the smoke has started to seep in. Let's get out of here. Yeah. yeah. You're not getting out of here, Tony. I can't let you. Listen, you can't do it, Ben. It's like a lynching. You can't be the judge in execution or two. I can't take any more. A monster, the way she is, and Tony like this. You know what they'll do to him. An asylum. I couldn't stand that. It's better this way. <laughs> smoke, will you put that gun away, Ben? <laughs> Tony, I don't want to do it, but it's the only way. There's one other way. Stay away. Don't, I don't want to hurt you. Stay away. I'm not much of a target with the smoke. <laughs> Stay away. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Give it to me. <laughs> Grab the gun, Tony. I got it. All right, now, come on. We're not me. Let it in now. Come on. Let go, my arm. I said come on. Tony, show us the way out. <laughs> if I can, Mrs. Stone. If I can. The room was full of smoke, and the concrete floor was warm from the fire below. We worked our way to the elevator, but from the smoke and sparks drawing up the shaft like a giant smokestack, we knew it was useless. The stairway. Over here. Then it stopped struggling. He wanted to live, too. We followed Tony by the sound of his cane. He stopped before he reached the steps. Flames outlined the square of the stairwell. Tony, take us to the fire escape. Where is it? The other side. Down this way. Ben was coughing and gasping for breath. Once he stumbled, nearly fell. For a second time in one night, I was helping him out of a fire. Through the smoke, we saw the light of the red exit sign. We leaned against the door and we found it open. A policeman was on the landing. I was coming after you. Watchman said you were here. He helped us down to the street and away from the building. You just took another one out. Over here, the fire bug. The fire bug? Oh, no. Ma. Ma, you're walking. Oh, no. Ma, it can't be. Who is she? The old man's wife. But she can't walk. She's paralyzed. What's it all about, Martha? My men in those warehouses... They acted like I was already dead. She was hurt in the fire a long time ago. Oh. You can walk better than me. Nobody will care. Oh, sure we do, my sure. Did you start those fires? Yes, I started them. That's what they did to me. And after I was hurt, they left me alone. They let me lie there alone. First I got so I could talk. But you wouldn't talk to me. I couldn't, Ma. Seeing you there like that and knowing it was my fault. Nobody came in. All those years, nobody. You can walk. Then I got so I could walk. When was that, Martha? About a year ago. First I thought I'd go out and see people. But I don't know anybody now. Why didn't you tell us? I was going to surprise you, Ben. But you didn't want me. You wouldn't stay around. Don't you see it was because it hurt us to see you like that? Well, when you look at me, you'd look away. So at night, I'd follow you. You didn't even look around. Then I got to understand. You didn't want me. It was the warehouses you wanted. I was jealous of those warehouses. Just like they were people, and I hated them. Martha, no. Oh, no. So one night, I watched you both go into one of the buildings... And I was left outside alone, just like I'd been so many years. I wanted to kill it, to destroy it. <laughs> oh, Ma. Oh, and when Ma. you came out, I went inside. <laughs> there were some papers and things in the corner. I started a fire, and then I ran out. Tony, I, I thought then that Then I you... hid, and I watched. And fire trucks came, and people. <laughs> I had to laugh. I'd brought all those people... They came because of me. Yeah, yeah. You come with us, Mrs. Graham. You? Where? They'll take you to a hospital. There'll be people there. People? People? Will they talk to me? Will they talk to me? Why, sure, sure they'll talk to you, Martha. They'll talk to you. Brother 
there, sometimes the night is even deeper than we think. A moral, too? Well, it seems to me it sticks out all over the place. The Graham's loneliness proved about as deadly as poison. Even more deadly. At least poison kills quickly. But there's an answer to loneliness. And it's so simple it chokes you. Loneliness is a prison that separates you from the world. And you can escape from that prison in only one way. By freeing another. Hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. None but the lonely heart stone. <laughs> Copy, boy. Many of us have at one time or another said, Boy, if I had to do it all over again. Or, Gee, I wish I were so-and-so. Or, If I had the breaks he or she had, I'd have done much more with my life. Today, we explore just such a possibility. A man who had a second chance. But, unfortunately, only one memory. A man who was two people and almost died twice. Charlie, don't you know me? I, uh, I'm afraid I don't. It's only two years. Have I changed that much? Two years? Since what? But don't you remember me? Mary! I couldn't have met you two years ago. But you did. I wasn't born two years ago. That's why. <laughs> mystery drama, Stranger from Nowhere, was written especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by... I'll be back shortly with Act One. We're in Texas, USA. I don't have to tell you one of the reasons for its fame. I shan't name names or actual sites, but the reason is space. One of the main space centers of the country is there. It is also where you'll find geneticists, scientists, and the newest electronic gear listening to space out there, for whatever or whoever is out there. More I can't say, because I think Uncle Sam is still a little sensitive about the strange case of Charlie Robinson. It's symbolic, really, the way Mary came into my life on a merry-go-round. It was late Saturday night. I'd spent all day at the carnival watching the people with their children having fun on the ride. The slides, sticky cotton candy all over their faces. Made me wish I was married and had a kid of my own. Then the place emptied and I got onto the merry-go-round for a last ride. I love riding on these things. Looks like we're the last grown-ups left in the old Tex Carnival. Hi. Hi. What's that you're riding on, a giraffe? Oh, no. This is an ostrich. Doesn't going around like this bring back your childhood? No, I never had one of those. Charlie! Charlie Robinson, it's not you. It couldn't be. How'd you know my name? Oh, typical. (laughs) Typical Charlie to be riding a white horse. What do you mean? Always riding off in some strange direction. Your banner flies. Uh, Look, why don't you explain yourself? Well, I'll try to as soon as this merry-go-round stops. Phew. Hey, that is some unusual power you have. Oh, I thought so, too. All I have to do is say, stop the merry-go-round, I want to get off, and it stops. So, you don't recognize me, Charlie? Haven't a clue. Wish I did. Does the name Mary mean anything to you? Is it yours? Mm Mm-hmm. Has been all my life. Oh, (laughs) you're embarrassed, aren't you, Charlie? Never thought we'd meet up again, did you? Why did you leave? Uh, I, I am sorry to say this, but I don't know you at all. In two years, have I changed that much? Two years? Since what? Well, that's when we met, two years ago. It's Mary. Oh, don't tell me you don't know me. I couldn't have met you two years ago. What are you saying? I wasn't born two years ago, that's why. Oh, Charlie, stop getting around. What do you want me to believe? That you're only two years old? (laughs) 
I realized the moment I said two years ago I wasn't on Earth. It was a mistake. But sometimes things slip out before you can stop them. But this girl and that name I couldn't figure. Because Charlie Robinson was a name I was sure I'd made up for my identity on Earth. My real name is Selra. S-E-L-R-A-H. I put a C in front of it, spell it backwards, and it makes Charles. Yeah. As soon as I got back to my apartment, I unscrewed the silver spheroid and talked to my contact, Jarva. Jarva? Yes, Selra. What is your report? We are ready to take it down. Jarva, I've had an unnerving experience today. What is it? A young lady said she knew me. She called me by my Earth name. What did she want? I, I don't know. Recognition. Acclaim. I thought you might help me, Jarva. You have been sent to the planet Earth to observe. Not to have warm feeling for Earth females. I will consult and get back to you. My mother planet has a tie with planet Earth. Millenniums ago, our name was Kill. We learned that on many stars and hominid-inhabited planets in our galaxy, this name was negative. Therefore, 400 Earth years ago, we renamed ourselves Tycho Brahe after the Danish astronomer who discovered Cassiopeia. I was there. Selra? Yes, Jarva? I'm here, still awaiting instructions. Do you remember the Earth here, 1600? 1600 Anno Domini. Very well. You had a meeting in Prague with Johann Kepler and the great astronomer after whom our planet is named. Tycho Brahe, yes? On that occasion, you were 30 Earth years old, the same as you are today. And you made yourself into an expert astronomer. My instructions are... Now, make yourself into an expert American from Texas. Yeah, it's all very well for you to tell me. But what about the Earth female called Mary? If you cannot carry off your disguise and your orders, you will be recalled. But... In disgrace. Oh, I plead my case, would you? I'd give anything to return to Tycho. I will report your wish, but don't expect much consideration until you have served your time. At night, I look out of my window up at the stars and I cry. Somewhere out there is my homeland. A thousand light years afar, or a million, who knows? I don't. I'm so lonely. I hate the daily pretense to be Charles Robinson, to be always on my guard, to be living a lie. It's almost unbearable. Uh, uh hello? Track you down, didn't I? Who, who, who is this? Charlie Robinson. Don't give me that who is this routine. It's Mary, and you know it oh, is. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. I, I, I was just... Sitting here. Mm -hmm. Staring out the window out there. How did you know? Because, darling, you always used to. I did? If I didn't know you so well, I'd be insulted. After disappearing as you did and then our accidental meeting on the merry-go-round, I'd think you'd be full of apologies. Apologies for what? Are you continuing this pretense? I suppose you've forgotten you asked me to marry you. I did. You most certainly did. And, uh, D did, did I marry you? <laughs> Very funny, aren't you? Hello? Hello? I didn't bother to knock. So, this is where you live. Well, don't you think this charade has gone far enough? Mary, I am being honest with you. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't remember marrying me? You don't remember our honeymoon? You don't remember disappearing two years ago? No. Tell me more about myself. There's not that much to tell. What are you trying to make me believe? You have amnesia? Please tell me about myself, whatever you know. Okay. If that's the way you want to play it, 
You had a good job here in Houston in space research. We went on our honeymoon to the Solar Disturbance Forecast Center in Colorado. We came home. You disappeared. No one ever saw you again. Solar Disturbance Center, huh? I had no idea you all were that far advanced in cosmic investigation. Charlie, how can you look me in the face and say this is all news to you? If that blank expression is your way of avoiding responsibilities, you've got another thing coming. Look, I'm willing to be nice about all this, but you better remember real hard that you are married. Jarva? Yes, Sarah? What is the latest you report? I'm married to an Earth woman two years ago. Was that necessary for your research? You don't understand. I've been given a body identical to someone called Charles Robinson, who, who lived on Earth two years ago and disappeared. I know. You knew all along and never warned me? We didn't wish to impede your research. Well, so what am I going to do? Be friendly, up to a point. You are to make friends with more Earthlings. You have been given a 30-year-old body. Get to know Texas people. Do what a 30-year-old earthling does. Chronometry is an earth science to measure time. Clocks and calendars do not exist on Tycho Brahe. By earthly standards, I am thousands of years old. My instructions were to make friends, so I contacted Mary and invited her for drinks to my apartment. I want you back home with me. Mary, besides my physical resemblance, what makes you think I'm your husband? A thousand things, starting with your name. I told you I made it up. It's a coincidence. Are you in hiding, Charlie? <sighs> yes, in a way I am. Look, I, I, I wonder, I, I, I just I just wonder if I could trust you with the truth. Darling, I, I forgive you. Whatever it was that took you away has brought you back. When you disappeared, I, I used to think it was the shock of your parents dying in that accident the day we came back that took hold of you and off you went. Mary, my parents died 3,000 Earth years ago. I wish you wouldn't talk like that. It scares me. If I could prove to you I am not your Charlie Robinson, that I come from another planet in intergalactic space, could you... could you keep that a secret? Uh, another planet? Oh, sure. Sure, sure I could. All right, all right. Now, now, now what, do you, what do you see in, in that bookcase uh, on the top shelf? Well, it's just sort of a silver, silver ball. All right, now, I'll, I'll get it down for you. I'm going to open it and... Now, put the two halves on the table. Uh, pull up a chair, huh? Uh -huh. Well, what is it? I I it's not silver, is it? It, it looks sort of iridescent. Uh, there. I've unscrewed the two halves of the sphere. Now, lay them side by side, face up. But is it some kind of a magic trick? Uh, maybe I overestimated your intuition. Java? Can you hear me? Java, are you listening? Java, I have a visitor with me. The earthly woman I told you about. Will, will you speak to her? Uh, I, I don't hear anything. What are you doing, Charlie? I'm communicating with my control on Tycho Brahe. Oh, oh uh, uh, Tycho Brahe? My home, the planet that I come from. Oh, oh, oh yes, yes, of uh, course. Her name is Jarva, and only I can hear her. But perhaps if you are patient, she'll speak to you. Oh, yes. Yes, sure, sure. Now, listen, Charlie. I, I just remembered I have an appointment at the doctor's. So I if you don't mind, I I'd better go now. Uh, take care, will you? Everything is going to be all right. Who do you believe? That's the problem. I've no reason to doubt Charlie's sincerity that he's positive he's come from another planet called Tycho Brahe. Is it his imagination or ours? His ability to communicate with this Charlie, his control. 
There are too many imponderables at this moment for me to advise you one way or the other, except to say, stay with us until I return shortly with Act Two. A clear case of amnesia? Is that what we have here? Could be. Or is it possible Charles Robinson is a being from another planet? straight-jacketed into the body of a human with human memories and speech. Those of you who have made Mystery Theater a listening habit know that that could also be. And so, thinks Charlie, since my assignment is to observe the Earth species in their native habitat, I'll begin by switching on a television set. Concludes our interview with science fiction writer Joshua Pride, whose last year's bestseller has just come out in paperback. Mr. Pride... Have we left out anything we ought to mention? Well, uh, nothing really, uh, except if you don't mind, since I'm here to plug my book, I, I'd like to mention again the name of my novel is Tycho's World. What? What did he say? Certainly. Tycho's World. Remember, folks. Which takes us to a planet of non-mortals who are eons advanced in their civilization. Thank you. <laughs> program is Other World. Our guest today, author Joshua Price. Java? Java, can you hear me? Yes, Sarah. This is Java. Why do you call me? I, I just turned on a Houston, Texas television channel and, and they were interviewing a science fiction writer. Now, this writer has written a book called Tycho's World. They're supposedly about our world. You must be mistaken, Sarah. Are you certain? I am very sure, but how could he know what Earthling would have any idea? Uh, well, someone's at the door. Who is it, Jarva? Probably that female Mary. Answer her. Oh, hold on a second, Mary. I'll be right there. What will I do about this man who calls himself Joshua Pride, this writer? We leave that to you. If he's dangerous to your mission, you will know what steps to take. Coming. Oh, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. I I was watching television. I, I didn't hear you. I was beginning to get worried. Can, can I come in? Sure, why not? Why are you here, Mary? Uh, I've come to apologize. For what? For running out on you the other day. Remember? You were going to communicate with your control in another world. I I got scared. I thought you well, I, I thought you were crazy. And what do you think now? That you need me. Now look, Mary, something has happened. I I just saw something on television and I need your help. There's there's somebody I've got to know more about. Of course I'll help. And you can do something for me. For both of us, really. What? Well, I found out today something I never knew. The space project you were working on two years ago when you disappeared was headed up by a, a, a Dr. Latrobe, a, a genetic studies project. Do you remember him, Charlie? No, no, I don't. What are you getting at? But he never knew we were married. He called me today. He would like me to bring you to see him. Mary, I am not that Charles Robinson. He says he worked with you. I, I think maybe he could help straighten things out. Oh, all right, all right. I'll see him. But I want you to do something for me first. Anything, darling. There's a science fiction writer called Joshua Pride. Now, I just saw him interviewed. Joshua Pride? Oh, of course. I took a creative writing class with him last year. He lives here in Houston. I want to meet him. It's very important. Well, I'll do my best. But can I see him today? Uh, tomorrow? I, I have no idea. I, I, I'll go to talk to him and I, I, I'll find out what, when he can see us. Not us, Mary. Me. Alone. I have to see him alone. Do you understand? Mr. Pride, it, it was good of you to let me see you on such short notice. I, I, I didn't think you remembered me. Oh, of course I did, Mary. For a former student, I'm always available. Besides, you sounded so distressed on the phone. What's on your mind? Well, two years ago, I married my husband. He was working at the Space Genetics Research Center... I, I didn't know that then. It, it, it was all so hush-hush. And then Charlie's parents died, and a day later he disappeared. It just vanished. So I went out to work, and, well, as you know, 
Last year, I thought I'd like to do more than just a nine-to-five secretarial job. So I, I took your writing course. Hmm. You showed a great deal of promise. Have you kept up your writing? Well, I tried to. But that's not why I'm here. See, Charlie, my husband, he, he showed up the other day, but he's, he's different. He's not the same as I remember him, Mr. Pride. Oh? Uh-huh. For one thing, he... He, he must have injured himself because there's this long scar in the middle of his forehead and, and, and he talks crazy. He says he doesn't remember me at all. That he wasn't even on Earth two years ago. That that he's from somewhere else. A, another planet. Do you know why he wants to see me? He, he didn't say. It would be a big favor to me if you would come. Why? Well, I... I don't know, Mary. Let me think it over and I'll get back to you. You mean you won't? Well, I mean I have certain obligations to myself and others. If your husband is suffering from certain delusions, how could I blindly go ahead and meet him alone, as you say? Well, I'll think about it. When Mary told me Joshua Pride was reluctant to meet with me, I knew something was wrong. He was either afraid for some reason, or he too was from my planet, Tycho. I consulted my control. Speak, Sarah. This so-called science fiction writer has not yet agreed to see me. Why do you say so-called? Because I am not sure he is what he claims to be. He could be from the far side of our planet because he's unlike us. I saw his face clearly on television and he has no third eye or even the slightest scar of its removal. That means nothing. He could have had a better plastic surgeon than the one who removed your third eye. Why is he hesitating to meet me? Sarah, we have told you to deal with the problem. Don't get in touch again. Until you have. If this disguised entity from our galaxy or even the far side of our planet has been sent to stop my work, he must be disposed of. I purchased a copy of his book, Tycho's World, and a revolver. Mary Robinson? Mr. Pride? Is that you? Yes, it is. Uh, look, I, I've, gi- I've given a good deal of thought to your situation, but I'm afraid I can't help. You don't mean you can't help, but that you won't. Well, uh, whichever way you want to interpret it, uh, to invite a, a complete stranger to my house for me to see it, uh, well, let's, let's put it this way, Mary, I, I, I just don't have the time. I'm sorry, I... You, Mr. Pride. I had no idea. And of course I understand. Uh, however, I. Uh, Mary? Mary? Uh, she hung up on you, didn't she? Who are you? Uh, how did you get in here? Your front door was unlocked. I, uh. I'm Charles Robinson, the man Mary wanted you to meet. May I sit down? Well, I suppose so, now that you're here. Thank you. Oh, I I see you have a copy of my book. (laughs) You're afraid of me, aren't you? Well, I'm alone. It's it's nighttime. A stranger walks into my house. Why shouldn't I be afraid? Uh, By the way, Joshua Pride, that isn't your real name, is it? What a strange thing for you to say. As a matter of fact, it is. That's a real chip you have on your shoulder, Robinson. It is your real name? Look, I'm not going to call the police or anything like that, see? Uh, after all, it's important for me to keep seeing you people and get fresh impressions. So, you just sit back, Robinson. Make yourself comfortable and we'll have, have a nice talk. All right? Where did you get the name Tycho from? It just came to me. Liar. Well, I, I must have read it somewhere. I open your book to, uh, to uh, page 78. Uh, Here, you say this planet Tycho was once named Argon, but in honor of a Danish astronomer, the name was changed to Tycho Brahe. How did you know that? Well, I haven't the foggiest. It it, it (laughs) seemed like a good idea. Yeah, of course, you only have half of it. Our planet's original name was Kill, not Argon. 
My dear man, I used the word argon because I could then call the early space and time travelers argonauts. That's why. Yeah, you're mistaken about that also. You're quite wrong. Robinson, Charlie, it, it's all made up, invented. It's not right or wrong. There is no such thing as space on Tycho. We are time beings and time travelers only. That is why I go back hundreds, thousands of years as if they were what Earth people called yesterday. Will you explain to me why you came here? To find out why so much of what you have written is based on fact. And how come you know it all? I... I, I think I've had just about enough for an evening. You may, but I haven't. And that's why I brought with me this handy means of persuading you to tell the truth. Now, hold on just a moment. We're, we're not going to get anywhere by using force. I believe this is the way a revolver is loaded. Uh, here, I marked this page, page 148. You talk about how each traveler to Earth is assigned a control. Yes, I do. And here, on the next page, 149, you call this control by the name of Jarva. Now, don't tell me this is also a coincidence, that Jarva came to you out of the blue. But it did. I, I, I made it up. It's, it's all fiction. Most of it is fact. You say... I know. Because Tycho is my home. You are mad. You are either one of us masquerading as human as I am, or you are here to unmask me. Now, let me see. How does this safety catch work? Oh, yes. I think what you're doing. Over the centuries, I've come often to Earth to watch, to report, and return. Sometimes I have to destroy an enemy, an unworthy creature. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you anything I possibly can, but put that gun down. It could go off. Unless you tell me by what right you use the name of my planet and my people... I have no alternative but to fire. No, don't. don't if you don't. are from Tycho, a bullet won't dispose of you. You know that. I know that. Of course, if you are human, it means the end. Stop, Robinson. Yes, I, I, I am from Tycho. Yes, I, I've been assigned to, to spy on you. Scientists have gone on record with a proposition that there is no confirmed evidence that somewhere in any one of the billions of systems of stars, of nebulae, of clusters, of interstellar matter, that life superior to ours does not exist. Every day our monitors record unexplainable interruptions of light and radio waves. So do not discount the possibility of truth in what you are hearing. It could be. I shall return shortly with Act Three. As our story becomes more intricate, it also becomes more incredible. A creature arrives on Earth, the duplicate of a man who has disappeared, identical except for a third eye, which he has had surgically removed. The creature is called Charlie Robinson. He thinks like a man, yet often talks like a history book. He is controlled by a voice contained in a silver sphere. He has just shot a writer called Joshua Pride. Mary, what are you doing here so late? I had to see you, Charlie. I called and called, but you weren't here. I had to go out. I'd made a date for us to see Dr. Latrobe. Who's that? Charlie... Remember your promise? You said you'd see him. Did I say that? The man you worked for here in Houston two years ago in space genetics. He's waiting for us now. Not now? It's 11 o'clock at night. He said he'd see us now. Please, Charlie, we must. What's the hurry? It's for your own good. You promised. I don't understand why we can't go see this, this man tomorrow. I'm very tired. Tomorrow will be too late, believe me. Why? Why? Because your life is in danger. Please come. Oh. Oh, no. No. Charlie? Charlie, is, is there a back way out of this apartment? I don't understand. You don't. Tonight, you tried to kill Joshua Pride. You fired a gun at him. He called me as soon as you left. 
I'm trying to save you. Now do you understand? Those are police down there. What will they do to me? For attempted murder. Probably put you in jail. I'm the only one who knows. Whatever you did, it wasn't your fault. Hurry, please. Prison. <laughs> there isn't a prison on earth that could hold me. You're behind all this, aren't you, Mary? Charlie, what are you saying? How did the police know where to go? I don't know. Uh, no jail can hold me. I wish you wouldn't talk like that, Charlie. If my bullet hit him and he's still alive, then Joshua Pride is one of us. Everything's going to be all right, Charlie. Where are we going? I told you, to Dr. Latrobe. What for? Because he knows you and he wants to help. No, no, you're out of your depth, Mary. All of you earthlings are digging their own graves. You don't realize it, but you are. We're not far from Dr. Latrobe's house. Uh, what none of you realize is that your precious Earth belongs to the lowest scale of all terrestrial planets composed of silicates and metal. Right, now, just a hundred yards more or so. Now, can you see his upstairs window through the trees, Charlie? It's lit. He's there. Jarva. I can't go without Jarva. I've, I've left her at my place. Come on, now don't No, stop. no, I have to go back. They'll find her and destroy her. Charlie, what are you talking about? My contact, the silver sphere. Jarva, my control. It's my only way of communicating with my planet. I've got to go back. The police have your apartment surrounded. They're bound to. You go back there and they'll capture you. Let me go back for you. You would? Charlie, you're my husband. I love you. I'd do anything for you. Now, where is that silver sphere? It's on the bookshelf to the right of my bed. Top shelf. I'll find it. Promise me not to move. You sit right there by that birch tree until I get back. Darn it. Where is it? Oh, I can't make out anything in the dark. It, it's not here on the shelf where he said it was. Maybe if I just reach past these... Now I've done it. Why well, didn't you turn on the light, miss? Oh. You can see what you're doing much better. Uh, I, I, I was just... Uh, I know. You were just looking for something to read. You're a policeman. That's right. I, uh, I, I was just looking for something for a, a friend. You happen to know where we could find him, miss? Find, find him? Who? Your friend. Isn't his name Charles Robinson? I, uh... I, I, I know, Charlie. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You know where he is now? Uh, no, no, I, I don't. No, not at the moment. You know he attempted to commit a felony? Oh. Now, obviously you do. I'm on duty here, miss, to apprehend anyone who shows up, so I'm going to have to ask you to come along with me to the station house. Well, I, I can't do that, officer. It's very important that I find something Mr. Robinson left here. If it's a revolver you're looking for, don't bother him. It's been recovered. I've got it. I've got it. See, it rolled under the bed. Is that what you came for? A silver ball? Yes. It's important to Charlie. Okay. Let's go bring it to him. Oh, I, I couldn't do that. I promise. Now, you don't seem to understand, miss. Assault with a deadly weapon. Robinson, the perpetrator, tried to kill someone, a stranger to him. For his own safety, he'd better be picked up. But could I go first and sort of explain it to him? You see... I'm his wife. Uh, let me just have a look at that silver ball. I want to make sure it's no bomb in it. What is this? It's empty. To you and me, it's empty. That's right. Okay. It's all yours. It's hard for me to explain. But my husband wants it very much. <laughs> Where are you? Right here behind you. Oh, you, you startled me. Did you bring Jarva? Yes, here she is. Oh, Mary, you're wonderful. I was so afraid. Charlie, I, I want to tell you something. No, wait, wait, until I've made contact, and then we can talk. Jarva? Jarva, can you hear me? This is Cell Rock, Jarva. <laughs> There's nothing. What is it? What's the matter? Jarva! Charlie! I can't get through. Jarva, this is Selra, citizen of Tycho Brahe. Help me, Jarva. Don't leave me on Earth alone. Mary, it's all over. They've abandoned me. 
Charles Robinson, will you put your hands up and come forward quietly? Oh, Mary. It's for your own good. Glad you're here, Mary. You know Joshua Pride. Yes, I do, Dr. Latro. Hello, Mary. I understand Charlie's getting better every day. Yes, Robinson is improving greatly. Everything he imagined seems to be disappearing from his mind. Everyone's been so understanding from the beginning. The police letting you take Charlie to the hospital, Dr. Latrobe, to say nothing of you, Mr. Pride, not pressing charges. When Dr. Latrobe told me the bullets were blanks, I, <laughs> I didn't want to look silly. Besides, Robinson wasn't himself. It was amnesia, wasn't it? No doubt about it. What I don't understand is, is where did he get those wild ideas about coming from another planet? My fictional planet, in fact. I expect very soon it will all seem like a bad dream, if he remembers it. He's lucky. He won't, but I always will. Why so? Two years ago, when Charlie was working here, I found him in the laboratory one morning, unconscious. But why wasn't I told? Mary, we had no idea he was married. His parents had just died in an accident, and we thought he was alone in the world. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Yes, Doctor. Yes, she's here. I'll send her right along. Hmm. Thanks. I'm glad to hear it. That was Dr. Mercer, the neurophysicist in charge. He says, Mary, if you'll go down to his office and wait, you can have a visit with your husband. The whole thing had to be kept quiet, Mr. Pride. We were doing these top-secret genetic studies, so... So, when you found Robinson unconscious that morning, you couldn't bring him around, eh? He came to a total amnesiac. How could we release him like that, knowing no one, not his own name or where he was from? Here, we had a man with a great brain capability, but no memory. So, we used him as a guinea pig. You're kidding. We programmed him, giving him memories, ambition, a reason for living. Well, how could you do that? Oh, my Lord, of course. You used my book. Tycho's World, exactly. And all the fictional characters in it. Robinson became one of them. It took months, but we instilled in his dormant cells who he was, where he came from, and what he had to do on Earth. Spy and report. We gave him the name Selra. Java, a character in your book, became his control. That explains it. We gave him a miniaturized sender receiver in a sphere he carried with him, which we monitored day and night. The scar on his forehead, which was really the result of a fall in the laboratory, became plastic surgery removal of a third eye. I never thought when I invented that idea that someone would believe it. <laughs> we monitored Charlie for almost two years, and during that time, he has been living in two worlds. I can't believe I'm hearing this, Dr. Latrobe. I'm appalled and, and very angry. To tamper with a man's brain, officially no less, is the most criminal assault on a, on a human being that I can imagine. To make a man lose two years of his life, it, it's unforgivable. You don't understand. He'll be as good as new and never know it. But what for? Why? Would he have been better off to remain a mental vegetable? However, there was a reason... Probably the most important one any man could have today. Charlie, hmm? are you awake? It's me, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hope you're not angry with me. You really recognize me, don't you? Of course. I apologize for ending up in the hospital the first week we're married like this. You just get well, and we'll pick up where we left off. I'll tell you a funny thing, I've been trying to remember what happened. Was it last night or or the night before my first back at Dr. Latrobe's lab? I, I, I know I was working late. Well, you didn't call me. I was getting worried. <laughs> What's a new bride going to think? I was standing on one of the lab tables to change a light bulb in the ceiling that had gone out. That, that's all I remember. I must have fallen and knocked myself out. <laughs> See the scar on my forehead? Mm -hmm. I really heal fast, don't I? Oh, you're in good shape, darling. And Latrobe's not mad at me for holding up the experiments? Uh, how long have I been here? A day or 
too. Nobody's mad at you, Charlie. Oh, you know, Mary, I'm getting awfully sleepy. Mm. They keep giving me these drugs, so I relax. Well, I'll come back to the hospital. You better. I want to go home tomorrow. You have my word to keep it quiet. Why did you pull that mind indoctrination on Robinson? This government has reason to believe emissaries from other planets are at this very moment right here on Earth, living among us, disguised as human beings. By programming Robinson, following his every move, we hope to learn something about the reasoning process of such a non-mortal person, a creature from outer space who is sent here and must deal with life in our world. <laughs> I don't know. Why not... Live and let live, Doctor. Because it's about time we found out whether in this vast universe we have friends or enemies. We have given you a glimpse into a file marked Top Space Secret. As I said in the beginning, if this account were widely known, it might be a bit embarrassing to Uncle Sam. However, I'm confident if anyone can keep secrets, it's you, that scrupulous league of listeners to Mystery Theater. I shall return shortly. In an automated and impersonal world, in a society that trusts the readouts of a computer rather than the readings of the human heart, nobody can close his mind to the possibility that someday science may become the ultimate deity. So, as the facts become known to me, I shall continue to open secret doors to the universe so we may be forewarned of the mysteries of the future. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Carol Titel, Court Benson, and Gordon Heath. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. Brought to you each week at this time by your neighborhood blue coal dealer. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. This is no time of the year to let your coal supply get low. Sudden changes in temperature and war conditions may delay transportation and keep your order of coal from getting to you when you'll need it most. Fill your coal bin now and help relieve transportation facilities for war supplies. Your friendly blue coal dealer is able to take care of you now from supplies on hand. But this condition may change at any time, especially since this fine home fuel is so rapidly gaining new users. New users who have found you get more dependable heat plus real economy with blue coal. Yes, it's wise to be prepared. Call your friendly blue coal dealer tomorrow. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Several years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The secret of hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, The Thing in the Swamp. <laughs> this is a tale of greed and hate. 
that was created by the belief of 10 million radio listeners. For if the story had not been told, the thing would never have risen out of the swamp to reach out with blood-red tentacles and thrice to murder. What is it? Who's there? It's I, Hugo. How many times have I told you not to sneak up behind me like that? Oh, Hugo, don't be angry with me. Fools. Fools. I'll never find it. Uh, never. What did you say, Hugo? Huh? Uh, nothing. Hugo. What? How much longer must we stay here in this houseboat on this dismal swamp? As long as I want to stay here. But, Hugo, I'm frightened. I'm afraid of this place. Those strange noises we've heard in the swamp. Do you think it's true what that man Nestor said on the radio? That there's a monster living in the depths of Furl's swamp? But how <laughs> else can one explain those unearthly noises that come from the swamp? Don't be a fool. If it's money, Hugo, money. if that's the re... Money. Yes, Hugo. What? Do you mean money? Oh, oh! What are oh. you trying to find out? Nothing, nothing, Hugo. I, I only wanted you to tell me what it is that, that keeps us here on this houseboat away from everybody. Oh. No, Amy. No. Not even you. Now go to bed. Let. Might help you to tell me, Hugo. I said go to bed. All right, Hugo. All right. No. No, not even dear Amy. No one will know. I'll have it all. All to myself. The death laugh of the loon sounds lonesome tonight. Sounds almost... That's not a loon. That's not a loon. That's not a loon. What, what are you? What do you want? Stay away from me. You're not a real person. You're a... An animal. A thing apart from ordinary men. Your huge, ugly head... I'm Skilly sure body. you don't find me pretty. Now tell me, Hugo. Where is the money? Where have you hidden it? No, no. I won't tell you. No. You'll tell me, Hugo Mankino. You'll tell me. No. Amy. Amy, come here. You've talked enough, Hugo. I thought I heard you call me, Hugo. What? Oh. Now, Miss Lane and my good friend Cranston, will you two please explain why you dragged me to this broadcasting station? Well, Commissioner, Lamont and I were talking about that poor woman. Uh, what woman? Uh, Mrs. Menkino, Commissioner. The woman whose husband was carried off their houseboat into the swamp by that, uh, that monster. Oh, that. Uh, she's out of her mind. Well, don't be too sure of that, Commissioner. Miss Lane, not only am I sure, but several of the state's best psychiatrists are sure also. But we're not sure, Commissioner. Uh, I hate to tear myself away, Cranston, but I'm sure you'll understand. Leaving before Mr. Nestor comes? Nestor? Oh, yeah. Now, what's heaven's gift to radio commentators got to do with my being here? Well, you remember the story Mrs. Menkino told of that uh, thing in the swamp? You just mentioned that. Phony story. Very phony. Well, Peter Nestor, radio's teller of strange tales, told of this exact monster living in the same swamp in his broadcast six weeks ago. Even the description that Mrs. Menkino gave the police of that monster tallied perfectly with Mr. Nestor's story. Uh -huh. Coincidence. And, uh, by the way, Commissioner... Isn't Menkino the missing cashier of the National Bank that was robbed of so much money about five years ago? Well, it does happen the police have been looking for Menkino for questioning for some years now. But that has absolutely nothing to do with this monster story. Lamont, let's hear what Mr. Nestor's saying on his broadcast. Okay, Margo. I'll turn on this radio. You won't hear much. The program's just about over. And that is the story, ladies and gentlemen. 
The statue, carved in granite and silhouetted against the sky, may be seen to this day. Well, the program's over. And now, a preview of next week's program. You may recall that my strange tale for my program just six weeks ago dealt with a legend of the thing in the swamp. Lamont, he's talking about it again. If you have read your newspapers lately... You know that a woman has reported that her husband has been carried off by a monster who exists in the murky waters of Furrow Swamp. And next week on my broadcast, I'm going to the exact spot where the monster is reported to have struck and attempt to give you an on-the-spot description of him. Don't forget to tune in next week. You have an appointment with danger. An appointment with a thing in the swamp. Good night. At the end of the broadcast, turn it off, Lamont. Right. Well, Commissioner, what do you think now? I think I'd like to talk to this Peter Nestor. Hey, How about a story, Mr. Nestor? Nestor? Yeah. All right, all right. I'll give you a report of the story later. Thanks. Uh, pardon me, the page boy said you wanted to see me. Mr. Nestor? Yeah? I'm Commissioner Weston. This is Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston. How are you? How, How do, do you do? do? I can guess what you're here for, Commissioner Weston. It's that story of mine that came true, right? The first time. What I'd like to know, Mr. Nestor, is where you got that story. Why, it's an old legend of the swamp. But the thing happened just as you described it. Don't you think that's strange, Mr. Nestor? Yes. How can you explain that? Oh, believe me, I was as surprised when I read about it as you are. As far as I knew, it was just a legend. Well, what about you going to Furrow Swamp and doing an on-the-spot broadcast? Next week, I'm going to that houseboat and wait for the monster. If it comes, I'll describe it over the air to my audience. Mr. Nestor... Do you mind if I come with you? Not at all, Mr. Cranston, but I'm very much afraid we'll find the monster's a myth. That the woman who reported her husband's death had listened to my broadcast and that her unbalanced mind had seized upon the idea. I'm not so sure, Mr. Nestor, because I believe that the so-called legendary monster is more than imaginary now. Here I am, bound to a chair on the houseboat, gentlemen. And I'm ready for what may come. One more picture, Mr. Nestor. Uh, All right, all right, one more. Thanks. Thank you. Well, my broadcast will begin in just eight minutes. That'll give you all enough time to get back the half mile to the truck containing the portable radio equipment where you may listen to my program. Well, uh, I thought, Nestor, that I was to be allowed to remain here. I'm sorry, Mr. Cranston, but if you stayed, all these reporters would want to stay, too. If there is such a monster, it would certainly scare him away. He's right, Lamont. Yes, I suppose he is. By the way, Cranston, where's the good police commissioner? Well, to use his own words, he had other more important things to do. Hmm. Perhaps he'll be sorry he didn't come along. Perhaps. Well, good luck, Nestor. Yeah, thanks. And now, gentlemen. Yeah? Uh, It's time to go. What's on your mind? I have an appointment with a thing in the swamp. Lamont, I wish we'd gone inside the transmitter truck with the others. It's not too cheerful out here in the car. Well, if anything should happen to Nestor, we can reach him quicker from here, Margot. This car radio takes quite a time to heat up. Uh, Nestor should here be... Here I am, alone oh, on the haunted houseboat of the missing Hugo Mankino, bound to a chair, waiting for our monster to come. It's not too comforting to remember that Hugo, living with his wife on this very houseboat where I am now, met his death by this monster just ten days ago. His body is supposed to be at the bottom of the swamp. Tonight, I shall attempt to describe this monster to you. Now, the police have claimed that this thing doesn't exist. I not only say that it exists, I say it will visit this houseboat tonight. Now remember, listeners, I'm tied from head to foot. My only contact with the outside world is this microphone propped up beside me. In front of me is the open door of this doomed houseboat, where I can see the swamp in which our monster is supposed to live. Nothing has disturbed the waters of the swamp up to... Wait. Wait, I see something. Come on, do you think... I something think we ought to hear what he has to say. Rising from the waters outside the door... Oh, 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 no. Oh, no. Lamont. The laugh's on me. Do you think he sees anything? Really He's a, a good monster. storyteller, Margo. You've Let's got to see. believe me. Now, it's wait a, a minute. monstrosity. Good as Nestor is, he couldn't make up the sounds of those chains. Claws covered with seaweed. And I can't get away. I can't. No, no. Stay away from me. Stay away. Lamont, what is it? 
That's what we're going to find out. Act two of The Thing in the Swamp will continue in just a moment. First, consider this important fact. You need proper heat in your home just as you need proper clothes and proper food. And you can only enjoy that sort of heat when you have the right fuel. Blue coal, you'll find, is right because it's prepared especially for home use. It's delivered to your home in exactly the right size to give you the most efficient heat. That's why this superior home fuel keeps your home warm and comfortable at all times. Every room at the right temperature. Add to all that the new Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, and you're sitting on top of the world. The Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator saves climbing up and down stairs. It automatically makes the adjustments that increase or decrease the heat according to your needs. It's easily and quickly installed. You can take it with you when you move. And what's more... It saves money. Ask your neighborhood blue coal dealer for a free demonstration of the blue coal heat regulator. He's listed under the words blue coal in the yellow section of your classified phone directory. Call him tomorrow. Now, back to the shadow. Now that we've gotten rid of the reporters and everybody else, Cranston, Miss Lane, what is this all about? Well, Commissioner, we were listening to Nestor's broadcast in my car. About a half mile from here. Well, everything was going fine on the program and... Miss the... Lane, I heard the broadcast. What I want to know is, where is Nestor now? I told you over the phone, Commissioner, he's gone. Gone? Now, look, Cranston, I was there when Nestor told you that he didn't believe any monster was going to show up. Weston... That monster really appeared. Nestor was tied to this chair here. You can see for yourself that the cords are broken. He couldn't have done that himself. So what? He hired a guy to cut him loose for publicity. I don't think so, Commissioner. And that doesn't explain this clump of wet seaweed here on the floor. <laughs> the wind could have blown that in. Personally, I'm going home. I think you've been taken in by Nestor's legend. And personally, I'm going home. Do you want to go home, Lamont? Uh-uh. Do you? Uh-uh. You're not afraid because everybody's gone back to town and left us here? <laughs> I should say not. Good. Because I think that if we stay here aboard the houseboat, the thing in the swamp may pay us a visit. Cops and the reporters are gone now, Rocky. Yeah? Give me those glasses. I want to take a look across the swamp. Yeah. We'll soon see. Gone, eh? There's still a car parked near the houseboat across the swamp there. That guy Cranston and his friend Miss Lane are still hanging around. What do they want? Suppose we row across and find out. Hey, Rocky, what about this this thing in the swamp? Forget it. Yeah, maybe this ain't such a safe hideout there. I long. said forget it. What's the matter, Nick? Are you turning yellow? No, no, Rocky, no. I don't think Cranston and Miss Lane are going to stick around long if the monster shows up. I don't like this, Rocky. I don't like it at all. You'd like a cut of the National Bank robbery money, wouldn't you? Yeah. Now with Mankito dead, we'll never find that door. It's still where he hid it, and we'll find it. Rocky, who killed Mankino? How did you find out about what it? What difference does it make? When I came in this with you, I told you I didn't want nothing to do with no murder. Now, if Keep you... your shirt on. I only heard about it on the radio. The monster is supposed to have done it. Look, Nick, I ain't gonna double-cross you the way Menkino double-crossed me on that bank stick-up. For five years, I've been waiting my chance to get my hands on that dough, and nothing's gonna stop me now. No. Not even that nosy guy Cranston and that dame poking around. What are you gonna do, Rocky? We're going across the swamp to the houseboat and give Cranston and his girlfriend a little surprise. Lamont. Yes? What time is it? You just asked me that five minutes ago. Well, it seemed like five hours ago. How much longer will we have to wait for... for that thing? There's no telling, Margo. It's the suspense of waiting that's so deadly. You're right, Margo. I think I'll take a look over this houseboat. Perhaps the answer to this whole mystery is right here. I'm not sure I'm going to like the answer if we do find it. What's this? What? This door here. I didn't notice it before. Ah. Seems to be a flight of steps going down into the hold of the boat. 
I can't see much. It's so dark down there. Here, a flash of light down there. I don't see a thing. Let's go down. All right. Seems to be a lot of water down here. What is it, Margot? Rats! The place is full of them. Let's go up again, Lamont. Hey, you go up, Margot. I want to take a look around. All right, Lamont. I'll wait for you on deck. All right. There. I wonder if I'll find what I'm looking for here. Let's see what's under this sacking here. Good heavens. Those claw marks on his throat. I could almost believe that legend about the monster. Margot! Margot! I found Nestor's body! <coughs> Margot! What is it? Margot! Here, open this door! Open, I say! All right, pound all you want, mister. You'll never get out of there alive. I don't like this, Rocky. I don't like it. Just keep her on and let me manage this. What about this dame here in the boat? What are you going to do about her? Maybe you killed her. Maybe I have. Rocky, I told you I don't She's want... only unconscious. She's okay. Yeah. When she comes to, she's going to start yelling. we got to let her go. She won't yell. That guy you locked in the hold of the houseboat. He can break out of there, Rocky. The wood is so rotten. Look, I'm getting sick of your griping. I tell you, he won't break out. Before we left, I opened up the seacock. He's probably drowned already. Look back. You see how low the boat sunk in the water? We're going back, Rocky. What are you talking about? When I came in with you, I said no killing. And we're going back and save him. Yeah? You're looking into the barrel of a gun, Nick. I think you've been around me long enough to know I'll use it if I have to. Okay, Rocky. You win. That's better. Just do as I say and we'll get along. Uh, He's coming, too. Uh, Lamont, I... Look, lady. I mean business. One sound out of you and... Where's Lamont? What have you done Shut to Shut up. Him? Rocky. Rocky, what's that? Where? There. Those waves in the water. Looks like someone's swimming, but there ain't nobody there. Just waves. Shadow. What did you say? Nothing. That's funny. I'd have sworn you said the shadow. No. No, no, I've I didn't. I've heard of him. I always wanted to meet up with the shadow. Let's see if a bullet will stop those no, waves. No, don't. No. Hold the neck. No, let me go. Still coming no. toward us. Now it stopped. No. Stopped no. good. I always wondered if a bullet could stop the shadow. Now I know. <laughs> oh, Lamont. Lamont, I... Oh, what do you want? What are you going to do with me? Come on, lady. Come with me. No. No. Don't you understand? I'm going to let you escape. Escape? This wasn't my idea. I don't want no part of it. I was after some easy money, but I realize now I was wrong. But I... Don't I... stop the talk now, lady. Rocky will be back here in the hideout any minute now. i got to get you out of here safely. We'll have to work fast. <laughs> What's that? It's the shadow. Shadow? Why, well, I thought... You thought the shadow was dead. That your friend Rocky killed me in the water. I saw the wave stop. The shadow cannot be killed, Nick. Uh... What are you going to do to me? I'm going to let you go. You're not evil, Nick. You've been misled. I'm going to give you a chance. The chance to go straight. Rocky's come back. Well, if Rocky's come back... No! No, it's the monster! The monster! Come. Come with me. You're going to the bottom of the swamp. And no one will ever find your body there. Just as they'll never find Mankino. No. no, no, don't come near me. Stop. What? Who said that? The shadow. The shadow's dead. The shadow is not dead. The shadow can see through your disguise. No. No, stand back there. Let, let go of me. Now I recognize that voice. It's Rocky. So you're the thing of the swamp. You killed Mankino. Uh, now you know there's no reason for this disguise any longer. On the comes. So, Rocky... That explains the monster. A diving helmet and a rubber suit covered with seaweed. Yes, Shadow, now you know. What are you going to do about it? You must pay for your crimes, Rocky. Oh, no, not Rocky. I'm getting out of here and you're not stopping me. I've got my gun trained on Miss Lane here in one false move and she died. <laughs> Double-crosser. You killed her. Yes, 
Just as I killed Minkino and Nesta. Just as I'll kill you if the shadow tries to keep me from leaving here. You won't try to stop me, will you, Shadow? You can't escape justice, Rocky. Oh, yes, Shadow. I'm clever. You have to admit that. Not clever enough to find the money stolen from the bank. The money that you and Mankino stole together. You're wrong, Shadow. I found the money. And I have it outside. Mankino couldn't hide it from me. And now, Shadow, Miss Lane and I are leaving. Tried to stop me and she'll... <laughs> Well, you saw what happened to my double-crossing friend, Nick. Come on. No, you don't, Rocky. Oh, my God. You knocked it out of my hand. What's the matter, Rocky? Lost your courage and bravado? Or you I... lost your gun? Shadow, give me back my gun. Give it back no, to me. No, Rocky, you'll never have the opportunity to use it again. You'll never kill again. But you don't understand. I had to kill Mankino. He tried to cheat me out of my share of the money. I had to do it. The money which you and he had stolen from the bank? I helped him steal it. It belonged to me, too. You have a twisted sense of right and wrong, Rocky. There is only one place for men such as you. The police will see to it that you pay your debt to society. Your days of killing are over. <laughs> Rocky made a complete confession of the whole thing this morning. Well, Lamont, I still don't understand where Rocky got the idea for his monster disguise. Margot, strangely enough, he got it from Nestor by listening to the tale of the thing in the swamp on the radio. He procured a diving helmet with a portable oxygen tank, covered himself with seaweed, and brought Nestor's legendary monster to life. Well, what purpose did he have in doing that? He's been trying for five years to find out where Mankino hid the money. He knew that Mankino was almost stubborn enough to die rather than tell. And Rocky thought that he might scare it out of him. But why did he kill Nestor? He wanted to build up the story of the thing in the swamp so as to scare people away from the hiding place of the money until he found it. He thought Nestor's death would do that. Oh, one thing led to the other. Yes, Margot. You know, I've just had a weird thought. What? In a way... Nestor was killed by a monster that he himself brought to life in the minds of ten million listeners. So actually, he created a monster that destroyed him. A real-life drama proving that crime does not pay will be presented immediately after a message from John Barclay, Blue Coal's distinguished home heating expert, Mr. Barclay. Thank you. Friends, an important part of furnace operation is refueling, fixing the furnace. Now, here's the way to do it right. First, shake the grates gently until you see a red glow in the ash pit. But don't allow red coals to drop through the grate. Second... Take a hoe and pull the live coals to the front of the firebox so the fire slopes downward from the front to the rear. Then put the fresh coal to the rear of the furnace. But don't cover all the fire. Leave a spot of live coals in the front. You need these to ignite gases arising from the fresh coal. Finally, remove ashes from the ash pit and set the dampers. Close the check damper and open the ash pit damper. Of course, with the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator, the dampers are automatically adjusted for you. Yes, folks, the right way is the easy way, and the easy way in this case is the economical way. Your Blue Coal dealer is always glad to help you with your home heating problem at no charge, no obligation. I know you'll be pleased with the friendly help you receive. Call him tomorrow. Thank you. The Shadow Program is based on a story copyrighted by the Street and Smith Publications. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. We now bring you an episode from real life proving that crime does not pay. November 1939. It is late at night. 
Two cars are speeding along the road. Suddenly, the second swerves ahead and forces the first car into the curve. Hey. Hey, what's the big idea? Why don't you watch me driving? Get out of that car, you hear me? Get out of there. Put away that gun. Get out of there with your hands in the air and quick. Okay, I'll get out and I'll teach you not to point guns at people, too. <clears throat> oh, so you're tough, eh? Well, how do you like this? Dead. Dead. That's how Albert Gatti handles wise guys. The dead will haunt you, Albert Gatti. And all the guns in the world can't save you. In a cell in Queen City Prison, January 12th, 1942, Albert Gatti hanged himself with a twisted sheet. The dead were avenged. And once again was proved the truth of the warning... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your neighborhood blue coal dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. Remember, keep the home fires burning with blue coal. This story was produced by the dl and Coal Company, distributors of Blue Coal. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. But first, an important announcement. Beginning next Wednesday, The Whistler will come to you at a new time, one half hour earlier. 7.30 Pacific Coast Time. Same station, same day. Only the time will change. Remember, beginning next Wednesday, tune in the Whistler one half hour earlier. And now the Whistler's strange story. Sleep, my pretty one. A few months before, Jean would have dismissed the whole idea of having her fortune told as ridiculous. But there was a difference now. Yes, three months ago, the smart little ring on the third finger of her left hand wasn't there. And the future was something she could take or leave alone. But she had to admit now that she was pretty much like any other girl in love. That sane, scientific thing somehow seemed a little unimportant. That with marriage just around the corner, things like tea room fortune tellers suddenly seemed important and exciting. So she gave in without argument when her friend Betty suggested they leave their table and visit Madame Zorga in her alcove behind the fringed red curtains in the corner. And as the old woman gazed into her crystal and rambled on, Jean found somehow she was taking it all seriously. A little too seriously. on the crystal with me. <laughs> Max would be terribly shocked if he knew I was doing this. Please, signorina. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, it's a coming. They part now. The clouds part. I, I see a number. The number 13, and now the number 11. It is a date. The 13th day of the 11th month. November 13th? I gaze deeper. Again, the crystal clears, and I see the letter J. And now, the letter V. Your initials, Jean. What? How can she? I told you. Go on, Madame Zorga. I cannot go on. 
Oh, but there must be more. I ever told you. The image fades. The clouds close in. The reading, she's finished. Is, is something wrong? <laughs> of course there is. It serves me right for falling for this hocus-pocus. It's a no hocus-pocus, signorina. If you must know, I will tell you. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of November. Why, that's this week. Well, never mind, Betty. Here you are, madam. I better get back to the laboratory. It's late. And don't mention this to Max, will you, dear? If he ever caught me going to fortune tellers, he'd get himself a new lab assistant and a new fiancé. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, darling. I had lunch with Betty, and she insisted on a tea room across town, and you know how that is. Mm-hmm. Mm. There. Miss me, Doctor? Oh, that's a silly question. Of course I miss you, dear. Uh, hand me that beaker, will you? Huh? Oh. I've been up to my ears around here. Oh, here you are. Right. Uh, oh. Gesundheit. Oh, excuse me. Where'd you pick up the cold? I don't know. Oh, I'll have to do something for it. May I see you a minute, Mitchell? Oh, well, yes, Dr. Olson. I'll be with you in a minute, dear. All right. Mitchell. Dr. Davies tells me you want to try your drug on one of his encephalitis patients. Oh, that's right. The man's been in a coma for three weeks. I think E-37 can cure him. You think? That's no basis for administering an untried drug? But it looks like he hasn't a chance otherwise. Nevertheless, as head of this institute, I'm afraid I'll have to refuse you my permission. The fact that you injected a bunch of rats with the virus of sleeping... But you don't understand, Doctor. Those rats had sleeping sickness. With all the symptoms. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. E-37 cured every last one. That doesn't mean it's safe for a human being. I'd hoped you'd uh, remember the last hopeless patient it was tried on. How long did he last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? I told you I found what was wrong. I've eliminated the toxic factor. You've eliminated the toxic factor. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It's a highly constructive development. But it still is an experiment. And this institute will not experiment with human lives. I absolutely forbid you giving Davies this drug. That's final. Mm. Institute will not experiment. I... I couldn't help hearing it, Max. The transfer. Yeah. Seems, my love, that my work for the past year has been dedicated to a batch of white rats. Oh, there ought to be a way... There is, just one. The drug's got to be proven on a human patient. Olsen knows that. For thousands of years, encephalitis has been killing human beings like dogs, and Olsen says we can't afford to take a chance. Well, he's thinking of the institute. I'm thinking of humanity. There's always a risk. That's how we learn. That's how we progress. That's science. Jean. Yes? Jean, will you help me? Well, of course, darling. I'm going to test my formula. I can make the test and Olsen need never know about it. What? What kind of a test? On a human subject. What? But who can you... Darling, listen to me. You love me. Well, yes, Max. You... You trust me. Trust you? You've got to have faith in me, darling. It means everything now. Of course I have faith in you, Max. I have an aunt in Dorset, Vermont. We can drive up there tonight. But I, I don't understand, Max. How can you make a test on a human subject? Who can... Leave that to me, darling. I'm going to inject the subject with the virus then follow it at the peak of the attack with E-37. The only way I can show Olsen. But you... You haven't told me who you... You said you trusted me, Jean. Did you mean it? Yes, Max. Good. Come on now. Let's start packing the equipment. Oh, careful with that vial, Jean. Take us days to reproduce that drug. Oh, I'm wrapping it in cotton. <laughs> oh, excuse me. There you are, Max. Now, that ought to do it. You can close up the bag. Um. Well, hold still a moment, dear. Why? What are you... Just hold still. Max, what is this? Giving you a shot. That cold of yours. Can't have you sick at a time like this. I, I feel a little faint. I know. It always affects you this way. There. That's why I didn't warn you. I don't like injections, Max. Why did I told you, you dear. For your cold. <laughs> you better have faith in the doctor, don't you? Yes. Yes, Max. Of course. Good. Feel better now? Yes, I... I suppose so. Well, let's go, then. It's a five- or six-hour drive. Matt, wanna... aren't you going to leave word where we're going? Of course not. I don't want anyone to know where we are or what we're doing until... until it's over. <laughs> With 
the prologue of Sleep, My Pretty One. The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now a word to you folks who did some traveling throughout the Pacific Coast states this summer. In addition to beautiful scenery, you probably noticed two other things. One, that wherever you drove, you found friendly, dealer-owned signal service stations. And two, that from Canada to Mexico, signal gasoline is known as the go-farther gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of signal's good mileage. But even more so, we're proud of the thing which makes that mileage possible. I'm talking about the extra efficiency signal gasoline gets from your motor. For after all, extra motor efficiency also means more thrilling pickup, more silent, responsive power. The things that make driving so much more fun. Yes, it's a fact. Extra driving pleasure is the result of the same features a gasoline must have to give you mileage. The very thing Signal Gasoline is famous for. That's why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the Whistler. decision is made, Jean. And you're on your way now to the little farmhouse in southern Vermont, where it will be decided, rules or no rules, whether the contents of the cotton-wrapped vial in Max's belief is a life-saving drug or a deadly poison. There was no alternative. You had to agree to help Max now of all times when he needs you most. But as you guide the car north through the chill November night, you can't help feeling uneasy as if something is terribly wrong. You wonder about the human subject he's so vague about. His fanatic zeal for his work. His determination that science must come before all else. You glance sidewise at him at the solid set of his jaw. What's the matter, dear? Nothing. Better keep your eye on the road. Yes. Uh, it's nice of you to do the driving. These blasted new glasses, I'm not used to them. I don't mind. Max. Yes? You're... You're sure you're quite right in this? Hmm? I mean... Well, if Dr. Olson were to find out, you'd... You'd lose your position. If I succeed, Olson won't matter much. I'll have office from every institute in the country. And if you fail? He'll matter even less. <laughs> Good Lord, Jean, watch the road. I don't know, Max. I... What's the matter? That car. For a moment, I... I thought I saw two of them. <laughs> Careful now, the road's pretty narrow. I can see, thank you. Well, there's the house up ahead. Well, I'm glad the snow held off. We're in for a blizzard. There we are. There's the old pump house and the crab apple tree. And watch it, there's an old stump on the right. If you don't mind, Max, I've just driven 200 miles of ice-covered road safely. I think I can handle a country lane without advice. I'm sorry. Oh, I... Oh, I'm sorry, Max. I... I don't know what's the matter with me. I... I don't feel like myself. Well, well, this must be Jean. How do you do? Come in. I, I declare, Max, you got mighty good taste. <laughs> I've been telling you. You must been... be froze to the bone. Well, there's plenty of hot coffee in the kitchen. Now, make yourself the home, folks. Now, I'll take your things up to your room. Oh, don't bother. And get out some extra blankets. No, she can't hear you, Jean. Huh? She's stone deaf. Best to just let her go her own way. She will, anyhow. Uh, I see. Come on to the kitchen. i got to get this stuff on ice. I'm glad we're warm again. I'm so drowsy, though. Well, you're just tired, dear. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> Same old ice box. I have to clear a place here at the back for the vials. You got them there? Uh, right here. Good. Max. I don't like to keep asking this, but... What is it? Where do you expect to find anyone with sleeping sickness around here? I don't. What? 
Well, it's very simple. Since there are no cases of encephalitis at my disposal, there's only one answer. To create one. Max. To inject the subject with the virus, then, after a good case is developed, E37. But we're completely isolated here. Where can you find... I found the subject, Jean. No. Now, please let it go at that, will you? Max. Look what you've done. It slipped. I'm sorry. Why did it have to be this one? E-37, Gene, the cure. Every bit of it was in that box. Max, listen to me. Maybe it's better this way. Maybe you'd better forget about E-37. Treat the, the patient in the ordinary way. There must be a hospital somewhere. Don't but... be ridiculous. E-37 was our only chance. I injected 20,000 units of sleeping sickness virus. A fatal yes, dose. Yes, a fatal dose. We've got to start work on another batch of E-37 right now. Come on. You follow Max down the dim old hallway in a daze, like a figure in a nightmare. The kind where you run slowly as if through water, trying to escape while nameless shapes come closer and closer. And though you still refuse to believe, to recognize it, one of the shapes is fear. Here we are. What? Why, oh, it's a... Laboratory. It used to be Aunt Agnes Pantry. She turned it into a lab for me when I was a boy. Self-defense, in a way. I was always mixing chemicals in her kitchen. But, Max, this... This is nothing like your laboratory in town. How can you... Sure, it's crude, to... but it's all we've got. Between what I brought and what's here, we can duplicate E-37. With a little luck. How tired are you, Jean? Uh, I'm all right. Once we start the process, we can't let up for a second. Let's get to work. And so it begins, Jean. It's midnight when the two of you have straightened out the dusty laboratory, cleaned the glassware, the retorts, and Bunsen burners. Three in the morning when the first solution is ready to run. Well, keep an eye on the filtrate here. I'm going to make another setup. Yes, Max. The autoclave's working. Good. Well, how do you feel? Just, just tired. Of course you're tired. So am I. We'll make it, though, Jean. Don't worry. We'll make it. Make a note of that, will you? Right. November 10th, 5.20 a.m. First dilution complete. One hundred... Max. What's the matter? My eyes, I... I don't know. I can't seem to focus. Sit down and rest a minute. You'll be all right. November 11th, 10.15 a.m. Fourth distillate just coming up... No, it's it's November 12th, dear. What? You've lost a day somewhere. Of course, I don't seem to be conscious of time anymore. Yeah. If I ever get through this, I'm going to build a monument to black coffee. It hasn't any effect on me anymore. What time is it now? 4 p.m. It's 26 hours since we ran that solution. Ought to be right by now. You got the beaker ready? Yes. Here, Max. Sterilize. All right. Put it on the burner, will you? All right. That's it. Now we wait for more. Oh, time. What a maddening dimension. You hurry. You're in a frenzy of haste. But everything has to go at its own rate. You can't hurry a fire or a chemical reaction. While you wait for them, a virus is multiplying, increasing, threatening a brain, a life. Max! What? Please don't talk about it. Not now. Uh, give me a cigarette, will you? Well, yeah, of course. Thanks. And a light. Steady. What? Your hand's shaking like a leaf. I... I just can't seem to control them. Yeah. I guess I'm pretty tense, too. Equipment's obsolete. It's a gamble any way you look at it. But we've got a good chance. You've ever been afraid of taking chances? Have you, Max? Why do you say that? 
Even if it meant gambling with our happiness, your work would come first. Science comes before everything, doesn't it, Max? That's not a fair question. I think it's appropriate right now. What do you mean? I love you, Max. I'll always love you, no matter what happens. I want you to know that. Jean, this is no time to... There's still time to drop this crazy business. There's still time to give the... the patient one of the standard treatments. What are you talking about? Oh, Max. Let me call Dr. Olson. Oh, I see. You're giving up, huh? It, it's not that, Max. Well, I'm not giving up. We're going through with this. If my experiment's successful, I want to know that E-37 alone is responsible. And if not... Go on, Max. What if it isn't? Then I'll just have to face the music. I see. Where are you going? To, to get some more coffee. <laughs> You're glad the telephone's at the other end of the house. That you'll have a chance to get the call through to Dr. Olson in Boston before Max has a chance to stop you. You wait for the operator to answer, trying to fit the words together in a way that will tell Olson the story without going too hard on Max. There's no other explanation, is there, Jean? The dull pain in the back of your head. The nervous disturbance, the deadly fatigue, the double vision can mean only one thing. Oh, why, Jean. Oh, Aunt Agnes. You're man, girl, not trying to make a phone call, are you? Why, the line's been down for hours, kind of a storm. Oh, no. Oh, you look all worn out, child, and no wonder. The way you two been working. Wait. Oh, you Listen to me, Aunt Agnes. Some rest, child. Listen, listen to me. Seen such dark circles under anybody's eyes. Agnes, I'm oh, listen. Why are you shaking me like that? What's the matter, child? Oh, I... I'll write a note. There's paper and pencil by the phone. Watch, Aunt Agnes. Watch. Eh? What are you it's writing? Tired. Oh, Max trying yes. dangerous experiment. That's right. Stop him. It's life and death. My life and my death. Stop him, my land. You understand that? I wouldn't that. dream of such a thing. Life and death. Never interfered with his doings. Not even after the time he and I blew up the side of the barn. Please. Well, the rest of the family was all life. upset. Him for my one life. One or another, but not me. That oh, science, my. you know. Max says that's the way we learn. Jean, wait. Now, why'd she run off like that? <laughs> You run blindly out of the house, down the snow-covered path to the shed where you left the car. There's only one way now, Jean. You've got to get away, to leave him once and for all. You've decided now that he's a man without a heart, that you were foolish to have fallen in love with him. And there's a stabbing, cold feeling inside that tells you you've discovered it too late. And as you fumble for the car keys... The nightmare you've lived through for the past few days comes back in a rush. I'll inject the subject with the virus, and after a good case has developed, E-37. How long did the patient last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? Hold still, dear. Giving you a shot for that cold of yours. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. That car. I saw two of them. Twenty thousand units of virus. The drug is our only chance. I don't know what's the matter with me. I, I don't feel like myself. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of November. No future, no future. Oh. Why don't you start? Please, Jean, please. what on earth are you doing out here? Where do you think you're going? I'm at that... I thought if I could reach Dr. Olson, I wanted to get someone some help. We settled that once. I know, There's but... no help outside, only here. Now, where's the oxalate? Uh, on the top shelf of the cupboard. I looked there. You'd better come and show me. All right, Max. I'll come. <laughs> Is it, Jean? About nine. The hypodermic and the sterilizer? No. Well, put it in, put it in. We're almost ready. Now, where are the notes? Uh, notes? Oh, 
Here. Let's see. Uh, virus injected Monday, November 10th. Disease approaches critical state. Mm, pretty close. Better make the final entry, Jean. Or next to final while I finish here. All right. Ready now? Yes, Max. Preparing to administer anti-encephalitic drug E37 subject. Work commenced on drug at 1 a.m. November 10th. Completed at 9 p.m. November 12th. Your hand trembles as you write. As you watch Max rise, walk slowly to the sterilizer, lift the lid and remove the hypodermic. There's a no future for JV after the 13th day of November. You fight it out of your mind. Struggle against the fear that grips you as Max turns, hypodermic in hand. Everything begins to waver before your eyes. You drop the journal. I'll be over in a minute, Jean. See, I simply put the needle in the solution. Release the plunger. And then... No. No, Max. Jean. Please. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word to you drivers. You've heard me tell how Signal has grown from a mere handful of dealers in Southern California to almost 2,000 Signal stations serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. Well, recently I was going through some letters from you listeners to see if I could put my finger on the answer for the ever-increasing preference for Signal. A driver from Long Beach wrote, Since switching to Signal, I've been checking my mileage, and my car does go farther with Signal. Another wrote, my 1939 Chrysler is still purring like a kitten on signal gasoline. And still another said, whether I drive in for a tank full of gas or air for the tires, signal dealers give me the same courteous treatment every time. Well, there you have it. Some drivers praise the conscientious service at dealer-owned signal stations. Others rave about the quality of signal products. I have a hunch it's a combination of both. But for the best answer, why don't you try a tank full of signal gasoline? My bet is that once you do, you too will want to join the ever-increasing number of drivers who are switching to signal. And now, back to the whistler. It was too much, Jean, the sight of Max standing there with a needle. Gradually, you become aware of the room you're in. A pretty bright room with organdy curtains and the green leaves of an apple tree showing outside the window. The sun is pouring in now, and suddenly you realize it's afternoon sun. I think she's coming around. What? I say, I think she's... Oh, oh never mind, Aunt Agnes. Oh. Well, it's about time. Max. You've slept the clock around, young lady. It's after three. Max, it's all over. I'm all right. Yes, it's over, darling. You're all right. And we've won. Oh, there's the doorbell, Aunt Agnes. What? The doorbell. Doorbell. Oh, doorbell. I, I expect it's the judge. I'll sit him down in the parlor. Good. I, uh, I told the judge to drop by on his way home from town, dear. Thought we might make an appointment. That is, if you don't mind changing your name on an unlucky day like the 13th. Change my name. My initials on it. A... Unless you'd rather... No, it... Max, you... You haven't told me. What happened? What did you do? <laughs> well, if you hadn't fainted when you did, you'd have seen. Within five minutes after I took that injection, I was feeling better. You? And four hours later, there wasn't a trace of sleeping sickness in my blood. Oh, oh Max. Max, darling. <laughs> That's science, darling. You risk a little to gain a lot. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, which will come to you half an hour earlier beginning next Wednesday at 7.30 Pacific Coast time. 
The Whistler is brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Featured in tonight's story were Gene Bates and Elliot Lewis. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Ruth Bourne, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Brennan, Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Johnny. Oh, hi, Paul. How's the world doing by you? Oh, I got troubles. Oh, like what? Like Albert W. Winkler. Winkler? Who's he? Maybe you mean who was he? Well, which is it? Well, that's the trouble, Johnny. We don't know. Huh? Well, he's disappeared, and with him, a hunk of emerald worth exactly 100,000 clams. Wow. Well... Sure. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Insurance Company, Dawson Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blooming Blossom matter. Expense account item one, a dollar even. Taxi from my apartment to the offices of Inter-Allied, where Paul Brennan wasted no time in getting to the point. Albert Winkler was a partner in a small jewelry firm down in New York. Real exclusive type place. Floyd and Winkler? Yeah, that's the outfit. Well, a few days ago, they got hold of an emerald. It's called the Green Eye of Calcutta. And Johnny, the darn thing's big enough to choke a horse. Okay, Paul, okay. I don't think you need to go any further. No, wait. They planned to put it on an exhibition at the big international jewelry show in Chicago next month, and Winkler took it home to work on it. Oof. Insured for 100000 you said. Yeah, and Winkler's insured for ten. Okay. So who killed him and stole the rock? Listen, will you? Go ahead. Well, Sunday morning, his partner Blewett tried to phone him at his apartment. No answer. So Blewett sauntered down to the office thinking he might be there. But no sign of him? Right. Nor of the green eye of Calcutta. Only a note Winkler had left the night before saying he was taking the stone home to work on it. Well, that makes it look as though maybe Winkler... Listen, about that time, the phone rang there in the office. It was the police department, also looking for Winkler. Oh. Yeah, they'd been called by Winkler's landlord after a chambermaid had found his apartment completely ransacked and the old boy missing. Uh Uh-oh. Who's working on it? For the NYPD, I mean. Uh, Sergeant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct Homicide. Old friend of yours, I believe. Yeah, good man. Has he come up with anything? Nothing. Well, Johnny? Sure, Paul. Now? Now. Item two, another dollar for a taxi back to my apartment where I slicked the stubble off my face, showered, dressed, and was about to head for New York when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, good. Well, who's that? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Dollar. Huh? I must talk with you, sir. It's important, very important. Well, who are you? Me? Well, this is Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom. Yes, and I must see you right away. Well, what's this all about, Mr. Uh, Blossom, did you say? Oh, why, that's right. How did you know that? Oh, for... Is this some kind of a gag? It certainly is not. And to think that now I'll be working with you on a... Oh, it's wonderful, just wonderful. What are you talking about? Why, you, don't you see? I follow every single one of your cases, sir. Either in the newspapers or on the radio. Oh, I'm your biggest fan. Is, uh, is that all you call to say, Mr. Blossom? It is not. I'm calling about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. Albert Winkler. Winkler? You know something about him, his whereabouts? I certainly do. Where are you, Mr. Blossom? Uh, Here at my house in New York, and I'll be waiting for you, sir. Goodbye. No, wait. Give me your address. Oh, oh, yes, of course. How could you know where to come if I hadn't given you that? (laughs) That was silly of me. Well, goodbye. The address, man, the address. Oh, Oh, of course. It's 825 East 73rd Street. (laughs) 
Item three, $9.20 transportation and incidentals to New York City and 825 East 73rd Street. It turned out to be one of New York's famous old brownstone houses, well-preserved and reeking of an era long past, when the city's wealthy and elite had built row on row of these monuments to a now-forgotten financial aristocracy. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in. I'm Wilbert Kenworthy Blossom, and I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be working with you on this. I don't know how to describe it, but I'll try. The inside of Blossom's home was unbelievable. Ornate pre-Victorian furnishings, heavy velvet draperies, huge lamps and chandeliers, gilt frame mirrors, even an ancient horsehair sofa. It was also filled with dusty piles of newspapers and magazines, hundreds of old books. Travel books, Mr. Dollar, and mysteries. Oh, I just love mysteries. One corner of the high ceiling living room was piled with old trunks and handbags, an old carpet bag even. Boxes of tools and utensils were stacked about. An ancient Victrola, beat-up sewing machine. You just never know when you might want to sew something, do you? Old guns and pistols, some of them museum pieces. A stringless tennis racket. A pair of rusty handcuffs locked to the base of a floor lamp without a shade. A broken bicycle pump. That's just in case I ever find a bicycle to go with it, you understand. Uh, yes. Against one wall stood an old metal cabinet loaded with rusty surgical instruments and a worn-out catcher's mitt. Yet... Directly opposite was a corner shelf full of priceless porcelain figurines and rare pieces of china. Some of the old clocks and jewelry on the mantelpiece were collector's items. Fine original oil paintings lay among piles of old shoes. All in all, it looked as though the contents of half a dozen pawn shops had been dumped into it. At auction sales, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, sir. I just cannot resist an auction sale or a bargain. But what are you going to do with all this stuff? Oh, just keep it. I like it. I like a lot of things. Yeah, so I see. Including 12 gross of Spencer's superlative steel tip shoelaces patented 1841. They were a bargain, Mr. Dollar. Just like all this fine artwork is, too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Some of my friends pamper me a bit, though. You know, send me things they pick up at sale. Yeah, now look, Mr. Blossom, you told me you know something about Albert W. Winkler. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Well? And think of that magnificent emerald. Gone. And disappear. Yeah, but now you said... And that poor Interallied Insurance Company. Oh, my. That's how I knew you would be called on this case. But a hundred thousand dollars... And ten thousand dollars on Mr. Winkler. Well, at least they're off the hook on him until he's proved dead. Aha. And that's where I come in. With proof. Proof? What proof? Have you seen Winkler? Mr. Dollar... I have. Well, where is he? You understand, of course, that I know Mr. Winkler very well because I've seen him at his office so many times. Yeah, okay, go on. Oh, go yes, on. indeed. Such beautiful, beautiful jewelry he had there. And, of course, he was always trying to buy some of the things I But had. you say you've seen him. Where? Well, Saturday I'd planned with a couple of old friends to attend a railroad auction. Uh, that was the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad. Winkler was there at the auction sale? Oh, well, yes. Did you speak to him? Oh, no. Well, why not? You said you knew him. Oh, I didn't go to the auction. I wasn't feeling very well that day. I had a little... <clears throat> a little cough. <clears throat> it was kind of like that. Then how do you know he was there? My friends went. And at least they talked about going. Mr. Blossom. And I'm sure you... they did, too, because they sent me something from... And what do you suppose it was? I don't know. I don't care. Now, look here. You got it me It was to... the very thing that has solved this whole case for you. What? And think of it. This dull, drab, dreary life of mine has suddenly become... Why, it's almost like a mystery story, isn't it? Adventure and... Look, Mr. Blossom, think would of it, you... Think of it. I'm being a detective. I'm working with my idol, the famous Johnny Dollar. Oh, George. Mr. Blossom, what did they send you? What's that? Oh, oh yes, of course. I'm sitting... uh, uh, here. Here it is, sir. Uh... It's right here between the erector set and the golf clubs. This old trunk? That's right. Oh, great Scott, you think you do. But at first, of course, I, I thought of calling the police. But knowing all about you... Mr. Blossom, let me see that. Excuse me. There are a lot of crumpled newspapers on top. Yeah, I see. As old as the trunk. Good Lord. It, uh, It isn't pretty, is it? Sergeant Randy Singer, homicide. 
Randy, Johnny Dollar, get somebody over to 825 East 73rd Street right away, will you? Body of Albert Winkler. Randy got there in a matter of minutes. Got the same story from Blossom that I had, then called for the lab crew to come and take over. Now, now, who delivered this trunk, Mr. Blossom? But it was just, uh, just a delivery man. Can you describe him? Would you know him if you saw him? Yeah, well, he was big and strong. He was very strong. Distinguishing features. Scars or a limp or a beard or well, something? Well, I told you, Johnny, he was big and strong. How old? Well, I would say he was somewhere between 25 and, um... Yeah? 50. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Well, that's a lot of help. Yeah, you better have those thick spectacles changed. But he was big. Yes, we know, and strong. What about his truck? Oh, I didn't see that. He left it outside. No. Now, look. These friends of yours who did attend the auction, who were they? Oh, oh yes. Now the investigation proceeds. Now the excitement... Who were they, Mr. Blossom? Uh, oh... Well, there's a uh, Randolph Harrison and Christopher. Randy Singer took down the names of Blossom's three auction minded friends. The lab crew arrived. Randy took off to dig up Blossom's friends, and I took a cab. That's item 480 cents to the apartment of Elwood Blewett, Winkler's partner in the jewelry business. Blewett lived alone in a modest but tastefully furnished five or six rooms on East 52nd Street. Of course, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to help you all I can. Albert's death has been a terrible blow. Yes. Well, tell me this, please. Yes? Did Mr. Winkler make a habit of taking valuable pieces of jewelry to his residence? Yes, Albert often took pieces home with him to work on them, clean, polish, and so on. Wasn't that a rather dangerous practice? Frankly, I always thought so. But he felt there was far more chance of being robbed if he were alone at the office than at his flat, where he wouldn't be expected to have anything of great value. Well, who has seen the green eye of Calcutta besides you and Mr. Winkler? I'm not sure. Of course, almost anyone would have been able to recognize it. Because of the publicity and pictures when you brought it over here? Yes. Come to think of it, Blossom indicated he'd been much impressed with it. Wilbur Blossom? Yeah. Do you know him? He's been in the office many times. He and Albert were always bickering over pieces that either of Bickering? Had... Well, it was really something of a joke. Albert always wanted some of Blossom's heirloom pieces, and Blossom wanted some of the finer things we had. Did he ever buy? Never. He always wanted us to put them up at auction or at a bargain price. Hardly our way of doing things, needless to say. When did you last see Blossom? By... Last Friday, I was busy with an important client, and from the back room where Albert worked, I remember hearing Blossom insist that Albert show him the emerald. What did he? I don't know. The silly argument got so noisy that I closed the door on them. Hmm. Oh, now, wait. Certainly you aren't thinking that perhaps Wilbert Blossom... I'm not quite certain what I'm thinking, Mr. Blewett. <laughs> Item five, ten cents, phone call to Randy Singer. No, not a thing, Johnny. One of the three names on Blossom's list is in Europe. The other two did go to the railroad auction, but purchased nothing. Randy, do a couple of things for me, will you? Like what? Phone whoever is stationed at Winkler's place that I want to look it over. Sure, everything is just as it was, including the poker that was used to kill him. Also, I want a copy of the picture of the trunk your lab boys took and the list of Blossom's friends. I'll have them waiting for you. And post a man at Blossom's place. Keep an eye on him. Hmm? Yes, right away. Johnny, have you learned something that... No, no, just, uh, well, just for his protection, say. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but... I... <laughs> Blossom. Yeah, Blossom. Maybe I hadn't given enough thought to the strange little character. Or to why the trunk with Winkler's body had been at his place. But if he were involved, why call me in? Cover up? Possibility. But Wilbert Blossom kill a man? Yeah, maybe he could. Maybe he did. I'd better see him as soon as I get through with the inspection of Winkler's apartment. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hi, officer. Did Sergeant Singer call and tell you that... He's on the phone here in the Winkler apartment now. Wants to talk to you. Says it's very urgent, sir. Okay, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, how did you know? Huh? The man I sent to cover Blossom's house for you got there too late. What? Whoever got in and attacked the poor old coot got away. Attacked? Blossom? Yeah, I really did a job on him. Johnny? <sighs> okay, Randy. Thanks. Thanks. 
Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. As everyone knows, democracy means many things. Self-rule of the people, a higher standard of living, freedom of speech, press and religion, rights and privileges, liberty. But the most vital promise of democracy is mankind's right to dignity. For it is through the dignity of man that democracy has given mankind its greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blooming Blossom Matter. Expense account item six, two dollars and a quarter for a fast taxi ride to 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. All right. As soon as I got your call, Johnny, I sent a uniformed man over to Blossom's house. From the way you talked, I thought maybe you suspected him. Yeah, Randy, I'm afraid I did. Boy, how wrong can you be? Anyhow, when he got there, he found the front door open and Blossom lying in the dark hallway. Where's Blossom now? In the hospital, but he's okay, just bruised up a bit. They're letting him out. Fingerprints? Anything to go on? The lab's checking on the prints right now. Uh-huh. Let me know. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. So, now let's find out who tried to put Blossom out of the way and we'll have the guy who killed Winkler. And stole the 100000 worth of emerald, then shipped Winkler's body to Blossom. Oh, uh, and by the way, here's the picture of the trunk you asked for and the three names Blossom gave me. Harrison, Norton, and Scatterday. What are you going to do with them? Randy, hmm? suppose the man who attacked Blossom is the one who did all the rest. You got a better suppose? Well, look, Randy, whoever wielded that poker on Winkler couldn't have been very strong. A really hefty wallop would have bent it out of shape. And the lab agrees with you. But, of course, it didn't take much of a blow to finish off old Winkler. He didn't weigh much over 100 pounds, you know. Yeah. Any strong arm could have finished him off easily and without messing up the whole apartment. And don't forget, whoever did him in also put him in the trunk and delivered it to Blossom's house. But why? Yeah. Yeah, and where's the emerald? That's what you should be worried about. A hundred grand worth of worry for your insurance company. Now, what are you going to do with that picture of the trunk and the list of Blossom's friends? Oh, yeah, sure. Hmm? I'll see you later. Item seven, five dollars and a half for a taxi to the warehouse of the Canyon City and Metropolitan Railroad over in Jersey. There I finally managed to track down a man who knew something about their occasional auction sales of unclaimed baggage and stuff. Insurance investigator, eh? That's right, Mr. McKinney. One of those boys with a fancy expense count, eh? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Look, you had an auction sale here last Saturday, didn't you? That's right. Handled it myself. Want to know something about uh, something we sold off? Exactly. Then I'm your man. Always remember all about every single item I sell and who bought it and, and all about them. That's fine. Because I want to know if any of the names on this list bought from you on Saturday. Yeah. Randolph Harrison. Man by the name of Harrison buy anything? Mm, no. How about Percival Wentworth Scatterday? No. Ellsworth Norton? No. You sure, Mr. McKinney? I'm sure. How, uh, how about Blossom? That a man's name? Yes, Wilbert Blossom. Well? No, sir. Nope, never heard of him. And like I told you, I never forget the stuff I sell or the fellas I sell it to. Wait. This picture of a trunk. Huh? Have you ever seen this trunk? Well, yeah. Did you sell this trunk on Saturday? Yes, I did. To whom? Come on, man, it's important. Well, uh, now, I was real early in the sale. Yeah, before most of the people got here. Uh, bought this trunk and had it sent to his apartment in New York. And his name? Well, it was a funny kind of name. Uh, Blinky or Winky or... Uh, oh, no. Winkler. Winkler. That was it. Albert Winkler. <laughs> Item eight, two dollars, two drinks for myself at the nearest bar. But they didn't help to kill my feeling of utter frustration. Item nine, five fifty taxi back to 18th Precinct headquarters in New York for want of a better place to go. Oh, it's about time you got here, Johnny. Oh. Uh, we matched up the prints we found after Blossom was attacked. You know who made them? Yeah, here's his card. Carlo Bernasconi. Any reckon? A couple of a dozen arrests, only one conviction. Anything to do with jewelry? Better. Accessory to a hijack operation a couple of years ago. He drove the truck. Hey. Sure. Got a mugshot of him? We got him. Downstairs. Come on, I'll take you down. Randy, what's he look like? Like you'd expect the truck driver to look, big husky brute. Has he admitted anything? Well, the threat of a murder charge made him talk all right, but none of it makes any sense. Of course it doesn't. But he's our boy all right. He killed Winkler, beat up Blossom. I thought your lab decided whoever killed Winkler was a small fellow. 
Mm, yeah, I So the theory about the same man killing Winkler and beating up Blossom doesn't work. But, Johnny, holy... Come on down, let's talk to this Bernice Cohn. After I make a phone call. Huh? Who to? Yeah? Get me a man named McKinney. Canyon City, a Metropolitan Railroad warehouse over in Jersey. Make it fast, please. Yes, sir. Hey, you been over there, Johnny? Just before I got here. Did you find out anything? No, but I'm going to now. Like what? Randy, for the first time, this whole thing is beginning to make sense. Here's your party. Mr. McKinney? That's me. This is Johnny Dollar, remember? Sure do. Good. Say, now... I've been reading in the paper since you left here about that body found the trunk over there in New York. Yeah, well, look. In that same, is that the same trunk you was over here asking about? Yes. Now, you told me that trunk was bought by a man who gave his name as Winkler. That's right. Do you remember what he looked like? Sure do. Why, I can give it to you as accurate as if it was in the police file. Well? Height, uh, mm, five foot nine, maybe nine and a half. Go on. Weight, between 155 and 58. You see, when I was young, I worked with a carny show, guessing weight and height, and if I didn't guess it right... Yeah, okay, okay. Now, how about the uh, color of the eyes? <laughs> well, I noticed them because of the way he squinted through them thick, old-fashioned steel glasses. Thanks, Mac. I'm sending you a ten spot in the next mail. Well, now... Well, Johnny? Come on, Randy. Let's go down and see this Bernasconi. You find something out new? Yeah. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, look, Bernasconi, you're in plenty of trouble for the assault on Blossom. Maybe even more. But I'm the man who can save you from a murder rap. If you'll answer a couple of questions. Ah, uh, sure. I told the cops... All right. All right. Did you pick up and deliver a trunk yesterday morning? Sure, I told him. For a guy named Winkler. You got the trunk from Winkler? Sure, at his apartment on East... What did he look like? How tall? Uh, maybe five, eight, or ten. What? Johnny... Slight uh... build or heavy or what? I'd say about medium. Maybe 150 pounds. Johnny... Now, look, mister... Now, wait a minute. You look. Did you deliver that trunk to a man named Blossom? Sure. At 825 East 73rd Street. What did he look like? Him I never seen. I knew it. He hollered from a window that the door was open and I should put the trunk in the living room. <laughs> what a junk house. But you must have seen him later when you came back and assaulted him. It was night then. When he came to the door, I just slugged him and let him lay there. Then I went inside where the lights was on to look for... Well, I looked for the big rock I'd read about in the paper. But then I heard a prowl car coming, so I beat it. The trunk wasn't there anyway. Okay, Bernasconi. See you later, Randy. Now, just a minute. Hey, and what about me? You said it... Item 10, 90 cents, taxi to Wilbert Blossom's old brownstone house on East 73rd. Come in, come in, Johnny. Thanks, Mr. Blossom. All recovered from your beating? Oh, of course I am. Here, sit down, sit down. You, uh, you said you wanted to help me on this case. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Why, this chance to work with a man I consider the finest insurance investigator in the world. Yeah. That's why I called you when I got the trunk with Mr. Winkler's body in it. Mr. Blossom, why don't you tell the truth? All my drab, dull life, I wanted to be a detective, an investigator. And this was my chance. My chance... Tell the truth, did you say? (sighs) Mr. Blossom, listen to some facts for a minute and see what conclusions you draw from them. Oh, deductions. (laughs) Like a detective. To begin with, this house of yours is so full of, well, junk. I told you, Johnny, I like things. I like things. But it also has a lot of fine paintings, sculpture, china, jewelry. Oh, I like all sorts of things. Especially if they're fine and rare. And bargains. (laughs) Like the green eye of Calcutta? Oh, the most beautiful emerald in the world. And I would conclude that you'd do just about anything to have that stone. Yes, sir, Johnny. I'd reach the same conclusion. Okay. Now, when Albert Winkler and the emerald disappeared, it was in the papers that Inter-Allied had written policies on them. Conclusion? Yes, sir. I would deduce that you would be called in. Wouldn't it be smart, then, if the killer was afraid I'd eventually get around to him anyway? Wouldn't it be smart for him to call me in and offer to help me? As a cover-up for what he'd done? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Or at least he'd think it would. Oh, yes, I... I guess he thought it would. Another thing, Mr. Boss. Well, huh? what is it, Johnny? The body was packed in the trunk with old newspapers. Like these you keep piled around. 
Oh, yes, yes. And I would deduce... So obvious that both Randy Singer and I overlooked them completely. Oh, well, there's so many things piled around here. (laughs) You couldn't be expected to... Johnny. Yeah? What really made you decide that... uh... Well, I'd like to know. All right. Albert Winkler was a frail little old man, about 4'11", not much over 100 pounds. Yes, he was. But the man who bought the trunk and had it sent to Winkler's apartment, who gave his name as Winkler, that man was about 5'9", 155 pounds. And he wore thick, old-fashioned, steel-rimmed glasses. But, Johnny, I can't see without them. Then there's the truck driver. The man who ordered the trunk delivered to this house gave his name as Winkler, too. But Winkler was dead by then. Dead from a blow inflicted not by some big bruiser, but by somebody of, say, your bill. Oh, that awful truck driver who thought the emerald would be in the trunk and came here to steal it and who beat me up. I suppose you want the emerald. Yeah. Here, Johnny, I... I kept it in this old coffee pot uh, that I picked up at an auction sale. Real bargain, too. Oh, isn't it a beautiful stone? Oh, if only Mr. Winkley would have sold it to me. That a bargain, that is. Then none of this would have happened. Well, I guess we better go now, aren't we? Huh. It's such a silly thing. Me trying to act like a detective. I guess I didn't even make a very good killer, did I? Why? Just this overpowering passion to have things? Maybe. Or maybe it was just a reaction. A last desperate attempt to some way, any way, break from a lifetime of lonely, dull, drab idleness. I don't know. But for some crazy reason, I feel sorry for the funny little old character who turned killer. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, $61.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... A case so simple, so easy, so obvious, that it proves almost impossible to solve. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Howard McNear, Herb Ellis, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gersel, and Johnny Jacobs. Musical supervision is by Jerry Goldsmith. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of Star Times. Dear Dan, if this is the way you want it, okay. If a pal and buddy has to reach you the hard way, all right. Enclosed is a ticket to my fight with Brennan tomorrow night. I'd like to see your mug at ringside. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up for you. Johnny Capella. Johnny Capella, a kid when I first met him, fighting in a different way. At Anzio. And maybe, just maybe, Anzio wasn't as hard for him to take as what happened right here. And now back to Box 13 and Dan Holiday's newest adventure, Double Right Cross. Johnny Capelli, contender for the middleweight crown, a big, overgrown kid with a smile full of white teeth and a heart full of kindness for everybody. Johnny Capelli, I never heard of him, Mister Holiday. Well, you don't read the sport pages, Susie. But you know him, huh? Uh-huh. We played duck on a rock on the beach at Anzio for keeps. <laughs> I saw him a little while ago. Told him my box thirteen idea, and I guess he saw the ad in the Star Times. And you're going to fight, huh? Yes, that's it, Susie. Did he send you a bedside seat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I can do with that one. So long, Susie. In the driving rain, I headed for the stadium. And my cab ran fenders first into a traffic jam. Well, there was no use trying to get through, so I paid off the cabbie and started to plow the rest of the way to the stadium. I looked at my watch two minutes after ten. The first round of the fight was underway. By the time I hit ringside, people were already on their feet leaving. There was booing. And talk. Capelli knocked out. Capelli acted like a fourth rater. Johnny Capelli laid down. I pushed my way back to the dressing rooms with a little knot of people around one door, and a girl was rattling the knob and calling. Johnny, Johnny, please open the door. Johnny. What's the matter? What's going on? Uh, how are you? Report up, beat it. No, I'm a friend of Johnny's. Who are you? His manager. I mean, I was, but not after tonight. He loses one fight, and you're quitting. Yeah, like he did. When he comes out of there, tell him he can take this contract and tell him. You're Helen, aren't you? Yes. Please go away. Johnny can't see any reporters now. Please go, will you? I looked at him. So this was Helen. The girl Johnny dreamed about, talked about, raved about, and talked some more about. All the while, he and I were trying to miss the casualty list in Italy. The girl he sent a diamond brooch, bought with a year's pay, he hoarded like a miser. Well, if looks counted, she was worth it. She rattled the knob again. And... Please, Johnny, it's Helen. Johnny. May I try? Johnny. Johnny, this is Dan. Dan Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, yes, you recognize the name? Oh, yes, Johnny spoke of you. He said... <laughs> What's the matter with Johnny? He won't come out, Holiday. Oh? Who are you? Helen's brother. You see if you can get Johnny out of there, Holiday. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny Capelli. It's Dan, Johnny. Is there any other way out of this dressing room? Yeah, the window. This is the ground floor. He could have got out of the window. Look, both of you, Helen and... Uh, Name's um, Eddie. Yeah, all right, Eddie. Get somebody with a key to open this door. Go ahead, Eddie. Step on it. Okay, be back in a minute. Now, what's all this about, Helen? Oh, I don't know. As soon as the fight was over, it came... He was conscious? Yes, he walked, but we got the door here, and he broke ahead of me and ran in and locked the door, and I just... All right, Helen. All right. Now, take it easy. We'll find out what's happened. When we got into the dressing room, Johnny was gone and Eddie was right. The window was open. I couldn't figure it. Johnny Capelli, a kid whose courage was A+. Plus. A kid who went through Anzio, Salerno, Casino. Sure, he was scared, like just like the rest of us. But he didn't whimper. 
And he didn't run out ever. He just didn't figure. And Helen didn't make it any more clear. No, I don't know. I don't know why I ran away. Well, take it easy, sis. Johnny must have had a reason. Yes, he must have. Now, listen, where'd he go? Well, if he's not at the hotel, I, I don't know. Well, he called there. That's no good. Any other place, think. Well, I, I don't know of any. Uh, all right. Uh, where can I get in touch with you later? 387 Christopher Place. Good. You wait there. I'll find Johnny. It was tough, but I finally tracked on a cab driver who remembered picking up a man back at the stadium. Seemed, well, drunk, he said. Took him to a little hotel on the other side of town. It could be Johnny, so I went there and... Go away. Johnny. Get out. Listen to me, Johnny. This is Dan. Dan Holliday. Dan? Yeah, let me in, Johnny. No, go away. Just go away, will you? What are you trying to do, Johnny? Nothing. Please, will you go away? Look, kid, let me in or I'll break in. Johnny. How are you, Dan? Where's the light? Don't turn it on. Don't, Dan. Okay, Johnny. No light. Close the door. Why'd you come? Why do you think? Listen, nobody else knows where I am, do they? No, nobody. Helen? No. Where is she? Home, waiting waiting for me to call her. But you're not going to. What's the matter, Johnny? Dan, I... I'm sick. What do you mean? I don't know. Look, Dan, it was swell of you to come. There's nobody I'd want to see any more than you, but... Not now, Dan. Some other time, but not tonight. You're going to tell me what's wrong, Johnny. All right. Turn on the light and take a look. Johnny. Yeah. Better with the light off, isn't it? Now, listen, you took a beating. You're hurt, kid. Hurt badly. I've got to get a doctor. No. I said yes. No, you got a doctor, so help me, Dan. I'll, I'll kill you. I'll... Uh... Johnny. Hello. Desk clerk? Listen, get a doctor to room 10 right away. And that means right now. All right, Mr. Holliday. He'll sleep for a while now. How long before he wakes up, doctor? Five, six hours, maybe longer. How badly is he hurt? Well, that's hard to tell. He took quite a beating. Uh, who is he? A uh, friend of mine. I see. Right? Yeah, sort of. Well, I, uh... Look, doctor, as long as there's no gunshot wound, you... You don't have to report this, do you? No, but, uh... Well, let's leave it that way, then, huh? You'll be back in the morning? Yes. I'll make a more thorough examination, then. He was too hysterical to do much with tonight. But I think he'll be calmer when he awakens. Then there's nothing... Nothing too bad. I don't think so. Bruises, contusions, and his eyes. I, uh... What's wrong with his eyes? I'll see you in the morning. Uh, good night, Mr. Holliday. Good night. Thanks, Doctor. I sat by Johnny's bed and watched. I, I didn't call Helen because... Well, for some reason, Johnny didn't want anybody to know. To know what? Maybe I'd find out when Johnny came, too. Maybe he wouldn't tell me. And I just couldn't see Johnny running out on anything. There had to be something wrong. Something big. I sat in a chair alongside the bed and thought about it. And I guess I fell asleep because the next thing I knew, I... Huh? Oh, oh, just a minute. Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, Doctor. Is he still sleeping? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe for another hour or so. But I'll wait. Thanks. He'll be all right? Well, I'd like to ask him a few questions when he awakens. I don't think there's anything seriously wrong, but, uh... Well, I'll wait. What are you getting at? I don't know. You'll have to wait, too. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll go out and get some coffee. You can use some, too, can't you? Yes, thanks. I'll be right back. I thought I'd be right back. But when I got down to the street, something changed my plans. 
There was a newsstand, and the first thing that hit my eye was a sub-headline. It said, Boxing Commission holds up Capelli purse. Capelli disappears after fight fiasco. I hurried to a phone, called the Star Times, got a few strings pulled, and a half hour later, I was sitting across from the commissioner at his home. Just exactly what interest do you have in this, Mr. Holliday? I'm a friend of Johnny's. I see. All right. You must have something important to tell me this early in the morning. I want you to tell me something, Commissioner. What? Why is the commission holding up Johnny's purse? Because we believe the fight was not quite on the level. Meaning, you think Johnny threw it? We don't know. We're going to look at the movies this morning. Johnny didn't throw that fight. Did you see it? No, I didn't, but I... How do you know? Oh, because I know Johnny. That's your only reason? I think it's enough, Commissioner. Look, Mr. Holliday, we have one job to do. Keep the boxing game fair and square as a service to the fans who pay their money to see good, clean sport. Capelli was a ten-to-one favorite last night. A big bet placed on Brennan would bring a lot of money to anyone. Meaning Johnny might have bet on Brennan? It's been done. And the commission is in business to see that it doesn't happen anymore. Until Capelli proves otherwise... We'll say he threw that fight. I didn't believe it. But Johnny lost. He lost badly. And he did run out and he... And he wouldn't tell why. I went back to the little hotel and ran into the doctor who was just leaving. Oh, Mr. Holliday. That cup of coffee took a long time. It wasn't coffee. How's Johnny? He'll be all right. That all? No. Last night when I examined him, something puzzled me. What? His eyes. Pupils dilated. And? This morning when I examined him again, I asked a few questions. What about? Your friend had every symptom of bellamine poisoning. Last night, the pupils of his eyes were dilated and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. That would affect his sight, wouldn't it? Yes. Taken internally, bellamine is poisonous. Quarter grain enough is fatal. And less than that? Dryness of throat, nervousness... In other words, if someone gave him bellamine, he'd he'd have a hard time seeing. Very difficult. And if he were a boxer? (laughs) If he were a boxer and went in the ring with his eyes in that condition, he wouldn't be able to see his opponent. To box 13 and Double Right Cross with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So Johnny lost the fight because he couldn't see Brennan. But why did he run out? Why didn't he want anyone to see him? I, I thought I was going blind, Dan. Brennan was just a shadow that was beating me. Well, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you say something? Because Tom? I didn't want anybody to know it was going to be that way. I'd take it alone. Noble, huh? Look, Dan... I waited a long time for that fight. You meant a crack at the title. Helen waited with me. If I was going blind, I wasn't going to let her know. Stick with me. Sure, sure. A kid like you would think that way. Now listen to me, Johnny. Somebody fed you the stuff to impair your sight. Somebody who wanted you to lose that fight. Who? You're crazy, Dan. What did you eat yesterday? Eat? The day of the fight? Nothing. Just a little breakfast. And the rest of the day? Nothing. Liquids? Water? Milk? Of course not. No fighter fills himself up with liquids. Makes him logy, heavy on his feet. But, Johnny, the bellamine had to be given to you just before you went into the ring. Any earlier in the day, and the effect would have worn off before the fight. Look, why don't you lay off, Dan? I'm telling you, I, I didn't eat anything or drink anything, not for hours before the fight. But you had to. No, 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 I know what I did. I, look, maybe it was my eyes. Maybe it is what I thought. I got hit in Italy, Dan. Maybe it's not that. The doctor knows what he's talking about, Johnny. Somebody fed you that stuff. Who? You tell me. Nobody. I didn't eat, drink. Do I have to go over all that again? No. But I am. You wait here, Johnny. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite over Brennan. And somebody played that for all it was worth. And it looked like it was worth a lot of money if the bet was big enough. A little while later, I was talking to Brennan. You're crazy, Holiday. Uh, 
Maybe the guy wasn't in shape. Look, Brandon, Johnny was in condition. So you're telling me that somebody dealt him? Meaning me? No, 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 I'm just asking. And I'm telling. I got 120 fights on a clean sheet. None of them were shady. I don't play that way. I'm not saying that. I'm only trying to find out who could have given Johnny that drug. Well, I wasn't near his dressing room. I didn't, didn't even see him after we weighed in that afternoon. All right, it, it had to be in his food. Food? No fighter's going to eat right before a match. I drink water? He just winches his mouth, that's all. What else, Bennett? If he's training right, nothing else. But, but if he gets thirsty... I told you, he just winches his mouth. He drinks water, it makes him heavy. That's why a fighter chews gum all day. It gives him a more... Gum? Fi- yeah, gum. Why? Gum. That's it, Brennan. That's it. Sure, I chewed gum all day. Before the fight in your dressing room? I must have been chewing gum. I remember the... Go ahead, son. What were you going to say? Nothing. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Look, there's only one way the drug could have been given to you. Now, you've got to think who gave you gum just before you went in that ring. I didn't have any. Johnny, what are you hiding? Nothing. You were going to say something a second ago. Did Baker, your manager, give you... No. Who else was with you? Just Baker. I was Helen. Shut up, Dan. Did she give you any gum? Forget the whole thing. I'm going blind, that's all. Oh, you're yeah, not. Feed it. Helen gave you that gum. She was in your dressing room before the fight, wasn't she? Cut it out, Dan. That's why you shut up before you remembered. And the chewing gum was the only way the drug could be given to you. Because you didn't eat, you didn't drink water or anything else before you went in that ring. But maybe 15 minutes before, Helen handed you the gum, didn't she? Shut up, Dan. Shut up and forget the whole thing. Come on, Johnny. She gave you the gum, didn't she? Didn't she? You, uh, you still got a good right, Johnny. I'm sorry, Dan. Sure. Sure, let's forget it. But I didn't want to forget it. I left Johnny and went to see Baker's manager. I didn't tell him what I'd found out. I just listened. Sure, I brought the kid up from the ham and egg palims. But after last night, we've washed up. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, a match with the champ next. Did you bet on Johnny? I never bet. Even if you thought Johnny was going to win? What are you driving at? At somebody who stood to make a killing if Johnny lost. You're asking for a cloud holiday? I just had one. What about Helen? Uh, what about her? All right, Baker, here are the cards. Johnny went in the ring last night, a sure bet to lose. What? Yeah, that's right. He was drugged. He couldn't see Brennan from the first bell until he was counted out. He was fighting on instinct and courage. Listen, what are you giving me? There was nobody in his dressing room but me and... And Helen? Yeah. Now, what about her? Nothing. Except once I walk in on the two of them and... Well, they was having a fight. What about them? They clammed up when I walked in, but I heard something about a brooch. Brooch? Diamond brooch? The one Johnny sent her from Italy? Maybe. All I know is what I said. That's enough. Thanks, Baker. Maybe you'll have a champ on your hands yet. The next stop was to see Helen. I, I wasn't sure how to handle this. And all I had to go on was the fact that Johnny was covering for... Why? And they'd had a fight over that brooch. Again, why? So the big question was, did she or did she not double-cross Johnny? Her first words to me were... Dan, you found Johnny. Maybe. Maybe, but what do you mean? Sit down, Helen. What's the matter? Is he all right? He'll be all right. He's, he's in a little hotel. Well, then take me there. I want to see him, Dan. Maybe he doesn't want to see you. What? Johnny, now... Did he say that? No. Well, what are you doing? Why don't you take me to him? Why are you talking like this, Dan? How much did you win on the fight, Helen? What do you mean? I watched her face closely after I asked that. Either she was the new Sarah Bernhardt or she was in the clear. For a couple of seconds, she stared at me and then... That's a filthy thing to say. Yes, I know, but I've got something to find out. And what did you hope to find out by asking me that? I hope to find out who made a killing on the fight by making Johnny a setup for Brennan. He was ten to one. Good odds for somebody who'd lay a good-sized bet on Brennan. 
You mean you... You think I'd bet against Johnny? Did you? That's not worth answering. All right, look. Johnny was knocked out because he was drugged. He couldn't see. And he was drugged only a few minutes before he went into the ring. Baker? No, a manager who's bringing up a champion doesn't sell him out. And, and that leaves only me, is that it? Maybe. And I bet everything I had on Brennan. Is that your story? Oh, sure, Helen. I have none. If that's what you believe, believe it. But tell me where Johnny is. I promised I wouldn't. You promised? Oh, no, Johnny can't believe I... Where's that brooch he sent you? Brooch? Yeah, that's right. The one he sent from Italy. A $3,000 brooch that bring about 1500 in a pawn shop. And 1500 at 10 to 1. <laughs> well, seems to be my day for taking it. I'm sorry. Didn't you give Johnny chewing gum just before he went into the ring? What did you say? Chewing gum. Johnny wouldn't tell me, but I know you gave it to him. I... Yes. You... You admit it? Yes. Huh. That was the only way he could have been drugged. And you admit it? Yes, I admit it. It doesn't make sense. All right, it doesn't make sense. You're so right, Mr. Holliday. Nothing makes sense. Nothing. Now go back and tell Johnny. Tell everybody. Go on. Well, this I couldn't get. Two of them. Johnny and Helen knowing it must have been the gum and Johnny not wanting to tell me. Then Helen coming right out and saying she gave it to him. Okay, there was one answer, and I hunted for it in the shape of that brooch. I called Lieutenant Kling at headquarters and got him to do me a favor. It took almost the rest of the day, but late that afternoon. Brooch? Uh, yes, yes, the police called, but I, I assure you I did not receive stolen goods in my shop. The, the police know that I so don't... So you're in the clear, now don't worry. Has the brooch been redeemed yet? Uh, no, no. Look, uh, all I want to see is a slip and who signed the brooch in. Well, here, I, I have it ready... I thought it would be the police who would come. I, it's right here. Here. Here you are. There's no mistake about this. Oh, no, no. I I let him have a thousand dollars on it. A thousand? And you're sure? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there. There's where he signed his name. Uh, John, uh, uh, John Capelli. No, that couldn't be right. Unless... Unless Johnny was afraid he couldn't make a fake fight look good. And wanted to make sure. But where did Helen figure? And why? And why? Then it hit me. Johnny protects Helen. Helen admits she did it. It made so little sense it began to clear. I checked with betting agents and found one who took a bet on Brennan. A bet of $1,000 at 10 to 1. He remembered who placed the bet, so... Well, they gave me one more call to make. Back, I went to Helen's apartment. Hello. Yes? Oh, hi, Holiday. Come on in. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Sister home? No. Uh, grab a chair. Haven't you seen her? Oh, yes, yes, earlier. Aren't you going to ask me about Johnny? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, where is he? I know. Well, well, what about him? I mean, he's okay, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. Oh, that's swell. You know, Holiday, I couldn't figure a guy like Johnny doing something like that. No, neither could I, Eddie. That's why I knew he didn't. What? Here, Eddie, uh, have a stick of gum. I... Oh, no, I, I never use it. Good for the nerves. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, that's what you come to see me about, huh? Maybe. You like to gamble, don't you, Eddie? Gamble? Oh, sometimes. Why? Ever get in so deep you had to uh, steal to make yourself even? What kind of a crack is that? Oh, a nasty one. Just as nasty as stealing your sister's brooch. I... What did she tell you? Nothing. She had a fight with Johnny. Maybe he noticed she didn't have the brooch. Asked her about it. Maybe she had her ideas about where it was. Yeah? So what? So she knew and gave you a break. But you had different ideas, Eddie. 
You pawned the brooch, signed Johnny's name to the slip, then bet a thousand against Johnny. Ah, oh, you nuts, you're off your rocker. Tell you what, Eddie. Let's you and I take a trip to the pawnbroker, then we'll go to the betting agent where you place the bet. Maybe I won't look so much off my rocker then, huh? All right. So what? I got a break. I'll redeem the brooch and... But... What are you looking at me like that for? I took two on the chin today. Maybe it's my turn now to give, Eddie. You lay off now. Sis won't prosecute and Johnny won't either. <laughs> she won't marry him if he did and... It's not the brooch, Eddie. It's the chewing gum. The gum you gave your sister to give Johnny. The drug gum to ensure your bet. You can't prove nothing, you can't. Eddie, you and I are going to the boxing commission and you're going to talk. No, I ain't. Either that or I tell Johnny everything. And leave him in the room. Alone with you. Oh, uh, Eddie. Get your top coat, too. It's kind of chilly outside. <laughs> As they say in the books, all's well that ends well. Gee, it's so romantic. Johnny and Helen getting married. Johnny getting another crack at the championship. And I... Uh, What's the matter? Uh, What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? Oh, Susie, my jaw is really sore. Johnny hung a nice right cross on me. What's a right cross? Huh? Well, it's, um... Here, here look, put up your hands. This way? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, look... I, uh, I leave it my left like this, and you... Like that? I... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Holiday. Mr. Holiday. I... Oh, good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by E. Jack Newman and Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and the part of Johnny Capelli was played by John Beale. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. In a good mystery story, there should be such a tangle of clues that in desperation, the only answer is, the butler did it. But then, this story isn't a mystery at all. It's about how desperate and amoral a man can be if murder seems the only answer to his problems. So why should he blame the butler for the death he finally managed to bring about? Forget it, Mother. It doesn't matter. If I want the money, I'll have to get it for myself. Oh, that's nice, dear. Just like your father. That's what he would have said. Now give me a nice kiss good night, and wish me sweet dreams. Good night, Mother. Sleep long and deep. <laughs> mystery drama, A Cup of Bitter Chocolate, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Joan Shea and Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. No human being ever sets out to kill another, do they? That doesn't ring quite true either, because sad and obscene as it may be, a small percentage do. 
I can't do it, Vera. I just can't. You've got to, Ted. No. It's the only way. There's got to be some other. We could borrow someplace? Do you know anyone who would lend you one other thin dime? Well, what about you, Vera? Isn't there somewhere you can raise some money? No. You got by before you met me. I mean, how... You want me to go back to that? No, I mean... Well, not exactly, but... Well, some of the guys you used to know... Why don't you come right out with what you want to say? There's only one way I could raise money from those men. Is that what you want me to do? What are you talking about? It doesn't matter. I'm not going back to that while I have you. I do have you, don't I, Ted? Yes, of course. I hope you mean that. I depend on you, my darling. So you better get the money. I can't get it from Mother. I've overdrawn my allowance. I have loan sharks clamping down on me from every side. I mean, where do I get it? You're the only heir, aren't you? You know that as well as I do, but... Well, you know how Mother is. Since I have never had the opportunity to meet her, I can only say I know how you tell me she is. Well, you can't exactly blame her. I'm all she has left. I mean... Well, she lost everything in one night all those years ago. I don't say I agree with how she feels since then, but... Well, you can understand it. You understand it, Ted. She has all the money. I haven't any control over it. She wouldn't have any control over it if... If she wasn't here. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't let's get started on that again. We never stop, darling. Oh, you don't know what you're saying. I know, all right. The only way you, me, us... We'll ever get the money we need out of your mother is if she is dead. Vera, I... I couldn't. I, I, I wouldn't know how. Suppose you were showed the way. I still couldn't. Look, I've done a lot of lousy things in my life, but nothing would make me go as far as... as murder. Are you sure? Yes. How long do you expect me to hang around? It's either now or never. Oh, Vera, please... I, I, I can't kill her. Okay. Then I go to her and get what I can out of her to leave her darling boy alone. Ah, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't be too sure. The point next to name is big news. Especially if there's a way to drag it into the dirt. And that's just what I would do unless she anteed up. For your information, one of the things your little Vera needs some heavy dough for is to keep you from becoming a father. Oh, no. Oh, yes. You can't. I mean... I, I mean, you What could... other choice do I have? Unless you want to marry me and live unhappily ever afterwards. I do, Vera. It's just a... Mother... Well, you, you've got to understand her, Vera. Why should I understand her? Would she even try to understand someone like me? It's just that... Well, since the whole rest of the family was, was wiped out in one night and she ended up in a wheelchair, she... She hasn't been able to adjust to the fact that life goes on. It's, it's, it's like she was locked into that awful night. And time has just stood still for her from then on. She ought to be locked up if she's that lonely. No, she isn't. I mean, she's clear enough about everything else. It's, it's an attitude more than anything. Anyway, it wouldn't do any real good. The way the will is, it ties up the money while she's still alive. And the only way it ever comes to me is if she's... What have I been trying to tell you? If I could only do it without being caught. You could. Lots of ways. How? Well, that's something we can work out together, darling. I must be mad even to talk about it. There's, there's no way. Of course there is. Pills. What? Well, after the accident, she had the nervous breakdown and all, and her back condition. Well, she must pop some kind of pills. Yeah, I... She has a whole carload of prescriptions. Well, find out what they are. Uppers, downers, you name it. I got a pipeline to any kind. All we have to do is to find out what she has to take too much of. Come in. Oh, it's just you, Miles. Yes, Mrs. Poindexter. I brought you your hot chocolate. Oh, isn't it a little early for that? It's ten o'clock, madam. Oh, and Master Ted isn't home? Mr. Poindexter has not yet returned. Where is he? I believe at the Union Trust Club, madam. It's mm. bridge night and he fills in for the Commodore. Oh, yes, of course. I'm so forgetful. His father would have been proud of him. Still, 
It is rather late. Not for today, Mrs. Poindexter. Oh, what is today? Tuesday, madam. April 14th, 1979. Oh, how foolish of me. How the years pass. Or do they? We are none of us getting any younger. What a terrible thought. I, I mean, not for me, but for all the rest. Try to forget, Mrs. Poindexter. It wouldn't do any good, Miles. I cannot. For they, none of them could ever get older. It all stopped for them in that awful moment when the car went off the road. Janice, Bruce, Thomas, Francesca, and the Commodore himself. Never to get any older, never to be again. Oh, only Ted and myself left. Oh, why, Miles? I can't give you any answer. My husband and all my children except my... my little one. It was God's will that you should be spared. I suppose. Except, do you know, Miles, I often wonder why. Uh, uh, may I, uh... Pour your chocolate before it gets cold. Oh, dear, thoughtful, faithful Miles. What would I do without you? Yes, of course. Uh, will you have your pills? Oh, I suppose so. Whatever they're for. Well, Dr. Bruchard is very definite that you follow his routine. Very well. Ted usually feeds them to me. But if you're sure you know what it is I am supposed to take... I think you can trust me, Mrs. Poindexter. Oh, after my beloved son. Who else in the world, Miles? Yes, madam. Here they are, all laid out for you. <laughs> what is it? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking how odd and variable life is. Night after night I accept these pills without looking at them or questioning what I take. Yes. <laughs> Just a silly, vagrant thought. If anyone wanted to get rid of me, it would be so easy. Maybe it, it might be better. Madam. Oh, Miles, I'm only being silly. I'm ashamed of myself for even having voiced the thought. <laughs> What are you doing, Miles? Oh, oh, Mr. Ted. Uh, just making up your mother's hot chocolate as usual before bedtime. Well, as long as I'm home tonight, I'll take it up to her. You haven't been at home so much lately these days. Haven't I? <laughs> but that's my business, isn't it? The madam always misses you, Master Ted. I don't have to have a butler criticize my relationship with my mother. No, sir. Yes, so you can leave me to take the chocolate up. I'll try to make it my business from now on. Uh, it's always so nice and soothing. You should try a cup yourself before you go to bed, Teddy. Well, maybe I will. It certainly relaxes you. Oh, yes. But not nearly so much as having you bring it up and just sitting with me for a while. That's the best part of it. Well, I'm glad you think so. We should spend as much time together as we can. Well, if you want. Oh, I do. But only if you want it. Is it what you want, Ted? Uh, yes, Mother. It's one of the things I do. What else? Well, Mother, there are some <laughs> business things I might like to do if I had some capital. Money? Uh, yes. Well, darling, why not? Just take all that up with Judge Gearing and his law firm. He was your father's best friend, and he'll know if whatever you want to do is a good idea. I don't want to take it up with the judge or his law firm. I'd like to be on my own. And so you should be when you are ready. But in the meantime, don't slink away from good advice. Your father always... Mother, what my father said hasn't much relativity anymore. Well, oh, look, can't I have some money, some freedom to be my own man? What do you need money for, anyway? Oh, forget it, Mother. It doesn't matter. If I want it, I'll... I'll just have to find a way to get it myself. That's nice, dear. Just like your father. That's exactly what he would have said. Now, give me a nice kiss goodnight, darling. And wish me sweet dreams. Good night, Mother. 
sleep long and deep. You're sure these will be enough, Vera? Yes. Just spill the powder out of the capsules into that icky drink she takes before she goes to sleep. There won't be any suspicion. Why should there be? An old back bay Boston family like yours? Anyway, there's no way to trace these pills. No, I don't think I could take that drink up to her. Well, you better take that drink up, Ted. And make sure she gets it. Mr. Ted. Oh, I, uh, I uh, didn't see you there, Miles. Uh... Did you want something from the pantry, sir? Oh, no. Oh, uh, yes. I uh, I was just getting Mother's chocolate ready to uh, take up. Well, I can do that for you. Uh, no, no, Miles. I, you know she likes me to do it when I can. I, I wanted to get this from me. Yes, sir. If you'll let me have the pot, I'll put it on a tray with a cup, and you can take it right up. You shouldn't have come back here, Ted. I can't be in the house with her knowing that... You sure she drank it? I, I watched her swallow every drop. They used all the pills? Yeah, Miles nearly caught me at it. I was just putting the lid back on the pot when, when he came in. You think he suspects? No. All right. You've got to get back there and empty out all her own pills so that it looks like suicide. I can't. I can't look at her dead. You've got to, Ted. It's just how you wanted to see her all your life. are gone. And I'm free. Free at last. Ted, darling. Oh, what time is it? Oh, what are you looking at me like that for? Well, might she ask that question? For Ted Poindexter's blood has run cold as his mother's corpse speaks to him. Frozen in white shock, his mouth hanging open loosely while a scream of terror crystallizes in his throat. He is speechless. How can the woman he murdered be alive? Or is she a ghost returned to haunt him forever? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. A gray woman, old before her years, lies in the middle of the bed, gazing up at the sun, who is her whole life. It would be beyond her comprehension to learn that he has just tried to take that life from her. As for Ted Poindexter, after his initial shock at being spoken to by a woman he considered dead, he has not gotten a grip on himself. And while he desperately tries to justify his presence in his mother's bedroom in the middle of the night, his mind is racing and speculating about what could have gone wrong in his plan for murder. Well, what is it, Ted? It's, it's all right now, Mother. It was only that when I came home, the front door was just on the latch. I called for miles, but there was no answer. And, and I started to worry that the house might have been broken into or something. Well, I, I certainly hope not. I, I haven't been disturbed. Oh, poor boy, so worried. Uh, what time is it? Oh, uh, it's about two in the morning. Oh, is that all? Oh, I really feel quite wide awake. I'm afraid I don't, Mother, so uh, I'll say good night and let you get back to sleep. I'll uh, turn the light off. I um, wonder what happened to Miles. And he came up about 10.30 and knocked on the door to see if I needed anything. I, I told him no, and he said he was feeling a bit tired and was going to bed. But it isn't like him not to lock up. No, no, it isn't. Perhaps before you go to bed, you could just look in on him and see that he's all right. Yes, I, uh, I will. Good night, Mother. <laughs> know what went wrong, Vera. But I thought you said your mother drank every drop of what you brought her. She did. And it didn't affect you at all? No. That's impossible. Unless... Unless what? Is there any possibility that your butler could have switched drinks in the pantry? But why? You said you found him passed out in his bedroom. That he left the front door open. That's right. But had he been drinking? No. At least there was no odor of alcohol. You suppose he could have swallowed the chocolate meant for your mother? If he made a switch? Maybe, but why would he drink it? It could have been an accident. I mean, how many...
lots, are there, in that set of china? Oh, half a dozen. You know, it's a, it's a breakfast thing with individual servers. But but he, if he drank the... Oh, what if he dies? How do we account for him? How do you account for him, you mean? Ted, you better get a doctor there fast and keep him alive. Maybe, for all I know, I'd be better off with Miles dead. Certainly, I'm not, Mr. Poindexter. <sighs> I'm not dead yet, by a long shot. Ted? Ted, what is it? What's wrong? I, uh, I can't talk anymore. I'll, uh, I'll have to call you back. I thought you were in bed, Miles. I was. I lay down for a few minutes. I had no right to fall asleep. Why not? It's not a very good way to protect Mrs. Poindexter. Yes, forgetting to lock the front door wasn't a very good way either. Hmm. I'm afraid she has less to fear from outside the house than inside. What the devil does that mean, Miles? I think you know, Ted... Ted? Where we stand now goes a long way beyond a master-servant relationship. Oh, and where do we stand? I've been with the Poindexter family for nearly 40 years, long before you were born. I consider them the only family I have. I think or always thought of every one of them as mine. Except you. Yes, I've always been quite aware of your disapproval. My feelings for you are a lot stronger than that, my boy. I can live without your love, Miles. Get on with it, huh? The rotten apple in the barrel. The bad seed. You've never been any good. You have no right to judge me. If I didn't before, I have now. What does that mean? The girls, the shoddy little affairs, the petty thievery, the drugs... They're all one thing. But murder is something else, Ted. Murder? I know about the woman you're mixed up with. I've followed you more than once on my days off. You stupid old meddler. Why couldn't you mind your own business? I considered it mine. Because I know you only too well. I could see that desperate thing building behind your eyes. I knew how far in debt you were. I never dreamed how far you were ready to go to get out of it. Until the last few days... Get to the point. Not with pleasure, I assure you. I wondered why you were suddenly giving up your evenings just to take your mother her chocolate drink. And I wouldn't admit it to myself, but I was afraid of why. Tonight, I watched you prepare that lethal dose carefully. So when I got you the tray, I changed to a pot I always brew for myself... You've gotten away with a lot, Ted. But you don't really think as long as I'm around that you could really get away with murder. And Miles didn't drink the chocolate with the pills in it? No. Then why did he pass out? I don't know. He's an old man. He got tired, maybe. He may be an old man, but he's got you right under his thumb. As long as he has that chocolate drink stashed away... If that drink was to be analyzed, it could lead right back to me. It won't be, he says, if I stay in line. You mean with all the evidence in his hands, he won't go to the police? Only if I try anything again. There's only one answer, Ted. You've got to get rid of Miles first. Or both of them together. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Mrs. Poindexter. What, Miles? The squeak. I've got to oil that wheel on your chair. Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't even hear it among the bird cries. Oh, what a perfect day to be alive. I do love the spring so, when everything is being reborn. Yes, it's my favorite time of year, too. Hold the chair, Miles. Yes. I'd like to get out and walk a bit. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I've been doing a lot of walking lately. And my back seems to hold up very well. I think it's a phase, some kind of cycle. They say your metabolism changes every seven years. Look. See? Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, that's how it feels. Maybe it's just spring, but everything is lovely. Even my poor Ted. Ted? I've always been conscious, believe it or not, how I hemmed him in. I suppose he must have resented it. But the last week, he doesn't seem to. Oh, maybe we found an accommodation somehow. I hope you have. And you walk wonderfully. 
The doctors say in time I could get back to normal. With your help, or someone's, of course. You can always have my help, Clara. Clara? Oh, I, I'm sorry. That just slipped out. Well, why not? You're a good friend. What would I do without you? You don't need anyone. Not anymore. <laughs> I'm afraid that isn't true. I'm suddenly very tired. I, uh, I'd better get back to my chair. Yeah, lean on me. Uh, when don't I? All right. Thank you. Uh, I wheel you back through the garden? I'd like to, but it's a, such a long way. Oh, would I be too heavy to push up the hill and in through the garage? To me, you're always light as a feather, Mrs. Poindexter. Uh, I think I like Clara better. So do I. But I don't think for us it's quite appropriate. Well, here's the chair. Let's get you settled. I I hate to get off my feet, but oh, I still do get a little tired. That will pass. Oh, oh that's Ted. Oh, I don't know why he likes those funny little low-slung cars. That's not so little, that sports car. You'd be surprised how much it weighs. Uh, wheel me up the drive, Miles. Ted's just getting out. I want to ask him something. Yes, here we go. Oh, he should have leveled off this incline long ago. But those concrete walls on each side, it's like going up into a tunnel. I always used to think when I parked and got out to open the garage door, if the brakes would ever go on... <gasps> Oh, what is it? The car. Ted's car. Ah, good Lord. It's slipping backwards. Ted. Ted. Miles. Look out. It's coming right at us. Too fast. It it, it must be in reverse. Oh, Miles. went too fast. Hold on, Clara. Hold on. Mother. Mother, are you all right? I I, I think I'm all right. Miles. Just a sec. I've got to cut this motor. I can't get to the ignition or... Uh, come on, Mother, I'll get you out of here. What, what about mine? Never mind, I'll go back for him. You first. Here, let me get you. Hurry, hurry, Ted. You, you've got to save Miles. Yeah, one, one at a time. There, hey. I, I'm all right, Ted. Now get back before it's too late. Is he, Dr. Burchard? Oh, fine, Ted, fine. Very lucky. When he went rolling away from the car, after he'd saved your mother, he ended up behind the wall. It shielded him from the explosion. And mother? Oh, a few little scrapes and abrasions. Matter of fact, I'm very cheered to learn she was spry enough on her feet to get out of range. Her back is improved wonderfully. You can see her if you want. I'd uh, like to see Miles first, uh, if I can. Oh, I don't see why not. He's bright enough at the moment. But uh, your mother wants to see him, too. Yeah, well, I won't be a moment. Okay. If I have other patients waiting, I'll have a nurse take you in. I want you to know, Miles, it was an accident. I don't think I could ever believe that. What, what, what do you intend to do? I don't know. I want to talk it over with your mother. Are you going to tell her everything? I might. I'll deny it. I expected that. She might not even believe it of you, even with the proof. The drink with the drugs in it? That really doesn't prove anything. No, uh, not in a court of law, perhaps. Or to my mother. We shall see. That's something we'll know by tomorrow. And in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes said Mr. Benjamin Franklin. For once the great sage was wrong, in this tale, it seems that death, even if prevalent, is very uncertain. I wonder if it'll ever come about, and to whom. To find out, join me shortly for Act Three. Dexter has fled to his inamorata, Vera, in search of what solace he can find from her. Clara Poindexter has come to visit Miles in his hospital room, proud that with some help from a nurse, she's been able to walk there. Fortunately, she is seated beside his bed now, for what Miles has to tell her is enough to make anyone reach for support. 
I don't believe it, Myers. I just won't listen to it. You have to, Clara. No. How could you do this to me? Ruin what little life is left to me. Uh, all I want to do is save your life. By telling me that my son wants to take it from me. If that's true, what's it worth saving for? Clara, listen to me. You've still got a lot of years. Now that your back is responding to treatment, now that you can walk again, you can shake off the past and look forward to a future. There's been enough disaster in your life. You've got every right to a future that can bring you some joy and some laughter and happiness. I tell you, frankly, that up until recently, I had some hope that I could share it with you. What? Well, it's not so impossible. If you forget that I'm a butler, you can remember that I'm a man. And that I've loved you for more years than I care to remember. Miles. Uh, I don't know what to say to that. As it happens, you won't have to say anything. No, just a moment. I don't know what kind of snob you think I am. No, 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 no. I don't think you're a snob, but coming from an, our background, it might have been difficult. If I thought I was enough woman for you, there would have been no problem. The problem is that I am not enough man for you. I decide that. You can't. I'd like to see you stop me. Clara, forgive me for having to say this. I have to stop you. Because I'm dying. But you, you... I'm not so young that I can complain. The other night, when I fell asleep and forgot to lock the door... That's part of it. Why I'm here in the hospital is too. Both nights I blacked out because I... Uh... Miles. Oh, Miles. What, what is it? Dr. Bruchard knows about it. I have what's called a neoplasm... The short and more brutal word is a tumor on the brain. Quite inoperable. But something can be done in this day and age. No, nothing for this one. It's growing. I haven't long to live. Oh, my poor Miles. What can I do for you? It's not what you can do for me, Clara. It's what I can't do for you anymore. When I'm gone, I can't protect you. But I'm getting well again. I don't need protection. I wish that was true. I don't want you to worry about me. But I do. Maybe I should bite the bullet and accuse Ted of attempted murder. Miles, you couldn't do that. It isn't true. Today was an accident. Maybe. But the drink he made for you was deliberate. I'll never believe Ted could do anything as, as dreadful as that. Even if I proved it to you by having it analyzed? No. Miles, why do you want to destroy me? Destroy you? Nothing is further from my mind. I only want to save you. From what? From Ted? My own son? No, Clara. Even more than that, from yourself. <laughs> Ted, I give up. Come on in. Vera, I've got to talk to you. About what? There, there was an accident today. So I heard on the radio. You tried to get them both, and you botched it. I mean, you really botched it. Now they've got you in a corner. Vera, listen. Today was an accident. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I've been meaning to have the shift gate attended to. You see, on that hill there, I usually shove it into first, but the gate is worn, and it goes in reverse half the time, so now I leave it in neutral and depend on the handbrake, but... This time, I must have had it in reverse. Oh, Ted, spare me the mechanical jazz. You think any jury's going to believe all that? What jury? Oh, wasn't someone hurt? They're both in the hospital. No, 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 they're both okay. And Miles is just going to sit still for you? I don't know. The way he feels about the family name... Oh, forget maybe. all that, even if he does. Where are you now? A fat chance you have of raising any dough to get what we have to off our backs. I've got something else to tell you. What? Using your collateral as heir to the point Dexter dough. You raised a lot of loans through me and my connections. To say nothing of those pills I kited through for you. We got all that through some pretty heavy sources. And these guys don't play footsie. Now how are we going to pay off? All right, just, just give me some time. We're playing out of time, Ted. These guys are leaning on me. 
And what they do to me is peanuts compared to what they could do to you. So where do we go from here? And I better be somewhere fast. Yeah, there's only one way I can figure, Vera. Can you get me a gun? A gun? What are you going to do with it? Miles leaving the door open the other night made me think. Now look, half the houses on our block have been broken into some time or another. So? So there's going to be a prowler breaks in real soon at my house, and there'll be some shoot and two deaths. You can't get away with it, Ted. I mean, no, only one gun. I have a registered gun in the house with a police license. They'll find the bullets from that where I missed the prowler. The gun you give me will do the damage, and I'll dump that in the bay. When? How soon can I get the gun? Well, make a call right now. They come home from the hospital tonight. We haven't much time. It'll have to be tomorrow night. My, how you've changed. You scare me. Yeah, maybe I'm just growing up and facing facts. Miles can blow the whistle on me any time he wants. I want to blow mine first. Clara. I, I mean, Mrs. Poindexter. Good morning, Miles. What are you doing on your feet? Getting very used to navigating on them again. How are you today? Oh, it's intermittent. Ah, uh, for the moment I couldn't feel better. Uh, give me that bag or whatever it is you have. Well, it's my personal laundry. I, I thought I'd give myself a little challenge today. More than what you're doing? Uh, watch it now. Don't rush the steps. Well, between you and the magistrate, I, I should have no trouble. What challenge? Well, after breakfast, I'm going to visit the laundry room downstairs and put my own personal things in to wash. Aren't you pushing things a little, madam? I thought I was Clara now. Ah, uh, oh. Forgive me for that. That was only a dream. I don't see why. I haven't anything to offer you. Only my life. What's left of it. Up until yesterday, I thought there was none left of mine. Look at you, Clara. Back on your feet, finding your health. You would have everything left if it weren't for... Don't. He's my son. He's your nemesis. No, no, I'll never accept that. Yes, I know. I'm afraid you never will. Where is Ted, by the way? Uh, he went off somewhere. Said he had to pick up something, but that he'd be back by dinner time. Uh, Miles, well, what is it? No, nothing, nothing. It's just a slight headache. Come along now. Breakfast is waiting. Yes? Uh, pecan repair. You got a clothes dryer under Fritz? Oh, yes, yes. Come in, please. Uh, uh, mm. Excuse me. Uh, yes, madam? I heard the doorbell. Is that Ted, Niles? Uh, no, madam. The man to fix the dryer. Oh, fine. As soon as he's through, I'd like to dry that stuff of mine in the machine. Very well, madam. Uh, this way, please. Right. Now, what's the trouble? It hasn't been turning itself off. The laundress complains that she's getting some slight electric shocks from it. Now, this is the laundry. There's the dryer. Uh, uh, what kind of shocks? Probably all in her mind. There can't be anything too dangerous about a machine like that. Uh, are you kidding? 220 volts you're messing with here. Now, just a couple of things have to go wrong and you don't follow instructions. Bye-bye, birdie. <laughs> what do you mean, bye-bye, birdie? A guy could get killed. How? Well, like this, you see. Now, 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 this here is the ground wire. It ain't connected properly. That's why the maid maybe got a shock or two. Oh. Which might have killed her? No. No sweat as long as you're careful. And like I said, follow instructions. But how could it be dangerous? Well, you see, like this, you know. Supposing you got a wet floor, you see, no ground wires. See, you're taking a real chance. Uh, if you want to figure curtains, supposing you got a, a metal plate right here in front of the dryer, and you took this ground wire and hooked it up to that, boom, <laughs> you got the perfect murder. What kind of metal plate? Well, most anything. Uh, like the front here I just took off to get inside. Hey, you see, there was just a loose wire. <laughs> right. Well, you're all set now. I'll just put the front back no, on. No, 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 that's all right. Leave it off. I'll put it back. I, uh, 
want the maid to vacuum the inside. Good evening, Mr. Poindexter. Ah, Miles, so we're back to that again, huh? Crossed swords? I don't trust you. I told you yesterday was an accident. I don't believe you. I don't know any way to convince you. Neither do I. Yes, we can't go on living this way. That size obvious. You're not afraid I'd hurt Mother in any way as long as you can dangle your so-called evidence over my head? Maybe not. But I'm afraid for her as long as you're around. I don't know how you can get rid of me. Is that Ted? Yes, Mother, I'm home. I'll be down in a minute, dear. Oh, Miles, uh, is that stuff in the dryer ready yet? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh, dear. Well, well, can we turn it on? I think so, ma'am. I wonder if you'd mind, Mr. Poindexter? What? Turning on the dryer? If you don't feel it's beneath your dignity. Ah. Uh, What's the matter? Oh, just a headache. Uh, I think you'd better turn on that dryer. Okay, Miles. Since we seem to be short of footmen, why not? Where is it? In the laundry room at the bottom of the stairs. The light is on. Yeah, don't think this is some sort of victory, Miles. I'll have my innings, too. Uh, what do I do? Just stand in front of it and pull on the switch. Right. Miles, what happened? The lights flickered. I'm and... sorry, Clara. It's the only way I knew you could be safe. <laughs> You're going to be all right, Miles. They're going to operate. Get that tumor out. Too late. They know that. Eh, it doesn't matter. The headaches were so excruciating I couldn't have stood them. This is... Goodbye, Clara. No, don't leave me. Not alone. Look at you. Standing. It's starting all over again for you. For us. No, it's too late. Clara. What? Before they brought me here, I drank the chocolate and washed the chocolate pot. No evidence, no scandal. And whatever happens, I even the score for Ted's death. A terrible accident. But the only thing that matters is that you're safe. Safe at last. Miles died from cardiac arrest before they could excise the tumor. It made little difference, but the drink had killed him anyway. The funeral of Ted Poindexter was a private one, with few mourners. But the friends who were there delighted in the fact that his mother came to it without the wheelchair that had caged her so long. As some simple soul has remarked, it was the best of a bad business. I'll be back shortly. As we said in the beginning, this was the story of The Butler Did It. And, of course, in the fashion of mystery stories, we hope to confuse you and that you would never believe it. Only this time, the butler actually did do it. Were you surprised? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, and Joan Shea. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day and expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man Who Came Back. Well, 
This is the way it started. It was a hot Tuesday afternoon, about four o'clock. Melody was sitting at her typewriter watching a tired-looking fly crawl across the ceiling. She didn't say a word, just waved an arm in the direction of his door. Certainly we will, Mr. Brandeis. Absolutely. Certainly. Yes, of course. Come in, Rick. Yes, yes. It's all right, Mr. Brandeis. Yes, she'll be there in an hour. All right, half an hour. Goodbye. Regan, you're it. I'm what? Here's his address. Name's Elmer Brandeis. That's the real estate office in Altadena. She came by a special messenger half an hour ago. It was late, but the bank tells me it's good. So you're it. You know, that's what I like, efficiency. It's too hot to be funny. I want you to hop out there and see what he's excited about. Didn't he tell you? Yeah, he's one of those nasty old coots. He didn't make much sense on the phone. Something about someone coming back. <laughs> Besides, his teeth were slipping around. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, it's a job. Business has been terrible lately. You know, I still want my expenses on that Tartaglia thing. Have you ever come up short with me? Yes, I have. You get all that's coming to you. When? As soon as Melody gets a bill from that hospital, because that's coming out of your check. Now, beat it out there and find out what this guy wants and call me if you're running into any trouble. <laughs> Brondike Manor was a brown-white cottage on the edge of ten acres of dusty land in back of Foothill Drive. There was a big sign right in front of it telling you how easy it is to own your own land and have your own home on Brondike Estates. Well, I parked across the highway, and it was just about then that a big, heavy-set man wearing a dirty white Panama hat and a suit that didn't fit him around the stomach crawled out of a 36 Ford sedan, jammed a cigar in his mouth, and came over to my car. He had hair in his ears. Yeah, hot afternoon, ain't it? Yes, sir, sure is hot. Sure is a hot afternoon. Yeah, it is if you spend it sitting in a car pulling on a bottle. Smell it, huh? mile away. Just trying to beat the heat. Okay, you've been parked in the car beating the heat. Yeah, you went. I ain't much good at trying to look like a guy who wants to buy a house. Yeah. Who do you look like? Yeah, it's a little greasy, but it's me. Uh Uh-huh. Marty Anderson. Confidential investigation. Guess I ought to have new ones printed up, huh? All right, you're a sleuth. How's business, Marty? Bunk. Too bad. You going in to see old man Brondike? Your nose is getting sunburned, Marty. <laughs> I was just going to go and see him myself when I spot you pull up. Recognize you from pictures in the paper last week on that Tartaglia thing. I figured maybe you and me ought to talk. Yeah. Hey, you, you make it tough for a guy, Regan. We're, we're in the same racket. What you going to see him about? You said you were going in to see him. Well, I kind of changed my mind when I seen you. This is where I came in. Ah, you're a tough guy, Rick, and you're a real tough guy, and a lot of people know it. But Marty Anderson's betting you're a dumb guy, too, a real dumb guy. Mm Mm-hmm. See you around, Marty. I'm an old conk, huh? A fat old slob who couldn't get a trick as a housekeeper or a tail in a punk, is that it? Well, you don't get too close. That's a real bad label you've got to hold up. Okay, Regan, okay. You're young and tough, but you just keep my card, wise guy. You'll want to see me. You'll want to see me before it's all tied up. Mr. Brondike, please, Elmer Brondike, he's expecting me. Your name, please? Regan. Sir Regan. R-E-G-A? No, no, no. You don't have to write it down, lady. And your business? Private. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to know a little more than that, Mr. Regan. Is it always this hot in here? Yes, and I'm sick and tired. Uh, look, just flip your switch and tell him I'm here, will you? He sent for me. Wait a minute, please. Well, what is it, Connie? It's a Mr. Regan here, Dad. He says he's expected. I don't find him listed on your appointment book. Don't be an idiot. Send him in. Send him in. Let me go in now, Mr. Regan. Yeah, thanks. Is he always like that? Most of the time. Other times he's bad. High blood pressure? He's got it high, low, and in between. I hate him. A winner, huh? I'm sorry, Connie. That is your name, isn't it? Go on in before I quit. Don't just stand there. Come on in and shut the door. What took you so long? Now, you're Jeff Regan, huh? Now, you don't look much like a private detective to me. Sit down. Where'd I put that thing? Over there by the inkwell. What? Oh. Well, now then, Regan, about this Collier, he's a no-good tramp. Do you understand that? A no-good tramp. I'll see that he goes right back up to San Quentin if I have to. I'm a dangerous man to play games with. He found that out once, and if he keeps up this business, he's got to find it out again. All right, you're dangerous. He's a no-good tramp, 
San Quentin. Say, are you mocking me? No, I'm not. I'm just wondering what you're talking about. I just told you everything. You got ears? Can't you hear? I don't hear anything but a lot of blubbering, and that doesn't make any sense. Too, too big gum here. Connie you told me all about your high blood pressure. You better watch that. Uh, she did, did she? Well, Connie talks too much. That's what's the matter with her. She talks too much. Oh, sure, and you'd fire her, only she's your daughter, and you'd have to pay somebody else three times what you pay her to take everything she has to take. Get out of here. Get out of my office. Get, get out. Get okay. out. Of my... Dad. No, 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 never mind. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Just hot, I guess. Heat always gets me. Yeah, me too. Now, do you want to tell me about it? He's an ungrateful scoundrel. Who? Toby Collier! Who else? Well, I took that boy in as my junior partner in Brondike Estates when he was nothing more than a car washer in a filling station. And how does he repay me? Hey, he... hey, 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 you're letting the heat bother you again. No. no, it isn't the heat, Regan, I'll tell you that. It's those phone calls. Phone calls telling me to beware and watch out and a lot of other nonsense. Mm Mm-hmm. Now we're getting close. They let him out of San Quentin last week. You'd think he'd go somewhere where people didn't know him and wash cars again or something. But no. He has to start telephoning my office and telling me he's back and that he's going to get me. What was he doing in San Quentin? Two to ten on an embezzlement count. How long ago was that? Three years ago. I guess he got time off or something. Why is he sore at you? I had to testify against him. It was my firm. He was chiseling. So now he's out of the clink and he's phoning you and trying to throw a scare into you, huh? He may be out, but he isn't scaring me or anybody else, I'll tell you that. Yeah. I want you to find him, wherever he is. Bring him here. All right. And then I want to tell him like I'm telling you. If he keeps bothering me with those phone calls, if he persists in threatening me, then I'll haul out some stuff I have in my safety deposit box and send him back up there on a swindling rap just to get him out of my hair. You withheld evidence at that trial? I withheld nothing. Just be a new charge, and I could make it stick if I wanted to. All right, tell me the rest of it. What do you mean, tell you the rest of it? No more to tell. He's a punk. He's got to get in trouble. Where'd Marty Anderson figure? What? Anderson, Marty. Confidential investigations. Big, dirty-looking ape who shaves every other day. No. Oh, that rump pot. How do you know about him? He tried to shake me down outside your office. <laughs> he would. Yeah, he's just a second-rate gum heel I called in three years ago when I thought Collier might be fixing my books. I think it's the only job he ever had. He's been pestering me ever since. Did he testify against Collier? Of course he testified against Collier. That was part of his job. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, there is. Why'd you call International instead of the police? You're pretty nosy, aren't you? I'm a lot of things. Now, come on, why? Because every time you call a cop around this town, there's always some snooping reporter hanging around the sergeant's desk. I got a half a million dollars tied up in this here gravel pit. I don't want anybody who's going to buy into it thinking that I might get knocked over by some loony. That's why I want it all quiet. Does that satisfy you? No, oh, it'll do for now. You'll probably come up with something better later on. Are you done? All right, where's you... Collier? If I knew, I wouldn't have called you in. You have a family here, a home, a wife, something? He was all alone. He had a mother somewhere, I guess. Pictures? <laughs> here. Okay, I'll keep these. When am I going to hear from you? When I find something. You bring him to me. I'll ask him to come. He doesn't have to. <laughs> you just spring that swindling rap on him. He'll come. Yeah, and if it's no good, he can turn right around and slap a slander suit right in your face, and I wouldn't blame him. Uh, don't you forget you're working for me, no, young man. No, I won't. Regan, Regan, you, you've got a nasty way of talking. People don't talk to me like that. Yeah, well, this is a brand new crowd of people, Frosty Top, and we talk just like we feel. <laughs> Down at the city hall, they didn't have anything on Toby Collier, except that he'd been released from San Quentin August 10th. From there, I went to the parole board office, but it was closed by that time. So I did the next best thing, and I sent a wire to the officer in charge of parole prisoners, San Quentin, asking for Collier's address. Then I dropped into the Times office, and I looked up the story of the trial. It was a page three item for two days, a second section filler for a week. After that, nothing. There were no pictures. But it did give the name of Collier's lawyer, a man named Alan Nordale. The phone book gave him an address over on Kingsley. Now that you, Millie? Hold on just a minute. I was just trying to get my dinner over before you... Who are you? Mr. Nordale? Mm-hmm. Well, my name is Regan. I'm a private investigator. I'm oh. trying to locate a former client of yours, a man named Toby Collier. Well, come in, come in, come in. I was expecting Millie, but come in. Thank you. I always fix my own dinner, poached egg and half and half. I I have ulcers. Uh, name's Regan? 
Yeah. Hey, you want an egg? No, thanks. Hey, you mind if I finish? No, no, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Mm. What's what with Toby Collier? Well, I'm just trying to locate him, that's all. Mm-hmm. I found out that you were his lawyer. He was released from San Quentin ten days ago. Yep, 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 yep. You sure you won't have an egg? Yeah, you get used to him after a while. Mm. Who do you work for, Regan? International Detective Bureau. The line's still there? Yeah. Well, so you're the line's eye, huh? Yeah. Yeah, line's is a bandit. But who's Kate? Elmer Brondike. Mm-hmm. And what you want Toby for? To ball him out for making threatening phone calls. Is that all? As far as I know. Yeah, Toby was a nice kid, but a calendar job. Born with one war going, one depression on deck, and a new war starting. Makes a difference. Yeah, the calendar got him. And he wound up in San Quentin. Well, everything was against him at the trial, too. He was pretty mad at old man Brondike and that private dick. And me and everyone else before it was all over. I tried to talk to him. From what Brondike tells me, he's still mad. Yeah, I... I did all I could, but he didn't have a chance. He tried to lift a lousy couple thousand bucks and they caught him. Well, he's out now. Do you handle his parole? No. You know who did? No. You don't know where he is in town? No. Brondike said he had a mother. No. Okay. I'll leave you to Millie. Yeah. If we uh, we play records, Millie used to be a violinist. Sorry, I'm no help. Uh, Regan, if you find Toby, I'd like to see him. Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I just want to see what three years in the pen does to a man like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you do. <laughs> Did you find Collier? I'm calling from home. Home? What about Collier? I didn't find him yet. Well, get busy. What are you waiting for? A telegram, morning, couple of things. Listen, this old schmo is plenty tough, and if he thought you were local... Look, it's 9 o'clock at night. I'm tired. There's nothing I can do till tomorrow morning. He saw us a shave pup about all this, and especially about you. Phoned up and said you'd call him a lot of names. He is a lot of names. I don't care what he is. You don't talk to a client like that. Besides, I haven't cashed his check. Now, go on out and find that guy and get this thing settled. Good night, Regan. Besides, I haven't cast a check. Well, I just set down the phone and started at the door when it happened. Connie Brondike was standing there, and she didn't waste any time. She didn't say a word, just pulled the trigger. The first three brought down plaster on the seat. The fourth one ruined the shoulder on my suit. And the fifth gave me a haircut. I made a grab for and I missed. I took the empty gun in my face. Next thing I knew, she pulled off one of those high spike heels and raised it above my head. I tried to stop her, but my arms wouldn't work. And that's all I remember. You are listening to the story of the man who came back. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, the investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Those who meet the high standards and qualify to serve with this fine organization may elect active or inactive status. Nurses requesting inactive status will continue with civilian nursing, but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. In addition, they have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. Nurses who request active status enjoy the same privilege of all other officers. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching centers, and the nurses obtain educational experience that benefits them in both civilian and military nursing. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, (laughs) D.C. And now, back to the story of the man who came back and Jeff Regan, the investigator. Oh, yeah. Connie had done a real good job. Six to five, I'd never get there before it stopped ringing. Oh. All right, all right. Hello? Regan, is that you? Yeah. What's the matter? Did I get you up? Something like that. This is Marty Anderson. Yeah. Did you wash your face yet? Still feeling tough, huh? I thought maybe we could talk now. Yeah. What made you think that? You're looking for Collier, ain't you? I know where he is. Yeah? Want to talk? Where? My place. On my card. Half an hour. I'll wait for you, tough guy. Uh, bring some money. This is going to cost you. Everything 
Something's going to cost me. Bring some money. Yeah, 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 I'm fine. I'm... I told you it was all right, honey, go. I was real worried. I, I thought I heard some shots, and I see this one jumping down the stairs like she had a good homicide somewhere. You sure you're all right? Go on, me. Take your hands off me. All right, me. Jake, let her go, let her go. She's a friend of mine. You sure it's all right. Hey, you're bleeding. Look at the plaster. Who oh, them were shot. Of course they were shot. You let... Jake, Jake, let her go, will you? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. I was cleaning a gun. Oh, cleaning a gun. Funny time to clean the car, 10 o'clock at night. Well, I do a lot of funny things. Come up and have a drink sometime, will you, Jake? Uh, okay, Mr. Egan, okay. Good night. Good night. Oh, no, you don't, lady. Stay right where you are. Let's go. No, we're going to talk. You hurt my arm. I'll rough you up good if I have to. Now, come on. I only went in my pitch. No, save it, lady. I didn't have any right to give them to you. They were mine. Should have done that. So you come over to get him and you take five shots at me and slam a gun in my face. Why don't you finish the job with your heel? I, I couldn't do it. I was going through your wallet looking for the pictures. I saw your license. The private detective. You're looking for Toby, aren't you? That's why you had the pictures. You're looking for Toby. Collier, your boyfriend. Yeah, we were going to get married. Only he went to the pen, huh? The pictures. That's all I had left of him. He didn't write? No. You know he's out now. Yeah. Has he gotten in touch with you? Why should he? He thinks I was in on it. In on what? The whole dirty, rotten thing. Toby was framed. Dad hired that Marty Anderson to help him do it. How do you know he was framed? I've been working for my dad for five years. I see things. Yeah, I'll bet you do. That's the truth. Oh, yeah. Everybody's full of the truth. All the liars are dead. Look at me. Well, go ahead and look at me, Mr. Regan. I know what you'd call beautiful. I ain't even pretty. I'm tall and gawky. No man would ever look at me twice. Well, Toby looked at me. He loved me. But what are you going to do to him when you find him? Well, he's been threatening your father on the phone. I'm just going to take him there. Yeah, would you bring him to me first? Would you let me talk to him? Why? Because I... Maybe I, maybe I can hold him in my arms and make him forget all his hate, and everything he's gone through. Maybe he'll still love me. We can go away together and get married. You know where he is. Can you find him tonight? Maybe. You gonna help me, mate? I gotta see a man. I guess I went kind of crazy tonight, huh? I don't know. I've been thinking about him so much lately. Yeah. Well, next time, give me a little thought, will you? Good night, lady. Well, Marty Anderson's office was a dirty room hanging over a shoe repair shop on Sunset near Alvarado. You could tell it belonged to him. The glass on the door hadn't been washed for ten years. He didn't answer when I knocked, so I tried my keys on the door. The third one worked. Inside, it smelled like a pile of wet gunny sack. The only light was kind of a sick green from a neon sign going on and off outside the window. There was an old army cot in one corner, and right in front of the window, a big black roll-top desk and a cracked leather chair. He was sitting there looking at the neon light he couldn't see anymore. One dirty hand was on top of a scratch pad near the phone, and the other was inside his coat. When I pulled it out, it was covered with blood and the rest of a pint of cheap whiskey. I found a 38 cartridge case on the floor. He didn't have anything in his pockets except some keys and a plug of chewing tobacco. There wasn't anything in the desk drawers either. When I started to call homicide, I had to move his hand. The name Collier was written on the scratch pad and there was an address to go with it. Extension 2521, please. Homicide, Chandler. Lieutenant Wendetti. Off tonight. Who's calling? All right, take this down, Sergeant. Shoe shop, Sunset near Alvarado. Yeah. One flight up. Yeah, 
Yeah. Office. Belongs to a private detective named Marty Anderson. Yeah. Got all that? Yeah. He's dead. What? Hey, who is... The Santa Monica fog was all over Flower Street on the 1300 block south. The streetlight didn't do much good. Just kind of hung around and watched everything get wet. I used a half a pack of matches finding my address. Out kind of late tonight, aren't you, Pilgrim? What'll it be? Toby Collier here? He was here. All right, I'll wait. He ain't gonna be here no more. You a friend of his? Never met the guy. Yeah. It's midnight, Peter. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, like that, huh? Any way you want it. I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna tell you something. All right, Santa Claus. Before I turn night watcher, they call me the Candy Kid. Six four, pound the two under three hundred. It'd be assault with a deadly weapon if I slapped you in the mush, but you're tempting me. Now, Peter. All right, wait a minute. Being a night watcher ain't slowing me down, though. All no, right, God. now maybe this will. I just came from Marty Anderson's. So what? Uh, He's dead. So what, what? And in about a half an hour, the cops are going to be here looking for Toby Collier. Yeah? Well, they can just dig him up and talk all they want. Dig him up? Are you blind or drunk or something? This outfit buried him this afternoon. This is a mortuary. Well, when I got home, she wasn't there. But a telegram was there. It was a long answer from San Quentin telling me how Collier had been brought to Los Angeles on a stretcher and the hospital that he was in, and a lot of other things. It took me 20 minutes to get out to Aladino, but I was too late. Well, her aim was a lot better this time. By the time I got through the door, the old man had dropped his gun and was kind of hanging onto a piece of drapery by the window. Got me. Got me. They'll get you, Miller. They'll get... Well, you've turned into a real Annie Oakley, haven't you? Good to see him like that. Real good. You want to give me that gun? It's empty. <laughs> sure, why not? He had it coming for a long time. You read my telegram? Yeah, I read it. And I phoned the hospital and they told me Toby was dead. Bad heart. <laughs> Wasn't that bad heart that killed Toby? It was him. He killed him. You don't have to make those faces. They don't make him any deader. You think I'm nuts, don't you? No, I'm not a lawyer, lady. You can plead any way you want. Well, I'll never tell it to a court. Don't bet on that. You want such a bad guy, I'll tell it to you. All of it? How many tramps you met in your life, Regan? Real tramps. Some. Some just thought they were tramps. Well, you met the genuine product today. Take him. For ten years, he's been packing away money. When the income tax people got close, he, he goes out and he finds Toby in a filling station. And makes him a junior partner. Huh? Yeah, works an embezzlement frame up that makes Toby the fall guy. That way he doesn't have to straighten out any books. Tramp number one. Genuine, huh? And then there's number two, a private dick named Marty Anderson. Pete. Oh, he's dead. Somebody shot him tonight. Yeah, he did it. The only decent thing he ever did in his life. Marty was in on it. He testified against Toby in court. But Marty wanted money. Yeah, all the time for the old man killed him. And it was supposed to look like Toby. Only Toby was dead. <laughs> Toby was dead. And he, he, he couldn't kill anybody. <laughs> when you find out about Toby, you come back and you do some shooting yourself, don't you? He killed Toby. At the morgue, they told me it was his heart. Heart, soul, everything that made him. He was on a hospital ward all the time. He was in bed. He only written and told me. All right, come on. You gotta take me down. Yeah. Well, don't make no difference now. This Toby, you must have loved the guy. That I'd have died for him. Yeah, lady, I guess you will. Well, that's the way it came out. Brondike killed Marty Anderson because Marty was trying to sell me what he knew about Collier's trial. Oh, Marty was a lousy private detective making those phone calls and trying to make Brondike think it was Collier. Well, 
The lion was mad because I phoned homicide and then ran away. He said it'd give the agency a bad name. And then he began talking the way he does. Funny thing about all this, Regan, those two going for each other. Yeah. She was nothing to look at. Him, he was a smart guy. He wound up in prison, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, but he was a smart guy. He was just framed. Not many smart guys get framed. What do you mean? I mean, Collier sold out to Brondike, and then he made the frame deal. How do you know? Collier left a will. Mm. You think any made a go of it? I mean, gotten married or something if all this hadn't happened? No. Nope. Why not? She went for him, and he went for her. Say, he didn't serve much time on a two to ten rap. He must have had a smart lawyer. No, you mean doctor. What? He had a heart condition. He was dying. And they paroled him? They let him out to die. Well, they do things like that? Sometimes. Hmm. No wonder he didn't write that name. Yeah, what do you know about that? Nothing. You work on it. I'm tired. Good night. Are you a registered graduate nurse? Do you know someone who is? Then please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in the event of an emergency. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. So don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Jack Webb is starred as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. The role of Connie Brondike was played by Betty Lou Gerson. Jeff Regan is written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy, with original music by Dick Aron. It's CBS same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. <laughs> If you like mystery, you'll be able to find out what makes a mystery when you find that clue with with mystery man Ken Crossan and other famous mystery experts on most of these CBS stations Monday night at 8.30. Remember, find that clue, CBS Monday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, greetings as usual, friend. Now, before we get down to cases, I want to ask you a question. What, in your opinion, is the dirtiest trick man can play on his fellow man? Now, don't say stealing candy from a baby, because that'll send you right back to the bush leagues. No, I'll tell you what I'll do. I promise you that if you'll listen to our Let George Do It adventure, you'll get some of the nastiest ideas on how to loss up your neighbor that you've ever heard of. Is that a deal? Okay, suppose I let George Valentine take it from here. Dear Mr. Valentine, first letter I ever written in 17 years, since the last time I filed a gold claim in Nogales. Name's Tioga Tom, only honest man left in the West. If you ever heard of the castle I live in out by the desert, then you know what these railroad tickets are for. To come see me, but you don't know anything else, understand? 
trouble you fellas, you jump on conclusions. Think nobody else is smart but you. If you think I need help, then you're crazier than the people in Cactus Junction. And I ain't spit in their direction since WPA. But I do need a mite of assistance regarding the arrest of a culprit. I'm a man everybody tries to pester, on account of how rich they think I struck it. But me, I like my privacy and I aim to maintain it. P.S. The culprit I make reference to is the one who stole or made disappear or killed my dog. Only botheration is, it was my C&I dog. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Like a chicken leg, dearie, I brought a whole fryer along with some hard-boiled eggs. You know how trains are. Oops! Excuse me while I just get my valise on the rack here. It's all right. I'll move my coat, only this Yes, is... you came all the way through from the city, huh, dearie? Claire Brooks, it says on the baggage thing. Oh, my, that's a nice name. I had a boarder named Brooks once, but he died with his kidneys, poor darling. How you like our town, Cactus Junction? It ain't much, uh, look, is it? Please, excuse me, but really, this seat is... Too... There we are. I guess there's no room for my hat, though. Have to jab it in across the aisle. Mind me to keep my eye on it. You never know. So now let's eat. Well, I'm awfully sorry, madam, but I'm trying Go to tell on, you that... Go on, dearie. You... There's plenty of chicken for both of us. Oh, but I had the most awful time wringing its neck. Oh, you should have seen me. I chased him all around the oh, yard. Oh, no. I, I said, will you please not sit down here? The seat is taken. Oh, George. George. Yeah, here I am, Angel. Well... If I'd known you was that tight. Oh, that's all right, lady. Sit still, sit still. But, George... Going out for a smoke. Have a nice time, Brooksy. Oh, George! Isn't he sweet, after all? Now, my name's Carmichael, dearie, and let me tell you about this Good. chicken. Good! Here we go, Jake. Well, here we go, Mr. Valentine. Last stop before Henry Switch. Emory Switch. That's where we get off, huh, conductor, for Tom's? Yep. Two, three-mile walk, I guess, up the hill. But there's a moon tonight. Rode around the back way, but of course it's his father. Uh huh. Kind of a lonely spot for a blind man, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, desert rat with money. <laughs> Probably never let a doctor touch him in his life. Seen him out there once, just a couple of weeks ago. He's fumbling along, hanging on to his dog. And... Doesn't like people, huh? No, there's an old Oriental been with him for years, if that's what you mean. Ho Sing, cook and bottle washer. Which increases, Tom, his whole fortune might have paid in his castle, they say. <laughs> Eh, uh, I can't feel too sorry for him. Tioga Tom, last honest man in the West. <laughs> says him. Well, you'll be the first fist up there for a long time, I guess. Maybe you can get your hands on some of that gold. Underway now. Eh, uh, save me another. Hey, wait, wait for me! I hate stopping Oh, conductor, there seems to be a guy out here. Hey, Never make it, will he? Always somebody too late for a train. Huh? Ridiculous. Shows a man's got no efficiency. I'm never late. Hey, wait, will you? Hey, wait! Well, come on, let's give him a hand. Hey, drinking, too. Hey. Can't even run hey. straight, you see. Hey, help me, fellas, will you? Please. Here, let me reach him. Hey. Now, now, here, I can reach him. Oh, gee, thanks. Oh, 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 easy oh, there. Couldn't even hang onto my hand. Oh, Don't know why we bother. He's liable to fall. Get out of the way, friend. Oh, get him. Here we go, boys. Here we are. Oh, oh gee. Oh, thanks. So, sorry to be in trouble. I was in the bar. Everybody is so nice. They couldn't get away. Okay, okay, Frank. You made it all right. Oh, yeah. Wait a uh, minute. Here's your uh, hat over here. My name's uh, Loosefoot. Want a drink? What? Uh, Loosefoot. Uh, it's a name. Somebody just give it to me, I guess. I don't remember. Uh, come on, come on. Have Wait a, a minute. Scepter, it's a ticket, huh? too. Hey, it, look, it fell off your hat. Take it. Here, give me that. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, sure, nice of you, hey, pal. Emery uh, Switch, it's a... Yeah, didn't it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I, I'm a necktie salesman. Got a few samples for the Switchman who works there. That's all. Well, thanks again, and, 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 and you too. I... Uh, where'd the other guy go? Back in the car, I guess. Oh, well, uh, thank him for giving me a hand, will you? I mean, thanks. I sure 
Yeah, sure. Only didn't you notice, Loose Brain? What that other guy tried to give you was a shove. I didn't shove him, Mr. Valentine. I just didn't help him much. I didn't want him on the train. Part of it. Well, Mr. Flannery, I don't know. I'm just curious. Perfect right. Perfect. His name's Loosefoot. You know him? Who doesn't? I've done business in Cactus Junction. Lawyer. Coming this time from the city, though. As far as Emery Switch, huh? You too, maybe, huh? And why not? Now, Loosefoot's the kind of a person who's always in the way. Son of an old partner of Tioga Tom's, or claims to be. Always claiming to have a claim on him. Oh? And why are you going? What's your claim, Mr. Flannery? Never ask a lawyer a direct question, young man. <laughs> Spoken like an ambulance, Jason. Or presume on a man's guilt before it happens. Now, I haven't really seen Tom since before he lost his eyesight. As many's the time I've handled his legal affairs. Oh, wait and... a minute, what do you mean, guilt before it happens? What happens? What's going on tonight? You and Loosefoot. That makes three of us headed for the same place to visit a guy nobody ever visits. And all on the same night. Why? Oh, you too, eh? <laughs> well, well. What's your angle? You need counsel, say so. You don't leave me alone. Why should I say why? <laughs> I'll tell you this, though. There's four, not three. Huh? His common-law wife for six months back in 1917. Or she says she was, but that's her claim. Not a bad one. You mean Tioga Tom? That big, overdeveloped appetite out there in the coach. Notice her eating fried chicken. A woman, Mr. Valentine, who'd wring your neck for a favor, but charged to tell you the time. The widow Carmichael. My lands, yes. That's where I live in Cactus Junction. Just to be near the poor dear. Thirty-three years I've waited. The one true love of my life. All right, so you're going to see him too, but would you... Four of us? Four of us? My, I think it's just friendly. That's what I think. Only even with my shoes on, it counts to five to me. Ain't that so, Cousin Henry? Ah, who's cousin? Well, I guess it does, widow. Oh, George, he's some sort of a cousin of Tioga Tom's. Uh, mother's side it was. Never very close, but... Blood's always thicker than water. That's the way I was raised. If you can't miss Brooks, here it's six of us, ain't it? Tioga, now he never liked crowds. Family trade. I told them we were going up to do a magazine story on him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But the rest of you, Mrs. Carmichael, will you please... I don't hold no secrets. I'm sure you don't. I ain't afraid to speak up. Remember, blood's thicker than strangers, too, widow. And to whom is bereavement a secret? What? what? Oh, but he'll be well again. I know he will. I brought along my nursing things. It's my opportunity as well as my duty. It's the telegrams, Mr. Valentine. We all got them. Even that loose foot up in the bar car. Where Tom's nearest. Bless his adorable old soul. Now, 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 widow. The telegrams? But I don't know Darling why... Darling, this should... evening, miss. From uh, Po Singh, that heathen up the castle. Here, read for yourself. Oh, thanks. Boss, very bad. Fall down, very bad. Come quick, please. Signed, Po Sing. Boss, very bad. A blind man, and he's already had some kind of a fall. Emery switch. Ten minutes stop, Emery switch. Come on, Brooksy, i got to get to a phone. Trap? What trap? What is it? Quiet, Angel. Oh, some kind of trap. I know, Sabby. All the same, he mixed oh, up. Oh, for the love of... Look, Po Sing, I told you this is Mr. Valentine. I'm on my way up, but I want to find out what happened since Tom wrote me. Now, if you need a doctor or no, something... No, 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 no. Boss, he say doctor just for horses and descending he bills. Boss dying, that's all. What? Come quick, that's all. Boss dying. <laughs> dying? Come on, Brooksy. Let's get our stuff off the train and get up there. I don't know what's going on. But, George, day before yesterday, a blind man's dog was stolen or killed, and then he has an accident. I know, I know. A rugged character who probably kept moving around, dog or no dog. Sure, somebody's up to something. This bunch of people. Haven't you realized what they are? Yeah, they all got telegrams. You know what I mean. 
They're the only people in the world, apparently, who have any sort of claim against Tioga Tom. They're nothing but vultures. Well, I'll go you one better, Angel. Say ghouls. Because you want to bet a guy like Tom has never made out a will? So if he did die, they'd all want to be handy to stake out those claims, start grabbing for his gold. Yeah, they go, George. All walking out together. Yeah. About three miles up the hill, somebody said. Only suppose you and I just walk fast and beat him, huh? Let's get to Tom first. All right. Loose foot in the widow. Look, there's certainly a pair. Cousin Henry, he's as slow as they are. Characters, I tell you. But there's one who's not so slow. Hey, he's not with him. Who, Mr. Flannery? Yeah, still in the compartment. Let's drag him along with us. I want to ask him about what he did with that seeing-eyed dog. Ask him? George, what makes you oh, think I'm just he's... guessing. I'll tell you later, Angel. Hey, Flannery, let's go. We're... George. Mr. Flannery's dead. Yeah. Heard it. You're listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. Tioga Tom, the legendary man in the castle overlooking the desert. He thought he didn't need help, but that was yesterday when all that worried him was the disappearance of his seeing eye dog. Once his protection was gone, something happened to Tom an accident. And his only friend, Po Sing, says that he is dying, says, Come quick. The vultures, the only relatives or ones with claims against Tom, they're gathering too. But if your name is George Valentine, you can't hurry to the castle quite as quickly as you'd like, because one of the vultures is dead. Yes, Mr. Flannery has been murdered. Holy brother of Macintosh, what are we going to do? All right, take it easy, Conductor, take it easy. Some sort of a sharp weapon, George. Yeah, a little tiny wound in his throat. Yeah, but I got a train to worry about, and them people all scattered now. I better get on the telegraph. George, you said you had a hunch Mr. Flannery was the one who did something to the dog. Why? Oh, any of these people could have got at that dog. You know, Angel, it happened yesterday. It's only 15, 20 miles from Cactus Junction out to the castle. So they could have gone back and forth. Well, what's on your mind? But Mr. Flannery told you he'd come all the way from the city, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Neat, sharp little guy, man with efficiency. How about that, did he? Well, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I'm so rattled that I, I can't tell. There's I've been... mud, well, clay on the bottom of his shoes and the instep. See it? I noticed when he crossed his leg and carefully creased his trousers. Uh, Mr. Valentine, wait till the sheriff... He'd been in the city the day before. How'd mud get there? I'm the kind of guy who'd have a shine before breakfast. Say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I got the stubs here. I... Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Flannery, compartment... But you're right. He just got on at Cactus Junction, just like the others. Uh-huh. So then maybe I'm wrong about the dog. Oh, George, now you're confusing me even worse. Well, why was he murdered? Who murdered him? Maybe somebody else did something, and he was up here snooping around and saw it. Quite an operator, you know that. That'd be his style. See something and just keep quiet. Hey, Al, you see him? No. Oh. See a little woman, a little wobbly guy, and a stiff-jointed slowpoke? I know, sure, I know. No, I didn't see him. I couldn't catch up. Already left the road, I guess. Took the trail up the hill. Oh, brother. This road run around the backside of the castle. Sure, about five miles up there. There's a place you Okay, can... stay and help the conductor, will you? Let me have your truck. Yeah. Well, he's got to get us off on the side. And then all right, all right. You guys it. worry about the train and the body. Come on, Brooksy. The ghouls are on foot. We can beat him. Yeah, sure. Only well, get that sheriff here fast. One murder's enough for tonight. Particularly if the second one should be me. Fits the description. Yeah. This door, I guess. Oh. Don't see anybody inside there. At least we're ahead of the others. Yeah. Uphill, it'll take him another half hour. Only George, the murderer, if he's one of them, wouldn't stay with the others. Wouldn't he run away? Oh, maybe whatever this is all about isn't finished yet. Here we are, Angel. I guess we walk right in. Oh, it's a kitchen. Living room in here, apparently. Yeah. Hello. Anybody here? 
Hey, Tom, where are you? The place is so empty, but it's clean. That must be his room. It's the only one that... Yeah, maybe he's asleep. But... George. Hey, a man dying, but his bed's empty. He's gone. Yeah, yeah, he's gone. Huh, what? Oh, 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 Mr. Valentine. Hello. Hello, miss. You're posing, but where's your... Tom, gone. <laughs> he is gone. Now, look, friend, what is this? A man who takes a bad fall and is dying doesn't just disappear like that? Oh, Mr. Tom, say, Mr. Tom, gone. Uh, now, excuse me, hey, please. wait a minute. Where are you going? I got a cleaver knife. A what? Meet the cleaver. You sorry? Mr. Tom say you must stay. Oh, he does, huh? The boss. Old Honest Tom says we should stay, huh? Suppose we don't. You're going to use that thing? More better, I think you stay. Oh, sure. Okay. No, we'll stay outside. I can't work. Brother Valentine the sucker, Valentine George, the sucker. George, there's a fence down here the front way, too. Supposed to be a gate half a mile from the house. Yeah, and this was a path when we started out on it. Where the deuce did we lose it? Valentine the pathfinder, the boy's. Oh, scarf. George, you don't know yet. Hey, look out now. Oh, easy there. Ooh. You seem to be down in a gully. What? Yeah. The trail must be up there, George. To a bridge right up over us. Come on. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't what I was looking at. Sawdust. Hmm? Yeah, sort of, scattered. All around here, too. Farther under the bridge. Seems to be just a little footbridge. Pretty far up there, though, isn't it? Yeah, sort of has been here for a day or two. Wet. Fell here. There's some on top of the cross piece, too. Yeah, I see it. Somebody said trap. Something up there has been freshly sawed, Angel. And anybody coming up the trail from the front gate would have to go across that bridge, wouldn't they? And it's so dark, they couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, come on. Get up there before somebody tries to walk across it. Hey. Oh, but... Look out where you're going. What? Bump into a man just sitting peaceful like that. Hey, there. Woman's voice, wasn't it? Well, yes, couldn't you see it? Tom, Tioga Tom, wouldn't you know? You wouldn't know anything. Who is it, Valentine? Yeah, I'm standing right here in front of you. You're sitting on a rock waiting for something to happen? Detectives all are stinking. Trouble with you, fella. But sitting nice and healthy, yeah, the poor guy who had the bad tumble. Only honest man left in the West. And he gets his hired boy to send out telegrams saying he's dying. <laughs> had a tumble. Broke ten ribs back in 1922. Never told a lie in my life. So that's the way you stretch it. Poor dying Tom. Been dying since the day I was born. So have you. So now you're sitting here waiting to hear wood break, huh? Po Sing brings you out where you can, waiting to hear people tumble through that little trap you set up there. Pest to me, every one of them. I told you that... I'm afraid we don't believe anything you told us. Told you I like my privacy. I aim to maintain it. Bunch of vultures, all pest to me, looking for my gold. So you hire me... See an eye dog disappeared. Don't you think somebody's up to something? You jump on conclusions. Say, I had that bridge sword. But one of them did it. Like one of them did a murder, I suppose. Ain't interested in murder. Gonna die myself sometime. That's enough to worry about. Just trying to slow up the process, that's all. I steal my dog and then saw my bridge. Who do you think uses that bridge? I do. Even without my dog, I can find my way around this place, but I found him out. Yes, sir. Tom isn't gonna go down with it. Huh? Go on, one chosen. Hold your tongue. Ain't you got ears? George, yes, somebody's coming. I'm going to get up on that bridge before... No, this way. Hey! Hey, where am I? Who is that over there? Where's the trail? I can't see. <laughs> My loving vultures. Tell everybody their friends of mine can't even find their way around. Hello, Henry. Your voice, ain't it? Tom. <laughs> Fitter than a fiddle. What in the name of... Never mind. Where's the rest of them? Loosefoot and the lady. Oh, coming, I guess. We move kind of separate. Only that telegram, Tom. What kind of a stunt? Yeah, let me take your arm. Help no, me out. Quiet, no, no, Henry Loosefoot. Mrs. Carmichael. Another county you heard from. Could hear that one across three counties. Yeah, there she is, over on the other side. She's headed for the bridge. Come on. The Hurry up and get her. I'll oh, be all right. Everybody. George, we can't get up there in time. We're on the wrong side. She's coming this way. Mrs. Carmichael, stop. Who is that? Where are you? Stay where you are. Don't come across that bridge. What did you say? Oh, the bridge, yes, I see it, all right. Uh, stop, don't walk on it. Oh, it's you, dearie, I'm coming. Stop, George, I you... said, stop, will you? Well, I can't stop till I get there, can Oh, I? Lord, she'll fall, oh. stop. My heavens, what's all the fuss? Oh, we 
Out of the Wait, way, Angel. Let me see something. What's the matter with him? Oh, dearie, what a climb. And the wind blowing my hat off all the time. What are you trying to see, George? The gird is sawed half through, all right. But a board's been freshly nailed across to support it. But George, but I But who don't... could have nailed the board across? Tom and Poe Singh are the only ones up here. So Tom was telling the truth. Someone else sawed it, then Tom had it fixed. Wait a minute. Mrs. Carmichael, where's your hat been? What? Yeah. When Flannery was murdered, little tiny wound... He was stabbed with something sharp. Well, how in blazes should I know where the pin is? George, she pinned her hat to the seat opposite us, the seat across the aisle. I remember it. Did I? Couldn't find it when I left the train. And the only person who would have noticed it or thought of using it was the one who sat down there. Cousin Henry. Yes, Cousin Henry. And George, he's down there with Tom. Wait a minute. What about Loosefoot? Where's he? Ran on ahead, I guess. He was the fastest. And the trail's easy mark. So we haven't seen him because he's probably already crossed this bridge. Probably clear up at the house by now. But, George, Tom is down there with sure, Henry. Sure, sure, with Henry. Don't you see, Angel? Tom wanted to know who killed his dog and sawed the bridge. That was the reason for the phony telegrams, this whole shindig. It was to get all the vultures up here and see which one of them wouldn't walk across the bridge. Henry. And five minutes ago, Tom discovered who was guilty. Well, uh, hurry up. Yeah, we yeah, but quietly. Because now it's all backwards. Now the question is what Tom intends to do to Henry. There. There they are. And they're not moving toward the house, not moving at all. Tom's got a gun, George. He's hanging onto Henry's arm. Even a blind man could shoot somebody as long as he Yeah, come on, around this way. Push out. Uh, well, come back, did you? Get down here, Mr. Valentine. This crazy... Shut thing. up, dog killer. You'll get your chance to grovel. He's a murderer, too, you say, huh? There's no answer, Angel. Around the rock here. Yeah, that's right. Now, come on. He's crazy. You're both crazy. Everybody comes pestering me. Well, it's going to stop once for all. Sure, he killed Flannery. Flannery's another pest. Snooping around the same day he was. Let go of me. Let go of me. Get your hand oh, off my... Oh, no, you don't. You move. The gun goes off. Okay, Tom. I'm here now, right beside you. You can hand me that gun. Uh-huh. Hey, George, you let go. He just let go. Oh, no, you, you... Look out. I'll get him. Give me that gun, I said. Where are you? Where is no, he? No, no, you don't. Detectives... Knocking my gun the sheriff will get him, don't worry. I just got an idea. It might be good to save you from dying for a while, Tom. <laughs> Man's dying from the day he's born. Oh, sure. Honest Tom. Rugged independent. I know I hate that guy, but shooting him while escaping might not go down so well with a jury. Uh, just shooting wild? Uh, I couldn't actually... Well, would have been just blind luck if I hit him, I mean. Oh, sure, sure, Tom. Be careful what you say. Don't want to tell a lie. Only honest man left in the West. Yep, that's me. Don't want to admit you might be a dead shot. Don't want to say right out to your blind. Even though that's how you suck at these people into coming after you. <laughs> but, George, he said... <laughs> Ain't a lie if a man always talks like he had to hear people to recognize him, is it? Ain't a lie to stumble around the few times you've seen, is it? Busty, you take the cake. <laughs> honest as the day is short... Sure, we all jumped at conclusions, all right. Because I guess there's no law against a man with good eyesight owning a seeing-eye dog. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Don't like it. People, don't like them. Well, you can leave for the castle pretty soon, Tom. Taking down your cousin Henry's confession now. Worthless bunch of vultures. Won't be pestered anymore. Sure, sure, Tom. You've got your privacy. You know, we did stop you from doing the one thing that really would have been wrong. Do I appreciate it? Obligations ain't for me, young lady. Well, the reason people pester you is because of your gold. And I thought maybe you'd tell us what... <laughs> Tell you a secret. Sure, I got barbed wire and fences, but I never actually said I have gold, did I? What? Oh, for the luck. Oh, George, come on, let's get out of here. Jump on conclusions like everybody else. Oh, that awful man. George, I want to go out someplace and go dancing and forget about him. Okay, spend my gold. Well, at least I know you haven't got any. (laughs) I'll tell you something that'll worry you for years, you notice? 
Tom didn't say he didn't have any either. You have just heard Nothing But the Truth, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. This is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. But tonight's story began when one man tried to destroy another with the strangest weapon of all. Darkness. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When your job is to walk into the darkness and discover what makes a city tick, you pick up some mighty strange friends. The winos dreaming of a muscatel paradise in cold, dark doorways. The petty larceny boys with their fast deals. The painted little dames defying the world with their brassy laughter. The homeless, the hopeless. In the city, night is for the lost. And sometimes you feel a hunger to be with someone of the everyday world. Some nice, well-adjusted soul who's got a reason for waking up tomorrow morning. I guess that's why I dropped in to see Bessie Chadfield tonight. Bessie's a little gray-haired librarian who has charge of a small storefront library on Huron Street. No one around this time of night but Bessie and a young fellow in a gray raincoat alone at a reading table. Mr. Stone, well, we haven't seen you, oh, in such a long time. <laughs> well, since Forever Amber, you haven't had the kind of high-type literature that interests me. <laughs> and when you finally do drop in, look what time you get here. Ten o'clock, right when I have to go over and start turning out the lights. I, uh, I timed it that way so I could get you behind those bookcases, uh, away from that fellow with the reading desk. Well, I'm afraid your timing is about 35 years off, Mr. Stone. <laughs> Mm, these light switches. Why do they always put them up so high? Aren't you going to tell that fellow it's time to go home? This is the way we tell them. We flick off the lights and then flick them on again. First off, like this. No! Don't do that! No! What? Turn the lights on quick. Let me handle him. What's the idea of doing that, mister? That's supposed to be smarter. or something. Oh, take it easy, fella. Take it easy. Or did he pay you to do it? Is that the deal? Huh? You tell George Brewster that the game doesn't amuse me anymore. You tell him if he keeps that up, I'll... I'll kill him. Oh, wait. I turned the lights out. It's closing time. What? Closing time? Oh. Yes, of course. What's wrong with you, buddy? You sick or something? Sick. Sick, yes. That's me, sick. Only mine's a childhood disease. Childhood. Childhood. Now, what in the world was that? I don't know. Ever seen him before? He's come in a couple of times this week. Spent all his time reading some reference books at the table. Seemed to be such a nice, polite young man. Considerate, kindly. Let's take a look at those books. Oh, my heavens, my, my heart is beating a mile a minute. And did you see his face? It frightened me. He was even more scared than we were. Of what? These are books he was reading? Yes. 
The mind in limbo, abnormal psychology, modern psychiatry. Why would he want books like this? Maybe he was looking for somebody in these books. Who? Himself, Bessie. Probably himself. Bessie was pretty upset, so after she locked up for the night, I started walking her toward the elevated station over on Lake Street. We'd walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, that man down the street, looking in that store window, Mm -hmm. that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that in his hand? That's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yeah, you wait right here, honey. Be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. The fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and turned toward me. The wan street light did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. Blood was running down his hand where the glass had cut it. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. That's the idea, pal. He spun around and started running for the elevated station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing. He stumbled over a trash can and a curb. I caught up with him, grabbing his arm. Let go of me. Leave me alone. Uh-uh. Let go of me. He slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train... I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. I folded up and I just sat there. I listened to the train pull away with the fellow on it and remembered what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite young man. After a while, I began to feel somewhat human again. I notified the police what had happened, and they sent a squad car out. After they left, I remembered something. A name this nice, polite young man had been throwing around. George Brewster. I found a phone book in a cigar store. There were three George Brewsters. The first number didn't answer. I tried the second. Hello? I'd like to speak to George Brewster. Oh, he's not in right now. Is there any message? Who is this? I'm his sister. Is anything wrong? Well, if this is the right George Brewster, something is wrong. Is there any reason why a young fellow should want to kill your brother? Oh. Oh, that would be Morrison. Oh, I warned George. Morrison, huh? Tom Morrison. Where does he live? Our old apartment, 612 Hamlin Avenue. What makes you think he wants to kill George? Well, this uh, character broke into a store tonight and stole a gun. I sort of think he had your brother in mind when he did it. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Well, lady, I know what I'm going to do. As fast as I hang up and get another nickel into this phone, I'm going to call the police. Oh, I feel so bad. It's not really Morrison's fault, poor man. Oh, no, no. He's uh, he's just a prince of a fellow. Uh, goodbye, lady. I've got to make a call. But then it turned out that I didn't have a nickel. And on the way to the counter for change, I started wondering why the sister of the man he was going to kill felt sorry for Morrison. And why Bessie thought he was such a sweet character. And, well, the night was young and 612 Hamlin Avenue couldn't wait. And I could call the cops later. (laughs) 612 North Hamlin was a second floor flat on the north side. I got there a few minutes after 11 that night. All the windows were lit up. I rang the bell and I waited I felt a little bead of sweat zigzagging down my face like I didn't have any place to go. Yes? Oh, it's you. No, no, let's not close the door just yet. In fact, let's push it open all the way. What do you want? My two front teeth and a few ribs. Get out of here. Now, look, pal, don't tempt me. I came against my better judgment to listen to what you've got to say. If I leave now, the only place I'm going is the nearest police station. Police station? I guess maybe that would be the best. What? Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I guess you better call the police, mister. What do you think you're doing, calling my bluff? The phone's right behind you. Okay, buddy, you asked for it. Sure this is the way you want it? It's better this way. I'm at the end of my rope. 
I don't want to kill him. George Brewster? Yes, George Brewster. I know how it'll end if he doesn't stop. Stop what? Call the police, mister. You'd be doing me a favor. Since when have I got to do you favors? Well, why aren't you calling? I'm an Eagle Scout in good standing. I haven't done my good deed for today. You can't help me, mister. Stone is the name. What makes you so sure I can? Now, thanks for even wanting to. After that bad time I gave you. Bad time? That's the understatement of the year. Well, I was panic-stricken. He got me half crazy. Well, what have you got to lose if you tell me about it? No. Okay. Wait, wait. I don't know. I... I'm like a drowning man grasping at straws. Look, maybe if you talked to Brewster, told him what he's doing to me, maybe, maybe he'd leave me alone. Huh? Well, you never can tell. But I'd have to know what I'm talking about. It's quite a story, mister. These lights. Look at them. Bright as the sun, aren't they? Lamps. Overhead chandeliers. Look at them. I'd hate to see your light bills. Like some men need drugs. That's how I need these lights. Come again? My sanity depends on it. My very sanity. On these lights? It's a sickness. You've even got a name for it. Noctophobia, it's called. Fear of darkness. Fear of darkness? That's for kids. I... Uh, no, I, I uh, take that back. I'm sorry. Don't be. I quite agree. Kids. Or neurotic women. But in a man of my age, it's, it's quite ridiculous. Only when the day starts drawing to a close, when the night starts crowding in. Have you been to a doctor? Sure, I've been to doctors. They tell me I shouldn't feel too badly. Plenty of people with my trouble. A hangover from childhood. An illness. Like heart trouble is an illness. I'll take the heart trouble. Maybe you haven't gone to the right kind of a doctor. Maybe psychiatry could help. Nothing's going to help me. George Brewster's going to see to that. What about this, uh, Brewster? He's trying to destroy me. With the strangest weapon of all. The strangest weapon of all? Yes. His weapon is the night. You are listening to Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy. In a moment, we'll return to Night Beat and Randy Stone. But first, we'd like to call your attention to another great NBC mystery adventure program. Every Sunday, you'll want to hear the exciting new Christopher London series with screen actor Glenn Ford in the title role. Stories for Christopher London are furnished by Earl Stanley Gardner, one of the most famous mystery story writers in America. There is no doubt about the greatness of Gardner's stories... And with the superb acting of Glenn Ford, Christopher London should be must-listening for every mystery fan. Make a listening date now to hear the exciting adventures of Christopher London every Sunday over most of these same NBC stations. And now, back to Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone in Night Beat. It was a weird feeling standing in Morrison's brilliantly lighted parlor listening to him tell me about his terror of darkness. A sturdy, healthy-looking man trapped by a childhood nightmare. I felt guilt listening to him like I was eavesdropping into a dark corner of his mind that was nobody's business but his own. And yet he had to tell me because he needed help. Because George Brewster was using Morrison's fear to destroy him. I was sent to Chicago by our company to read place Brewster Stone. Till he found out why I was here, he couldn't do enough for me. He even got me this apartment. Greater love hath no man. Then he found out what the setup was. He changed fast enough. How did he find out about this uh, fear of yours? Well, I'm telling you how. The other night, the two of us were working alone in the big vault down at the office, working on some old account or other. And the overhead light, it blew out. Uh-huh. Well, it was so sudden, I, I couldn't help myself. I tried to keep calm, but... Well, it's like something tearing me to pieces inside. I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't... Finally, I had to run. So he found out no, about... No, no, no. He wasn't sure, but... It started him thinking. Yes, I see. Next afternoon, he came over to my desk. He was jovial, friendly, like he'd been in the beginning. Saying we'd been at each other's throats long enough. Inviting me to have dinner with him that night. 
Right from work, we went to his favorite spot on the north side, a place called the Catacombs. I began feeling uneasy the moment I entered. How do you like this place, Tom? That's okay. It's fine. Uh, it's been a favorite of mine for years. One spot in particular. <laughs> the wine cellar. How do you feel about wine? Oh, I like it all right. Come along with me. I'm a wine man from way back. Uh, say, George, I wanted to talk to you about that little outburst last night. They have a different wine cellar here with a different temperature for each type of wine. I haven't been sleeping well, you see. And... Me, I prefer Riesling myself. Well, here we are. Huh? At the white wine cellar. We'll select our own brand for our supper. Here, I'll open the door. Yeah, this is a privilege only an old customer like me can get away with. Come on. It's dark down there. That's why they've got this candle here on the ledge. Got a match? Why, well, uh... A match, Tom. Mm. Yeah. Here. Okay. I'll get this candle going. Good. Now, let's go downstairs. Uh, George, uh, you think we should do this on our own? Done it hundreds of times. Been coming here for the last ten years. Well, now let's go down these stairs. Huh? Careful. Yeah. George, I was explaining about last night. A candle uh, casts funny shadows, doesn't it? You notice how cool it is? Twenty feet below street level here. Look, I want to talk about last night, I don't want any misunderstanding. Huh? It's just that I've been working pretty hard. Oh, Tom. Would it make you feel better if you showed me you're not afraid of the dark? Okay, you can show me. I'll blow out the candle. What are you trying to prove, Brewster? Nothing at all. It's your idea. Where are those matches I gave you? You gave me some matches? Well, I must have lost them. It's not going to work, Brewster. I'm not insane, you know. I can stay down here until you're quite satisfied. Funny, isn't it, about the darkness? The way it seems to close in on you. The way you start thinking you can't breathe. I know, I, I can see how someone could... What's the matter, Tom? But this is ridiculous. Something so suffocating about a dark room. Stop it. Stop it. Only the heavy, smothering blackness. Stop it. Where are you going, Tom? Anything wrong? <laughs> Anything wrong? Anything wrong? I ran out of that cellar like a kid, like a kid scared to death, Stone. That was a rotten thing for him to do. Well, he's fighting for his job, Stone. He's not too young anymore. He can't start all over again, so we'll do anything. Oh, great. I'm sure he's told the people down at work. I'm sure they're all laughing at me behind my back. You don't know what that does to me. I can imagine. Today I found a new desk lamp on my desk, courtesy of George Brewster. Every day, something like that. Did you ask him why he's doing it? He won't admit he's doing anything. He says it's all my imagination. Maybe I ought to see a doctor. Or better still, maybe a change of climate would help. Well, I'd leave town in a minute. Only my future's at stake, too. Before I let him drive me crazy, I'll kill him. Well, I'm going now. I'm going to talk to this bird. Where does he live? Out in the suburbs, Lake Forest. He lives with his sister. All right, I'll give you a ring as soon as I've seen him. Mr. Stone, I hope you can do some good. Yeah. Oh. Say, I almost forgot something. What? Uh, that gun you made off with. Well, I... Maybe uh... if we're lucky, we can talk the store owner out of pressing charges. I'll try it. That was a crazy thing to do. <laughs> I was so desperate. Wouldn't have done you much good when they put them in the window. They never loaded I'll let you in on a secret. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been such a hero coming here tonight. I'll let you in on a secret, Mr. Stone. You can get bullets without a license. The gun's loaded now. Oh, oh, oh great. All right, go, go and get it for me. All right. Yes, I want to give it to you. It's in my bedroom. He started for the bedroom... And then it was almost like a comedy routine where, after the big build-up, the punchline comes right out on cue. The moment he entered the other room, every light in the house suddenly went out. What happened to the lights? Take it easy. Where's the fuse box? I don't know. Never had any occasion to use it. 
Besides, if it was a fuse, all the lights wouldn't go out. It wasn't you. Use your head. How could I do it? I'm getting out of here. All lights out, too. Stone. Well, I... maybe something went wrong with the central wire. But why should it happen exactly now? Wait, huh? The downstairs apartment. Their lights are on. If it was the wire, all right, I... All right, let's ask them where the fuse box is. Yes? Oh, Mr. Morris. Uh, my lights went out. It might be a fuse. Where are the fuse boxes for these apartments? Out in the back. I'll get a flashlight and show you. Here we are. The fuse box is right here below our meters. Whenever the people from the light company come out, they have a dickens of a time finding it. Will you hold the flashlight steady and let me take a look? Wait a minute, Stone. Lower the flashlight just a little. Huh? It's not the fuse. Look at the master switch on my meter. Look at the one of Mrs. Graham's. Why, somebody pulled your switch down to off. Yes. Yes, someone surely did. Well, here, let me push it up. There. And look upstairs. All your lights are on again. That's probably some kids playing a joke. Now, how do you suppose the rascals ever found it? It's so well hidden. I, uh... I've got a theory that all kids come equipped with a special radar of finding things like this. Mrs. Graham, tell this gentleman who used to live in my apartment before I did. Why? Tell him. Why, you know. He even got the apartment for you. Your friend, Mr. Brewster. But what is that? Tom, that doesn't prove he did it. For me, it does, Stone. For me, it does. Morrison went around to the front of his house and up the stairs to his flat. I waited in the hallway until he came down again. He looked different. His face was hard and set. His eyes were like chunks of glass punched into the flesh. What are you waiting for, Stone? When we were so brutally interrupted, you were going for the gun. I've got it now. Oh, yes. Uh, hand it over. I'll bring it back. No, thanks. Well, where are you going and what are you going to do? I'm fighting for my sanity, my life. He's never going to do this to me again. Never. I can't let you do that. You're not going to have to. The minute you leave, I'm going to call every cop in the book. Yes, that's what you do, isn't it? Yes. Then I'd better give you the gun. <clears throat> this could become habit forming. I dropped to my knees in the hallway, and then the hallway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two hallways, and then there were four. And then everywhere I looked, there were hallways. Morrison tried to push me aside and get by me, only it was a whole circle of Morrison's. I grabbed at his legs to hold him back and it was like grabbing at a centipede. Then all the Morrison's in all the hallways brought all their guns down on my one poor head. And that was it, brothers and sisters, that was it. Feeling better, Mr. Stone? Oh, if I felt any better, I'd call him a bomber. Oh, what a business. I heard a commotion and I came out and you were lying here. Oh, is this my head or is it a candle? Oh, oh, how did it happen and where's Mr. Morrison? Oh, Morrison, Morrison, yes. How long ago did you hear this commotion? Oh, just a couple of minutes ago. You came out of it real fast. Yeah, I've got an iron constitution. Have you got a, got a phone? Well, yes, but don't you think you Come better... on, lady, grab my head, put it back on nice and neat and let's get to that phone. <laughs> Hello? Hello, this is the fellow who called you before, Miss Brewster, about Morrison and your brother. Oh, yes. He's not there yet, huh? No, my brother's... I don't mean your brother, I mean Morrison. What? No, is, is he... Oh, yes, he sure is. Now, give me your address, and the minute you hang up, get away from your house as fast as you can. Morrison's got a gun, and he's half crazy. Maybe we should call the police. Well, maybe we should, but I'm not going to. They'd throw the book at him ten years for attempted murder. I think I can stop him before he does anything. Oh, I can't tell you how sorry I am about this. Lady, you and your brother should be. The cab got me out to their Lake Forest house in less than 20 minutes. The house was on a hill, and a flagstone path wound round and round for a city block until it reached the front porch. As I ran up the walk, my head started rattling like a handful of pennies in a tin cup. I felt weak and tired. All the time, I tried not to think about what I'd find when I reached the house. And now I was at the end of the path, walking toward the front porch. A nerve deep in my throat started jangling like a burglar alarm. The 
house was in darkness. And Morrison was standing beneath a little porch light, his gun pointed right at me. You won't quit, will you, Stone? What have you done with him, Tom? He hasn't done anything with him yet, Mr. Stone. Huh? Who is... I'm sitting over here at the end of the porch. I'm George's sister. Oh. I didn't see you in the dark. Why didn't you get away like I told you? Well, you see... I won't hurt her. It's him. He'll be coming along soon. George would never have done what he did. I begged him not to. To take advantage of a man's weakness. Well, Mr. Brewster is coming home. What? His car is stopping at the bottom of the hill. Now he's starting the long climb. Morrison, listen to me. You just sit there, the both of you. And I must insist that you be very quiet. Please, listen to me. Please. Please. Keep coming up that path, Brewster. It's a long, long way. You must listen to me. Morrison. You don't know what you're Waiting doing. near the porch light, the gun George in his hand. George hurt you. He shouldn't have done that. Far below the small what figure of George Brewster so making a long, slow don't climb. Realize that you're going to kill George because he found out about your fear. But don't you see? George is afraid, too. Of bigger things. Of being 53 and seeing his whole life going down. Brewster had stopped at the first landing to That's catch his breath. That's why he hurt you. And now he was climbing up the path again. He was fighting. Maybe a hundred steps from his death. I found myself counting the steps. Why are you afraid of the Don't you see? If you weren't afraid, George couldn't hurt you anymore. Please, listen to me. Keep your voice down. If you try to warn him, you both die too. Keep coming, Brewster. Yes, he kept coming. No more than 70 steps now. What is there to fear about the dog? The girl's voice going on and on. Nothing. Brewster getting closer. All it does is hide the world. Less than 50 steps now. 40 steps. 30 steps. If you believe in God, if you believe in your own soul, how can you fear the night? What is there in the darkness that can hurt you? There's such peace in the darkness. After the heat of day is gone, you rush the tumult, the struggle. You can breathe easy again. You can let the tightness inside unwind. He's almost closer. Listen to me. Please listen. It's not going to work, Miss Brewster. I'm going to try and run. Wait. Miss Brewster. Stay where you are, Miss Brewster. No. You must see me in the light. I tell you, stay where... Tom. Look at her. I didn't realize. I'm not afraid. What right have you to fear? Julie, is that you on the porch? What right have you to fear, Mr. Morris? What right? You, a long climb. Must be getting old. Well, what are you doing here, Morrison? And who's this? I oh, don't uh, mind me. I just came along for the ride. What's this all about? I... I just came to... Say goodbye, Brewster. You're leaving? Yes. I'm going back and tell them you've... You've done a good job here. It's not fair to replace you after so many years. You sure nobody scared you away, Morrison? Look at him, Brewster. Does he look like he's afraid? Julie cured Morrison of his fear of darkness. Cure is a pretty strong word. But maybe she helped. I kind of think so. I do know this. It's going to be mighty hard for Tom to fear the darkness, knowing Julie is not afraid. But neither Tom nor I will ever forget what we saw as the porch light lit up her face. Julie Brewster, who did not fear the darkness, was blind. And now that part of the story they always print in heavy type, the moral. And don't smile so indulgently. Morals are very nice things. Some of my best friends have morals. <laughs> you know, seriously, Julie's whole life is a moral in itself. And trying to top it is like trying to follow Al Jolson with a mammy song. The best you can do is 
tip your hat to the fellow who wrote, Out of the night that covers me, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He must have had someone like Julie in mind. Well, four o'clock in the morning, a stale cup of coffee, a tired sandwich, and a story to dictate, and I worry about my unconquerable soul. Ah, me. Give me a rewrite. Nightbeat, a new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Nightbeat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Nightbeat. Stay tuned for Brian Donlevy and Dangerous Assignment on... In just a moment, Autolite presents Suspense with Jimmy Cagney. Hello, uh, tonight I understand we have an Autolite Suspense special. Every bit of special is your star performance as the Autolite Resistor Spark Plug Maestro. Is that a plug for me or for my favorites, Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs, Hap? Well, with no offense to either Harlow, it's neither. Tonight, Jimmy Cagney and Autolite and Suspense are dramatizing one of our great American tragedies. It's so tremendous a problem, it warrants our entire nation warring against its grimness and the grim reaper who is its symbol. Tonight's Suspense story will remind you to drive carefully behind Autolite resistor spark plugs or any other, Harlow. Then let's join the Autolite audience and listen. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starting tonight, Mr. James Cagney in Anton Leader's production of No Escape, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The only thing I can do now is tell you how it happened, without any bunk. I don't care what you've heard or read about me. I'm not a devil or a mad dog. I don't know what people think happens to a fella. Do they think all of a sudden I turned into stone? I'm no different than anybody else. If I don't eat, I get hungry. If I cut myself shaving, I bleed. I'm just like the next guy, and that's the whole idea. This, this, it happened to me, sure, but it, it would have happened to anybody. It could have happened to you. It was supposed to have been one of them days you circle on the calendar with a red pencil. You see, with a little town like ours, 23 miles from the big city, right on the main highway, we get the speed artists going both ways. Yeah, and every couple of days they manage to leave something behind to remember them by. Like a kid with a broken back or, well, well, you, you get the idea. So a couple of years ago, the Chamber of Commerce started a safety campaign to name the safest driver of the year. Something to kind of keep the guys in their toes. And this year, the fellow they chose for the award was yours truly. And tonight was the big doings with a few well-chosen words from me, a lad who was a public speaker, was a wonderful bus driver. I got to the house a little after six. Teddy, uh, my kid brother, was just leaving. Hi, you big shot. <laughs> Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, the world's champion driver. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, all right. Hey, that's a swell picture of you in the paper. You don't look so bad for an older man. Right, or I'll beat your ears in. <laughs> say, Eve called to say you should wear your blue suit and try to look human. That I would like to see. Me too. <laughs> Sorry, I can't wait, though. I'm late for a date. I'll see you in the morning, and you can tell me how you slayed. All right, Ted. So long. I gave myself the works. Shower, shave, the blue suit like the lady said. <laughs> Eve looked after me like I was at least five years old. I didn't mind a bit. Ever since Ma died in 42, I kept the house going for Teddy because a kid needs something like that. But he was getting out of school in June and then maybe Eve and I... Well, it was nice thinking about it. So nice that I guess I forgot all about the time that was passing. Yeah? 
Look, slow motion, you should be halfway over here by now. <laughs> okay, Eve, honey. Got the speech ready? Yes, but if you don't get moving, you'll be making that speech to a bunch of empty chairs and dirty plates. Yes, Mama. Be right over. <laughs> Eve lived outside of town. I'd really have to step on it to pick her up and spend some time rehearsing the speech. I then get to the high school auditorium by eight. I got into the car, and I decided to take the canyon road through the hills where there wasn't any traffic. I could make better time that way. Now, wait, wait, wait just a second. Let me get my thoughts together. I gotta get this part exactly right. You gotta see it just like it happened, or else it's all a waste of time. All right. It was on the canyon road that wound up through the steep hills. The wall of the mountain on one side of the road and the deep canyon on the other. About, about ten to seven. But already dark. Nobody on the road but me, so I stuck pretty close to the middle. And every time, at every turn, the scream of the tires. But I wasn't worried about that. Four brand new tires, hardly a week old. And good brakes. I never take chances with things like that. Going about, about fifty miles an hour. Maybe a little bit better. But I was all alone on the road, so what difference did it make? I was maybe two-thirds of the way up to the top right where the road makes a wide curve. I remember I, I put a cigarette in my mouth and I pushed the dashboard lighter in. I heard the lighter click and I started reaching for it. And then, a pair of headlights blazing out of nowhere. And then a, a screeching horn, a car coming the other way. I felt my inside double up like a fist. I slammed my foot on the brake, swung the steering wheel to the right. I didn't feel anything hit and I thought, oh God, it's gonna be okay. I jammed on the emergency. I jerked the door open. Now look back. The road was empty. I still heard the horn, though, but f- far away, and another sound, too, like a bunch of empty crates topping over and over. And at first, it didn't register with me. For maybe maybe half a second, I just stood there wondering what happened. Then I saw the reflection of the flame lighting up the whole canyon. I went to the side of the road and looked down. The car was about 500 feet below, burning. And the horn still blasting away, like the driver's body had fallen against it. I started down the canyon. It was almost, almost straight down. I fell and I rolled and I came to my feet again. Why didn't that horn stop? Why didn't it stop? And then, then it did stop. And I realized that I had stopped. I had stopped too. What was I waiting for? To get my wind, that's all. I, I went down another few feet. And then, and I stopped again. Holding myself against the tree. Come on. Come on, Harry. Get going. No. No. What good would it do to go down there? I couldn't help whoever was in that car. It was too late. Nobody could help. Then far down the road, I saw another pair of headlights starting the long climb. I went back to my car. I told myself I was going for help. I drove on to the top of the hill. There was a little gas station up. They'd have have a phone. I was almost there. An old fellow in white overalls was putting around the pumps. I started slowing down. My whole life was about to be smashed. I'd have to tell them the truth, and what good would it do? What about Eve? What about my kid brother, Teddy? What's more important than a man's own family? I'd reached the gravel driveway to the gas station. The old guy heard me coming and started straightening up. Now, now, I swung back onto the highway and pushed the accelerators to the floor. Eve's house a little before 7.30. It was funny. I thought I was okay until I reached for the door handle. And then my fingers seemed to go dead and my heart stopped, started going a mile a minute. Harry? Is that you? That's me. I'm sorry. So, sorry I'm late, Eve. Well, where in heaven's name have you been? Honestly, if you aren't the most aggravate... Harry Graham. What? Huh? Look at you. You look like you've been run through a threshing machine. Yeah, I know. Let's go in and out. I'll clean up a little. Well, what in the world happened? Uh, I had a flat tire. I had to change it on the road. Flat tire? Oh, fine. All right, wait right here. I'll get the whisk room. Of all things to happen tonight. All right, all right. Happen. Lay off, will you? Harry. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, don't just stand there. While I'm doing this, take your comb out and start combing your hair. Hmm. Took my comb out and turned toward the whole mirror. Funny. I didn't look any different than yesterday or the day before that. I was still Harry Graham. After, after he finished with me, we went back to the car. Get in. 
I tell you what, you're so upset anyhow. Why don't you let me drive into town? Okay, if you want to. See, now, I turn left at the next block, don't I, for the Canyon Road? Canyon Road? Yes, we can save some time going that way. No, no. Huh? No. No, I, I don't want to go to take ten, Canyon Road. I want you to go the regular way. But we're going to be late. Do what I tell you. I'll drive the car myself. But, Harry, we always... Do what I tell you, Eve. All right. I'm going to have to bite my head off. What have you got against Canyon Road? It's it's too dangerous at night. Well, all I've got to say is that when they picked you for the safest driver of the year, Harry Graham, they really hit the jackpot. <laughs> to the high school auditorium just a couple of minutes late. But as it turned out, we weren't the only ones late. We got to the main table. I saw that the chair next to mine was empty. Police Chief Blake, who was supposed to introduce me for my speech, hadn't showed up yet. And they... Then when the dinner was ended, Chief Blake came through the door. And he looked awful. He went over to the chairman of the meeting and whispered something, pointing at me. And then... Then he started for me, and I... I thought my heart would quit beating. I was looking for a way to escape, maybe when... Hello, Harry. Oh, uh, hello, Chief. Hello. Folks. Folks, please. I'm sorry I'm so late. I've just come from Canyon Road. Another terrible accident. The car went over the canyon. Four people killed and burned. We still haven't gotten them out of the wreckage. It looks like they were forced off the road... Another dirty hit-and-run case. Oh, that's terrible. My boys are up there now looking for traces of this other car. And I don't have to tell you that we're going to keep on looking till we find out who it was. That's why I had one of my boys bring me back to town here to this meeting tonight. Because now it's even more important to let a fellow like our friend Harry Graham here know we appreciate his good work and wish to the saints there were more like him. Yes, after what I just saw on Canyon Road, I'm really proud of Harry Graham. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. James Cagney in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This show hits with the zing of a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs. It gets me right between the optics. Arlo, I've been doing a little research. Yes? The frigid facts on faulty driving should dispel the optical illusions of any automobile driver foolish enough to relax his vigilance for one single moment. Every 30 seconds, a man, woman, or child is injured on our streets or highways. This year, 32,300 people are doomed to death. By Cornelius Happ, I never stopped to realize. You know, Harlow, it takes 10 seconds and 336 feet to stop a car traveling at 60 miles an hour. That's why brains are more important than brakes. Why the man behind the wheel should be aware of the speed at which he's driving. Why safe and sane are synonymous words to drivers who value their fellows' lives as well as their own. In other words, Hap, just because auto light resistor spark plugs give your car more pep, don't try to use all of it, eh? Exactly, Harlow. Uh, but there's more. The Good Samaritan is the gracious guy or gal who not only knows and keeps the rules of the road, but also keeps his temper in his head when some bungling Benny gives him the hog, the road hog treatment. Yes, Hap, it's sad but true that one right way to wrong driving is to always demand your highway rights. Be sure to be safe. Right, Harlow. And now let's get back to suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. James Cagney as Harry in No Escape. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I, I had to keep my eyes on the table. I couldn't even look at the chief as he stood there praising me. All I could see was that burning wreck at the foot of the cliff. And all I could hear was that awful horn blowing. I had to bite my lips to keep him screaming, I did it. Harry. Oh. Harry. What? Oh, what? Uh, Open your feet, son. We'd like to hear a few words from you. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, look, uh, look, Chief, folks, uh, I don't think anybody wants to listen to me tonight. Uh, please, let's forget it. No, Harry. Now more than ever, we should hear what a fellow like you has to say. Come on, Harry. Hey, just oh, but listen, listen. Uh, Go on, uh, Harry. Oh, well, all right. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm no, I'm no great shakes as a speech maker. Just a lucky thing my girl's a good English teacher. <laughs> I, uh... 
I don't believe we should honor a man for safe driving any more than we should honor him because he's never killed anyone with a gun. Now, uh, when, a, when a man gets behind the wheel of a car, he doesn't give up his responsibilities to his fellow men. No one can escape the, 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 uh, the responsibility of being his brother's keeper. And, and that goes for... That goes for... That's... Harry, what's Listen wrong? Listen to me. How can I stand up here and read a speech after what, after what Chief Blake just told us? No, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't do it. Uh, I guess Harry's right after all, folks. I guess maybe we just better call him eating off. I know I've got to get back to Canyon Road as soon as I can. Come on, Eve. Come on. Let's get out of here. All right, honey. Oh, Harry. Yeah, Chief. Uh, you can do me a big favor, huh? The fellow brought me down here. I had to beat it right back to the accident. Oh, so? Uh, I've got to get back there myself right away. Hmm. Can you give me a lift? Uh, well, I sure, I sure like to, Chief, but, well, I've got to I've got to get Eve home. Well, you could take me home by the way of Canyon Road. We've gone that way before, honey. But uh, I'd uh, be much obliged to you, Well, you see, Chief, it's... Harry! Okay, okay, let's go. Uh, it's too bad the meeting had to end like this. When I have a hunch, you feel like I do, Harry. Like you can't sit still till you find the rat who killed those people. Well, I promise you this, Harry. Whoever he is, we'll get him. Yeah, wasn't that one for the book? Less than two hours after my accident with the other car going over into the canyon, I was back on Canyon Road. Only this time with Eve sitting behind me and the chief of police in back. Uh, Harry, if you don't mind, could you step on it a little bit? I I promise you I won't give you a ticket. Okay, Chief. Honey, push the lighter in, will you? Lighter? For my cigarette. Oh, sure, sure. The speed better, Chief? Fine. Harry hates this road. I wanted him to take it earlier tonight. Well, it's all right if you got good tires. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Had four brand new ones put on just last week. Oh, here, here's your light, Eve. Eve. Huh? Oh. Thanks. Her voice didn't sound right. Her voice didn't sound right. And then I remembered. When I picked her up tonight, I told the reason I was so messed up was that I'd had to change a tire. She was thinking about that now. I knew she was, trying to figure out why I'd lied to her. Nobody said anything after that. When we reached the part of the road just before it made the big bend, I started slowing down. I uh, hope I got you here quick enough, Chief. Yeah, you did fine. Is this where it was? Yeah, just around this bend. Yeah, that's right. But how did... Huh? N- nothing. Again, again, I'd said the wrong thing. What was the matter with me? How was I supposed to know that that accident was around the bend? I was cutting my own throat, but now... Now I'd made the turn and there was the red flag burning on the road and a big crash truck at the edge of the canyon and police cars blocking the highway. Just pull over the side, Harry. Okay. Now oh, they're coming down there, Fraser. Oh, oh, hello, Chief. You ready to start bringing them up soon? That's, uh... That's a walkie-talkie he's working with? Yeah. Mm. Keeps contact with the men down the canyon. Say, Harry, why don't you come along with me and really see how's, how we work here? Oh, thanks, but I've, I've got to get Yvonne home. The school teacher's got, got to get up early. Isn't that right, baby? I don't mind waiting if you'd like to stay. Huh? Yeah, come along, Harry. Oh, but, uh... I don't mind waiting, Harry. Hmm. Now, now it was me against all of them. Oh, I was sick about that car down there in the canyon, those four bodies inside... But, well, nothing could change that now. And I was fighting for my own life. And they wouldn't break me down. I stood with my foot on the bumper and Chief Blake leaning against the fender of my car while his boys gave him their reports about the hit-and-run car. And it didn't bother me a bit. Oh. Two of them told about the plastic cars they made of a, 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 a tire mark they found on the road. Uh, <clears throat> does it help you any, Chief? Uh, not much, Harry. New tire. A lot of people have new tires. <laughs> You, for instance. <laughs> yeah. I kicked my new front tire for them, kicked it hard. They brought over an old fellow in white overalls. The guy in the service station where I'd almost turned in to report the accident. The chief asked him if he thought the car I'd seen was a hit and run. It must have been just about that time, you know. And the way this fellow skadoodled away for no reason at all. I don't know what kind of a car it was, though. A black sedan, I'd say. <laughs> like this one, maybe? Yeah, uh, uh... Well, might be, might be that. 
But it's too dark to be sure. Well, first thing tomorrow, I'm going to get myself a green convertible. <laughs> and everybody got a good laugh out of that. But I would have to be careful. Mustn't go too far. It was me against all of them. And I felt the kind of excitement that a guy might get from walking a tightrope. Thinking back now, sure seems screwy, but that, that's how I felt. And maybe that is the worst thing that happens to a guy in my spot. The way it turns you into a wild animal against the world. Hi, Charlie. Chief Blake. Hey, yeah, Charlie. It was the fellow with the walkie-talkie over near the crash truck. We're ready to start bringing up the bodies. Okay. Come on, Harry. Let's go over. Something flopped coldly in my stomach. And then lay still. This was the test. If they didn't break me down now, they could never do it, never in a million years. All the people who'd come up from the town started gathering around the crash truck. I wanted to run and never stop running. But I didn't move. And just then, the first body swung into view. And you could hear everyone in the crowd sucking his breath. And I bit down hard on my lip till I tasted blood. A brown blanket wrapped neatly around something. And then the bundle rested on the ground. And everyone seemed to edge away from it like it could hurt them. And the cable went down into the valley again. And then there was a second bundle. And then there was a third. And then a fourth. And over and over, like a drum beat, like a prayer, I told myself they wouldn't break me down. And then someone pushed forward from the crowd. Joe Mandel, the little tailor. He seemed shy and embarrassed, as though he had no business being here. Uh, uh, Chief, Chief Blake. Huh? Oh, oh yeah, Joe. Uh, my boy, Philip, he, he didn't come home for supper tonight, and I... You, you want to look? Uh... Well, you know how a woman is. Rose will feel better if I tell her, okay, I looked, and it wasn't... Well, you know. Oh, all right, Joe. Doesn't hurt none. Thank you. No. No. I... I... I'd better go back to my rose. Sorry, Joe. I... Uh, wait a minute. Yes? Do you know who Phil was going to be with tonight? His best friend was... Mike Roebuck. They were always together. The Goldust twins, everybody called them. Uh, thanks, Joe. Excuse me, Chief. I must go to Rose now. Fraser! Yes, Chief. Get back to town. Go over the Roebucks. Don't tell them anything is wrong. Just see if Mike's home. Okay. <laughs> started back for the car. My legs felt like they weighed a ton. I heard a sudden movement in the crowd behind me. Oh, no! Oh, my baby! My baby! They wouldn't break me down. They wouldn't break me down. I opened the car door. And Eve was there. I'd almost forgotten her. And I was sure she knew the truth. They brought up all four? Yeah. Harry. I, I, don't, I don't want to hear anything now. I'm taking you home. Wait, Harry. Listen, I'm telling you. Kiss me, Harry. What? Huh? Hold me and kiss me. I'm such a stupid fool. Hold me. Hold all right, me. all right. Now, now stop it, stop it. Harry, if you knew what's been going through my mind. Okay, okay. Now stop it. Just a fool, a stupid fool. And then when I saw you come back to the car, the look on your face. Oh, Harry, how could I have ever thought... No, all right, all right. Now, we, we'll talk about it later. I'll never talk about it again. Never, Harry. So, it was all over with. I was going to be okay. God, I wasn't proud. I felt rotten and sick. And now that it was all over, the strength ran out of me like water running out of a glass. But what good would it have been to crucify myself? It wouldn't have changed anything. I wasn't a bad guy. It could have happened to anybody. 
And now, now I was going to be able to take care of my own. Eve and my kid brother, Teddy. Was that a bad guy? A fellow who wanted to do right for his family? I started the car. I put in gear and then looking at me through the window was, was Chief Blake. Signaling me to wait. I turned the key off. Well, whatever it was, I was very tired. Come on out, Harry. But, uh, I've got to get Eve home. Come on out of the car. But, uh, Harry, do like I tell you. Come with me. What do you want? Come with me. When you drove up here tonight, I... I didn't think it would end like this. You know about it? You, of all people, Harry. Listen, you've got to believe me. It shouldn't have happened to a fellow like you. You've got to hear my side. Right here, Harry. Huh? Huh? What are you... Take a look at... this fourth body. Why should I? Pull the blanket back, Harry. Oh. No. No. Teddy. Teddy! I don't care what you heard or read in the papers. That's the story, just like it happened. No bunk. And thinking back, I... I guess I kind of hit the nail on the head in that speech that I made that night. You know, that part about... No man can ever escape the responsibility of being... his brother's keeper. Thank you, James Cagney, for a magnificent performance. Mr. Cagney will return in just a moment. Well, Hap, after that performance of Jimmy Cagney's and your heartfelt expressions on the rights and wrongs of the driving man, it's hard to switch the conversation to auto light resistor spark plugs. <laughs> well, Harlow, I'm sure you'll find a way. Yes, I think I'll just say, friend, switch to a set of auto light resistor spark plugs just as quickly as you can swing into a service station. When you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs, your car will idle smoother, give you better luck with lean gas mixtures, actually save you gas dollars. What's more, auto light resistor spark plugs cut down spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Switch to auto light resistor spark plugs today. And remember, auto light means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Mr. James Cagney. It's always a pleasure to appear on Suspense, but I was especially pleased when Tony Leader asked me to do tonight's story. That's because I feel strongly about the kind of thing that happened to Harry Graham. I believe that any person who gets behind the wheel of a car assumes a great responsibility to himself, to his family, to his fellow men. That one moment of carelessness or recklessness or drunkenness can mean a lifetime of pain and misery for someone. And it might be you or me. Yes, when you're driving an automobile, we are our brother's keeper. Over the holiday season and all the time, drive carefully. Next week on radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Herbert Marshall will appear in a story with a Christmas atmosphere. Another study in... Suspense. 
James Cagney is now appearing in the photoplay of William Saroyan's prize stage hit, The Time of Your Life. Copies of tonight's suspense play, No Escape, by Larry Marcus, will be available for educational use by groups interested in highway safety. They may be obtained by writing Suspense, the Columbia Broadcasting System, Hollywood, California. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Ronald Coleman, Robert Montgomery, Dana Andrews, and Frank Sinatra. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Herbert Marshall. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. All right, Mr. Wilcox. Autolite and CBS wish to thank the radio editors and columnists of America for electing suspense as the best mystery show in the annual balloting conducted by Motion Picture Daily for the magazine Fame. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of the Shadow are on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the Shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, one of the shadow's most thrilling adventures, Murder from the Grave. That's him there, walking towards the corner. Yeah. Pulling closer to the curb. Okay, okay. Wait, we're right beside him, see? Yeah, I know. All right. Let him have it. Right over here, Doc. All right. Well, here he is, what there is left of him. Yeah. They did a pretty complete job, officer. Yeah, he must have stopped every slug they threw at him. He's still breathing, though, and I don't know why. Well, we better get him to the hospital at once. Here, give me a hand with him, will you? Okay, but it looks to me like a waste of time. Well, what's the story, Doc? DOA, officer. Dead on arrival. Yeah, I figured that. Well, better make out of the part. You want to send him to the city morgue or hold him here at the hospital? I'll check headquarters and find out. Yes. Gangster, isn't he? Might say so. Do you recognize him at all? Now, how can I answer that? The guy ain't got hardly no face left, has he? Hey, good evening, Dr. Henry. Oh, hello, Dr. Metzger. What brings you down here to the receiving room? Uh, just keeping in touch with the activities of the hospital. Well, what have you there? A uh, gang shooting, Doctor. He seems to be well perforated. Yes. Especially the face. It's been just about shot away. Yes. So I see. He died on the way to the, the hospital. So, uh, mind if I have a look at him? No, Doctor. No, go ahead. I'm going to use your phone, Doc. I'll be right back. All right, officer. Dr. Henry. Yes? Did I understand you to say that you have pronounced this man dead? Why, why yes, Doctor. I'm afraid you were mistaken. What? This man is still alive. Well, Dr. Metzger, I couldn't feel any pulse. Yeah, no heart you, he is alive. Ring for the other bit at once. But, Doctor, as I, I say, you... this man has to be brought to my laboratory. Hurry, Doctor, there's no time to lose. Dr. Henry speaking. Hello, this is Dr. Metzger. Oh, yes, Doctor. That patient, the man who was brought to my laboratory, is alive and can be saved. Why, why that's unbelievable, Doctor. Nevertheless, it is true. But what about his face? His face has been shot away. I intend to give him a new face. Now, listen to me, Dr. Henry. 
I want a general order given to all in the hospital that I am not to be disturbed for the next six weeks. Uh, yes, sir. All of my meals and any surgical instruments or supplies that I might need are to be left outside of my door for that period. Do you understand? Uh, yes, Dr. Metzger. I... If these orders are carried out, I can tell you now, Henry, that in six weeks' time, I will bring forth a man who is whole again. <laughs> Doggone it, Jack. I just can't help it. Old man, curiosity is getting the better of me. And you've got to find out what goes on in Metzger's laboratory. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> He's been in there almost six weeks now, Jack. Imagine almost six weeks without telling anyone how his experiment is progressing. Say, does anyone even know if the patient is still alive? Yes, we do know that much. Metzger sent word to that effect to Doc Hawkins yesterday. <laughs> Look, Sherlock, how do you plan to get into the laboratory? Well, when Metzger opens the door for this tray of food, uh -huh. I'll just walk in with him, that's all. Good luck. Yes, I'll need it. Uh, knock on the door for me, will you? Sure. Hmm? Who is there? Your food tray, Dr. Metzger. Oh, thank you. Uh, where do you want me to uh, put... Uh, one moment. Uh, you believe the tray with me, Dr. Henry? Well, I was just going you to put... You were just going to try to gain entrance to my laboratory. <laughs> I'm aware of your intense curiosity, Henry. A curiosity that is shared by everyone else in this hospital. Ah, well, you can tell them all for me that my experiment is nearing completion. Very well, Doctor. If they wish, if they wish, they may come here to my laboratory tomorrow at noon. And I shall reveal to them my finished product. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, uh, Dr. Metzger asked us all to be here at noon today. It's now quarter after. I, for one, see no reason for waiting around any longer. You're right, Henry. Well, what do we do? Well, we'll let him know we're here. Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. Why doesn't he answer? Well, there's only one way to find that out. That's by trying to get in. The door isn't locked. I'll go look for him. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. He must be in there. He's not out here. Good Lord. Come here, all of you. Oh, what is it? Look. Look, there on the floor. Oh, hold. It's Metzger. He's dead. Yes. And it looks like murder. His face has been slashed. Look, here on the floor. A broken mirror. Where's the patient? The man he was working on. There was no one else in this room when I came in. Well, then he's gone. Yes. But not before he murdered Dr. Metzger. Uh... And since that time, Lamont, the police have learned nothing. Well, that's understandable, Dr. Hawkins. They really have nothing to work on. You have no idea what this Mr. X looks like, have you, Dr. Hawkins? No, we haven't, Margot. Dr. Metzger did a plastic job on his face, changed it completely. That's all we know. Well, well it's been 24 hours since the killing. The man has had ample time to get away and cover up his tracks. Yes. I don't see how Lamont can do any more than the police have done, Doctor. Uh, I didn't ask Lamont to come here for that purpose, Margot. Oh, no? No, I... Well... I discovered something in Dr. Metzger's laboratory that I hadn't even told the police about. Well, why not? Because it's something too fantastic for them to believe. Well, what is it, Doctor? Metzger's personal notebook, in which he recorded the progress of his experiment. I have it right here. Well, what does this notebook contain? Well, the first entry was written the night the patient arrived in the hospital. Dr. Metzger wrote in the notebook at that time... Tonight, I have at last been given the opportunity that I have been so patiently waiting for. The perfect subject for my experiment is at this very moment lying on a table before me. I have given him the first injection of the solution. The reaction was most successful. Now, the real work begins. What does all that mean, Dr. Hawkins? You'll learn later, Lamont. Just as I learned as I read further into the notes. The next entry of any importance came a week later. At that time, the doctor wrote... Everything is progressing satisfactorily. Today, the patient has sufficient strength for me to begin the plastic work. I have found that best results can be obtained by giving injections of the solution every 24 hours. This is most important. Any period of time beyond this is dangerous. Well, what is the solution that he keeps talking about? I'm coming to that, Margot. I'll skip over the entries that follow. They deal mainly with a growing conflict between the patient and Metzger. A note of regret creeps into his writing. You sense that he's almost sorry for the work that he's done. Eventually, this conflict claims to open hatred. And in the last entry, written the night before he died, Dr. Metzger wrote... Hey, Harold, have mercy on me. 
for ever conceiving this work that I have done. The patient has now reverted to the vicious being that he has always been. Instead of having gratitude for what I have done, he shows only resentment. Tomorrow morning, I shall remove the bandages that cover his face. He has threatened me that if he is not pleased with my work, dire consequences will result. This, then, is the fruit of my labor. This is the price I pay for my great discovery. My discovery of a solution that literally brought a dead man back to life again. A solution with which... So that's it. That was the secret solution. Yes. But that's unbelievable, Dr. Hawkins. A solution that brings the dead back to life? Metzger was a great scientist. Nothing was impossible to him. Well, where is the solution now? I couldn't find it. I've searched everywhere in the laboratory. Then it's evident that the patient knowing about it took it with him. I'm afraid so. Well, I'd say you had good cause for alarm, Doctor. This killer who is now at large is a man returned from the dead. A man without a soul. Yes, that's true. But uh, tell me, Lamont, have you gotten any clues from what you've just learned? Only one. The broken mirror that was found near the doctor's body. Obviously, this mirror must have been shattered by the missing man. Well, why do you say that? He must have broken it in rage when he first saw his new face. Metzger must have made him sufficiently horrible to bring on this range. So we have only one clue to work on. A man with an incredibly ugly face. Dr. Hawkins! Dr. Hawkins! What is it? What is it? Come in. Dr. Hawkins, something terrible has happened. Yeah, what's wrong? In the morgue. The hospital morgue, just a few minutes ago. Yes, what's what happened? A man with a gun came in. Forced me to take one of the bodies. A dead body out to a car. What? I... I had to obey. Why didn't you call out for help? I... I was about to until I saw his face. His face, Dr. Hawkins. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. It wasn't human. Doctor, I'd say our killer has made his first move. And I fear that it won't be his last. <laughs> While we're waiting for the curtain to rise in Act Two of Murder from the Grave, I want to ask you something. When the summer months come, what are you going to do for a supply of hot water? Would you be able to have all the hot water you want, when you want it, and will it be available at a cost within your budget? This is an important problem in many homes. That's why today, the Blue Coal Dealers of America are offering the latest in low-cost hot water heating equipment. They've given you the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator... They've given you the John Barclay Home Heating Service. And now, in 1941, the same blue coal dealers bring you the equipment that provides all the low-cost hot water you want. Yes, the new blue coal deluxe water heater that works automatically gives you more clean hot water than you can use. Think of it. Now, at last, you can have an abundant supply of clean hot water heated at just the right temperature and whenever you want it, all summer long. Phone your neighborhood dealer tomorrow and ask him about this new blue coal deluxe water heater. Remember, it will pay for itself in savings over the usual cost of summer hot water. And remember, too, when it comes to keeping your home warm and comfortable, there's no other fuel like blue coal. Give your dealer a call in the morning. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. <laughs> Put the slip in the car. <laughs> yes, sir. We're getting to be regular customers, ain't we? Hey, why do you do this? Why do you want these bodies? You'll find out. Everybody will find out very soon. This ain't our last visit to you, Mr. Markeeper. Uh, you'll be seeing us again. No, no, you'll get me into trouble. Shut up. You? All right, Eddie, step on the gas. Let's get out of here. Extra, extra, another gangster's body kidnapped from the morgue. Uh, that particular pendant will cost you $2,000. Oh, I there see. There we are. Well, there. This is a stick-up. Oh, uh, what do you want with that? Oh. You can't get away with this. No. Oh. Just watch us. Grab them rings, Eddie. Hi. Bill, take that for your bracelets. Okay. Ah, that's all we need here. Wait a minute, boys. Before we blow, we ought to let the folks have a look at us for purposes of identification. Take off your mask, boys. Oh, no. 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 They're not you. Oh, how horrible. We ain't very pretty, are we? Well, nobody is. Once they've been dead. 
Look. Only three guards for a payroll over a hundred grand. Cut them off, Eddie. Squeeze them into the curb. Right. Good work. Come on, boys. What do you guys think you're trying to do? You'll find out soon enough, Buster. You men stand where you are. We've got a dummy gun here. Go ahead and use it, brother. Go ahead. All right. You ask for it. Look, look, the bullets don't have any effect on them. They're still coming toward me, I'll be Don't you know better than to shoot at a mob that's already been dead? <laughs> Let them have it, boys. Margo, the entire city has been terrorized by this mob of, well, ghouls. That's all you can call them. Lamont, do you honestly believe that this gang consists of the... Dead men who were kidnapped from the different morgues? Yes, Margo. There's no doubt of it. They've been sustained by Dr. Metzger's life-giving solution. Oh, how horrible. And so far, no one has been able to learn just where this gang is hiding out. Well, what can be done, Lamont? Well, one of the mob was captured by the police this afternoon. They've got him in the city jail. Did he reveal anything? No, he refused to talk. That is, to the police. But I have an idea that I might be able to get something from him. I think I know what you mean, Lamont. I think you do. I'm paying a little visit to his cell. There's the shadow. Why don't they come for me? They know the cops have got me. Why don't they come? <laughs> what was that? So, your friends have deserted you, eh? Who's talking to me? I must be getting stir crazy. I don't see nobody. You're not stir crazy. I've merely made myself invisible to you. You made yourself in... Oh, I get it. The shadow's paying me a bit. That's quite correct. What are you doing here? I've come to talk to you, to learn something about you and your companions. Save your talk. I ain't saying nothing. I know the horrible secret that you and your gang possess. The power that you have to bring life to the bodies of those already dead. How'd you learn... <laughs> Where'd you ever dream up an idea like that? I followed the activities of your leader from the day he killed Dr. Metzger and stole the life-giving solution. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You're being foolish enough to remain loyal to your mob after they've deserted you. That ain't true. Then why haven't they tried to get you out of this jail? Certainly they must know that you'll soon need another injection of the serum. What? What are you talking about? I learned from Dr. Metzger's own journal that the life-giving solution must be injected every 24 hours. To go beyond this period without it means a return to the dead. No. No, you're just trying to scare me. How long has it been since you received your last treatment? Yesterday. Just about this time. Then its effect should be wearing off right now. We must act quickly. Tell me where the hideout is. And after dealing with your friends, I promise to bring back enough of the serum to keep you alive. Uh, are you sure you ain't handing me no line? I swear it. Now, tell me the secret hiding place and just how many men there are. Okay. Okay. About the men. The boss has only two henchmen left now. Phil and Marty. It's been getting harder to make snatches from the morgue. And besides, the boss don't want to waste the serum on us dead ones anyway. Only two days ago, he let one of the boys go back to the grave <laughs> without a shot from the hypo. And believe me, Shadow, his face wasn't pretty to see. Quickly now. Where's the hideout? The hideout? Well, it's... Hey, what's happening to me? I got a funny feeling in my head. Quickly, man, quickly. My buzzing. Tell me where the hideout is. It's... It's... How much better for them to have left you untouched after death had claimed you the first time? Margo, we're certain of one thing. What's that, Lamont? That our Mr. X, having built up his mob from the remains of notorious gangsters, is now finding it difficult to get bodies of gangsters who, before they died, knew their trade. Correct. Also, he's obviously running low on Dr. Metzger's solution. He's letting his lesser helpers die without giving them injections. Correct again. Well, then, here's my plan. I'm going to ask Commissioner Weston to plant a story in all the newspapers that our notorious out-of-town gang leader, Dutch Carson has just been killed by the police. Who's Dutch Carson, Lamont? 
a Middle Western mobster who dropped out of sight about a year ago. Well, why are you doing all this? To attract the attention of Mr. X. Then I shall arrange with the commissioner to be taken to the city morgue and be placed on a slab as the body of the dead Dutch Carson. And unless I'm badly mistaken, Margot, within 24 hours, the three missing ghouls will be back in their graves, and this time, for good. You ready to stretch out on the slab, Mr. Cranston? All right, Tom. <laughs> you know, you're the first live stiff I ever had in here. <laughs> well, I hope I remain that way. Yeah. And will you cover me over with the sheet, please? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Hey, what's going to happen when these fellas find out you ain't a dead one, much less the missing Dutch Carson? <laughs> well, not Tom. Um, well, it's something I'd rather worry about when it happens, if you don't mind. Well, I'm here to tell you I wouldn't touch your That's job. Quiet. Huh? I hear footsteps outside the door. Yeah, yeah, somebody's there. Yeah. Who are you? Take a look at me, Pop. That ought to answer your question. You, uh, you come again. Uh, yeah, I told you I'd be paying you another visit. Well, uh, what do you want? I want the body of Dutch Carson. I got a little job he's going to do for me. Phil. Huh? Makes up a shot of the solution. Hey, it ain't time yet, boss. We don't need none for another hour. It ain't for us, stupid. That's for a new guy I just snatched out of the morgue. I got him in the next room. Yeah, but we're running low on his stuff. Mix it up, I said. We can use this guy. He's valuable. Huh? Who is he? Dutch Carson. Dutch? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know him, but I heard of him. He's, uh... Well, I don't know him either. But he was supposed to be one of the smarter boys in the Middle West until he disappeared about a year ago. What happened to him? I don't know, but what's important now is that we've got his body in the next room. Hey, what's that? What's going on out there? Come on, get inside, you. Hey, why'd you bring that dame in here, Marty? Well, I caught her snooping around outside trying to look in a window. <laughs> Maybe she was trying to cop a quick look at a couple of dead men, eh, boss? Interesting. What's the idea, girly? Well, it was just... Oh, your face. Find something wrong with it? You're the one. You're the one that killed Dr. Metzger. Oh, so interesting. Where'd you get your information? Let me out of here. Not a chance. Now sit down like a lady like this. You can't push me around like that. Oh, well, I'm giving you a pretty good imitation, ain't I? Now, what were you doing outside? Who sent you here? Oh, you're so clever. Why don't you find out? Who sent you here? Answer me. No! Oh, oh, stop it. You're hurting my arm. Lamont! Yeah, Lamont! Now, that won't do you no good, sister. Lamont! Where is he? What have you done with him? I ask you a question. Wait a minute. Done with who? Who are you talking about? You brought him here. What have you done with him? Hey, she must mean the stiff inside. Now, what is this? Who'd you bring here, boss? The body of Dutch Carson. Why? Dutch Carson? Yeah, I snatched him from the morgue. You heard of him, Marty? Heard of him? Are you kidding? A year ago, I buried Dutch Carson a load of concrete at the bottom of a river. I see. Hey, then who did you bring here, boss? I don't know. Hold on to this dame. Yeah. I'm soon going to find out. He's gone. The body's gone. It's a trap. The cops are behind us. Yeah, one thing is sure. The guy is still in the house. Marty, go out and look around the grounds. Okay, boss. And now, if you don't mind... But I do mind. Just staying right here. No, keep away from me. Give me that knife, Phil. No, no! Sadly, boss, here you are. What are you going to do? I'm going to carve that pretty face of yours to rip it. No, don't! No, don't! Keep him away! Get ready, sister. (laughs) Who laughed? Not quite so fast, Mr. X. Hey, hey, what's happened? You're not touching that girl. Hey, who done that? Who knocked that knife out of my hand? I did, Mr. X. Who's speaking? Where's that voice coming from? It's coming from the shadow. The shadow, eh? Well, now, Shadow, this is one time you've stubbed your toe. Because even you can't do anything to dead men. You're wrong, Mr. X, because I know that you need an injection of Dr. Metzger's solution every 24 hours in order to continue living. Yeah, and we aim to continue getting it. I wouldn't be too sure of that. What do you mean by that, boss? I mean that I now possess the solution. You see? Look. Look, the bottle hanging there in midair. He's got the solution. Give me that bottle, Shadow. Oh, no. This is my hold on you, gentlemen. And I shall keep it until your allotted time expires. I shall watch you return to the dead again. Get away from him, boss, quick. I'll get it all right. We may not be able to see your shadow, but we can see the bottle. Boss, put that gun away. That ain't the way to do it. Oh, Oh. (laughs) now you've done it. You hit the wrong target, Mr. X. Oh, you broke it, boss. You broke the bottle. It spilled all over the floor. I didn't mean to hit the bottle. I wanted to plug him. The cops, the cops, the cops. You'd better give up, Mr. X. No, no, we ain't giving up. We still got another hour to live, Shadow. And a lot can be done in that time. We're going to rip this town wide open just for luck. Wait. 
You're staying here. Yeah, try and stop us. Marco, they've got an hour to spread the greatest terror this city has ever seen. I've got to stop them. <laughs> We ain't got much time, boss. Look in the back, Marty's gone already. Yeah, I know, Phil. Gee. Will we look as bad as that when we return to the dead? We we'll never know. Besides, right now, we got a little fun ahead of us. Now, when we get to town, shoot and keep shooting at anybody who gets in our way. They're going to remember us when we get done, Phil. Okay, boss. Hey, hey, watch your driving. This is a narrow bridge. You know, it's something's pulling the wheel. I, what? I can't straighten it out. I... <laughs> You'll never straighten it out, Mr. Egg. Shut up. How did he get here? I've been with you since you left your hideout, gentlemen. Hey, let go of the wheel. Shut up. So that you can carry on your campaign of ruthless killing? Oh, no. Hey, he's trying to steer us into the river. Where is he? Hey, he must be on the running board. Hey, let go of the shadow. Don't be a fool, Shadow. If we drown, you'll drown, too. That's not as important as the lives of the innocent people you're planning to kill. Hey, Phil. Phil, I can't hold the wheel much longer. Stop the car. Stop the car. Too late. It's too late. Lamont, you might have been drowned, along with your ghostly friends. I certainly might have been, Margot. But fortunately, I threw myself clean into the car before it went over the bridge. You know, Lamont, I've become very attached to you. Oh, don't think for a minute that all our mad exploits together haven't been fun. But I wish that for a while, at least, we could have a calm, peaceful existence. And we shall have, Margot. We shall have. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, nonetheless, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I hang on to my hat when we start out again next week. (laughs) Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And now, fresh from the records of the New York General Sessions Court, we bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. New York City, December 13th, 1940. Stephen Fleming passes bad check in business deal. Crime, grand larceny in the second degree. New York City, April 1st, 1941. Stephen Fleming sentenced to serve 15 years to life in state's prison. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> the Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. Great Gildersleeve is brought to you partially transcribed by the Kraft Foods Company. Kraft, you know, makes Philadelphia brand cream cheese. The cream cheese that's been famous for quality since 1880. Delicious, creamy white Philadelphia brand is so popular, it outsells all other brands of cream cheese combined. Enjoy it often. Just be sure you get genuine Philadelphia brand when you buy. Look for the red Kraft K on the silvery package. Remember, there's only one Philadelphia brand cream cheese, and it's made by Kraft and guaranteed fresh. Well, it's the evening before Thanksgiving, and Summerfield, like many other places, is blanketed with snow. The great Gildersleeve walked home through it as part of his training for his bout with old Tom Turkey tomorrow. And we might add that the water commissioner is in the pink of condition. Hello, everybody. I'm home. Oh, hello, Auntie. Well, Marjorie. See, that's a tantalizing aroma coming from the kitchen. Uh Uh-huh. Bertie's cooking the turkey for tomorrow. Good. I think I'll go back and take a look at it. Now, Auntie, don't start sampling it tonight. No, I won't. That turkey isn't going to get the best of me this time. In fact, I plan to eat light. Light meat. <laughs> Hello, Bertie. Evening, Mr. Gillespie. Hi, Unc. Leroy, what are you doing over there by the oven? Me? 
Leroy's watching the turkey, and I'm watching Leroy. <laughs> it's a good idea. Anki's here now, Bertie. You better double the watch. Yes, ma'am. Everybody stand back now. Bertie's going to baste it. Uncle, we got a 24-pound turkey. Say, isn't he a whopper? 24 pounds and five of us to eat it. Oh, boy, that's nearly five pounds apiece. Um, Bronco and I may not be here for dinner, Anki. He's trying to get tickets for the football game tomorrow in Center City. Oh, that's too bad. We'll miss you, my dear. Well, you know how Bronco is about a football game. Yeah. It was such a big dinner. And we ought to invite somebody to share it with us. Leroy, there's a pretty little girl staying at Mr. Bullard's. You mean invite Babs? Yeah, why not? Yes, why not? The pretty little girl has a pretty mother, Auntie. Yeah, well, naturally, if we invite Babs, we should invite her mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come along, Leroy. Let's slip on our overshoes. <laughs> having snow on Thanksgiving, Uncle. Yeah, makes things pretty cozy. Right, George, I'm glad I thought about asking Paula and Babs over. What if Mr. Bullard won't let them come? Yeah, well, Leroy, Mr. Bullard doesn't boss everything. It's none of his business if his sister wants to spend Thanksgiving with friends. Since when has Mr. Bullard considered you a friend? My boy, it's Thanksgiving. It's the time when we should all be friends. Okay. While you ring your friend's doorbell, I'll cover you with a snowball from behind this tree. <laughs> Careful, Leroy. You sure make a good target against that poor twite, huh? No, Leroy. Turn sideways and I'll knock the ashes off your cigar. Leroy, watch it. Oop, here it comes. Yoker. <laughs> Bullard's window. Run, Bullard! Leroy, you shouldn't run. What's going on out there? Guess I'd better run. What do you can... Oh, it's you, Gildersleeve. A big fat kid. <laughs> well, oh, Mr. Bullard. Gildersleeve, did you break my window? No, but I'll gladly pay for it. Leroy was aiming at me and missed, but I'll pay for it. If he'll aim again at you and hit, I'll pay for it. <laughs> now, Mr. Bullard, I'm sorry it happened. It was an accident. Fortunately, it's just a pane out of the storm window. Gildersleeve, why did you come over in the first place? Well, I came over to see if I couldn't take your sister and little Babs off your hands for Thanksgiving. They're spending the holiday out of town. They are? Yeah, I didn't know Paula was planning a trip. Should you have been consulted? Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> but she might have said goodbye. Well, now that you mention it, she did leave a message for you. You? What was it? She said goodbye. <laughs> so, goodbye. You wait a minute. Mr. Bullard. If you don't mind, I'll talk to you through the peephole. It's cold out there. <laughs> well, I brought the broken window. You shouldn't pay for the pain. Gildersleeve, I've been paying for a pain ever since you moved across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Even on Thanksgiving, he's a hard man to like. pay for breaking his window? No, Leroy. You could take it out of my allowance. Say, a nickel a week? Every other week? <laughs> no, I'll take care of it, my boy. Thanks, I'll get swell. I'm going up now and take my bath without even being sent. Good boy. Yeah, I shouldn't have gone over to Bullard's anyway. You'll never set foot on his porch again. Yeah. I guess I will have to go over and pay him. Someday. Yeah, I'll put the money on a stick and poke it through the people so he can't bite my hand. Mr. <laughs> please. Yes, Bertie? Will Mr. Bullard's sister and little Babs be here for dinner tomorrow? No, they're out of town, Bertie. Unless Mr. Bullard has them locked up in the attic. Yes, sir. You're fooling, ain't you? Yes, I guess so. Bertie already put their names in the pot. Too bad they can't be here. If Miss, Miss Marjorie and Mr. Bronco go to that football game, we're going to have more dinner than we know what to do with. Well, Leroy and I will do our best by it. Oh, I'm counting on you and Leroy to eat double. But we're loaded. Of course, a lot of people ain't going to have a big Thanksgiving. Well, it's true, Bertie. A lot of people's just going to squeak by. You we're pretty lucky, Bertie. Yes, sir. I've been thinking about that while I was basting that big turkey, Mr. Kelsey. Yes, Bertie? You remember the little boy that wandered in here from the children's home last Halloween? You? 
Mike Smith. That's right. The little lost ghost. Cute kid. Say, I wonder what kind of Thanksgiving dinner he's going to have. Oh, you have a good dinner, but he may not have as much as we've got. Bertie, after church in the morning, why don't I drive over and pick up little Mike? Yes, sir. Now we're lining up a real Thanksgiving. Yeah, come to think of it, Thanksgiving is no good if you don't share it. That's what the Indians did. <laughs> On the first Thanksgiving, they had a lot of food and they shared it with the pilgrims. Well, the Indians have nothing on the water, Commissioner. The little pilgrim will be the guest of Big Chief Running Water. Yes, sir. <laughs> I did it. Good evening, sir. Evening, Bertie. Well, Judge, come in. Hello, Gildy. I didn't want to be late for Thanksgiving dinner, so I thought I'd come and spend the night. <laughs> Well, we'd love to have you, Horace. Well, you told me you had an engagement. As a matter of fact, I have. So I dropped by to bring a little sweet meat for your festive board tomorrow. Who? Here you are, Bertie. Thank you, Judge. What's in this jar? It's cranberry relish that I prepare myself. <laughs> you make cranberry relish, Judge? Yes, indeed. I didn't know you so handy around the kitchen. Well, Bertie, I spend most of my idle hours on culinary experiments. I'm writing a cookbook. Yofer. I think it's nice the judge is so handy in the kitchen. Thank you, Bertie. Yes, sir. The judge is a handy man. He spends his working hours with the law book and his idolized with the cookbook. That's about it, Bertie. Yes, sir. Miss Gilsleeve, that's why the judge can come up with cranberry relish. He spends his working hours with the law book and his idolized with the cookbook. Yeah, I know, Bertie. Miss Gilsleeve, you know why the judge can come up with cranberry relish? Yes, Bertie. That's right. He spends his working hours with the law book and his idolized with the cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, you have quite an admirer in Bertie. Well, the feeling is mutual, Gildy. I'm sorry I won't be here to sample Bertie's Thanksgiving dinner. Well, Marjorie and Bronco may not be here either. But I'm inviting little Mike from the children's home. Ah, oh, the little fellow who was lost on Halloween. Yeah, Mike's going to be our guest of honor. <laughs> Gildy, you're a shining example of the spirit of Thanksgiving. Well, that's not all I planned to do. I went over to invite Mrs. Winthrop and Babs, but... The old Bullard said they were out of town. Oh, so Rumson is spending Thanksgiving alone? I didn't ask him, Judge. I don't care where he spends it. Well, I know Rumson Bullard is difficult at times, but he's a lonely man. Yeah, I think he wants to be alone. <laughs> I'm not so sure, Gildy. Perhaps we just don't understand him. Yeah, I know I don't. Be that as it may, at a time when the peoples of the world are divided, suspicious, and working at cross-purposes... It seems the least we can do is set an example of amity and accord here at home. You have. Chances are the world could achieve more harmony around the Thanksgiving table than around the conference table. You're probably right, Judge. I hadn't looked at it that way. You're right, George. I'll invite Bullard tomorrow. <laughs> Well, it's nice of you to join us for dinner today, Mike. It's nice of you to invite me, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> you will have a lot of fun. Yeah, I didn't think to ask Mrs. Foster when I should bring you home. Just take me back and I'm good and full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's plenty to eat, all right. Bertie has a turkey almost as big as you are. I don't know if I can eat that much. <laughs> well, I'll help you. You ought to be a big help. I wonder how he meant that A lot of us kids are going out for dinner today You're good Boy, I like Thanksgiving How many times a year does it come? Well, only once, Mike But Christmas will be here soon Yeah, that's when Santa Claus comes Yeah, I'll bet you get a lot of presents Yeah, Bobby's even getting a mother and father for Christmas You? Who's Bobby? He's my friend Yeah, I see Well... Here we are. Remember this house? This is where you found me when I got lost. <laughs> That's right. I sure was dopey to get lost. Well, if you had to get lost, we're glad you picked our house. Thank you. Oh, before we go in, Mike, let's go across the street and ask someone else to dinner. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to invite the man who lives in this big house. He's all alone today. But that big house, why is he all alone? Well, Mike, you know how it is. Do I? Well... 
This man's a little difficult to understand. Seems he hasn't many friends. Why? Well, sometimes he isn't as nice to people as he could be. But we're going to be nice to him. You see, I feel sorry for Mr. Bullard. Is that his name? Yes, yeah, that's his name. Oh, it's you, Gildersleeve. Good morning, Mr. Bullard. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bullard, I'd like you to be a little friend of mine, Mike Smith. Well, how do you do, young man? Hello, Mr. Bullard. Uh, little Mike's from the children's home. He's having dinner with us. Yeah, turkey. Oh, splendid. I hope you enjoy your dinner, Mike. Uh, Mr. Bullard? Yes? I'd like you to join us, if you will. Me? Well, that's very thoughtful of you. Well, Mr. Bullard, it's Thanksgiving, and you're all alone. Yeah, and Mr. Gildersleeve says you don't have very, very many friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh? If, well, if, what I meant was... For your information, Gildersleeve, I have countless friends. I'm having dinner today at my club. Yeah, Mr. Bullard, let's not have another misunderstanding. I really wish you'd come with us. Yeah, Mr. Gildersleeve feels sorry for you. <laughs> Oh, is that so? Gildersleeve, I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me. You enjoy your dinner, I'll enjoy mine. Good day. <laughs> Mike, what are you going to do with a fellow like that? Mrs. Foster would send him to bed without any dinner. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. Want to make luscious, rich frostings and smooth, perfect fudge every time? Fudge and frostings that are bound to be perfect, that need no cooking? You can do it a brand new way, a way you've probably never thought of. You do it with Philadelphia brand cream cheese. That's right. Philadelphia brand cream cheese is the magic ingredient that makes fudge and frosting more delicious more consistently perfect than ever before. Have a pencil and paper handy, and in just a minute I'll tell you where to write for your free, that's right, free pamphlet with more than 20 easy recipes for making wonderful fudge and frostings with Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Now, maybe you're thinking that fudge and frosting made with cream cheese would have a cheese flavor, but they don't. Wonderful Philadelphia brand cream cheese gives you fudge and frosting with a perfect Delicate, rich taste, because Philadelphia cream cheese is made with fine milk and thick cream. This fudge and frosting has a special freshness, too, because Philadelphia brand cream cheese is guaranteed fresh by Kraft. And Philadelphia brand gives fudge and frosting a truly marvelous texture, never grainy, never too hard, never too soft, but always smooth. Just be sure you use genuine Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Look for the red Kraft K that's on every silvery package of genuine Philadelphia brand. Remember, genuine Philadelphia brand cream cheese is made only by Kraft. Now, to get your free pamphlet with more than 20 easy recipes for Philly fudge and frostings, simply drop a postcard to Kraft Kitchen, Box 6567, Department G, Chicago 77, Illinois. That address again, Kraft Kitchen... Box 6567, Department G, Chicago 77, Illinois. Right tonight. Well, the great Gildersleeve has caught the Thanksgiving spirit. He invited little Mike from the children's home. He even invited Big Bad Bullard to share his turkey, but Bullard insisted on not coming. Now it looks like there will be several empty places at the table. Uncle Mort. Yes, Marjorie? I'm leaving now. Bronco got tickets for the book football game. Oh? Uh-huh. He's down getting gas, and I'm going to meet him out front. We're a little late. Well, sorry you can't be with us for dinner. But before you go, I want you to meet little Mike. Mike? Yeah, oh, Mike? He's in here with me, testing the turkey, Mr. Gildersleeve. You don't spoil his dinner, Bertie. No, sir. You better send him in. I want Marjorie to see him. Who did you want to see me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, Mike, this is my niece, Marjorie. Hello, Mike. Hello. What's a niece? 
You, well, in this case, she's somebody I'm uncle to. Are you here for dinner, too? Well, I live here, but I can't be here for dinner. You'll excuse me, won't you? Well, I don't know. She and her husband are going to a football game, Mike. Would you rather see a football game than eat turkey? No, but our college is playing. Isn't anybody going to eat Thanksgiving dinner with us? Well, Leroy will be here. He's over on the hill with his sled. What about Mr. Bullard, Unky? He expressed regrets. Bullard style. He's all alone. <laughs> you feel sorry for him. You feel sorry for him. Okay. Oh, oh, that's Bronco. Well, Mike, I'm awfully glad you came. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Marjorie. <laughs> Mike, it's just plain Marjorie. But you've got a husband. That makes you Mrs. <laughs> well, I'll still be Marjorie to you. Goodbye, Anki. Ta-ta, my dear. What do we do now, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, it's quite a while until dinner, and I'm out of cigars. Why don't we drop by Mr. Peavy's and then join Leroy for a sled ride? Okay. Shall we go back and help Bertie taste the turkey before we go? Well, I guess we could take a little sliver where it won't show. Hello, Peavy. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what can I do for you today? I need some cigars, Peavy. I took a chance on your being open today. Well, I'm closing in a little while. Your uh, usual brand? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Peavy, aren't you going to say hello to Mike? Is she here? Yeah. Well, I didn't see you down there below the counter. Hello, Mikey. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Uh, here, Mike. Let me lift you up on one of these stools. Uh, I can climb up. He's having Thanksgiving dinner with us, Peavy. Oh, you don't say. You care to have a soda on the house, Mike? No, I guess it's it for your dinner. Huh? You didn't give me a chance to answer. <laughs> yeah, you better save up. We have a big dinner to take care of. There aren't many people eating with Mr. Gildersleeve and me. Well, Marjorie and Bronco are going to the game over in Center City, Peavy. Well, if it was 40 years ago, I'd go out there and sit in the snow myself. Mr. Gildersleeve, can I whisper something? You well, out? Excuse us, Peavy. <laughs> yeah, well... What is it? Why don't we ask Mr. Peavy over for dinner? Yeah, that's a nice thought. I'm sure his dinner's all planned, but why don't you ask him? Okay. Mr. Peavy? Oh, am I included now? Yes. Would you like to come over and help us eat our turkey? Well, I'll be eating at home, Mike, but thank you just the same. That's all right. I thought you might be lonesome. You like Mr. Peavy has a wife at home. He doesn't get lonesome. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Last Thanksgiving, I would have taken you up on the invitation. Oh? Just happened that I was alone. We'd planned on having a turkey, but Mrs. Peavy went to visit her mother instead. Wish she'd visit, wish she'd visit her mother again this year. How's that? So you'd be lonesome enough to eat with us. <laughs> uh, Peavy, Mike is bound and determined to fill every place at the table. Hey, isn't that Mr. Bullard parking the big car out front? Yes, it is. He's coming in here. He's still alone. Why don't we give him another chance to eat with us? No, Mike. Maybe he wants to be coaxed. I do sometimes. I even get under the bed and won't come out. <laughs> well, all right. Just for you, Mike, I'll ask him once more. Uh, how do you do, Phoebe? Well, hello, Mr. Bullard. Hello, Mike. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Bullard. Oh, Hello. <laughs> what a cold fish Go ahead, Mr. Gildersleeve, ask him Ask me what? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Bullard If you'd care to reconsider, the invitation to dinner is still good well, Thank you, Gildersleeve, but I have plans of my own Well, we'd love to have you come to our house Gildersleeve, stop nagging at me to come to your house <laughs> You're all right You have your dinner and I'll have my party at the club Oh, uh, Peavy, I want five pounds of your best after-dinner mints. My, my. Five pounds? You must be having a big party. Oh, yes, yes, I am. Thanksgiving is a day to gather your friends around you. And although I may not be considered popular by one of my neighbors, I have many friends. Uh, Peavy, make that ten pounds of mint. Ten pounds? <laughs> I'm glad I opened up today. Stuffed shirt. 
Must be inviting his whole club. Uh, how much will that be, Phoebe? Well, it comes to seven dollars, but of course it's a lot of mint. You must not be having anything for dinner but mints. <laughs> Mike. Uh, there you are, Phoebe. These mints should be the crowning touch after my friends and I enjoy a hearty meal. We're having vichyssoise, a tossed green salad with anchovies, roast pheasant, golden pheasant, you <laughs> might have. wild rice, of course, candied yams, and for dessert, flaming plum pudding. Mm, sounds mighty good. Mr. Gildersleeve, maybe he'd invite us to his dinner. <laughs> right, come with me. We have to pick up Leroy. Thanks for picking me up, Unc. Well, it'll soon be time for turkey. Boy, did I work up an appetite sliding on the hill. I'm hungry, too. Me, too. Three of us will have a fine time. Isn't Mr. Bullard coming? No. Bullard's invited a lot of people out to his club for a fancy dinner. Vichy Soirs. <laughs> Leroy, it was nice of you to take me down on the hill on your sled. Oh, that's okay. Forget it. I like you, Leroy. You do? Why? I don't know. I guess it's like Mrs. Foster says. She says little boys always want to be like big boys. Well, I I am getting pretty big, I guess. Uh, Mike, someday you'll be as big as Leroy. I don't know if I'll ever get that big. <laughs> you know, Mike, I sort of like you, too. Thank you. Hey, we're coming close to where I live. Yeah, that's your home, my boy. Hey, look, stop the car. You are, Leroy. Just stop the car. Well, you're all right. Why are we stopping here? I haven't had dinner yet. Uh, yes, Leroy, why are we stopping? Unc, could we get some more little kids like Mike and take them home to dinner? Leroy, that's a wonderful idea. Oh, boy. Leroy, can I go in and see who's left? Sure. Caddy, Unc. You bet. Run on in, Mike, and round up a car full. We'll wait. Oh, boy, I've been wanting to invite somebody. Yeah, what a fine little fellow. Yeah, he's okay. In Leroy. Yeah. There's another fine fellow sitting right next to me. Oh, heck. Gosh. <laughs> Gee, Unc, that's the way to have Thanksgiving. Yes, sir. Invite people to dinner who'll appreciate it. To heck with Bullard. Let him have his big dinner with all his fine friends. Hey, Mr. Gildersleeve, Leroy. Yeah, I didn't expect you back so soon, Mike. Where are all the kids, Mike? They've all gone out. They have? But do you know who's sitting in there with no place to go? Who? Mr. Bullard. Mr. Bullard. <laughs> Come on out, Mr. Bullard. They know you're in there. Well, what do you know? You imagine that. Hello, Mr. Bullard. Oh, uh, uh, hello, Gillespie. You right? Hi. Hey, Mr. Bullard, you're the last man I expected to see here. Oh, well, I thought I'd come over and take some of the children to dinner. You're not the only one who can entertain friends. And, uh, well, good day. I think I'll take my mints and go home. You wait a minute, Mr. Bullard. Yes, yes. Yeah, I thought you were going to have a big party at your club. Well, I intended to, Gildersleeve, but a lot of pushy people like you have taken all the children. Well, we didn't get our share. There's room for one more. You mean? Uh... Yeah. How many times do we have to ask you? <laughs> well, Come on, Mr. Bullard, I... I'll get in the back seat with you. All right, all right. Thank you, Leroy. Thank you. Right, George Bullard, this is a fine idea. I'm so glad you're going to be with us. Thank you, Gildersleeve. <laughs> Don't cry, Mr. Bullard. You have more friends than you thought you had. Yes, sir. There's something about Thanksgiving. The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just 30 seconds. Have you tasted the two delicious new versions of Philadelphia brand cream cheese? Now you can get delicately rich Philadelphia cream cheese filled with spicy bits of chives and Philadelphia cream cheese with pieces of red pimento all through. 
Imagine the delicious variety of easy snacks and sandwiches you can make with these two new kinds of Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Try them tomorrow. Just be sure you get genuine Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Remember, there's only one Philadelphia brand, and it's made and guaranteed fresh by Kraft. This is Gildersleeve again. Thanksgiving is a holiday we Americans cherish. It's a part of our national tradition. And more than that, it shows how our way of life in this country has always been linked so closely with religion. These days, I think we all realize how important it is that we strengthen our faith for ourselves and our children. Take someone to church this week. You'll both be richer for it. Good night. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Willard Waterman. The show is written by John Elliott and Andy White and is partially transcribed. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Mary Lee Robb, Lillian Randolph, Gail Gordon... Tommy Reddick, Earl Ross, and Dick Legrand. This is John Heaston saying good night for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of those famous Kraft quality food products. Be sure to listen in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> In a sandwich, what do you like best? Say, in a cold beef sandwich, a cheese sandwich, egg salad, salami, what do you like best? Well, if you've ever tried it, I bet you'll say Kraft's prepared mustard. Because when you add a little Kraft mustard, you add a lot of tang. In fact, there are two kinds of Kraft mustard. Salad mustard, mild and delicately spiced, and Kraft mustard with snappy horseradish added. Have both kinds on hand. And remember, the next time you make a sandwich, when you add a little mustard, you add a lot of tang. Buy Kraft's prepared mustard. Groucho Marx, you bet your life. He's next on NBC. The Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. The Great Gildersleeve is brought to you partially transcribed by the Kraft Foods Company. Kraft, you know, makes Philadelphia brand cream cheese, the cream cheese that's been famous for quality since 1880. Delicious, creamy white Philadelphia brand is so popular, it outsells all other brands of cream cheese combined. Enjoy it often. Just be sure you get genuine Philadelphia brand when you buy Look for the red Kraft K on the silvery package. Remember, there's only one Philadelphia brand cream cheese, and it's made by Kraft and guaranteed fresh. Well, the great Gildersleeve is facing the same situation every parent faces sooner or later. Leroy is growing up. Nowadays, it seems the boy's pants are too short and his shoes too small almost before the water commissioner gets the bills for them. And that isn't the only way Leroy is branching out. Instead of living in a wild western world of pistol shots and galloping hoofs, he likes to gallop off after dinner and hang around with the boys. See you later, Unc. Leroy, where are you going tonight? Just out of the corner. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing, my boy. Well, what's going on down there? I'm just meeting Tiger and the guys. You Tiger? Tiger Davis. A big wheel on the football team. You're not going to play football under the streetlights? No, we're just going to stand around. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? 
Well, nothing, I'm sure. But it's a school night. What about your homework? I'll be back early. Can I go now? Tiger's waiting. Yeah, I suppose so. But be back by 8 o'clock at the latest. Sure. What's wrong with that? That's a new expression. I wonder where we picked that up. It isn't that I want to check up on Leroy. There's no harm in knowing what kind of company he keeps. I wouldn't be a good parent if I didn't. Yeah, I don't see him hanging around the corner anywhere. Getting close to 8 o'clock. You think I'll stop in and ask Peavy if he's seen it? Hello, Peavy. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what can I do for you this evening? Hey, Peavy, you haven't seen anything of Leroy and his crowd, have you? Uh, not yet, but some of them usually drop in about this time on their way home. Phoebe, I don't like the idea of boys Leroy's age drifting around after dinner. Well, if it's any comfort to you, I've watched them come and go around this corner for 40 years. And I can remember only one young man who didn't turn out as well as I thought he was going to. Well, who was that, Phoebe? <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't agree with that. But uh, running a drugstore, you do get a chance to observe the kids. What do they do every evening? Well, they just stand around and talk about this and that. All evening? Well, it's the awkward age, Mr. Gildersleeve. It takes all evening to find something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that sounds innocent enough. Peavy, what do you know about this Tiger Davis? Well, Tiger has quite a reputation. Oh, what kind? Well, you can eat more banana splits than anybody in town. Yo. <laughs> Here they come now. Hi, Mr. Peavy. Hi, Mr. Peavy. Hello, boy. Hi, Unc. Hello, Leroy. Unc, this is my old pal, Tiger. He and I are pals. Hello, Tiger. Hi, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh... Hey, Gildersleeve. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you the water commissioner, but I didn't know your last name, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Peavy. Well, Tiger, it's uh, nice to meet you at last. Leroy's talked a lot about you. Yeah. Well, when you're the first string quarterback on the football team, everybody wants to know you. I see. Well, you aren't looking for me, Unc. Well, not exactly. In fact, definitely not. Now that you mention it, you said you'd be home by 8 o'clock and it's five minutes after. Well, I would have been home by now, Unc, but there was a keen fight down the street. You don't say. You fight? Sure. Le What's wrong with that? Leroy, have you been in a fight? Heck no, it was in a store window. Television. Yo, television. Well, sure. What's wrong with that? So that's where Leroy picked it up. <laughs> well, we better be getting on home, Leroy. I'll walk on ahead with Tiger, Unc. Yeah, all right. Good night, Tiger. Good night. Good night, boy. Good night. It's after eight, Peavy. Are you going to close up? No, I may stay open another hour. Till nine o'clock? Sure. What's wrong with that? Peavy, <laughs> you too? More coffee, Mr. Gilsey? Yeah, about half a cup, Bertie. Thank you. Yes, sir. How about you, Miss Marjorie? Oh, no, thanks, Bertie. I'll wait for Bronco. Yes, ma'am. Sorry I'm a little late with breakfast, but Leroy was in such a hurry for me to pack his lunch. Yeah, he left like a shot out of a gun again. <laughs> he even went off and forgot his books. You know, Marjorie, I'm a little concerned about Leroy. I hate to think what his report card will look like. Leroy's smart about everything else. I don't know why he, he don't get grades like little Babs across the street. She's a grade A student. Mm. Leroy's a grade D minus. <laughs> well, some boys just find it hard to study, Yankee. I know Bronco did until he started studying nights with somebody else. You? Who? Me. Yeah. <laughs> right, George, that's a thought. I wonder if we could get Leroy interested in studying with Babs. Well, do you think you could get Babs interested in studying with Leroy? Yeah. Well, she seems to like Leroy. And Leroy's a total loss around girls. Look her out the window, Unky. Babs is on her way to school now. You? Yes. <laughs> She's such a cute girl. 
Yeah, I think I'll run out and ask her if she'll do her homework with Leroy. Excuse me, Margie. Yeah, I'll have to hurry before she gets away. Good luck, Auntie. Yeah, I don't like to ask favors of Babs. But she'll do this for Leroy. Sure. Babs! Babs! You calling me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yes, I'd like to have a word with you. I'm on my way to school. You will. I'll walk to the corner with you. That's a very pretty dress you're wearing this morning. It isn't a dress. It's a skirt and sweater. Yeah, well. Anyway, it's pretty. Thank you. Babs, I hear you're an A student. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, Babs, if you'd care to come over this evening and do your homework with Leroy. Why don't you help him with his homework? Me? You can do ninth grade stuff, can't you? Well, I went to school, of course, but that was some time ago. Yeah, I really think you're the one who can help Leroy. Mr. Gildersleeve, Leroy is beyond help. <laughs> but when I try to talk to him, he just hangs his head and kicks the ground and giggles. Yeah, well, Babs, he's at the awkward age. He certainly is. Young girls seem to have more poise than boys. Leroy's just growing up. He's still shy. So when you see him, why don't you suggest coming over and studying tonight? Yeah, I think I know what you'll get for an answer. So do I. He'll hang his head and go... (laughs) (laughs) I guess she's right. Leroy's a bigger problem than I thought. Four o'clock. They haven't gotten out all the water bills. Around the end of the month, I wish the department didn't have so many customers. Come in. Hello, Gildy. Hello, Judge. Why, Gildy, you're working. You bet. I have to send out these water bills. Well, I can speed that up for you. You how? When you come to mine, just toss it in the wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> You old goat. I just saw Leroy on the street with his sidekick, Tiger Davis. You did? Yeah, they were on their way home from school. Leroy was carrying Tiger's books, and Tiger was riding Leroy's bike. Oh, my goodness. Judge, what do you know about this Tiger? He seems to be a popular boy. I know his father. He's with the Internal Revenue Department. At least he was. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess the boy's all right. But I'd like to see Leroy spend more evenings at home, studying. Gildy, have you ever thought of inviting Tiger into your home? Well, no. In addition to opening your home to Leroy's friends, you have an opportunity to observe the company he keeps. Not that I think Leroy is forming the wrong friendships. Judge, that's a fine idea. I'll have Leroy invite him out. I would. Sure. Is Tiger and Leroy say? What's wrong with that, Dad? What? In... Nothing, Judge. You just not help, that's all. Oh. <laughs> Is Leroy out again this evening, Unky? He'll be back in a few minutes, Marjorie. He's bringing Tiger to the house tonight. They're coming over here? Yeah, my idea. A shrewd little plan to keep them at home. And Leroy is delighted. But, Anki, what'll they do here? Oh, we'll popcorn, toast marshmallows. Anki, you seem to forget. Leroy is way past that stage. No, Margie, don't worry. I'll keep things rolling. Right in, Tiger, old pal. Here they are now. I'm going to run upstairs, Anki. This is your party. Anki? In here, Leroy. Hello, Tiger. Hiya, Mr. Gildersleeve. Nice of you to invite me over. Well, glad you came. What are we going to do, Anki? Well, if anybody gets hungry, we might toast some marshmallows. Toast marshmallows? Oh, you have a great sense of humor, Dad. (laughs) (laughs) What's wrong with toasting marshmallows? Ah, kid stuff. Have you got a ping pong table, Leroy? We can play ping pong. Well, gosh, no. Well, you can't play ping pong, but Leroy can play the piano. The piano? What goes with you and the piano, Junior? Well, gee, gosh, I used to play, but I haven't touched it since I was a kid. You, my goodness. I got them into the house now. What'll I do with them? Ah, 
What was that? <laughs> yeah, I'll get it, Bertie. Good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, Babs, I didn't think you were coming over this evening. Uh, come in. I decided to help Leroy with his homework. Good. Hi, Babs. Hello, Leroy. What's this about homework? Uh, Babs, this is Tiger Davis. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I, I've seen you at school. I haven't seen you. What's this about homework? Leroy, this morning your uncle asked me to come over and help you with your homework. Oh, Unc! Didn't you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, yes. Leroy, you should study more. Study with a girl? Leroy. Well, Tiger, I'm being framed. I don't study with girls. No? What's wrong with that? What? Get with it, Junior. She's got it. <laughs> Leroy, I didn't ask to study with you, and if that's the way you feel, I'll just go home. Yeah, but Babs. Gosh, I hadn't planned on studying right now. Uh, <clears throat> Junior. Yeah, Tiger? Well, if you're not going to study with Babs, uh, I think I will. Yeah? yeah? Tiger, we can't study together. We don't take the same subjects. Well, I'm shifty. I'll change my course. <laughs> players. Oh, brother. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's perfectly obvious that Leroy doesn't want to study with me. Yeah, but Babs. Uh, well, I, uh, I have to leave early, too. <laughs> so, uh, see you home, Babs. Thank you. Gosh, Tiger, you're not leaving. Junior, the girl has books to carry. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good night. Good night. I'm sorry, Leroy. What's there to be sorry for? you soon find out who your pals are. And anybody who studies with girls is no pal of mine. Well, perhaps it all turned out for the best, my boy. Now you can buckle down to your homework. Leroy? Leroy? Yeah? Where are you going? Upstairs to study? I'm going to bed. <laughs> How do you figure a boy his age? <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. Here's a wonderful new way you can make rich frosting and a grand fudge every time. Frosting and fudge that's never grainy, never too hard, never too soft, but always creamy smooth. Frosting and fudge that's easy to make without cooking. You do it with Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Have a pencil and paper handy, and in just a minute I'll tell you where to write for your free, that's right, free pamphlet with more than 20 easy recipes for making wonderful fudge and frosting with Philadelphia brand cream cheese. Philadelphia brand gives fudge and frosting a wonderful, delicate, rich taste because this cream cheese is made with lots of fine milk and thick cream. And Philadelphia cream cheese keeps fudge and frosting moist, and fresh tasting longer. You know, Philadelphia brand cream cheese is guaranteed fresh by Kraft. So always be sure you use genuine Philadelphia brand. Look for the red Kraft K that's on every silvery package of genuine Philadelphia brand to help you pick the real thing at a glance. Remember, genuine Philadelphia brand is made only by Kraft. Now, to get your free pamphlet with more than 20 easy recipes for delicious... Philly Fudge and Frosting, just write to Kraft Kitchen, Box 6567, Department G, Chicago 77, Illinois. That address again, Kraft Kitchen, Box 6567, Department G, Chicago 77, Illinois. Write tonight. <laughs> Well, in order to get Leroy to concentrate on his homework, the great Gildersleeve invited pretty little Babs over to help him study. But since Leroy's idol, Tiger Davis, concentrated on Babs, Leroy hasn't been able to concentrate on anything. You know, all I started out to do was to get Leroy to spend more time at home. Now I can't get him to go anywhere. Yeah, I'll go up and talk to the boy again. This is getting to be a full-time job. I wonder how my grandfather ever lived to be 90 after raising a family of eight. 
Leroy? Yeah? It's your old uncle. Can I come in? I guess so. What are you doing, my boy? Say, you're studying. Sure, what else is there to do? Well, that's a fine idea. But you might turn the book right side up. Uncle, why did you have to invite Babs over the other night? Well, frankly, I was a little concerned about your homework. You and Tiger were wasting too many evenings downtown. I wonder what Tiger sees in girls. You, well, Leroy, that's what happens to boys sooner or later. They start noticing girls. Sometimes it happens almost overnight. I never thought of that happened to a regular guy like Tiger. I guess I won't see him anymore. He's gone. <laughs> now, Leroy, you mustn't feel you've lost Tiger as a friend. It just happens you're a little behind him, that's all. I am? Yeah, what I mean is, he's growing up a little faster than you. Well, I don't believe it, but he says his dad has given him a razor for Christmas. Well, Leroy, it won't be too long before you'll need a razor. Yeah, I can see you and Tiger being pals again, going to school dances, maybe double dating. Yeah. I guess a guy just can't fight it. <laughs> well, it's really nothing to worry about. You know, I've gone with girls for many years, and I know. Nice girls are really pretty nice. I guess I'd better do my homework, Unc. Yeah, yes. Well, I'll say good night. Good night, my boy. Good night. The way my face feels, I won't need a razor for years. <laughs> I think I'll check it in the mirror. Peach fuzz. <laughs> well, what if I did have whiskers? I still wouldn't want to go running around with girls. I don't want to see any more a tiger either. Big shot. Calling me Junior. Well, Bab seems to like him. If I don't do something pretty soon, nobody will have anything to do with me. Maybe if I tried, I could have fun going with girls. Junior. Leroy Forrester, grow up. If Tiger can do it, so can I. Overnight. Starting tomorrow. I think I'll wear my Sunday suit to school. Everyone around here thinks I'm still a kid. I'll show them. I'll show them if it kills me. Miss Gilsey, do you want me to hold breakfast for Leroy? Yeah, I suppose so, Bertie. He's a little late this morning. Yes, ma'am. Unky, mm. what's happened to Leroy? Now he doesn't see Tiger, Babs, or anybody. Here he comes now. Yeah, let's not mention Babs or girls. Leroy's a little sensitive on the subject. Poor Leroy. Yeah, come on, Leroy, we're waiting. Thank you, Unc. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Bertie. Good morning, Leroy. Leroy, you're wearing your good suit. Sure. What's wrong with that? Do I smell shaving lotion on you, my boy? I borrowed a little of yours to get my face used to it. I may be shaving before very long. Maybe by Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it won't be too long. Glad to see you're feeling better this morning, my boy. Yeah, I feel great. And you look very nice. You think you should be wearing your good suit to school? Uh, you have clean blue jeans, Leroy. Well, jeans are okay, but I might as well get some use out of this suit. I'll be growing out of it soon. Oh, yes, yes, you will. Leroy, why do you keep watching the window? I don't want to miss Babs when she starts for school. What's this? You're going to walk to school with Babs? Get with it, Marge. The girl has books to carry. <laughs> oh. oh. She's coming out of her house now. Excuse me. Uh, Leroy, you haven't finished your breakfast. Well, Leroy, you haven't touched your prune. I don't eat those anymore. Am I a shoes dunk? Oh, I suppose so, my boy. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Leroy. So long. See you at dinner. Now I've seen everything. That ain't like Leroy leaving the table to walk to school with a girl. It is quite a change in the boy. Yes, sir. I know he don't like prunes, but I thought he preferred prunes to girls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking you to school.
school. Oh, are you? Here, give me your books. Hey, Roy, let go. I'll carry my own books. You can't carry your own books. The guy carries the book. Get with it. Oh, well, all right. Uh, how about meeting you after school and carrying them back? What, Leroy? And, uh, how about coming over tonight and doing homework? Leroy Forrester, the other night you said you didn't want to study with me. Well, I'm shifty. I can change my course. <laughs> Leroy, what's happened to you? Are you wearing perfume? Shaving lotion. <laughs> Shaving lotion? <laughs> Why don't you ask your age? That's just what I'm doing. <laughs> What's so funny? What are you laughing at? Oh, you're acting so silly. Just like that Tiger Davis. <laughs> you mean you don't like Tiger Davis? He thinks he's so smart. <laughs> but but I thought... He isn't my type at all. He isn't? Shall we cross the street? Okay. What are you stopping here for? Leroy, boys old enough to use shaving lotion usually help girls across the street. What? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, sure. Let me take your hand. Thank you. It's okay. What the what kind of boys are your type if Tiger isn't? Well, I like boys who are hmm, more natural. Like who? Well, right now, you're sort of natural. I don't feel natural. <laughs> Leroy. Yeah, Babs? We're across the street and you're still holding my hand. I know. <laughs> no, those children over there are giggling at us. Oh, let them giggle. They'll grow up someday. Overnight. <laughs> That boy. I thought I had him straightened out. He's neglecting his homework again this evening. Well, you're not in the street corner. I'd better check with Peavy. Hello, Peavy. Hello, Mr. Gallisley. Peavy, have you seen Leroy? Shh. He's sitting over there in the booth. Who? With that tiger again? No, this time he's with a little deer. <laughs> Oh, Babs. Well, he should be doing his homework. He's doing his homework. He is? They've been studying all evening with the same algebra book and the same soda. <laughs> well, as long as he's studying, I won't interrupt him. They wouldn't hear you anyway. They're concentrating pretty hard. You? Oh? I haven't been listening, you understand, but when I went over to ask if they wanted to order, Babs said something about pie. Pie? And Leroy said pie was 3.1416, but I don't have any of that kind of pie. <laughs> so I went away. TV, that's algebra, and you know it. <laughs> You're right, George. I'm pretty happy about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Here's Tiger. Yo. Hi, Mr. Gillisleeve. Is that Leroy in the booth? Uh, yes, but... Hey, Leroy! Yeah? Where you been? Come on, we're meeting the guys in the corner. Meet him yourself, Junior. Can't you see I'm with a girl? <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just 30 seconds. Now, for a greater variety of delicious, easy snacks and sandwiches, get two wonderful new versions of Philadelphia brand cream cheese. There's delicate, rich Philadelphia brand filled with tangy bits of French chives and Philadelphia brand with tiny pieces of red pimento all through. To help you pick the real thing at a glance, look for the Red Craft K that's on every package of genuine Philadelphia brand. Remember... Genuine Philadelphia brand cream cheese is made only by Kraft. Look what I found back of the couch, Bertie. 
Leroy's cap pistol. Yeah. Mm. His Hopalong Cassidy gun belt and holster. Well, Bertie, I guess we can put these away with his baby shoes. Our cowboy has hung up his guns. <laughs> I hate to see him grow up. Well, it'll be a relief, too, in a way. No more crazy kid ideas. Won't have to suffer through any more of those silly fads. Yo-yos, water pistols. Hey, I'm trying to have a record player. What's this? Fab's got some keen records. All the kids are getting record players. Can I get one, can I, Uncle? Hunk? Eh, kids don't change. They just get more expensive. <laughs> Good night, folks. Great Gildersleeve is played by Willard Waterman. The show is written by John Elliott and Andy White and is partially transcribed. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Mary Lee Robb, Lillian Randolph, Gil Stratton, Barbara Whiting, Earl Ross, and Dick Legrand. This is John Heaston saying goodnight for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of the famous line of Kraft quality food products. Be sure to listen in next Wednesday and every Wednesday for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Today, the Kraft Foods Company salutes the 4-H clubs, who are this week celebrating their 30th anniversary at a meeting in Chicago attended by boys and girls from every state in the Union and from Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Kraft congratulates these junior citizens on their agricultural and homemaking achievements and on the principles expressed in this solemn pledge made by every 4-H club member. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, my health to better living, for my club, my community, and my country. Groucho Marx, you bet your life. He's next on NBC.